from New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast, present that immortal character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. <laughs> This week's story, The Black Guardsman of Braddock Castle. Holmes, it's black as pitch down here. You say we're in the lower dungeon of the castle? Quite, and below sea level, too. Note how cold and clammy these stone walls are, Watson. Yes, well, they're no colder and clammier than my flesh. I don't like it, Holmes, I don't like it at all. Prowling through a deserted castle, stalking a medieval apparition, a legendary ghost. It happens to be the other way around, Watson. Huh? What do you mean? The ghost is stalking us. Listen. So once again we raise the familiar brass door knocker of Dr. John Watson. Well, 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 Mr. Harris, come in, uh, sir. Come in and warm yourself uh, by the fire. Thank you. I see you're deep in your memoirs, as usual, Dr. Yes, Watson. yes. In, in fact, I've just completed a strange and terrifying case in which Holmes and I were involved in the West Country. Hmm? Cornwall, to be exact. Yes? Well, what's it called, Dr. Watson? The Black Guardsman of Braddock Castle. And I must say, Mr. Harris, that to this day, the very recollection of it is enough to disturb the uneasy realm of my sleep. Perhaps you'd like to hear it. Why, we most certainly would, Doctor. Well, to begin with, Braddock Castle had been empty and deserted for 50 years. It stood on an island off the rugged Cornish coast just north of St. Michael's Mount. And a devilish, gloomy and forbidding place it was. The natives of the region gave this architectural monstrosity of grey parapets and towering battlements a wide berth for reasons which I shall relate later. But one sunset, two fishermen were rowing their boat just off the island, heading for the mainland. Uh, uh, what is it, John? Hold up with the oars. Why, what's up? Hold up with the oars, I say. There's something floating on the water here. Like... <gasps> Great, Peter. It's... it's a... Uh... Oh. It's a body. A human body. And fair water log, too. With naught but the legs showing above and the rest underwater. Oh, great Peter. Here, Arthur. Give me a hand now. We'll pull him into the boat. Oi. Right. Easy now. He's as steady, does it? Hold his legs down. What? Drag him over. You soon see what this poor beggar might be, Herbert. John! Oh, John, look! Oh, there's no head on him. The beggar hasn't got a head. Oh, it's cut clean off. Lord bless us, it's... Ah! Herbert, Herbert, look! Where? On the North Tower. Yonder on Brother Castle. John, it's him. It's him. I curse him. Standing there, black against the red sun, with his axe on his shoulder, looking down at us and laughing at his work. He's done it again. The black guardsman of Brother Castle. He swung his axe again. <laughs> Watson, in a very few minutes we shall be in Whitecliff on the mainland directly across from Braddock Castle. And after that, Holmes? After that we shall repair to the Green Lion Inn and ascertain from Lady Eleanor Wincroft the strange contents of her long telegram. Why, well, I, I thought it was quite clear, Rubbish, Holmes. Watson. It was written with a fine feminine disdain for logic. All we can gather is that her brother, Sir Alistair Wincroft, last lineal male descendant of the Earl of Braddock, was found floating on the water of his ancestral castle with his head severed from his torso. Sounds like an intriguing and rather sinister business, Holmes. Quite. But on itself, not enough to force me to leave my comfortable quarters at Baker Street and endure this tedious trip to Cornwall. Then in heaven's name, what possessed you to leave in such great haste? Why are we aboard the Southern Railway now? Because of the legend of Braddock Castle. You're aware of it, Watson? Oh, vaguely. Something about a ghost, wasn't it? Almost every English castle has a favorite apparition, Watson. But this one is particularly bizarre. It seems that the castle originally belonged to a family named Wexley, who, like most good Cornishmen, supported the Lancastrians during the Wars of the Roses. 
Eventually, it was attacked by John Wincroft, Earl of Braddock, in 1497. And every defender wiped out. Every defender, mind you, but one. All but one, eh? This last defender was a guardsman dressed in black mail and carrying a huge battle axe. From the topmost tower, he swore that his ghost would walk the castle and bring violent death to every Wincroft who dared to inhabit it. After that, he flung his great battle axe down among his tormentors and leaped to his doom. Good Lord, Holmes. You're not inferring that this ghostly axeman chopped Sir Alistair's head from his body? I'm inferring nothing until I see Lady Wincroft, Watson. Mr. Holmes, I'm very grateful to you and Dr. Watson for journeying all the way down from London. Uh, There's no trouble at all, Lady Wincroft, no trouble at all. On the contrary, Watson, I find it a most unpleasant journey. However, Lady Wincroft, perhaps the challenge of this rather bizarre situation may provide us with all the compensation we need. Now then, a few questions. Of course, Mr. Holmes. I do not wish to appear rude. However, I must ask that you make your answers brief, precise, and above all, accurate. We shall get to the heart of the matter so much the sooner. You will bear with me in this, Lady Wincroft? I shall do my best, Mr. Holmes. Good. Now, to begin with, have the official police been notified? Oh, yes. The local authorities have already telegraphed Scotland Yard. Well, in that case, Holmes, I suppose Inspector Lestrade will appear in due course, huh? Quite. Now then, Lady Wincroft, two weeks ago, your brother Alistair crossed the bay to the castle. He took no companion but went alone. In the interval, nothing was heard from him until last night when he was taken from the water. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Why did he undertake this special journey? Oh, frankly, Mr. Holmes, our family has suffered, well, severe financial reverses. It became to our interest to sell the castle, but under the circumstances... I see. Under the circumstances, no purchaser would be interested as long as the legend persisted. Rather an expensive nuisance, this medieval guardsman, eh, Lady Wincroft? Yes. It was Alistair's idea to prove this legend nonsense, to rout the ghost, so to speak. Hmm. Unfortunately, this apparition has heightened its own prestige in cruel and telling fashion. Now, Lady Wincroft, you'll forgive me if I ask you a personal and perhaps a rather painful question. Yes, Mr. Holmes? I don't mean to pry, but I have a curious mind. It seems odd to me that you show no grief over your brother's death. May I ask why? Well, Holmes, I don't think... Please should... do not interrupt, Watson. Well, Lady Wincroft? I... Well, I had not seen Alistair since he was a boy. He dissipated what was left of our fortune at the gaming tables. Perhaps I sound callous. But it was he who was responsible for our present difficulty. And where has Sir Alistair been all these years? Oh, in Africa for the most part, somewhere on the Gold Coast. It was only very recently that he appeared here in Whitecliffe for the idea of selling Braddock Castle. I see. Come, Watson, let's be off. Well, where are we going, Holmes? To the mortuary, of course, to examine the torso of the little lamented Sir Alistair. <laughs> Remarkable, Holmes, remarkable. A clean and terrible amputation worthy of a surgeon's skill. You know, I don't... Holmes. I say, Holmes. Yes, Watson? You're not even looking at the place where the head... I'm not interested in the head, Watson. It's the man's hands that tell the story. His head? Yes. Observe, Watson. Here is the signet ring of his family. But note the fingernails, and particularly the black substance beneath them. Ordinary dirt, it appears to me. Rubbish, Watson. If it were dirt, the action of the water would have cleansed it from the nails days ago. No, that black substance is tar. Tar? But what the deuce does that have to do? Come, Watson, you and I got across the bay to Braddock Castle and try to flush our ghostly quarry. Oh, you, you mean tomorrow, of course? On the contrary, Watson. I mean tonight. I don't like it, Holmes. I don't like it at all. Growing dead ahead into this beastly fog, we, we, we should have sighted Bladder Castle by now. Patience, Watson, patience. Of course, this whole guardsman legend is sheer poppycock. The castle's been deserted and empty for 50 years. I wonder. Holmes, you don't mean to say you believe a ghost... No, is... Watson, I'm interested in seeing whether the castle has a bona fide tenant of more recent vintage and... Hello, what's this in the water? I don't see anything. Look closer, Watson. It's oil slick. What of it? Interesting. This happens to be a region where motor-powered craft never Holmes. come. There it is, dead ahead. Braddock Castle. You see it? Through that rift in the fog? Yes. Unpleasant-looking place, isn't it? <sighs> as bleak and forbidding a fortress as I've ever seen. Uh, observe, Watson. The mist seems to be swirling away from the parapet now. Very soon we'll... Watson, look. Where? On the topmost tower. 
great heavens, it's him. The Black Guardsman of Braddock. It is indeed. Look at him, Holmes, look at him. Standing there with his great axe over his shoulder, watching us. As though waiting to welcome us. A one, two. Well, Watson, there's Braddock Castle just across the moat. You've secured the boat firmly? Oh, yes, Holmes, I have. Note that our good friend the guardsman has left the drawbridge down, an open invitation for us to cross. Very considerate of him, don't you think? Uh, too considerate. And there seems to be a small door at the other end of the drawbridge. The moon's coming out now, and I can see it plainly. Come, Watson, we'll cross over and investigate it. Well, he seems to have disappeared from his watchtower above. Probably watching us from somewhere inside the castle, Holmes. I only wish I'd brought my service revolver from London. Too late for that now. Hello, here's the door. It's probably locked. On the contrary, Watson, it's open. Holmes, I don't like it. This mysterious medieval apparition doesn't make sense. I beg to differ, Watson. We're dealing with a rare intellect playing a sinister game to the finish. Yes, but the drawbridge down, this open door, he, he seems to be inviting us in. Precisely, into what he hopes is a trap. And... Good heavens, Holmes! The drawbridge is going up behind us. Right. That means he's cut off our line of retreat. Yes. And in that case, Watson, we'll just have to accept the guardsman's invitation. Come, let's see what lies beyond this door. And now to return to our story, Dr. Watson... Well, as I told you, Mr. Harris, Holmes and I opened that small door at the end of the drawbridge leading into the lower depths of Braddock Castle. The very air was foul with the musty smell of centuries, and it was dark as the black hole of Golcutta. I could feel the hackles rise on the back of my neck, standing there in that eerie place. But Holmes was his usual self, as cold as ice. I say, Holmes. Watson, listen. Hear anything? No. Then let us proceed. This seems to be a narrow passageway of some kind. Stay close to me, Watson. Well, my dear fellow, I'm so close now, I'm breathing down your neck. Holmes, can't we light a match? Out of the question. But it's pitch dark. Right. And there may be a pit or some floor trap ahead. The chance we'll have to take. But, Holmes... I repeat, I... Watson, it's out of the question. We can't afford to reveal our whereabouts to our phantom friend. Uh, if you ask me, the blighter already knows. What's the matter, Watson? Oh, the place is filled with spider webs, thousands of them. Yes. Proves no one's passed through here lately. Look, Watson, how this passageway slopes downward. Oh, I'd give a hundred pounds to know where it leads to right now. Ooh. What is it, Watson? Oh, oh, oh Speak up, I, man. I, I just ran into a spider web head on. Oh, calm yourself, Watson. Spider webs won't hurt you. Perhaps not, but dash it all, there was a big spider in the middle of this one. Holmes, let's get out of here. In a moment, Watson, in a moment. There's a means of egress here. Those stone steps at the other end of the room. Apparently, we're below sea level. Observe how cold and clammy these stone walls are. Yes, well, they're no colder or clammier than my flesh. I don't like this at all, Holmes. I don't like it at all. Prowling through a deserted castle, pursuing some medieval apparition. It happens to be the other way around, Watson. Oh, what do you mean? Listen. Holmes, the Black Guardsman. Undoubtedly. He seems to be waiting. <laughs> Good heaven, someone screamed. <laughs> Holmes, what the devil? No time to talk now. Quick, Watson, up those stone steps. Hurry, Watson. That scream came from somewhere in this corridor. Well, I, I'm not as young as I used to be, Holmes. I do. Hold on. What is it, man? I, oh, dear. I, I believe I just stumbled over a body. If you did, it's undoubtedly Sir Alistair Wincroft. Sir Alistair, but he was found dead in the bay. Rubbish, Watson. I'll venture to say this is Sir Alistair. Here. Let's have a light and we shall see. Oh, oh. Yes. Yes, here we are. Good Lord. What a ghastly sight. Yes. The black guardsman of Braddock Castle has bloodied his axe again. But how do you know? S it's... Sir Alistair, a quick search should prove it. Ah, yes. Here's the man's wallet. Identification papers. Look for yourself, my dear Watson. Let me see. 
By Jove, it is Lady Eleanor's brother. Quite. But, but who was the man they fished up out of the bay? Anonymous, Watson, but a sailor, certainly. The man's hands were rough and there was tar under the fingernails, a sure sign of the nautical trade. It was obvious that the hands of the headless corpse were not those of a gentleman. Yes, but this think, sailor... Watson, think an elementary connection stares you in the face. You recall the oil slick in the bay? From this point, we may deduce that... Holmes, there he goes again. Hmm. Elusive beggar, isn't he, Watson? But with a pronounced tread, far removed from the ethereal. Follow me. Oh, where are we going? Up these stairs. Unless I miss my guess, they lead to the main hall and perhaps to the Black Guardsman. Quite right. This is the main hall of the castle. You can see by the moonlight filtering in through the windows. Quite. And Holmes, what the devil are you peering at the floor for? Dust. Its telltale granules have marked the path of many a criminal to the gallows. Aha! Capital. Capital. What is it? Observe, Watson. Footprints. The floor is covered with them in the thick dust. And very peculiar they are, too. Peculiar in what way? Use your eyes, man. Use your eyes. It's obvious. These footprints were made by bare feet. Bare feet? Holmes, that doesn't make sense. On the contrary, Watson, it does. It makes very good sense indeed. Fascinating, fascinating, these impressions in the dust. Note, Watson, coming in from the direction of the main hall door, they're vague, shuffling, not clear at all. Note, too, they weave from side to side as though their barefooted owners were somewhat intoxicated. Well, what does that signify, Holmes? It's very clear. It shows that each of these barefooted men was carrying a heavy burden which caused them to stagger and shuffle erratically. On the return journey, the prints are quite clear. You mean somewhere up those stairs, these barefooted men disposed of their burden? Precisely. And if we follow them, Watson, I think we shall find some sort of large room and perhaps some immensely valuable loot peculiar to the continent of Africa. Africa? Holmes, what the do? Follow me, Watson. In a very short time, I hope to gratify your curiosity and dissipate your bewilderment. We are, Watson, just as I told you. Yes, you're quite right. Those dust prints lead directly into this large room. Yes, and observe, Watson, what are standing in rows against the far wall. Good Lord, Holmes. It's ivory, tusks of ivory, hundreds of them. Precisely. Brought in on ocean-going boats in the dead of night by native crews, as the bare footprints here indicate. A fortune in tusks brought across Africa by slave caravans, loaded on the beaches of the Gold Coast and then transported here. By Jove, then Braddock Castle is being used as a staging point for, for smuggling ivory into England. Exactly. Naturally, it was to the interest of the devilishly clever intellect who concocted this scheme to heighten the illusion of the Black Guardsman of Braddock Castle. Above all, what was needed was privacy. Hence the headless bodies, the appearance of the apparition upon the battlements in full regalia. But uh, Sir Alistair, what of him? Ah, yes. At first, Watson, knowing his African and Gold Coast background, I'd rather suspected that he was the master of this ring. Now, however, I know that there's someone else. Yes, but who? Who is responsible for all this? Only a master criminal of supreme shrewdness could operate this kind of smuggling game on such a grand scope, Watson. A man worthy of my own metal. A protagonist of almost superhuman cunning. <laughs> Holmes! It's the guardsman again. Yes, he's running up those stairs leading to the tower. Here, Watson. Seize a weapon and give me one. Right, you up. Thank you. These swords will do, and let's set out after him. By Jove, Holmes, it looks as though this time we may meet him face to face. If our friend the guardsman is who I think he is, that'll be useless. He happens to be a man of a thousand faces. Come, Watson, to the chase. Uh, he seems to have eluded us, Holmes. We've come all the way up the tower stairs to the outside battlement here. He's probably hidden in one of those side rooms we observed on the way up, Watson. Look, Holmes. Now the drawbridge is down. Yes. The guardsman has already arranged for his own retreat, it seems. Well, Holmes, uh, perhaps we'd better leave the castle by any means we can and summon the official police. No, my dear fellow. We have our man close by somewhere, and I hope to meet him. But he's armed with a great axe, Holmes. These swords would be of little use against a Come weapon. Come, Watson, let's go downstairs and examine the side rooms along the tower stairs, one by one. Perhaps we may soon flush our quarry. Really, Holmes, sometimes you can be deuced stubborn. The odds are against us. 
Not that I quail from odds at the fatal battle of my wand against the Jezile Devils. I... <laughs> Holmes. Yes. It's our old friend again, Watson. And this time we come to the end of our chase. But, but, but he's below us now on the, on the tower stairs. Right. Then we're trapped. Trapped up here on the tower battlement. Quiet, Watson. Listen. Holmes. He, he's coming up the tower steps directly toward us. Obviously. But what can we do? Wait. Wait indeed. Wait for the great axe of the executioner. I... Holmes, look. There he is coming out of the shadow up the stairs. Good evening, Holmes. Dr. Watson. We meet again. Eh, Professor Moriarty? Moriarty? Come, Moriarty, we're old antagonists and we may speak freely. I rather suspected that a swindle of this magnitude was worthy only of a man of your talents. You're very observant, my dear Holmes. Thank you, Professor. You're also an infernal nuisance. It caused me no end of trouble, you and the good doctor, in this, my latest enterprise. I presume you know all about it. I do. In that case, I must remove you both from this mortal coil. The black guardsman of Braddock must keep the castle inviolate, eh? <laughs> Two strokes of this axe. One for each of you, and the score is settled. As you settled it with that sailor and with Sir Alistair, eh, hey, Moriarty? I needed my first mate to, uh, <laughs> to tell a ghost story, Holmes. As for Alistair, he was a fool. I found that our mutual enterprise suffered from his stupidity, therefore I removed him, as I must remove you. Holmes, he's raising the axe. Don't be a fool, Moriarty. If you throw that axe, you may decapitate one of us. But in that case, you'll have to close with the other. And we are each armed with a sword. A simple example in mathematics, eh, Holmes? Quite. Your theorem does not frighten me, Holmes. And for you, I reserve the first blow. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! Watson, it's Inspector Lestrade. What the devil? Look out, Holmes! He's throwing the axe! Missed me by a hair, Moriarty. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, where are you? Up here in the tower, Inspector. Watson, stop him. Stop, Moriarty. Good Lord, Holmes. He plunged over the battlement into the sea. Mr. Holmes, you may safely leave the proceedings in my hands. Indeed, Inspector Lestrade. And what further proceedings are there? Oh, a number of things. Details that engage our attention before we can report this case closed. Ah, I see. We. First of all, we shall recover the body shortly, and then I shall take steps. Rubbish, Inspector. Huh? You won't recover the body of this particular criminal. <laughs> Come now, Mr. Holmes. I give you credit for a fertile imagination and, indeed, a certain analytical talent, but we are dealing in the realm of fact here. Pray proceed with your dissertation, my dear Inspector. The man plunged from a high battlement to the sea below. He may have struck directly on these rocks or avoided them. It doesn't matter. He's most certainly dead, Mr. Holmes. Is he, my dear Lestrade? Listen. Listen. Listen to what? I hear nothing. Don't you, Inspector? By Jove, or someone's rowing away from the island. Quite. It's impossible. It can't be. Ah, yes, Inspector, but it is. That was Professor Moriarty. A man of many parts with a special genius for staying alive. Yes, Lestrade, he's done it once more. He's escaped me. But somewhere, someday, we shall meet again. That was a thrilling case, Dr. Watson. And did Holmes and Moriarty meet again? Indeed they did, Mr. Harris. Indeed they did. Holmes often called Moriarty the Napoleon of crime. Ah, yes, I'm afraid the professor was the only man that Sherlock Holmes really respected. Well, I hope we meet the professor again too, Dr. Watson. But now, how about a small hint on next week's story? Next week, Mr. Harris... 
I think I shall relate to you the adventure of the Bruce Partington plan. Well, that sounds very interesting, Dr. Watson. I can assure you it is, Mr. Harris. It's a story of spies, international intrigue, and the stolen plans to a certain nautical machine on which hinged the fate of the British Empire. The makers of Clipper Craft clothes and more than 1,200 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Lockridge. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Ian Martin. This week's story was written by Max Ehrlich, special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Bruce Partington Plan. Speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes, this is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Your Mutual Station will broadcast exclusively the American League playoff game in Boston tomorrow between the Red Sox and the Cleveland Indians. The playoff is on the air at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's tomorrow afternoon at 1.15 Eastern Time for the American League playoff on your Mutual Station. Now, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast present Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's immortal character, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. <laughs> this week's adventure The Case of the Frightened Bookkeeper. I regret using my hunting crop on your hand, sir, but you are rather obstinate. And you are wanted for murder. I shall stop the train and we shall return to London. Where I shall have the pleasure of turning you over to Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. As a gift. Compliments of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, here we are again at the door of Dr. Watson's study, ready to hear another exciting story from the good doctor's memoirs. Ah, good evening, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, evening. Delighted to see you again. Uh, Dr. Watson, which of your spine-tingling adventures with Mr. Holmes do we hear about tonight? Well, it's the case of the frightened bookkeeper, Mr. Harris. It confirmed a murder under fantastic circumstances, and it ended with the strangest doings in a court of law that I have ever witnessed. Well, Doctor, two things always amaze me. Uh, Mr. Holmes' case is the one, and for Uh, another... May I venture to guess that the other source of your amazement has to do with... Clipper craft clothes? It certainly does, Dr. Watson. If you think a really fine suit should cost you a young fortune, why, you'll be glad to know you're wrong. Absolutely wrong. Because you can own a suit that looks like an expensively tailored model without going haywire. Impossible? Well, just slip into a Clipper craft suit. Study the tailoring, examine the fabric. Don't think you can afford it? Well, then glance at the price tag. No, your eyes aren't playing you a trick. The price is only forty or forty-seven fifty. You wonder how it's done? Well, listen. More than twelve hundred of this country's finest independent stores, from Maine to California, have combined their vast purchasing power to keep your budget happy. That's why you'll pay only forty-seven fifty for the handsome Clippercraft worsted suit you'll hardly ever wear out. Try one on at the Clippercraft store in your community. You're bound to agree. Clippercraft values in suit, top coat, and sport coat are flabbergasted. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many, many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, just what was the frightened bookkeeper afraid of? This story, Mr. Harris, begins shortly after nine in the morning on Lombard. The customary swarm of office workers was dashing about, 
But no one was hurrying quite as quickly as our bookkeeper, Mr. Humphrey Littleton. He scurried across the street like a startled rabbit and ran into the overseas bank. He raced across the vast marble floor to the cubicle in a far corner. There, he hastened to hang his coat on a hook and wipe his perspiring brow. Then, he mounted his tall stool and opened the huge letter. Mr. Littleton. Yes, Mr. Mason. I presume you realize that you are late. Yes, Mr. Mason. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. To be precise, Mr. Littleton, you are 18 minutes late. Yes, sir. I believe, Mr. Littleton, this is the first time in 21 years that you have been late. That is correct, Mr. Mason. The bank is shocked. I know, sir. I presume there is some reasonable explanation for this unfortunate parent. Oh, well, there is, sir. It's the bell. What now. bell? If you step to the window with me, sir, then I can explain. The window? Please. Oh, very well. Now, sir, if you look across the way at the crowd in front of the merchant's building... What of it? It's the old bell. The bell on top of the building. It didn't ring this morning, sir. First time in years. And what concern is it of yours? Well, you see, Mr. Mason, I always stop for my breakfast down the street. I always pride myself by listening to the bell, but it didn't ring this morning. And that's why I was late. Well, Mr. Lin... Oh, I say. What on earth are those policemen doing? It appears as though they are carrying something, doesn't it? It's a man. They're carrying someone out of the building on a stretcher. Oh, an accident, no doubt. Oh, say, they're covering his face with a blanket. He must be dead. And isn't that Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard out there? I have never met the gentleman. Of course it is. Oh, he's coming into the bank. Now we shall see what's what and who's been killed. <laughs> Mr. Littleton. Yes, Mr. Mason. May I present Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard? I'm happy to make your acquaintance, Inspector. How do you do? Mr. Littleton, you were late this morning because the bell on the top of the Mercer's building failed to strike the hour of nine. Yes, Mr. Mason. Inspector Lestrade informed me that the bell did not strike because something had fallen into the mechanism. Do you know what it was? I haven't the remotest idea. It was a dead body. Really? It was the body of a Mr. Henry Bennett. Henry? Mr. Bennett was murdered. What? You committed the murder, Mr. Littleton. I? Well, I... You were late because you did not simply stop for breakfast. You also stopped to do away with Henry Bennett. Humphrey Littleton, you're under arrest. No, no, I didn't. You can't arrest me. Oh. You can't. Keep him away, Snatcher, or Inspector. The bank keeps the gun there. Why, that's I, I have the gun. Now, out of my way, or I'll shoot you. You haven't a chance, Littleton. We'll find you. I don't think so, Inspector. I'll take my coat if you don't mind. Don't call to your men. I can still see you very well. If you budge or say a word, I shall kill you. Oh, I never thought he had it in him. Mr. Littleton, the murderer. And now we'll have to search all London for the rascal. Stop that man. Stop him, I say. After him. After him. I'll answer it, Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Oh, good morning, Inspector Lestrade. Mr. Holmes, well, Lestrade, what information do you wish to impart? Aside from the fact that you've found a cadaver in a small, inaccessible area, that you've lost a prisoner, and that you're desperately anxious to discuss the case. Holmes, the inspector's hardly said a word. How do you know what this is all about? He's hardly said a word, my dear Watson, but his appearance is most eloquent. Is it, Mr. Holmes? Indeed. You've ducked on the knees of your trousers and the elbows of your coat, indicating clearly that you've been squirming about in an area that's barely accessible. You've found a corpse, since a considerable number of woolen threads are on your jacket. They are the distinctive colored threads found on the blanket used by the coroner when facing dead bodies in his wagon. Mark, your complexion is livid in your breast. You have therefore been running. Surely not in haste to pay us a social call. Rather, I should say, in pursuit of someone. And the manner in which you're nervously fingering your notebook, Inspector, can only signify that you're impatient to discuss the case. Pray discuss it then. Understand, Mr. Holmes. I'm telling you this because you have been somewhat helpful on previous occasions. A masterpiece of understanding. I'm not asking your assistance. It's just if you should come across anything that should be brought to my attention. Now then, our information fragmentary. Perhaps I may embellish it. We found a corpse lying across the mechanism of the gigantic bell on top of the merchant's building on Lombard Street. Well, who was the dead man? A Mr. Henry Bennett. Bennett. Bennett, yes, I have a card on him. Who is he, Holmes? Oh, a petty thief, tiresome record of criminal trivia, served a few short prison terms, bit of flotsam on the sea of the London underworld. Bennett's skull was split open. We found the weapon. It's a walking stick with a cast iron top. A walking stick? We couldn't fathom where it came from, but a, a girl in the crowd recognized it. She's a secretary at the overseas bank across the way. The bank had presented the walking stick to one of its bookkeepers. 
It's a memento of 20 years' service. And the bookkeeper's name? Humphrey Littleton. Find anything else? Yes. There's a letter on the body. Obviously a blackmail note. Addressed to Humphrey Littleton. Well, how does the note read? Uh, it said, Merchant Building, Tuesday morning, bring usual payment to show you keep mum. It's called in pencil. Wasn't signed for. Any eyewitness? Two of his fellow employees saw Littleton leave the merchant building. You then crossed the street and entered the bank and attempted to arrest Humphrey Littleton, but he had escaped. Am I correct this time? Yes, yes, Mr. Holmes, he vanished. He took a gun from the cashier's drawer, forced his way past him. Evidently, the little bookkeeper was tired of being blackmailed by Bennett, so he did away with him. Yes, but how did the body get into the mechanism of the bell, Inspector Lestrange? Uh, Littleton met his man in the building this morning, struck him on the head, killing him instantly, dragged the body to the roof. He intended to push it off, so we believe Bennett had fallen or committed suicide. Well, that's all very well, but you still haven't explained... I, I, I'm coming to that, Dr. Watson. The killer must have been startled by a noise and believed he was about to be caught, seen by someone on the roof, chimney sweep, perhaps. There's a trap door on the roof that leads to the bell. Littleton must have dropped him there when he became afraid, lest he wouldn't have time to push him off the roof. Anything further you wish to state for some? No, no. No, I must be off. I, I don't suppose you'll have occasion to do so, Mr. Holmes, but if you should come across a clue as to the whereabouts of Littleton, you might tell the yard. The son. I leave the solution of this case entirely in your capable hands. It will rest well there, Mr. Holmes. I've no doubt, Mr. Sarge. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, confound it, Holmes. You're not just going to sit there while Inspector Lestrade steals a march on you. Oh, a bit of it, my dear Watson. I'm merely giving him time to leave. The moment he's sufficiently far away, we're off to the overseas bank. We shall see if we can't locate Mr. Humphrey Littleton, the frightened bookkeeper. Perhaps we may shake salt on the tail of this bird who flown the case. This is the photograph of Mr. Middleton, Mr. Holmes, from our file. Ah, yes, Mr. Mason. And uh, this is the cage where he works, Mr. Mason. Yes, Dr. Watson. I see. Holmes, what are you doing crawling about on the floor? Uh, Mr. Mason, when he made his escape, you say he seized the revolver from the drawer, then his coat hanging on that hook, then left the bank. Exactly. I don't know how on earth he'll ever be found in all of London. Aha. Found something else? This pink pill is rolled under the desk. And this microscopic bit of green paper. Note the geometric design of the paper. Both items are most informative. Pill? Green paper? Uh, that copy of the Evening Star on the desk, Watson, please. Oh, first you find the pill, and then you want to read the newspaper. What are you up to, Holmes? Ah, there we are. It's safe. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Come, Watson. Mr. Mason, we shall have the killer in a jiffy. But, 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 Holmes, it's With no time, time, Watson, no time. Good morning, Mr. Mason. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Good morning. Uh, where are we off, Sir Holmes? Victoria Station, as quickly as a Campbell carrier. And why, may I ask? Because, my dear Watson, it's there that we shall find Mr. Humphrey Littleton, as they must be late. We shall find him with the aid of this pink pill and the geometrically designed speck of green paper. <laughs> The most fortunate Watson, the train Mr. Littleton has chosen for his departure to the continent is still here at the station. Come along, I've set his ticket for us. We'll afford it. Well, but what train? How, how do you know all this? The answer is the pink pill I discovered in his cage at the bank. I recognized it immediately. Its mate is missing. There's a pink pill and a brown pill. Ingredients, a form of butyl alcohol, tyrosine bromide, and caffeine. More commonly known as seasick pills. Well, I see. The pill fell from Littleton's pocket when he lifted his coat from the hook. Pills. By George, he was preparing for a sea voyage. Positively brilliant, my dear Watson. Yes, our bookkeeper was prepared to bolt from the clutches of his blackmailer to abandon his position at the bank. He was preparing for a sea voyage, timid so that he is, by securing pills. Escape, Watson. All right, you are. Thank you, sir. But, um, why did you read the Evening Star? To examine the travel section. Not a single passenger ship sails today for a far-off port. There are simply the regular daily sailings across the channel to France. Of course, I had to fortify this clue with more tangible evidence. The uh, particle of green paper? Easily identifiable. It is a familiar green paper utilized for the printing of railway tickets. As for the neat pattern of it, it was definitely the portion punched out by the ticket seller. The railways maintain an infallible system of tracing those punch marks, Watson. Each punch has a peculiar design of its own. I was quite correct in surmising that Littleton was headed across the channel via Victoria Station. His tickets for the train to Dover, the train we are about to board. Uh, shall we? Uh, this compartment? So the agent then. 
I say, Holmes, do you expect the killer in this compartment? Yes, I realize it's empty now, but he'll arrive most assuredly. All right, step in, Watson. Step in. Well, oh, thank you. Oh, um, by the by, while I was waiting at the gate, I glanced at the newspaper, Holmes. There's an item about this crime. The eminent counselor, Mr. Francis Ridgway, upon being informed of it, has volunteered to defend Mitterson without a fee. Really? No, I... This is an extremely dangerous method of dealing with a killer. I told him for an evening, and he isn't aboard. You must have made an error in your deduction. Impossible. We're moving. Yes, and someone's out there trying to jump on. Open the door, Watson. Oh, right, Watson. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I thought I'd never make it. Uh, are you gentlemen going to Dover? Yes. And you? To Dover. To the Channel Steamer. Well, since we've a journey of two hours together, perhaps we should introduce ourselves. This is Dr. John Watson. How do you know? My name is Sherlock Holmes. What is your name, sir? What is your name, sir? Fox, Fox. George Watson. I beg your pardon. Your name is Humphrey Littleton, and you're wanted in London for committing murder. <laughs> Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes was brazenly inviting disaster in challenging the arm killer, wasn't he? Ah, he certainly was, Mr. Hannis. But at this point, I have an invitation for you concerning a much more pleasant topic. Won't you tell us more about Clippercraft clothes? Well, I accept the invitation gladly, Doctor. One of these days, you're going to walk into the Clippercraft store in your community and walk out wearing a happy smile and a handsome suit by Clippercraft. You'll pay only forty or forty-seven fifty, depending on your choice. But you'll deserve all the admiration your friends will voice, because yours will be an investment in one of America's greatest clothing values. Yes, Clippercraft is just about the finest clothing value America can offer you. You see, more than twelve hundred fine stores from coast to coast have concentrated their enormous buying power to really put the brakes on your high cost of living. Why, it's clear as daylight that a project of Clippercraft's scope keeps Clippercraft's great tailoring plants operating at full speed the full year round. You get the savings this money-saving plan makes possible. Yes, Clippercraft suits are phenomenal values at only 40 and 47.50. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and sport jackets. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. <laughs> Now, shall we return to the frightened bookkeeper, Mr. Harris? Well, we can't return to that train fast enough for me, Dr. Watson. Well, you remember that Holmes and I were in the compartment of the Dover train, face to face with Humphrey Littleton, the murderer. Holmes had just identified him. What, what makes you think that I'm Littleton? Suppose you answer one question, sir. Would you leave this train and return to London in our custody? Or do you choose to be stubborn? I'll not return to London. I'll take that revolver, Mr. Littleton. You'll not take me back. I repeat. Your revolver. No. You're behaving like an idiot. London's most brilliant criminal attorney, Mr. Francis Ridgway, has announced he will defend you greatest. He has never lost a case. You've an excellent chance. No. No, I won't. I won't. Oh, don't be silly, man. You've no possible avenue of escape. Scotland Yard has surely telegraphed the French surety. I'm waiting, Mr. Littleton. Turn over your revolver. No. Once I surrender to you, I'm finished. I'd rather kill both of you. Once you're out of the way, I can jump off the train. Then what? Dashing from village to village? How long can you hide out on the downs like a stricken animal? You shan't persuade me. My mind is made up. I'll take my chances. Very well. If you insist upon... He's missed. He's gone, Watson. I I haven't heard. I regret the necessity of using my hunting crop on your hand, Mr. Littleton, but you are rather obstinate. I shall stop the train and we shall return to London. Then I shall have the pleasure of turning you over to Inspector Lestrade. As a gift... With the compliments of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Why, 
Sherlock Holmes, the morning newspapers say that Littleton is safely locked in prison. I must say you handled that case with astonishing speed. I've, I've hardly even had time to catch my breath, and it's over. It's not over, Watson. What do you mean, it isn't over? I'd say from the moment the murder was committed, events moved with a relentless logic. I hardly employ the word logic, my dear Watson. That's what disturbs me. So hurry, finish your breakfast. We're off to the merchant's building. But why, Holmes? To visit Mr. Francis Ridgway, counsel for Littleton's defense. Why? To ascertain how he plans to defend the bookkeeper. Well, it should be a simple, speedy trial, shouldn't it? Perhaps. <laughs> I'm delighted that you've got him here to my office, Mr. Holmes, and Dr. Watson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ridgway. It is an incredibly exquisite office. Those draperies, magnificent rugs, most striking. Don't you agree, Holmes? Yes, yes, quite. May I ask, Mr. Ridgway, what sort of defense you plan for Humphrey Littleton? Well, there isn't a scrap of evidence on his behalf, Mr. Holmes, and he admits he was being blackmailed by the dead man. You see, uh, Littleton once needed money desperately for his wife, who was ill. He took some from the bank and juggled his books to cover up. Bennett knew about it, but Littleton denies committing the murder. Says he was never on the roof of the merchant's building. Says his walking stick was stolen from his flat. No one will believe him, I'm afraid. I don't suppose you've learned anything that would help me, have you? No, I have not. To make matters worse, he bought that ticket to France. He claimed he wanted to chuck his position and run away just to avoid the blackmailer. The jury will interpret it as a plan for escaping after committing murder. Oh, I shall paint as stirring a picture as I can of the miserable creature. Hounded by a petty thief, he, he became fed up, that's about all. I shall fight every inch of the way, but confidentially, this may be the first case I've ever lost. It's two in the morning, Holmes. Where the dickens have you been? I couldn't wait for you to return from the hospital, Watson. My mission was urgent. Yes, but where were you? I've been searching for evidence that might interest Mr. Ridgway. Oh, and did you go on this urgent mission carrying that pair of shoes under your arm? I did not start out on the mission that way, no. Really, you do perform the most extraordinary antics. Why the Little pair of... trial begins tomorrow. You mean you've got something that might acquit the bookkeeper? The grim fascination of a trial for homicide, Watson, is that the results are most unpredictable. <laughs> Here you are, Holmes. Two seats. There's Littleton in the dock. See him and Francis Ridgway in the far corner? Quiet, Watson. The park of your size is about to read the indictment of the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, the prisoner at the bar, Humphrey Littleton, is indicted, and the charge against him is murder. Upon this indictment, he has been arraigned. Upon his arraignment, he has pleaded that he is not guilty and has put himself upon his country, which country you are. It is for you to inquire whether he be guilty or not, and to hearken to the evidence. The Crown charges that on the morning of July 19th, Henry Bennett was ruthlessly attacked and died instantaneously when he was struck upon the skull by... Mr. Francis Ridgway! Good heavens! Silence! Sit down, Holmes! What the... Silence in the court! Mr. Holmes, what is the reason for this disturbance? May it please your lordship, gentlemen of the jury... Henry Bennett was not murdered by Humphrey Littleton, the prisoner in the dock, but by Mr. Francis Ridgway, counsel for the defense. May it please your lordship, I do not know why Mr. Holmes has chosen to interject this fantastic One assertion. One moment, I... Mr. Ridgway. Mr. Holmes. My lord. You have, on many previous occasions, made a substantial contribution to the enforcement of law and order. The court will entertain a statement. I protest, your lordship. Go on, Mr. Holmes, tell them. Tell them I didn't do it. I didn't do it. God help me, I didn't do it. I had. The court will entertain a statement by Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Ridgway, it originally struck me as curious that a counsel possessing your perfect record should volunteer for a case so obviously doomed to speak. Could it have been that you wanted to have the case because you wanted to lose it? Idle speculation. I visited your office to develop my theory. Dr. Watson admired your draperies, but I noticed a black spot on your rug. It's a star. Although you may have vigorously cleaned the remainder of your office, you neglected to remove that one speck. Well, go on, Holmes, go on. Where did the tar come from, to this way? 
Well, the murder was committed on an extremely hot day. On the roof of the merchant's building, the tar melted. It came off on your shoes. After killing Bennett on the roof, you returned to your office soiling your rug. Preposterous. Conjecture on your part, sir. Last night, I was on the roof of the merchant's building. I made plaster cast of the killer's footprints. I then paid a midnight visit to your deserted office, Mr. Ridgway. I found a pair of your shoes in a closet. The cast, which I'm prepared to submit as evidence, match your footprints perfectly. Inconclusive evidence. Utterly inconclusive. In addition, in addition, I took a sample of the tar from that same roof and compared it with a sample from the tar on your rug. I have here a report based on experimentation at home to the effect that both samples match perfectly in chemical content. Proof. I demand proof, sir, that I actually committed the murder. And you shall have it. There is a young gentleman waiting outside at my request. His name is Bob Dexter. What is most important about this young gentleman, however, is not his name. It is his occupation. Mr. Dexter is a chimney sweep. My friend, Inspector Lestrade, ceases to correct. There was a noise that startled the killer. It was a chimney sweep. Mr. Holmes, do you request that the witness be summoned now? In a moment, my lord. I made inquiry. I found this young gentleman at his home in Stephanie. I persuaded him that accepting your bride to keep silent, Mr. Ridgway, was a disgraceful crime. He is prepared to testify that he overheard your angry conversation with Bennett upon the roof. Mr. Holmes, what was the subject of the conversation? My lord. The conversation revealed that while Bennett was in prison, he secured information from his fellow prisoners. From your victims, Mr. Ridgway, your dupes who served while your clients were struck free. Once released, Bennett patiently gathered cancelled checks, notes, photographs, overwhelming evidence about your career. Your brilliant career was founded upon a tissue of lies, bribery, forgery, coercion. You invited Bennett to the building to purchase his selection. But you killed him with Littleton's walking stick. Would you stolen to be sure the evidence pointed to the helpless bookkeeper? Now, shall we call Mr. Dexter? We saw you do away with Bennett? <laughs> May it please your lordship, I should like to make a request. Proceed, Mr. Ridgway. I move that the indictment against Mr. Humphrey Littleton be stricken from the record. And a new indictment be drawn up by the grand jury charging the murder of Henry Bennett. Mr. Francis Ridgway. <laughs> By Jove, Holmes, now that you're relaxed in your chair with your pipe, you must take the time to tell me precisely what did happen on the morning of the murder. I, I confess I'm still a bit puzzled. It's painfully obvious, Watson. Bennett was blackmailing both the bookkeeper and Mr. Ridgway. Ridgway knew it, Littleton didn't. Ridgway sent a message to the bookkeeper, enticing him to the merchant's building that morning. He'd previously stolen the walking stick. I see. But before the bookkeeper was due to arrive, Ridgway killed Bennett with Littleton's walking stick. Then Littleton came along, innocently enough, expecting merely to make his regular, insignificant payment to Bennett. He saw a crowd, became frightened, and dashed off to work at the bank. Well, I'm still amazed at how you arrived at the proper solution. Confounded, Holmes, how do you do these things? Elementary, my dear boss. Elementary. Well, Dr. Watson, the case of the frightened bookkeeper was really very surprising. I'm sure you've an equally sharpening adventure planned for next week. Yes, Mr. Harris, I have. It's called The Adventure of the Guy Fox Society. A secret cult whose membership consisted entirely of fanatics devoted to one of the most horrible purposes imaginable. Of course, nothing on earth could keep Holmes from joining the society. Well, Dr. Watson, we shall be standing impatiently at the door of your study next week for The Adventure of the Guy Fox Society. <laughs> Makers of Clipper Craft clothes and more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Luckman. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Ian Martin. This week's story was written by Howard Merrill with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your
your Clippercraft dealer. Write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. <laughs> Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Guy Fox Society. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. With your dial set at 710, you're all set for Behind the Front Page with Gabriel Heater, which follows in just a moment. Airlines now ready for departure. It's Eastern Airlines for double dependability. Eastern planes are the world's finest. It's pilots tried and proven through years of service. Fly Eastern, the dependable airline. This is WOR, New York. Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created for Arthur Conan Doyle. The dramatizations are by Edith Miser. And now, once again, we turn into the familiar gate. The wind whistles cold and sharp through empty branches. A brilliant October moon peers intermittently from behind scudding clouds. Hello, what's that in the good doctor's window? Pumpkin lantern. Dr. Watson is celebrating Halloween early this year. Come in, Mr. Harris, come in. Why the delay on the doorstep? Why, I was just admiring your Halloween decorations, Dr. Watson. <laughs> a work of art, eh? Presented to me this afternoon by my youngest godchild. It's supposed to warp goblins and witches and other nefarious familiars who are abroad this time of year. <laughs> you mean who are supposed to be abroad, Doctor? <laughs> Not necessarily, Mr. Harris. Not necessarily. Oh, here, take this chair by the fire. Thank you. Did I ever tell you of the time Holmes and I had a rather terrifying encounter with the notorious Laughing Limer at Tower Heath? Why, you know you didn't, Doctor. Who was she? A witch who had been buried centuries before on wild and brooding countryside known as Dartmoor. This adventure took place on All Saints' Eve, the particular witch's Sabbath, which you Americans refer to as Halloween. And... Uh, <laughs> there I go off the deep end as usual. Suppose I pause to pour us each a glass of fresh cider, hmm? While you pay homage to our sponsor. What could be fair, Dr. Watson? To tell you that Uppercraft suits sell for only thirty-five and forty dollars, with a few special models at forty-three seventy-five. To say that Clippercraft top coats and overcoats sell for only thirty-five to forty dollars, and sport jackets for only twenty-four dollars, is only half the story. Because you really only begin to appreciate that these prices are astonishingly low when you've seen Clippercraft clothes. Custom details in the form of correct styling, perfect fit, luxurious tailoring, and rich, long wearing fabrics are yours in Clippercraft. Manufacturing ingenuity and a really great distribution idea make all this possible. Available to you in your own local independent store, where friendly attention is traditionally yours. For through the Clipper Crack Plan, 924 leading stores across America have concentrated their buying power, resulting in tremendous things in manufacturing and distribution costs. You'll be amazed at Clipper Craft's values. Compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to return to the Witch on the Moors. Oh, right. Uh... It was uh, one morning several years after my marriage, uh, a brilliant fall day. The last day of October, to be exact. Mary and I had just finished our matutinal Finn and Harry when a violent jangle at the front door bell heralded a telegram from my erstwhile partner in crime, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. As nearly as I can remember, it ran, uh, if convenient, meet me Paddington Station, 1015. If inconvenient, come anyway. Bring service revolver. Don't suppose you have any silver bullets? Silver bullets? 
What was the meaning of that inquiry, Doctor? <laughs> As a matter of fact, that was my first question after Holmes had settled himself in the corner of our railway carriage. <laughs> Holmes, I got from your telegram that we're about to embark on another investigation. A dangerous one, judging from the fact that you wish me to bring my revolver. But why the facetious inquiry as to the silver bullets? Because it's a common superstition among the natives of the Moors of Devonshire that the evil spirits who are bound there can only be killed by a silver bullet. Who's interested in native superstitions? We are, Watson. We've been urgently summoned by Sir Lionel Fenwick of Fenwick Hall. The long dead ancestress of his is supposed to be on the prowl. It seems she's not only playing all sorts of outrageous pranks, but actually threatening the safety of his infant son, born only two weeks ago. In other words, what? We're not on the trail of a common criminal. This is a witch hunt. <laughs> Pressing, eh, Watson, the first glimpse of the moor? Yes. We shall be there shortly. Uh, notice that ancient Roman tower... She's buried at the crossroads at the foot of that hill. It's from that building that she derives her name. Who derives what name? The Laughing Lemur of Hightower Hill. A lemur is the Roman word for ghost or spirit of the dead. But she was a witch besides. That's why she was buried at the crossroads. She would have been burned, of course, and her ashes scattered to the four winds, except that she was a great lady and married to the head of the House of Fenwick, whose given name was Hugo. Hugo was an old boy in his 60s when he married her. Much to the annoyance of his brother Edgar, he's a lusty, fun-loving young French noblewoman, a Louise de Lombal, whose mother was the notorious Madame de Montespan. Madame de Montespan? Well, wasn't she a, a sort of minor borgia? Yes, Watson. At any rate, Louise seemed young, gay, and exceptionally healthy and active. Too athletic, perhaps, for her ancient bridegroom, because she insisted he accompany her when she rode to hounds. Well, in due course of time, he was found, his neck broken, on the far side of a particularly high wall, which his wife, shrieking with laughter, jumped a few moments before. Even after Hugo's death, Louise rode day and danced by night, and day or night she continued to laugh. Death bad taste, if you ask me. Quite. At first, her brother-in-law, Edgar, seems to have been fairly tolerant of the situation, since he now believed himself lord of the manor. But one day, three weeks after her husband's death, Louise came to him and informed him that she was going to have a child. The dead Hugo is there. She relayed the information with gales of laughter. Uh, poor Edgar. The joke was certainly on him. Oh, no. He started rumors about his brother's widow. The French perfume she used were love potions. She and twelve companions she brought with her from France formed a coven. A coven? In the old days when witchcraft was in flower, Watson, witches and their familiars banded together in unholy groups of thirteen, which were called covens. Oh. Lastly... Edgar claimed that no mortal had fathered the child, that it was the offspring of the devil himself. In proof of intention, he pointed out cloven hoof prints under Louise's window. In short, the unfortunate lady was tried as a witch, and uh, English justice being, shall we say, uh, slightly biased in those days, she was sentenced to be hanged by the neck until dead. Dashed unfair, if you ask me. After which she was buried at the crossroads beneath the Roman tower, with a stake through her heart and a great stone over the grave to make sure she didn't return from it. Oh, a lot of primitive nonsense. I wonder. At any rate, during the last fortnight, some person or persons seem to have moved that stone. And some rather curious, not to say frightening, phenomena have occurred. Yet the present house of the head of the house, Nick, seems to feel the safety of his firstborn is threatened, and that this danger should reach its peak tonight, which is All Hallows' Eve. Yes, here we are. This is our station. And that uh, gentleman waiting over there beside the wagonette with a pair of handsome cobs is undoubtedly Sir Lionel, present master of Fenwick Hall. <laughs> Keep the rug tucked over your knees, gentlemen. It's a longish drive to the hall, and the wind across the moors has turned uncommon cold. Oh. I'll admit, Mr. Holmes, I was greatly relieved when I received your telegram saying I could expect you. Oh? Have there been any further disturbances since you posted your letter to me? There have, Mr. Holmes. The church bell has tolled at odd hours, last night and the night before. Furthermore, a young goat was discovered, dragged to the foot of the witch's grave, its throat all torn and bleeding. Of course, it could have been killed by a wolf or some ferocious dog, but... Unpleasant occurrences, Sir Lionel, but as you say, not necessarily supernatural. That's what I keep telling my wife and that stupid old nurse of hers. But I must say, when old Willie was found to be missing this morning, I really began to worry. Old Willie? He's the gatekeeper, Mr. Holmes. 
lives in the little stone lodge beside the entrance to our property. He's tended that gate for over 50 years, never leaves it night or day, uh, except to come up to the hall for the Christmas party and my birthday. Well, maybe the monotony finally got the best of him, eh, Holmes, and uh, he decided to... He couldn't wander very far, Dr. Watson. Old Willie is a cripple. He managed to hobble a few feet with the aid of his crutch. But, but uh, that's the curious part of the story. Willie was missing, but his crutch was there where he left it every night, propped up against the foot of his bed. By Joe. Was there anything else missing? Any clothing, overcoat, shoes, money, provisions of any sort? No, Mr. Holmes. Wherever Willie went, he went in his nightshirt. Not even his carpet slippers are gone. Nothing was missing? Nothing at all? As a matter of fact, one object has disappeared with him. The old broom with which Willie swept the leaves away from the gates. Old Nanny, my wife's nurse, set up a typical Irish wailing when she heard about it. Insisted old Willie had ridden off on it to join the witch's Sabbath tonight. She always hated him because he makes her get out of the cart and open the gates herself when she goes marketing for my... Typical household feud, eh, Holmes? I tried to reason with the ignorant old fool, but she kept moaning and groaning that she's always known Willie had the evil eye. She's managed to frighten my poor wife nearly to hysterics. Oh, my wife is Irish too, Mr. Holmes. Her name is Bridget, in fact. I must say they place more credence in these old wives' tales than we do here. Nanny says it's the curse of the House of Fenwick being visited upon us. The curse of the House of Fenwick? Yes, it, it, it seems a certain Lady Fenwick, born Louise de Lombard. Oh, yes, Holmes has already told me about her. Hanged as a witch and buried at the foot of the Roman Tower. Well, well, it seems that when they had to place the noose around her neck, uh, she turned to my, uh, well, great-great-something-or-other grandfather, who had the bad judgment to be standing nearby. She turned to him and laughed. But my dear brother Edgar, a silken rope, que c'est charmant. <laughs> you think this is the end of Louise de Lamballe, but you are so very mistaken. You do not believe to have my first child, and so I say, I will not let your first child live. No, not the first child of any of the great house of Phoenix. Louise shall come back from the grave. She shall come back and take them all. <laughs> Has she managed to live up to her threats, Sir Lionel? Certainly not all of the oldest children of our house have met an untimely death, but uh, a rather high percentage have been stillborn. Uh, several have succumbed shortly after birth. The wind is rising. We're approaching High Tower Tor, Dr. Watson. The wind is always stronger here. How ghastly the Roman ruins look in the moonlight. When we reach the next bend in the road, we shall be opposite the witch's grave. I see. The curious strip of mist flying across the road. Easy, easy, baby. Easy, blue boy. What, what place has got in the horses? Something seems to open them. Great Scott, what's that? There's something white over there in the bracken. Rain in the horses, Sir Lionel. Right. I think our investigation may be in here. Right. Come along, Watson. Help someone. I'm a giant. I see that white thing. It's moving. It's crawling along the ground. Yes, the man. He's badly hurt. What's he doing all in white? It's a nightshirt, Watson. I know. It's old Willie, but he, his face is all black. So are his hands. Willie, what's that stuff you've got in your skin? It's the salve, the flying salve she give me so I could fly here to High Tower Heath. We flew, <laughs> me and me broomstick, we flew all the way. Good Lord, he's out of his head. He's delirious. Yes, he's in a bad way. Take his pulse, Watson. Here you are, Willie. Take a swig out of my flask. Thank you, sir. I'm frozen cold. I've been cold ever since I put on the salve. She said it's because we was flying so high. Who was she? What was her name? Uh, the witch, of course. What did she look like? Uh, that I couldn't rightly say. She was wearing a veil over her face and standing in the moonlight at the foot of me bed. I'd been asleep when she called to me. Wake up. Wake up, Willie Malloy. You? Who be? <laughs> Someone who can make you dance. Someone who can make you fly. You've always wanted to dance, haven't you, Willie? We're giving a dance tonight. 
around my grave. Here, take this jar of ointment. Cover yourself well with it, Willie. Cover your old broomstick. It will make you fly. I'd like that. Free like a bird. I'd like to fly. Then rub on the ointment. I'll wait for you outside. We'll fly to the tower and dance together around my grave. <laughs> I did like she told me, sir. I covered myself and me broom. And first thing I knew, I got lighter and lighter. Up and up I went, up in the clouds. And the next I knew, I was here on the heath, watching them dance, the little people. They were dancing around in a circle. But it made me dizzy to watch them. So I crept under a bush and went to sleep. This morning, I woke up cold and sick. The magic was gone. I couldn't fly, and I couldn't walk. Poor old boy. Hello? His pulse, it stopped. The home is good, Bandy. Willie, Willie, don't give up now. I'm afraid he has watched. Yes, he's dead all right. Dead of narcotic poisoning and one of the most desperate tricks I've ever encountered. Mr. Holmes, what do you mean? I shall be able to answer that question more accurately, Sir Lionel, after I've had a chance to analyze the ointment that's smeared on this broomstick outside the body. What? Bring it along, Watson. Careful you don't smear it on your clothes. The moon's rising above the hill. How white the crossroads look. Yes, this is where the witch is buried. I say, look here, all around. The heather is trampled down in a large ring. Great Scott, there was a dance here last night. And look at these footprints in this damp spot. Small footprints. All small. No wonder Willie said he saw the little people. Here we are, gentlemen. This is Fenwick Hall. Is that you, Lionel? Rachel, my dear, I've brought Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Thank heaven for that. It's time we had someone with intelligence to bring order into this hysterical household. Gentlemen, this is Rachel Conway, my cousin. How do you do? How do you she do? used to keep house for me before my marriage, and she very kindly consented to return while my wife, Bridget, was having her baby. And a good thing I came back. Bridget hasn't stepped a foot out of her bed since the child was born. She won't even try. Maybe she might, if you'd go away where you belong. That will do, Nanny. <laughs> What's that horrible stench? They've both moved into the nursery with the baby, Nanny and Bridget. She's had her bed brought downstairs, Lionel. They've been burning powders and drawing magic circles around the crib all afternoon. It's a wonder the baby isn't suffocated. Sure, and something's got to be done to protect the little one's soul from the ghouls and ghosties. His father won't give him a proper Christian christening. No, he must wait till the bishop gets back from Scotland. So it's up to his old nanny to put on the witches. You seem to be an expert on witchcraft, today. Sure I am that. Me part of Ireland's alive with them. No doubt. But at the moment, I'm more interested in finding out what this stuff is on the handle of this broomstick and discovering which one of the women in this household has been visiting the witch's grave. How can you tell that, Mr. Holmes? Tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I will search the room of every woman in this house. Whatever for, Mr. Holmes? It was a woman who lured Willie to the crossroads last night. No one can wander over the heath without collecting evidence of it on his or her clothing. Mud on the shoes, bracken on the coat or cloak. By the way, Sir Lionel, do you suppose I could speak to your wife a moment before she goes to sleep? That she cannot. She's asleep already. Really? I'd have thought she'd be concerned over her son's safety to doze off. Tonight of all nights. They gave her a sleeping potion. They put it into her tea. I see. You said the nursery was down here on this floor, I believe. That's right, Dr. Watson. But surely if the child is in danger, it would be best to move him off the ground floor. What he's in danger from can come through locked doors. He'll be in danger till he's christened. That's when the witches try to snatch him. It's the soul they're after, not the body. Nanny, one more word of that nonsense and I'll ship you back to Ireland. Now, get back to your mistress where you belong. Sure, if it's back to Ireland, I'm going. She goes with me and don't you forget it. 
<laughs> Nanny's a fool, Lionel. You should have heard long ago. But poor Bridget was so homesick. I, I didn't have the heart to take her nurse from her. Good heavens, what am I thinking of? Cook has laid out supper for you gentlemen on a table in front of the fire in the library. I'll uh, fetch some hot coffee. Uh, thank you, but we've no time to waste on food. I say, Holmes, I'm starved. Very well, Watson, suppose you make us some sandwiches while I set up our chemical equipment. Uh, if you could arrange it, Sir Lionel, I should like to have the use of a room not too far from the nursery. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. You may take over the gun room. It's directly opposite. Good. And if you smell any further curious odors, don't be alarmed. I imagine we may be able to give nannies, powders and potions a run for their money. Watson, let's see what we've discovered in this confounded salve. Hog's fat, water, hemlock, aconite, blood. Probably from a rat or bat. I can't determine that without a more powerful microscope. Sink foil, deadly nitrate, and soot. Fine collection of poisonous ingredients, eh, Holmes? The interesting thing, Watson, is that they're all well-known ancient poisons. The aconite and deadly nightshade, or belladonna, being particularly potent. My belladonna's a violent delirium. No poor wonder poor old Willie thought he was flying. Yes, Watson, the salve that was used to anoint Willie and his broomstick was undoubtedly a medieval witch's formula for flying. Ointment. You don't really believe in things like that, Holmes? No, Watson, I don't think Willie actually flew from here to the Roman Tower. But he was undoubtedly under the impression that he'd done so. He was probably transporting a cart or carriage. But why should anyone want to poison Willie, take him across the moors and leave him to die? I don't think the intent was to harm him as much as it was to frighten him. Unfortunately, whoever took him to the witch's grave was frightened off when they found they weren't alone. When they found they weren't alone? Exactly. The little people were more than they'd bargained for. Oh, Holmes, really, there are times Quiet, when you... Watson, someone opened the door upstairs. Turn out the lamp. I tried. I didn't hear anything. Yes. Someone's coming along the upper hallway. I think my remark about searching the rooms tomorrow might lead to something. If any of the women in this household have anything to hide, you may depend on it, they'll try to get rid of it tonight. Someone's coming down the stairs. Yes, judging by her step, it's a woman. She's been for the library. Stay here, Watson. Keep your eye on the nursery door. I'm going to follow her. I wouldn't throw those papers in the fireplace, Miss Conway. <laughs> Mr. Holmes. If you'll allow me to take one look at them. I'd rather die. Very well. Suppose I tell you what those envelopes contain. Some early photographs of Sir Lionel and letters from him. But they're not love letters. You must believe me, they're not. I do believe it, Miss Rachel. You were and still are in love with him. The affection has never been returned. Is that right? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But Lionel doesn't know how I feel. He doesn't know I've kept his letters. Please, please don't tell him. It would, it would kill me if he found out. I've kept many secrets in my room, Miss Rachel. I believe there's room for one more. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I, I don't know how to thank you. Don't try. And for goodness sake, go out to the kitchen and make yourself a cup of tea. Make some for Watson, too. I will, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I will. Holmes! Holmes, come quickly. The old nurse slipped out of the nursery. She's gone upstairs. Calm yourself, Watson. We'll catch her on the way back. Yes, I wonder what she'll bring with her. Strange. Her old hat is creak at night. Quiet, Watson. Yes, she's coming back. She's reached the head of the stairs. Now she's stopped two steps down. So that's her little game, is it? Very interesting. Very... Yes, here she comes down the rest of the way. Strike a match, Watson. Now then, Nanny, what's that you've got in your hands? A ball of twine and a pair of shoes. And why not? My lady's shoes, it is. Forgot to shine them. So you did. Muddy, aren't they? Let me see them. You go to the devil. Well, I'll be... Yes, Watson, as I suspected, Lady Fenwick wasn't as bedridden as she wanted people to believe. Sometime during the last 24 hours, she's been out on the moors. That red clay on her boots is rather prevalent at the foot of High Tower Hill. You mean she's been pretending to be the ghost? Holmes, it's midnight. The witching hour. Ah! Help! Help the baby! Save the baby! Nanny! Bridget, I'm coming! No, no! For the love of heaven! Stay up there! Come downstairs, Sir Lionel, if you value your name. Richard, Mr. Holmes, what's happening down there? Light the lamp, Watson. That's better. Now, Sir Lionel, if you'll investigate the second step from the top. Huh? Good Lord. 
A piece of twine stretched across the stairs. Yes, a trip rope. You were supposed to fall downstairs and break your neck. Oh, no, no, Lionel. She didn't mean any harm. Nanny only wanted to frighten you so you'd let the priest christen the baby. You mean that's the reason she gave you, Lady Fenwick? Bridget, what in heaven's name has been going on here? Oh, darling, I was so frightened when Nanny told me about the curse and the witch's stone being moved. I didn't want anything to happen to the baby. I didn't know Willie would die. I only thought she wanted to get... Even with him, I didn't mean any harm. I didn't mean any harm. <laughs> wow, I'll say that was a spine chiller, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Appropriate for Halloween, don't you think? But look now, why did old Nick want to call oh, Mr. Harris... <laughs> Before I explain all that, suppose we show our gratitude to the people who make this program possible. A very sound idea, Dr. Watson. It's quite a shock when you're face-to-face with Clippercraft clothes. I mean, an extremely pleasant shock. For even experts are amazed at Clippercraft values. Without the sacrifice of quality, you can buy really fine Clippercraft clothes for far less than ordinary clothes cost elsewhere. In a pleasant atmosphere at your own local independent store where you get friendly personal attention. Clip has delivered the goods in more ways than one. Through the famous Clippercraft plan, 924 leading stores from coast to coast have concentrated their buying power. The result exceptionally fine quality at exceptionally low prices. Remember, Clippercraft suits are only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only $3 to $40, and sport jackets only $24. Selling beautifully tailored expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan. Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, New York, New Jersey, and the B&B Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. <laughs> Now, Dr. Watson, I was about to ask you, why did old Nanny want to stir up so much trouble? Oh, she hated the Moors, Mr. Harris. She hated Willie and she hated Sir Lionel. She was a thoroughly warped personality. Holmes suspected her immediately, of course, when he smelled the hocus-pocus powder she'd been burning in the nursery. He knew she must have made the flying ointment that was responsible for Willie's death. Well, now, Doctor, what about the gravestone? Ringing church bells and the little people. (laughs) Who <laughs> is it plays Halloween pranks, Mr. Harris? You mean children? Right. Holmes realized that when he saw the size of the footprints on Hightower Heath. Well, I'm blessed. I hope so, I'm sure. Now, let me see. Uh, next week, I'll tell you how Holmes and I investigate case of a little governess whose employer agreed to pay her extra wages because she was willing to cut off her hair and wear a bright blue dress. Sounds like rather curious requests, Dr. Watson. Why was she asked to do those things? That question led Holmes and myself to visit a decidedly sinister country place called the Copper Beaches. We found a most unexpected answer in the act. of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Copper Beaches. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. (laughs) 
This is Cy speaking for Clifford Clothes. This is a mutual broadcasting system. makers of Clipper Craft clothes for men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Once again, we find ourselves in front of Dr. Watson's crackling fire. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Harris, just a moment, until I put on a, a fresh fan knot so our listeners can really hear it. Ah, that's the ticket. Now, go ahead, Mr. Harris. Outside, a cold white autumn mist shrouds the black tree skeletons. But inside, we sit warm and cozy and ready for another of Dr. Watson's fabulous Sherlock Holmes adventures. What's it to be tonight, sir? Your conversation of white shrouds and skeletons brings to mind one of the most bizarre problems we ever undertook to solve. It came dash close to being our final problem, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Sounds promising, Doctor. Nothing I like better than hearing about Holmes in a tight spot. And whenever our adversary proved to be the notorious Professor Moriarty, it was generally a very tight spot. Professor Moriarty? Wasn't he the man Holmes referred to as the Napoleon of crime? The same. Actually, this case began when Sir George Westbrook discovered a corpse dressed in a Roman senator's toga, tunic, and sandals. Holmes always maintained he could deduce a man's entire history from his wardrobe. But uh, this time... Uh, <clears throat> Doctor... Speaking of judging people by their clothes, I thought I... Bless my soul, yes, of course. I almost forgot. Let's have a few words from our sponsor, who is also an authority on the subject of gentlemen's apparel. Uh, May I say, Dr. Watson, that most people, like Mr. Holmes, do judge people by their appearance. That's mighty important in connection with Clippercraft clothes. Because you'd never guess Clippercraft costs so little. Such low prices for such truly fine quality are rare, to say the least. Clippercraft suits are yours for only 35 and $40, with a few special numbers at forty-three seventy-five. dollars Top coats and overcoats are only 30 to $40, and sport jackets, $24. These are planned values, the result of the Clipper Craft plan concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across the country, resulting in tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Remember, all this is yours in your own local independent store, where friendly attention is traditionally yours. Want to convince yourself? It's as easy as a visit to your Clippercraft dealers. Just compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to get back to the gentleman in the Roman toga. All right, Mr. Harris, but it all began on a freezing winter morning. My first view of Baker Street presented a dispiriting glimpse of icy sleet falling between the dun-colored houses. I donned my carpet slippers, my oldest trousers, and a well-worn bathrobe with the firm intent of enjoying a placid breakfast and settling myself in front of the fire for the rest of the day. I no sooner opened our sitting room door, however, when I caught sight of Holmes tramping about wearing to himself and tossing a shiny golden coin into the air. Confounded if I could only lay hands on the villain. Uh, Morning, Holmes. What seems to be the difficulty today? Hmm? Difficulty? Moriarty is back in business. Only this morning, Mrs. Hudson received this coin. Here, have a look at it. Hmm, a handsome gold sovereign. Flooding the town with them. Great Scott, don't tell me Professor Moriarty, the greatest criminal in Europe, has turned philanthropist. No such luck. That coin, Watson, is counterfeit. A brilliant job, more's the pity. Only an expert can spot it. 
No wonder Moriarty has been so quiet these last two months. It takes time to develop a coin as perfect as this. Well, at least he hasn't had time for murder, arson, or any more of his serious crimes. Serious? You think flooding the country with counterfeit coins isn't serious, Watson? Do you realize what this will do to the value of the pound? Oh, by Jove, of course. I... Uh, Holmes, that's our doorbell. Tell Mrs. Hudson I'm not at home. But Holmes... I'm not accepting any tough any hateny cases. Not while Moriarty is threatening the credit of the Empire with his fraudulent gold pieces. Well, well, come in, come in. Uh, I, uh... Which of you gentlemen is Sherlock Holmes? Well, my friend over there has the honor. Whatever it is, I'm busy. Oh, but this is terribly, terribly important, so I... I don't know what to do. He, he's dead, you see. Dead men do not interest me. Uh, couldn't you uh, inform his relatives? Well, that's just it. I don't know who they are. I, I, I don't even know who he is. I, I don't even know when he died. Albert, he's my assistant, says it must have been over a thousand years ago, but that seems quite impossible. There's not the slightest sign of decomposition. Oh? On the other hand, and until Albert and I broke through this morning, no one had been in that room for centuries. Uh, what room? Uh, the Roman baths. I, I discovered them, you know. The Brits are undoubtedly ancient Roman. Even the cadaver was clad in a senator's toga. And, and genuine, I assure you. We found him there in one corner. Now, let's get this straight. You found a fresh corpse dressed in a Roman toga in some Roman ruins that have been buried for centuries. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Watson, what are you waiting for? Bring the gentleman a chair. But uh, you said you were busy. Don't be irrelevant. This sounds interesting. Oh, uh, very well. But uh, won't you uh, sit here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm afraid I forgot to introduce myself. Here, here. Here's my card. Read it for me, Watson. Sir George Westbrook, President L and W A Association. That means London and Wessex Archaeological Association. Of course, of course. I remember hearing the Corporation of London had engaged you to investigate some ancient Roman remains which you discovered in the Billingsgate section. That's right, Mr. Holmes. They're under the basement of the Coal Exchange in Lower Thames Street. Albert and I have been burrowing the way down there for over a month. This morning we broke through the final bit of brickwork and emerged into a large subterranean chamber. All right, Albert. I think the opening's big enough. Yeah, give me the lantern. I'll go through first. Yes, sir. Why, Sir George, your hand is shaking. <laughs> is it any wonder? <laughs> I'm excited, Albert. Unless I'm very much mistaken, we've unearthed some baths that were built by the early Romans. <laughs> yes, well, come along. Careful. Don't, don't tear your clothing. I say, sir. It is a biggish room, isn't it? Splendid, Albert. Splendid. Look at that ceiling, will you? In almost perfect condition. Hello, what's that in the corner over there? Hmm? Looks like a heap of white cloth. No. No, the... There's a, a leg sticking out of it. Good Lord, it's a body. We'd best have a look at it, sir. Yes, but be careful. Don't don't touch it. Don't touch anything. What's that white thing he's got on? Why, it's a toga, Albert. A Roman toga. Topping wet, sir. If you ask me, he's been drowned. <laughs> Did you say drown, Sir George? That's right, Mr. Holmes. No, but that's impossible. There hasn't been any water in those baths for over a thousand years. Interesting. Very interesting. Tell me, Sir George, mm. what was the condition of the air in that chamber when you broke in? Stale? Vitiated? No, Mr. Holmes. It, uh, it was quite fresh. That's curious now that I think of it. Because there was no other entrance to the room except the one we'd come through. The doorway to the rest of the baths was filled by a, a great heap of bricks and rubble. You were unable to identify the corpse. As a matter of fact, we uh, didn't do any further investigating. Albert was quite overcome by the sight of the body. <laughs> I'm afraid he's never been very strong about such things since the time that mummy disintegrated in his arms while we were working on those pre-Hellenic excavations in Crete. Hmm. I sent him home and came straight here to consult you. You mean you left no one behind to guard the body? No, Mr. Holmes. What? Where's my hat? Where's my coat? Watson, don't just stand there. There's no time to lose. I suppose I should have informed the authorities, Mr. Holmes, that the thought of all those stupid Scotland Yard inspectors trampling around in my beautiful ruins like a herd of elephants. 
I left a couple of dark lanterns burning. Oh, yes, here they are, in this packing case. All right, now, follow me, gentlemen. Why do basements have to be so damp and depressing? Careful there, careful. This is, this is where we started to dig. It's a rather rough tunnel slanting downward. You'll have to bend over, I'm afraid. You're sure that this earth won't cave in on us? No, I don't think so, unless, of course, someone should give it a tremendous push of some sort. Ah, it is where we broke through the wall. Well, you'll be interested in this, Mr. Holmes. Notice the masonry. Yes. Yes, the bricks are undoubtedly Roman. Let's see, they measure nine and a half inches long by four and a half inches broad and only one and three quarter inches thick. Not unlike those of the Roman bars at Rochester. Except that there, the tiles are a mere one and a half inches thick and measure 16 inches by 12. Oh, really, Holmes, did we come here to discuss bricks or inspect a body? Never neglect an opportunity to increase your store of knowledge, Watson. Oh, and stuff my brain with a lot of useless tittle-tattle, not me. Here's the hole we made in the wall, Mr. Holmes. It's not very large, I'm afraid. Well... I'll go through first and light the way. Now, gentlemen, if you'll follow me... I'll go next and you can bring up the rear, Watson, with the other lantern. Now then, Watson, alley up. Don't be in such a rush. Here, take the lantern. It's a tight squeeze, you know. I... Hello, I think I'm stuck. If you'll pull his other arm, Sir George. Right. Oh, <laughs> Phew, glad to get out of that. I told you you should go on a diet, Watson. Oh, just because you're satisfied to look like a walking skeleton, you were... Hello, this is a gloomy-looking spot. More like a tomb than the sort of place one thinks of as an elegant Roman bathing establishment. Yes, it certainly is more like a tomb at present, complete with the remains of the deceased. Although how he was able to insinuate himself into this chamber... Yes, I... quite. A superficial survey of the walls and ceilings certainly shows no signs of any recent entry, except by way of the hole through which we just dragged Watson. Interesting, very interesting. Yes, suppose we view the body we came to investigate. Yes, he's over here, Mr. Holmes, against the south wall. Oh, w watch your step. The flooring here is a bit uneven. Here he is, exactly as we found him, lying on his face with one arm stretched over his head. He's a uh, skinny old boy, wasn't he? I say, these robes, or whatever it is he's wearing, they are sopping wet. Yes, the poor fellow was undoubtedly drowned. Lungs still full of water. Extremities icy, rigor well advanced. He, well, he's been dead six to eight hours, I should say. Holmes, how about it? Not necessarily. The floor he's lying on is extremely cold, also the air. Of course, the really fantastic part of the whole picture is the man's raiment. The tunic and the toga with the wide purple stripe. Even the thong sandals are the authentic garments of an early Roman senator. So I see, so I see. Whoever this person was, he was thoroughly at home among Roman customs and manners. That ring of office on his outstretched hand is undoubtedly authentic. Oh, look here, Holmes. You, you don't actually believe this is a, a genuine Roman senator who got himself drowned in this room and managed somehow to stay in this state of preservation? No, Watson. There are several obvious flaws to that theory. In the first place, although the costume is authentic in line, cut, and drape, the wooden fabric of this toga was woven not on an ancient hand loom, but by a modern machine. Second, the liquid in which the gentleman was drowned would have evaporated in a short time, even in very stale air. And third, this room is neither the frigidarium, which was the cold plunge, nor the caldarium, which was the warm. No, judging by the recessed benches built into the walls, this room was the suratorium, or what the Romans called the vapor bath. But of course, Mr. Holmes. Why didn't I think of that? But, good Lord, then... Then how was he drowned? And why? Uh, suppose we turn the victim over, Sir George. His identity may give us the answer to those questions. Right, oh. Easy. By Jove, he, he looks really even more Roman from this side. That nose, those hawk-like features, like some rapacious old Caesar on a Roman coin. Rather accurate and appropriate description, my dear Watson. Yes, this, unless I'm very much mistaken, is Brutus Octavius Bainbridge, the world's greatest numismatologist. You mean the coin expert? But of course... I thought the old fellow looked familiar. Well, I've heard he often wore Roman dress when he was lounging about at home. Oh, so that part of our mystery is a perfectly normal explanation. Don't be too disappointed, Sir George. There are several other little questions to be cleared up, the answers to which may be rather more exciting than you anticipate. Well, what do you mean, Holmes? Well, for one thing, Mr. Bainbridge disappeared very suddenly from his home one night a little over two months ago. About a fortnight later, the British Isles began to be flooded by an extraordinarily clever counterfeit sovereign. Bad joke. I pointed out to Scotland Yard that there might possibly be a connection between the two events. You mean Mr. Bainbridge's 
who was a, a counterfeiter? I mean, as the greatest living authority on coins and coinage, he was undoubtedly kidnapped by a band of unusually daring counterfeiters and forced to assist them in their work. I thought you might possibly come to that conclusion, Mr. Holmes. What? Great Scott, that voice. Where does it come from? Over a hidden speaking tube of some sort, I imagine. But who is it? Unless I'm very much mistaken, that voice belongs to my arch adversary. Greetings, Professor Moriarty. So now you've taken up counterfeiting. Have I destroyed so many of your activities that you're running short of funds? I've warned you repeatedly, Holmes, that you were getting to be a nuisance. Surely you must have realized how dangerous that can be. But, my dear Professor, surely you must realize that danger is the breath of life to me. <laughs> this time, Holmes, you've overreached yourself. On the contrary, Moriarty, it's you who have gone too far. <clears throat> What's me? Get Sir George out of here. I'll keep talking to give you a chance to escape. Was it necessary to kill Bainbridge after you'd finished picking his brains? Not necessary, my dear old, but expedient. We drowned him. I wonder if Dr. Watson can guess why. Well, dash it, I can. Why not shot or strangle? I say, what's all this about, Holmes? Get out of here, you idiot. But I leave you in danger, I should say not. You see, Dr. Watson... Drowning would serve two purposes. It would eliminate Mr. Bainbridge, and it would provide a taste for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. What do you mean? I knew he'd never turn down an invitation involving a corpse in a toga, ostensibly drowned in an ancient Roman bath. What's he? If you have no regard to your own safety, at least have the intelligence to get Sir George out of here. I'm dashed if I understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. You will, Sir George, you will. Sorry to have to execute you too, but I'm afraid you signed your own death warrant when you sent for Mr. Sherlock Holmes instead of Scotland Yard. <laughs> I rather thought you would, you know. Ah, well... This is what comes of associating with anyone who is foolish enough to think he can outwit Professor Moriarty. Look here, you old blunderbuss. You needn't think you can bully back Sherlock Holmes or me either. No. Great Scott, what's that? I rather imagine one of the good professor's hirelings has blown up the entrance to Sir George's tunnel. What? You, you mean we're, we're buried alive in this sepulchre? Mm -hmm. Just like Aida and her young man. Isn't it romantic? <laughs> you might try singing yourself to death as they did. Such a waste of time, I always thought. What a pity Mr. Bainbridge won't be able to join you. You'd have made such a jolly quartet. <laughs> well, that's tall, eh, Holmes? Looks as though we're entombed in this blasted place until Sir George's assistant turns up tomorrow morning and finds the tunnel caved in. Tomorrow, my dear Watson, is Sunday, and the day after a bank holiday. Better blow out one of the lanterns and save it for later. But this is terrible, Mr. Holmes. Why, we'll, we'll be asphyxiated by the time Eldred arrives on Tuesday. I doubt it, Sir George. There's a very definite movement of air. Fresh air. Icy fresh air. If you'll wet a finger and hold it up, you'll notice what amounts to a slight breeze. No, I doubt that we shall die from any lack of oxygen. We may very well perish, however, from cold and exposure. It doesn't take long to freeze to death in this temperature. Oh, you needn't be so confounded cheerful about it, Holmes. Don't interrupt, Watson. As I was saying, we may very well expire unless we can discover how Mr. Bainbridge's body was brought into this room. What good will that do? Any passageway large enough to permit the entrance of this corpse will also serve as an exit for Sir George and myself. You, Watson, may have a bit of trouble. Oh, you go to blazes. But, Mr. Holmes... What passageway could there be? As you know, the architecture of the ancient Roman baths was fairly identical. There was obviously only one doorway into this bath, and that's blocked by a great fall of earth and bricks. Quite. But aren't you forgetting, Sir George, the small, unseen, tube-like passage that invariably ran under all the rooms except the coal plunge? Of course. The hypocost. Oh, what in thunder is a hypocost? A smallish tunnel lined with red paving squares, which ran from a furnace outside the buildings under all the principal rooms of a Roman bath. If we can discover some loose tiling in this floor, 
we may thank the ancient Romans for inventing what our poor, retarded civilization considers a modern improvement, namely central heating. Discouraging. I've dug up two dozen spots. Cheer up, Watson. At least the activities kept you from freezing to death. Yes, it's ruined my trousers. Good thing I was wearing my old suit. I say, the light's getting dimmer. Holmes, the second lantern is about burnt out. Keep digging, Watson. It's our only chance. I say, Mr. Holmes, uh, could you come over here a minute? I think I've found a sort of grating under this last batch of bricks. Good Lord, let's see. Yes. Yes, we found it. Watson, help me with these bricks. All right. There. Watson, bring the lantern. Right here. Here they are. Now then, let's see. There's a black down there, isn't it? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sir George. We are now in the vapor room. The blocked up entrance over there leads to the hot bath. That would put the cold plunge on our left. No good going in that direction. When we go down into the tunnel, we should turn right to get out. Quite correct, Mr. Holmes. I'll go first. Give me the lantern, Watson. It's flickering, Holmes. It's it's gone out. Very well, then. We'll have to crawl our way out in the dark. I've been crawling like a snake for hours. Stop complaining, Watson. At least we're not sealed up in that boat. Well, maybe not, but I can't say this is any great improvement. Oh, I don't ask to stand upright. If I could only get to my hands and knees for a moment. There's a shallow pool of water here. How oh, jolly. I could use a bath, only I'd just as soon not have ice water, you know. Save your breath. How are you getting along, Sir George? I'll, I'll manage. Oh, what? Now what? Something ran over my hand. Probably a sewer rat. Delightful. Maybe we could take it home for a pet. Quiet, Watson. I think we've reached the end of the tunnel. Yes. It opens out. You mean I can finally get up off my stomach? Yes, give me your hand. Oh. I think my back is permanently bent. Hello? There are some steps here. Steps going up. And the door at the top. It's open a slit. Yeah. There's a light. Well, there must be another entrance at ground level. Yes. Follow me and be very quiet. Better have your revolver handy, Watson. This may well be the most dangerous part of the entire adventure. Easy now. Let's have a look through the crack before we open the door. It's a large, bare-looking place. What's all that machinery? Those are melting furnaces, presses, weighing apparatus, rolling machines... And on the far side of the acid and water baths in which Bainbridge was undoubtedly drowned. In short, you see before you a very complete mint for the coining of counterfeit money. Mr. Holmes, who's that sinister-looking man stepping out of the shadows? There, there, look. He's adjusting a jeweler's magnifying glass in one eye. Now he's... he's hunched over a pile of golden coins. Good Lord. His head oscillates from side to side like a snake. Enjoying the fruits of your labor, Moriarty? You! Holmes! You didn't expect us to return your call quite so promptly, eh, Professor? Don't bother to reach for that acid. Watson has you covered. Better put your hands up. That's right. Now, you'll come around that table. Slowly. That's right. I have a little present for you. A pair of bracelets that... Oh, Holmes, he's going through the window! Shoot, Watson, shoot, confound it! I can't! Why not? Well, blast it all, you rushed me out of the house in such a dither this morning, I forgot to slip my revolver into my overcoat pocket. <laughs> Don't look so crestfallen, Watson. I'm rather relieved we didn't get the handcuffs on the professor. Once he's safely behind bars, I'll have no opponent worthy of my talents. I should probably die of sheer boredom. You mean sheer conceit? <laughs> That was quite a story, Dr. Watson. There's always plenty of action when Professor Moriarty's around. How true, Mr. Harris, how true. This particular adventure had a rather pleasant epilogue. What was that, Doctor? Oh, well, suppose I tell you about it after we pay our respects to the gentlemen who so graciously make this program possible. What hmm? could be fairer? 
You know, the thing you remember about Clippercraft clothes is not their low prices. Not until you're ready to buy again, that is. What you really live with is Clippercraft's superb styling, the perfect fit, fine tailoring, and long wearing fabrics. No one would dream your Clippercraft suit had cost only $35 or $40, or $43.75 for a few special numbers. Or that your top coat or overcoat had cost only $30 to $40, or your sport jacket $24. No, these exceptional values are made possible by the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across America, bringing these fine clothes to you in a pleasant atmosphere where you get friendly personal attention. Selling beautifully tailored expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Presby, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. And now, Dr. Watson, about the epilogue to the adventure of the corpse in the Roman toga. The officers of the Royal Mint tended Holmes and myself a dinner in recognition of our invaluable services in breaking up a counterfeiting outfit which had threatened the value of British currency. Holmes received a large illuminated scroll and a, a sizable check. Always acceptable, eh, Dr. Watson? <laughs> yes, quite so. I was presented with a priceless Roman ring of office, which we had found on the dead man's finger, and a magnificent copy of Vitruvius de Architectura. On the flyleaf in Holmes' handwriting was the inscription, One never knows what bit of useless tittle-tattle may save a man's life. The chapter on the hypercost was underlined. Got you that time. And now, Dr. Watson, I wonder if you'd like to give us a hint about next week's story. Well, next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I found a man shot under a smashed street light. All the evidence pointed in one direction. But the victim had been shot at point-blank range, and there was only one wound. But we heard two shots. Oh, Holmes always referred to it as the case of the well-staged murder. <laughs> of Clippercraft clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Hunger and starvation are the enemies of civilization and democracy. It's up to every American, man, woman, and child, to save a little food every day. In that way, the people of Western Europe can be helped in their fight for decency and freedom. listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the well-staged murder. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast to New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. This is a mutual broadcasting system. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Willie Inch, did you say? Just a second. Do you want to talk to a fellow named Willie Inch, which I doubt? No. He says he's got to see you, got to. Who is he? I'll ask. Uh, Mr. Wolf doesn't recognize your name, Mr. Inch. He wants to know who you are. Uh, Just a second, I'll tell him. Mr. Inch says he's a sneak thief. He says you never heard of him, but he's heard of you. Should I tell him to get lost? Wait a minute, Archie. Ask him what he wants. Uh, Inch, Mr. Wolf wants to know what you want to see him about. A phony murder rap. This is a phony murder rap. It'd have to be, wouldn't it, Archie? How do you mean? Phony, I mean. Did you ever hear of a sneak thief committing murder if it could possibly be avoided? Yes, Archie. Tell Mr. Inch. I'll listen to his story. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Mr. Wolf and I talk about this little difficulty. He calls it the case of Archie Goodwin and how he got hooked. However, I call it the case of the disappearing diamonds. I prefer my title. He prefers his. Anyhow, it started with an improbable character named Willie Inch. That'll be our sneak thief, Archie. Let him in. Okay, boss. Okay. Inch? Yeah. Come in. In there. I'll follow you. Mr. Wolf, this is your client. Mr. Inch? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Tall fellow. Must be over six feet six. Sit down. Uh, where? Archie? Here, Mr. Inch. This ought to be comfortable. Where, well, Mr. Inch? Uh, uh, look, Mr. Wolf. They're going to claim that I killed a woman I never even touched. And I'm going to fry for something I never even done. All right, Mr. Inch. How did you kill her? I didn't. I didn't. I never killed nobody in my life. Mr. Inch, you say you're a thief. Can you prove it? Uh, I got a record. Why? I was wondering about that bulge in your pocket. Oh. Oh, here? It's a, it's a silver cigarette lighter, ain't it? I guess it sort of dropped into my pocket as I was going by. Y- you see you see the way it happened? Never mind, Miss Dange. Now tell me how you didn't kill the woman for whose murder you will fry. Well, well, Mr. Wolf, sir, it, it was like this. There was a window half open, you see, and I happened to crawl inside the house. But hey, now. Well, Miss Dange? This, uh... This is just between us, ain't it? Possibly. How do you mean? Explain, Archie. Mr. Wolf said possibly. Oh. Well, uh, okay. So I happen to find myself in the bedroom, see? So I happen to sort of roam around, and I hear there's like a party going on. You know, people and music. So I lock the door. So go on. Let him tell it his own way, Archie. Well, Miss Lynch? Uh, so that's the mistake I make. The mistake? Uh, maybe I, I leave my fingerprints on the door. So? So, so later, a dame gets herself knocked off in the same room. And they look for fingerprints. And they find mine. I'm it. That's all. I, I got a record. So, so the chair. I see. Pitiful case, isn't it, Archie? Very, very mournful. Inch. Uh, yes, sir. I presume you came away with some souvenirs? Oh, nothing. It wasn't worth the trouble. You know, just odds and ends. Junk. Have you got the junk with you? Yeah. Let me see. Uh, here. Hmm. Cigarette case, platinum. Lighter, gold. Vanity case, gold. That's that's all? Mm, Positively. Junk, the man says. I promise nothing, Mr. Inch, but it might be better if you told the truth. Me? You. Oh, well. Mm. One square cut emerald ring. I I just happened to find it. (laughs) There's something more. A pewter ashtray. Look, the room is dark. I can't see. Piles of coats under beds and hats and handbags. I take what I find. Why didn't you turn on the lights? One of these big standing lamps. You know what I mean. Go on. I bump into it. And it scares the living... I mean, it scares me. So? I I turn the switch. It don't work. Archie. That sounds like the law, boss. The law. Stay right where you are, Willie. 
May I suggest that there is a way to find out, Archie? Okay, okay. We don't want any. Good morning, Goodwin. You remember me, your old friend, Inspector Kramer? Two gentlemen with me are also with the department, Pearly and Ostrakovich. May we come in? What do you want? We want a murderer, and we want some rocks worth 250 grand. Does that answer your question? What makes you think you'll find all those goodies here? Come in, man. We know Willie Inch is here. Where is he? Now, just a second. We're coming with you, Goodwin. Okay, Inspector, come along. Uh, the law. That's Willie Inch. Frisk him. Uh, no weapons? Okay, just put the cuffs on him. Inspector Kramer. Oh, yes. Hello, Wolf. I want to tell you something about this man whom you and your men have so bravely captured in my office. You don't need to tell me about him, Wolf. We know about him. Do you indeed? Yes. We know he killed Mrs. Florence Avery March and stripped a quarter of a million worth of diamonds off her. That's all we need to know. I didn't do no such a thing. Where's the ice, Willie? I never even seen none, honest. Take him away, boys. I'll make the charge when I get back to my office. Wait. Uh, Mr. Wolf, sir. Take him. Look, I ain't done nothing, I tell you. Inspector Kramer. Yeah. We're going to have a little talk now, aren't we? If necessary. How do you mean? Explain, Archie. Uh, Mr. Wolf means you're going to have a little talk. If necessary. Very funny. I will now draw up a chair and show you why it's necessary. In the first place, $250,000 worth of diamonds makes it necessary. Archie, if you please, a bottle of beer. Okay. Will the inspector name his poison? You know I never drink on duty. Then just for me, Archie, please. On my way. While I opened a bottle of imported beer, it occurred to me that I had something to be grateful for. At least I wasn't in Willie Inch's enormous shoes. And as I went back to the office, I had time to wonder why Mr. Wolf would stick his fat neck out for a no good like Willie. Thank you, Archie, and sit down, Archie. Inspector Kramer has a theory that may amuse you. Near our Wolf's office. It's for you, Inspector. Hello, Kramer. Yeah? A gold cigarette holder? That's all? Okay. Inspector, do you realize that you have already taken a great deal of my time? Archie. Yes, Inspector? The great Mr. Wolf just said I had a theory that might amuse you. Would you care to hear it? I can hardly wait. Okay. My theory is that both Wolf and you are receivers of stolen property and possibly guilty of murder conspiracy. So far, you got me in stitches. <laughs> Willie Inch, with a record as long as your arm, robs the home of Mrs. Florence Avery Marsh. He strangles her with a silk scarf, takes the diamond she's wearing, grabs everything else that's lying around, and then what? Is it a question? I'll tell you what. He will, too. <laughs> Archie, listen, listen. Then Inch brings the stuff here, the stuff that's piled on Wolf's desk and the diamonds. You want me to tell you where the diamonds are? They're in that safe right there. Inspector Kramer, I know nothing about the diamonds. They are not in the safe and they're not in the house. Now, you can take my word for it, or you can get a search warrant and make a fool of yourself. I'm going to have lunch. <laughs> By two o'clock, the newspapers were full of the murder of Mrs. Florence Avery March. The suspect was already in custody, caught at the home of Nero Wolf, well-known private investigator. Some of the stolen jewelry had been recovered, but not the diamonds. Then we had a visit from Mr. Anson Stark, who had opened Mrs. March's door and found her dead. Stark was a big athletic guy of about 30 or so, with the large, capable hands of a surgeon or a laboratory worker. He seemed annoyed at the inconvenience we caused him, but that was only natural. That's the story, Mr. Wolf. I don't see how I can add anything more to it. Uh, you had known Mrs. March for several years, huh? Mm, casually. When you broke the door open, uh, was it difficult? Not very. You were the first into the room? There were three or four of us. We pushed in together. You saw the body of Mrs. March immediately? She was lying across the bed that was heaped with coats and hats and handbags. You knew she was dead? Of course not. In fact, somebody else discovered that she had been choked to death. And who discovered that the diamonds were gone? I don't know. I didn't. Uh, were there many diamonds, Mr. Stark? No, just a few, but big ones. She wore them on a pendant around her neck. 
Mr. Stark, I want to thank you again for having been so patient. I have been patient, Mr. Wolfe. I have my own business to attend to. Which is? Oh, I have a small but hopeful enterprise. Electronics, tubes for radio and television. Mostly experimental. Well, that reminds me, Mr. Stark. When you entered the bedroom, was the light on or off? Uh, let me see. Of course, it was on. It must have been on. Why? Just curiosity, Mr. Stark. Oh, Anything more? That's all, except thank you for coming here. Archie, will you take Mr. Stark to the door? Mr. Stark departed like a man who'd been delayed by a petty annoyance. A few minutes later, the door buzzed. And I went, expecting anything. Anything but what was standing on the threshold when I opened up. A honey blonde. Or, to put it another way, a blonde honey. I said hello. No, more like hello. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, I'm his assistant, Archie Goodwin, and what can we do for you? Well, I'm Valerie Ladd. And I'm Archie Goodwin. Where did I tell you that? Well, that's exactly where I came in. Well, I mean, where I thought you were going to ask me to come in. Oh, come in, come in. I'm sorry. Well, is he, is he here? Wolf? Mm-hmm. Uh, does he know you? No. Is he expecting you? No. I see. Of course you don't see, do you? Well, uh, this is it, Mr. Goodwin. I'm a writer. Well, I may not look like it, but that's what I am. And I want to do a, a profile, a character study of Mr. Wolf for a magazine. Oh. Well, what's wrong? Well, you see, there's a writer named Rex Stout. Oh, I know. He's written a lot about Nero Wolf, but well, can't I write about him, too? I don't know if he's going to like it, but you can't be shot for trying. Come on. Mr. Wolf, this is Valerie Ladd. Pardon me for not rising, Miss Ladd. It is not impolite. It is merely impracticable. Miss Ladd wants to write about you for a magazine. Please, Mr. Wolf. Nonsense. Mr. Wolf, if I could just spend a few hours with you, that would be enough. Would it indeed? Oh, yes. Have you written much, Miss Ladd? Oh, reams. You know, uh, the habits of writers interest me. The habits? Yeah, the writing habits. For instance, do you use a pen or a pencil? Do you dictate, or like most writers, do you do your own typing? Mr. Wolf, if you knew the hours and days and, and years that I've pounded a typewriter. Of course. Archie. Yes, sir. Why don't you take Miss Ladd up and show her the orchids? You never know about Nero, Wolf. At least I never do. This was something I would have bet against a thousand to one. I couldn't understand it. But I certainly couldn't complain. Archie, look at this one. Oh, did you ever see anything so gorgeous? Very pretty. Ah, they're all just beyond belief. Yeah? But you're not even looking at them, Archie. What? Oh! <laughs> Archie, are you always like this? What do you mean, like this? Well, so... So distant and preoccupied. Honey, you got me wrong. Completely. I was thinking... Oh. Yeah, about telephone numbers. Well, it's a lovely thing to think about. What can you think about telephone numbers? I was thinking how some girls have them and some don't. Oh, I see. Archie, I apologize. For what? I did have you wrong. You're not a bit distant. I can be a lot closer than this, honey. What is it? What's what? The number. Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's in the book. Yeah. I wonder. Hmm. Sound as if you don't believe me. Oh, I believe you, but uh, here's a telephone book here. Let's lick it up together, shall we? Uh, Archie. Yeah. I, I'm afraid I lied to you. I was afraid of that, too. Are you angry? Well, I can take no for an answer, honey. Even when it's hard to take. Archie, I've changed my mind. I want you to have my number. And I want you to use it, too. You know, honey, I'm beginning to take an interest in this dialogue. Let's have it. Okay. Olympia 9, 3659. And a very, very pretty number it is. Valerie Ladd. Two Ds? Mm-hmm. Olympia 9, 3659. Honey Blonde. Gorgeous. Oh. Spelled <gasps> gorgeous. There. Uh, what are we doing tonight, Olympia 9? And I said that you were distant and preoccupied. Uh, we were talking about tonight. Hmm. 
All right, Archie. Yes, I'd love it. Oh, these orchids, they're really beyond belief. And you won't even look at them. True, I'm too busy looking at you. Well, how do I look, Archie? Beyond belief, honey, (laughs) beyond belief. Well, there goes the good one luck again. It's a house phone part. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. He wants us to come down. Archie. Yes, dear. Even if he says no, we uh, we still have a date. Honey, though the heavens fall. When we entered the office, Mr. Wolf was frowning over a sheet of letter paper in his hand. He looked up and tossed the paper to me. That is a peculiar thing, Archie. The sheet of letter paper just arrived. Since Miss Ladd is interested in detection, show it to her. Thank you. Well, well, some sort of code, isn't it? Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P. That's all. What do you suppose it means? You're kidding. Archie. Oh. What? Did I say something wrong? No, 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 no. Miss Laird, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I haven't time for an interview just now. Goodbye, Miss Laird. Oh, but Mr. Wolf. Goodbye, Archie. Say goodbye to Mr. Wolf and let's go. Goodbye. That's the way things can be around here. Well, here's the door, and shall we, uh, shall we pause for station identification? Hmm. I'll wipe it off, Archie. There. Thanks. Well, what happened, Archie? Yes, indeed. Yeah, oh, Mr. Wolf, I mean. Oh. Why did he suddenly want me to go? Well, I'll tell you, though. I don't know whether I should. That, that code message he showed you? Yes. Quirk you up. You remember. Yeah, sure. Because I use a typewriter. From left to right, it's the first bank of letters on any typewriter. Oh, I see. It was a test. Yeah. And you flunked it, baby. You're no writer. Archie, I I, I can explain Sure, it. sure, sure. Tonight. <sighs> Tonight, Archie. You do believe me, don't you, Archie? Oh, of course, baby, of course. Well, it's just that I was there at the party, I mean, when, when poor Florence was murdered... Then I read in the paper about, well, how they caught the man at Nero Wolf's. And I always wanted to be a writer, so I thought if I could get an exclusive interview and... Well, that would be a good way to start my career, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, it would. Uh, pardon me a second, will you, Valerie? I gotta make a phone call. There's a booth that'll only take a minute or two. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm at the Riviera with Valerie Ladd. I'm happy for you, Archie. I will remind you that I have not seen you since Valerie left the house. I was otherwise occupied, Archie. With orchids. With orchids? What do you want, Archie? Look, with that typewriter gag, you practically told me she was a phony, didn't you? Of course, of course. Just for the record, how did you know? Have you looked at her fingernails? She never touched a typewriter in her life. I wanted to be sure. Okay, now... Now, do you want me to tell you something? You mean that your charming companion, Valerie, was at the party when Mrs. March was murdered? How did you know that? Simple, Archie. I got a list of the guests from Inspector Kramer. Among them was the name of Valerie Ladway. Simple? Ladway. Lad. Yeah, sure. Okay, what am I supposed to do about it? Just hang on, Archie. Just hang on. I went back to the honey blonde, the beautiful, phony Valerie Ladd, Ladway. I mean, I went back to the table where she should have been, but she wasn't there. I sat down and waited. Looked at my watch, 11.24. 11.32, no Miss Ladway. 11.45, I finally realized that not only Valerie, but her coat and bag were also absent. I called the waiter. Yes, sir? Uh, What happened to my friend? The young lady left some time ago, sir. Okay, give me the bill. She paid it, sir. She did? Yes, sir. In fact, she said you gave her the money for it. Yeah? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Well, I didn't know it, but she is certainly right. Gee, this is most thoughtless of you. Sorry, I uh, I lost my keys. My money, too. Your keys, Archie? Yeah. Glad you were still up. You lost Miss Ladway, too? Definitely. I'm going to bed. Good night, Archie. You think it's funny, don't you? <laughs> yes, Archie. Yes, yes, I do. Good night, Mr. Wolf. Archie. Yeah? Before you retire, one thing. What? Open the safe, will you? And leave it open. Why? Because there's nothing in it of importance. And it's a valuable safe and I don't want it damaged. Good night, Archie. At about two o'clock in the morning, I thought I heard a noise. I got up, put on the rest of my pajamas, picked up my gun and went down to the office. The man had his head in the safe and everything was scattered all over. He stepped inside the door. Put your hands behind your back and stand up. Huh? Okay. Now, just what are you after, bud? Uh... When I woke up, I was alone on the office floor. I did not feel good. The place looked as if a hurricane had struck it. Every file drawer had been empty. I felt a draft from somewhere. Got to my feet, trying not to joggle my head too much. It was the front door standing open. I closed it gently. Then very, very gently, I groped my way to the kitchen for ice, water, and towels. Archie! What? Oh, didn't you hear me scream? No. Is it bad? It's better. You're angry, aren't you? Nuts. What, Archie? I said nuts, Mr. Wolf. Nuts. I'm sorry about what happened. Yeah, you expected it. But I didn't expect you to be caught by somebody behind you. You must have known there would have been two of them. Now, how would I know that? How? Think of Miss Ladway's delicate hands. Do you believe she intended to open the safe herself? You think she stole my keys and so on? Well, let me tell you... Hey, wait. That guy was digging in the safe that... Then who hit me in the head? (laughs) Ah, gee, someday you'll be the death of me. In the morning, will you tell Inspector Kramer I'd like to see him here? Fuming and protesting, Kramer arrived about 1.30. When I let him into the office, Mr. Wolf was gazing thoughtfully at the ground floor plan of the house of the late Mrs. Florence Avery March. We'd gotten it from the original architects. Wolf looked up and almost smiled. Thank you for coming to me, Inspector. You know how difficult it is for me to come to you. Okay, okay, what's up? I take it you haven't found the diamonds. No, not yet. We'll break inch down, though. Don't think we won't. Oh, I'm sure. But this is what I want to ask you, and it's quite serious. Okay, okay, all right, what? After the body was found, your men arrived at the house before anyone left. Right. And before anybody was allowed to go, every person was searched thoroughly. Nobody could have gotten a pin or a needle out of that place. I know something about police methods, and I believe you. Now, how thoroughly did you search the house itself? Wolf, look. We've got that floor plan you're studying now. There are no hidden closets. Every square inch of that house has been examined. The diamonds aren't there. Willie Inch killed the dame and snatched the diamonds. What he did with them, we'll find out. Possibly, possibly. Goodbye, Inspector. At approximately 3.15, the postman arrived with an envelope for me. The envelope contained my keys, the bill from the Riviera, and the money left after the check was paid. At approximately 5.07 p.m., I discovered that Wolf had been using the telephone all by himself. He explained. He was going to have a party. He had invited all of the guests who were at Mrs. Florence Avery March's somewhat fatal party including Anson Stark, Willie Inch, and Valerie. Near old Wolf, the natural-born ham, he made an entrance that would have been worthy of Queen Victoria in her heavier days. He sat in his oversized throne behind his oversized desk and beamed at the peasants. Valerie moved toward me. I'm 
I'm sorry, Archie, but you must know why I did it. Why? But you said I wasn't a writer. I wanted to prove that you weren't a detective. Did you take the stuff while we were dancing? I could have, couldn't I? You could have bumped me on the head last night, too, couldn't you? Oh, Archie. Let it go. It was humiliating, though. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you realize the purpose of this party. We want to know who killed Mrs. March and what became of her diamond. Mr. Inch. Uh, yeah? When you visited the room where the body was found, the room was dark? Uh, the bulb was burned out. I tried to turn it on. If there had been a body on the bed, would you have seen it? Maybe. With all those coats, maybe not. Sir, so, Mr. Stark? Yes, I said the light was on. Perhaps I was wrong. What of it? You're engaged in the manufacture of tubes for radio and television, huh? I told you that. Inspector Kramer. Yeah, why? A light bulb was found in the wastebasket in the room where Mrs. March died. Yeah. Like you said, we tried the bulb in the socket and it worked. So what? One more question. Does anybody remember whether Mr. Stark was carrying a bundle or a package under his arm when he arrived at Mrs. March's party? Oh, I do, Mr. Wolf. I think he had a box of flowers. That's true. I did bring flowers. No, Mr. Stark. That box contained two parts of a light bulb and some adhesive. During the party, you strangled Mrs. March, put the diamonds into the light bulb, assembled the thing, and screwed it into the lamp socket. Archie, stop him! <laughs> really, Archie, it was quite simple. Light bulbs are only a stem glass bowl and a brass sheet. Yet nobody, including the police, would think of looking inside one. Mr. Stark could come back and collect his treasure any time after the excitement had died down. What's the matter, Archie? I got a headache. Valerie Ladd. Led me. Poor girl. She and whoever the man was with her must have thought the diamonds were here. That bump on your head will be better in the morning. A bottle of beer, please, Archie. I'm going to bed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Why must you place such confidence in women? Remember what happened to Mark Antony and Samson and Archie Goodwin. <laughs> Good night, Archie. I've been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. This is an Edwin Fadiman production. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and G.G. Pearson, Bud Heaston, Gray Stafford, Dick Ryan, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Midnight Ride. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, yeah, hello, Doc, how are you? <laughs> what? In trouble, you? <laughs> More trouble, you attract trouble, Archie, hang up. It's our dentist, Dr. Thrumming. Let him wait. We never can find him when we need him. Tell him it's after office hours. Doc. Doc, you're talking so fast, I can't make head and the tails of it. Look, look, listen, Doc, come on over here and we'll be able to hear you. It'll only take you a few minutes. Right. You consistently disobey me. I want to work on my paper about odontocosms. Doc Thrummick has a friend who's in some trouble and he needs our advice. Besides, we owe Doc a fair-sized little bill, remember? Money again, Archie. Money is the curse of our times. Yeah, man, bring on all the curses that is available.
ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-born mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> This story is one we refer to as the case of the Midnight Ride. Oh, yeah, there was a ride, all right. But it would never have happened if we hadn't received another phone call a few minutes after our Dr. Thrumming phone. It was late in the evening, and Nero Wolf was studying his paper on orchids while I was absorbed in playing some phonograph records. Archie, Archie, not so loud. I can't possibly think when you play that infernal thing at such volume. What was that you said, boss? I said I can't understand why you can't get music from a phonograph without vibrating the top of the instrument. That's right, that's right. I can't understand why the neighbors haven't called the police. Do you hear that, Archie? Archie! All right, I'll answer. You're fired. Naturally. Hello? Hello. Is this Archie Goodwin? I know, Mr. Wolf's... What? Me? Archie. Yeah, who is it? I need help, Archie. Please. Come at once. Please. Oh, please. You and Nero. Who is this? This is Gloria... Bo- no. No, don't. Is Gloria who? Ronaldo... R- West... R- 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 Hello? Hello? Well, did you hear that? Another female bar. What happened? Boss, who do you know named Gloria? Gloria? I know nothing about anyone named Gloria. She said her name was Gloria something. I couldn't quite get the last name. But she did say Ronaldo Road. Well, it's quite possible that she resides on Ronaldo Road. First she asked if this was Archie Goodwin speaking, and before I had a chance to say anything, she asked me to come to her at once. She needed help and for you to bring me along. I mean, for me to bring Nero along. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, she said she was Gloria... Bar or Mar or something like that, and then she said Ronaldo Road West, and then the scream, and that's all there was. Hmm. The usual pattern of your experience with women. Sounded like a hand was slapped over her mouth, or she was grabbed by the throat. Bring Nero with you. I am taking no more assignments this week. Ronaldo Road West, where is it? I don't believe there is a Ronaldo Road West. If I remember correctly, Ronaldo Road runs north and south and is approximately 12 miles long. But she said west. What she probably tried to say when she was interrupted was Ronaldo Road West Chester. West Chester, of course. Asked Inspector Kramer to try to check on that phone call. I'll ask him to try. By the way, do you expect to find this Gloria alive, Archie? I certainly hope so. And are you aware that if someone strangled her... Then they must have heard her speak your name? Yes, and yours too. Shall I open it, boss? Why not? Let us face it, Archie. Huh? It's me, Archie. Wait till I slide the night chain off, Dr. Thrummy. Uh, my nose. <laughs> I forgot all about you, Doc. Where have you been? It's only been three or four minutes. I've never had such a disturbing night since I had my first patient. But at first I was afraid to leave the house. And why were you so afraid, Dr. Thrummy? But there were two men sitting in front of my place in the car. Oh, oh good evening, Nero. Uh, were they waiting for you, Doctor? Well, why not? It's very likely. Since she called me, I've been so completely unnerved. Here, I... Doc, here. Have some brandy. Oh, no, 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 no. You know I never... Uh, well, that is... Uh, well, a small one. I, I am upset. Uh, you understand, Archie. Uh, uh, oh, well, that's better. Just who called you and upset you so? Oh, hello, Nero. Did someone call me? Uh, when? You phoned me frantically that a woman called you. I couldn't understand you on the phone. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, poor Gloria. She was cut off. Oh, Gloria. Did you say Gloria? Well, didn't I? I thought I did. Oh, dear... What did you say? I said Gloria. Oh, my, isn't that strange? I thought that's what I said. 
Uh, no, no, no more, please. We just had a call from Gloria. Who is Gloria? Well, you remember, we all went to school together. Uh, that is, uh, oh, you do too remember. Uh, Gloria, you know, she was... Um... Uh, just what is Gloria's last name, Dr. Thrumming? Well, it was Gloria Barnesworth. I don't know what it is now. That's what she was trying to say to me, Barnesworth. Did she tell you where to find her? Uh, no, she didn't. Uh, oh, dear me. She was just about to tell me when I said I'd call you and Archie and get your help. And then she was cut off. How do you know she's the Gloria Barnesworth you knew and I'm supposed to know? My. Whew. Uh, could you open the windows? Why, yes. Archie. Oh, sorry, Doc. The air outside's contaminated. Oh, is that so? With what? Oxygen. Mm, oh, these factories, factories, factories. Oh, well, I found her picture in an old class photo. Here it is. Oh, yeah, now I remember. But, Doc, you and this gal were several years ahead of me in school. I, I'm not in this picture, so she must be about 40 now. Well, gentlemen, you both seem to have the situation well in hand now. So, if you'll excuse me, I will retire to my room. Oh, oh yes, but we don't have anything figured out yet. Ah, but you will. Let me know in the morning how successful you have been. Good night. Well, anyway, a woman called here, and just as she was about to tell me who she was and her address, she was cut off as though she was strangled. Yeah, Archie, did you say someone strangled her? I don't know, Doc. I hope not. Well, let's start our search along Ronaldo Road. Hey, hey, Archie, Archie, don't answer it. They're after me. The men in the car, they saw me come in here. After you, nonsense. They found out Gloria phoned me. Don't let them in. Now, how could you know all that? Oh, dear me. Do you mind? A short one? I'm so weak today. Please, Archie, don't open it. I warn you. Now, just relax, Doc. I'll handle this. Good evening. Evening. Are you Archie Goodwin? Uh, no, he is. Yes. No, I'm not. He is. Put up your hands. Unhook the night chain. Now just turn off this light. Oh, I told you. I told you. Where's Wolf? Oh, he's been in bed for hours. And who is this little man? Hey, Why, well, I'm... Don't you know? This is my, uh, my, my brother, Brother Cuthbert. Yes, he's quite right. I'm a bit older than he is. Shut up, Cuthbert. All right, get your coats and hats off that rack. What for? We're all going for a little ride along the river. And it's a bit chilly. Oh, dear me. Uh, I feel faint. I'm getting dizzy. Get your hat. Uh, yes, sir. And put that bottle down. Yes, but it's so cold out there. Get tonight. along. Here's the car. Now, Mr. Goodwin, hand over that gun in your pocket. But I haven't got... Okay, there you are. Thank you. Now, get in the car. You get in the front seat with the driver, Goodwin. Your brother can get back with me. Okay, you know where we're going, driver. Yeah, yeah but... Yeah, but I... what? Get going. But do you know who this guy is? I do. Why? Well, now, look, I... Well, this guy is Archie Goodwin. What if he is? Well, this won't work. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be Goodwin. He's with Nero Wolf. What's your name, pal? I can't see you, but I seem to recognize your voice. Well, well, you see, it was like this. I was in on... Are you going to shut up and start driving? Okay, okay, I'm going. <laughs> See here, it's getting very late. I, I don't like this. Uh, where are you taking us? Keep calm, Doc. Yeah, don't get excited. Just take it easy. Listen, Goodwin, I got a record Shut for up, you. you What's the idea back of all this, friend? We're off the road here, driver. Yes, but we're way out in the country. Now, we'll all get out here. Now, wait a minute. I said get out. You too, driver. Oh, now, wait a second. What's the big idea? Now, all of you start walking over to that clump of trees. Go on. <laughs> What's he going to do? What do you think? Okay, that's good. Just stand there. Now get out your gun, driver. Get... Oh, now wait a minute. This is get the way you Get out your gun see... and don't turn around, driver. Now let him have it. Go on, or I'll kill you. I don't go in for this kind of stuff. Besides, shoot and empty the... your gun into them. Go on. Oh! Now just drop your gun on the ground there. Now I will take Goodwin's gun, and after I finish with it, I'll just toss it over beside his body. You what? Hey, now, wait a you minute. You'll notice I have gloves on. Hey, Doc. Dr. Thrumming. You all right, Doc? Oh. Oh, Archie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I got you into this. I, I can't last long. Where are you hit? 
Tell Nero I make him a present of his new bridge work I put in. Let me have a look at you. I wanted to die in my bed with my friends around You're me. You're not bleeding. I wanted the choir to sing. What? I'm not bleeding? No. Are you? No. The driver was a bad shot. He missed both of them. Then what am I doing down here on the ground? You fainted at the first shot. I dropped purposely on the second shot. He missed every time. Come on, get up from there. We're very lucky people. Uh, what became of them? Hand me my gun. Oh, is this your gun? Wrap it in this handkerchief. Come over here. Yep. Here he is, the driver. And he's dead. This is dreadful, Archie. What do we do now? You got a lighter? Uh, here's my pocket flash. Well, here's his gun beside him. Don't touch it. Have a look through his pockets. Wish I knew what he meant when he said he had a record for me someplace. A picture of a girl says to Mike from Violet. Mike. Mike. This fellow's face is certainly familiar, but I can't... Hey, wait a minute. Mike. Mike... Mike Jordan, that's it. Mike Jordan? Yeah, Wolf cleared him on a frame-up three years ago, and this uh, this girl, Violet, is an entertainer in a nightclub downtown. Uh, Violet, yes, but what does all this have to do with Gloria? Strange, there's no other identification on him. Maybe the other guy took it off of him. Well, now we got to find Violet. How? Oh, we can't even find Gloria. I think now that this guy, Mike Jordan, missed us deliberately. Let's start hoofing it back to that last crossroad. There was a telephone there. I'll call Nero. <laughs> So that's the story so far, Mr. Wolf. Sorry to wake you up, but we wanted you to know. Yes, we did. Oh, such a night. What was your reason for telling the man that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? Well, I didn't want him to know that it was Doc, because Gloria had called Doc, and he must have known about it. And the driver turned out to be Mike Jordan. And what did Mike say to you in the car? Well, he didn't finish, but he said, I got a record for you, Goodwin, it. And then the man shot him up. And when you located Violet at her place, she was cataloging recordings, hmm? Bring her in here now, Archie. Sit down, Dr. Thrumming. Uh, yes, yes, I am a bit weary. Come in, Violet. Uh, Violet, this is... Hey, wait a minute. You, you're Nero Wolf. Sit down, Miss Violet. Oh, what's the idea, Mr. Goodwin? Why'd you bring me here? Will you look at this photo? It says, to Mike from Violet. Where'd you get this? I got it, Violet. What we want to know is, where's Mike now? What's he doing? Can you tell us where he lives? What's Mike done now? Can you tell us his address? Maybe. Do you know who he has been working for? Yeah. A guy with a big car and a lot of dough. You've seen this man? Yeah, kind of a good-looking guy. I think his name is Durant or, or something like that. I understand you've been occupying yourself with cataloging some phonograph recordings. Yeah, that's what I was doing when Mr. Goodwin came in. Mike's got a home recorder over at his place. Do you have all the records that have been made on the machine so far? No, just what we made in the last week. Lots more at his place. Do you and Mike know of a woman named Gloria? No, at least I don't remember. It was on Rinaldo Road. Gloria Barnesworth was her maiden name. Where is this Rinaldo Road? I don't know. It's in Westchester, we think. I've never been there. What has Mike done, Mr. Wolf? Is it bad? As a matter of fact, Mike is in the clear. Good. There's no charge against him, and there never will be. You haven't seen him for a couple of days? No. And I never go to his apartment unless him and some guests are there. Do you know where he is? Will you give me the address of his apartment? Okay. 324 East 35th Street. Thank you very much, young lady. What's all so mysterious? Well, something's happened to Mike. I can tell by the way you talk. Very well, Archie. You have a special visit to make. Look for the machine, and it's quite late, so you had best hurry. Well, I'm going with you, Archie. Now, good night, Nero. Oh, I mean, good morning. Oh, I don't even know what day it is. Come along, Violet. We'll drop you at your place first. <laughs> Well, there we are, Doc. Yes, has his name right on it. Mike Jordan. No, well, we're fairly certain that no one's in there. Hey, what do you know? It isn't locked. The lights are on. I know, I know. Listen. 
Yes, a light humming noise. Huh. But where is it coming from? Over in that corner, those wall cabinets. There it is, a radio. And a phonograph combination. Yes, and a recording machine. And the recording arm's still down on the record. Just lift it off and put the playback needle on. Yeah, there we are. But look, I don't go in for that kind of stuff. You've been working for me for several weeks now, haven't you? Well, sure, boss, but I never went in for no kind of We're going to pick this guy up and take him for a little ride. It ain't my life. All you do is drive the car. Okay, I'll take a chance. But remember, I am just the driver of your car. If anything happens, I didn't know nothing. You'll do just as I say. Incidentally, I know a lot about you. Things the police would like to know. Okay. Okay, I'm working for you. I came out to Ronaldo Road to make an honest living. But I see I'm right back where I started. And worse, I just ain't got a chance. Oh, remind me. I've got to phone the place. did say Ronaldo Road. And that's where our Gloria called from, so they're all tied in together. Come along, Doc. We're going back to Mr. Wolf again, and we'll just take this record with us. Well, Archie, I guess this phonograph was worthwhile after all. Yes, indeed. Hey, don't you find this a very interesting recording, Nero? I'm sure we're going to add it to our collection. And these are the two men who took you on the right. That's right. But we're really no further along in our desire to help, Gloria. That's right. We're on Ronaldo Road. Boss, if we can find the address, will you go with us down there or over there or wherever it is? I might. And you already have the clue to the address. We have. Where? In that phonograph recording. Play it again, Archie. Just the part where he uses the telephone. And slow the speed way down. Then take down the numbers I call off. Okay, boss. Six, five, three, two, two, three. That's enough. By slowing down the record, we were able to count the clicks of each number he used on the dial. Now, there's the number the man called. We hope it is on Ronaldo Road. Have Inspector Kramer get the address of that number combination, and we are ready to make our assault. I'll call Kramer, and then I'll get the car out. It hadn't been out for weeks. Maybe it won't start. Hmm. No such luck, Archie, I assure you. No such luck. <laughs> I think we must go through this big gate. Uh, yes, yes, there's the number. 23, Ronaldo. Slip up to the entrance as softly as possible. Turn out your headlamps. Well, here we are, boss. Easy now, getting out. Don't pull, Doctor. Don't pull on me. Oh. Yeah. There we are. Now, come along. Yeah, spooky sort of place, isn't it? All big houses are like that. Must be 20 rooms. There's not a light in the place. Use the knocker, Archie. Uh Uh-oh, stand back. Here comes somebody. Yes? Uh, is Gloria in? What? Gloria? And who are you? Uh, uh, We are here to see Gloria. Uh, uh, Come, come. It's this hour of the night? Certainly not. Uh, Just a moment. She's an old friend of mine. Uh, Yes, and his too. He's Archie. My good man, what is your name? Uh, Jennings, sir. 
in the uh, household is in bed at this hour. What is it, Jennings? Who's at the door? Uh, they're asking for you, Miss Gloria. For me? Well, come in, gentlemen. You may go, Jennings. Please. Very well, miss. Just as you say. Now, what did you want? Say, Doc, is this the Gloria? Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem... Are you Gloria? Yes. Well, why did you call us? Oh, then... Then you're Archie Goodwin. Yes, and I'm Dr. Thrilling. Uh, but you I are... called you because I need your help. Desperately. Gloria, oh. what is going on here at this up? Oh. And who are these gentlemen? Well, you... You see, Uncle... Mr. Goodwin came... Came to see you? Why? Well, I... Because I... I think you'd better go to your room, my dear. Don't you think that is best? Your room and rest? No. No, I don't want to. I won't. Go to your room. No. No, I won't. I can't. All those people walk in and out. They want to kill me. Jennings, take her to her room. Uh, yes, sir. Come along, please. No. No, I won't. I won't. Let me go. There are hundreds of people. They'll kill me. Come along. No, no. Please. I'm so sorry. But there's nothing we can do with her. Now, Mr. Goodwin. Yeah? What is it you wish? The girl called you Uncle. Oh, pardon me. I'm Nero Wolf. How do you do, Mr. Wolf? Yes, she called me Uncle, but I'm not really a relative. I'm Dr. Gunther, retained by the family. As you can see, the girl is quite ill. Oh, uh, well, we're old friends of Gloria's, and we'd like to see her. But you just saw her. We don't refer to this young lady. We have in mind the elderly Gloria. Now, come, Dr. Gunther. You know to whom we refer. What? You... You mean the girl's aunt? Well, it's very strange. If you are a friend of the aunt's, that you are not aware of her condition. Her condition? Yes. The aunt has been bedridden for nearly a year. Paralysis. And it seems to be most coincidental with your visit, but she passed away this afternoon. Died? Gloria? This afternoon? But... How could that be? We'd like to see the remains, Dr. Gunther. Yes, we'd like to see the remains. Just where are they? They are here, Mr. Goodwin. And if you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way to the small parlor. There you are, gentlemen. I'll leave you alone. I'll be in the library. Well, gentlemen, there she is. What do you say? Do you recognize this woman? Well, yeah, been many years, but that is Gloria Barnesworth. Well, good heavens, yes. It's Gloria, all right. Poor woman. I remember now. She married a very wealthy manufacturer named Kenton, who died. She's remained a widow, I guess. Uh, he said she died this afternoon. Are you sure it was an elderly woman who called you this evening? And by the way, just feel her forehead. It's warm. She couldn't have been dead more than an hour. She isn't dead. No signs of pulse. Your cigarette case, please. Hmm. Very slight moisture. Respiration, barely perceptible. She's under heavy narcosis. Been given a heavy dose lately. Uh, let's get out of here. Wait. Do you recognize the uncle? Rather, Dr. Gunther? No, do you, throw me? No. Does he look like the man who took you for a ride? It was too dark, boss. And he was all bundled up in heavy clothes. Uh, let's get out of here. The door was locked after we came in. He's right. Come on, Doc. Let's put our shoulders to it. One, two... Go! Well, gentlemen, what on earth does this mean? Why'd you lock the door? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's a spring lock. I had no intention of locking the door. And I suggest, Archie, that you have it repaired. And now, Archie, will you step to the door and let Inspector Kramer in? He followed us up the driveway. Yeah, about time... Getting cold down here. Inspector Kramer, this is Dr. Gunther. In that room is a woman he claims is dead. She is actually under the heavy influence of narcotics. Yeah? Well, who is she? Mrs. Gloria Kenton, widow of the wealthy shoe manufacturer. And this attractive young lady coming down the stairs is supposed to be mentally ill, which I do not believe. Her name is Gloria, too. A niece of the elder Gloria. But Archie and I both knew Gloria Barnesworth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. And I suggest that this man is not a doctor, but is young Gloria's husband, 
And they're attempting to force the Aunt Gloria to change her will in their favor. This is utterly ridiculous. The aunt was able to phone Doc Thrumick and me tonight, but she was apparently caught in the act. And this man, who is posing as the uncle, hired Mike Jordan to drive his car while he picked up Archie with the intent of killing him. But this, this is the same man? The same. And if Mike Jordan hadn't recognized Archie, both of you would be quite dead. This man double-crossed Mike and killed him, believing that the whole thing would be blamed on Mike. Mike deliberately missed. All right, so what's he going to do about it? Come on, let's get out of here fast. Look out, he's a cop. <laughs> All right, now get those hands up and keep them up. Come along, Archie, I have another appointment. The inspector can handle it from here on. Oh, dear me. Oh. Oh, What happened? Uh, Am I all right? Yeah, you just fainted again when the shooting started. Oh. Really quite fortunate that Mike Jordan recorded that conversation. Fortunate indeed. How did you know this uncle was the same guy who took us for a ride? First by his speech pattern, he is undoubtedly a Canadian. But you must have missed the most important slipper. What was that? When he escorted us to see the body, he said to you, Archie... If you and your brother and Mr. Wolf will step this way... Now, uh, how would he believe that Dr. Thrumming was your brother? No one mentioned it. Of course, the clue I planted and then missed myself. Quite right, Archie, quite right. What time is it? Uh, 8 a.m. I certainly appreciate your coming out for me on this deal. Oh, but I didn't do it just for you. There is an orchid lovers' convention this morning at 9 o'clock. What? And you mean... Yes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it tremendously. <laughs> Both of you. Oh, brother. Uh-huh. What's that? What's that? Nothing, Doc. Nothing at all. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Howard McNear, Gene Bates, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, Grace Lennard, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Final Page. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. What? Oh, Fritz. Yeah, I thought it was the outside line. Yeah? Yes, thanks. I'll be right down, Fritz. Boss, Mr. Wolf, will you please hurry? You're well aware that it will avail you nothing to hurry me? Why you Mr. Ware be in such a rush today? But the car, it's downstairs waiting. Fritz is all ready. Let him wait. Isn't it enough that I've agreed against my better judgment to leave the comforts of home to go rushing through the crashing traffic of the city? To a dinner? That should be an inducement. Fritz could have prepared a delicious dinner. He has truffles in the pantry. Well, why did you promise Arthur Merle? You didn't have to accept the invitation. Quite so. He's an old friend. Besides, he does set an excellent table. It's just that I don't like the traffic. Traffic? <laughs> I know why. It's that awful oxygen in the atmosphere outside. It's not the traffic. Archie, you're talking much too much. I know, boss. I'm impatient. Would you mind giving me some slight indication that you intend to move from that chair? Just as soon as I finish this beer. Sure you wouldn't care for half a dozen sandwiches before we go to dinner? If we were going anywhere other than to Arthur Merrill's, I'd agree with you. He's the only person in the world I know of, except myself, of course, who has a proper appreciation and respect for the art of preparing good food. Ladies and gentlemen.
gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. We usually refer to this story as the case of the final page. Under normal circumstances, the last page of a manuscript would be absolutely worthless unless you read all the preceding pages. But in this instance, the final page held the answer to a murder. Without that page, we couldn't arrive at the solution. Actually, we didn't even know the problem. Anyhow, I finally got Nero Wolf to the lobby of Arthur Merle's apartment building. Going up. Going up. Up, please. Are you going up, gentlemen? Are you, honey? Certainly. It's my job. Then so are we. After you, boss. When did they install women elevator operators in this building? I've been here for two years. Floor, please. Arthur Merle's apartment, I believe. It's 814. That's right. Are you Mr. Wolf? Uh, no. This is Mr. Wolf. I'm Archie Goodwin. Although the name Wolf would be much more appropriate for him than for me. How did you know he was Mr. Wolf? Mr. Merle came in half an hour ago. He mentioned that he was expecting you. You see, Archie, you rushed me unnecessarily. We practically preceded him here. And we'll probably have to wait interminably for dinner. I just hate to be late. Arthur Merrill has never been on time in his life. He's no more punctual than any other writer. He's never been known to meet a deadline on time. This is your floor, gentlemen. Arthur Merrill is just down the hall to the right, 814. Uh, thank you. And uh, by the way, I want to compliment you on your congenial attitude, miss. I'll speak to the management. Oh, thank you, sir. Decent of you. Uh, what's your name, huh? Women are usurping everything. Really cost to live here. Merle's really in the chips. Every book he writes sells a million copies. Remember the last time we had dinner with Arthur Merle? I do. Delicious. Mountain quail. Shot them himself. Yeah, he's quite a marksman. Archie, such proficiency as Arthur Merle displayed in hunting is evidence of a wasted life. Sure. He probably never made over $500,000 a year in his whole life. Well, ring again. Don't just stand there. Surely he's expecting us. The elevator operator said he was? Yeah, she seemed quite well informed. If I were a judge of women, which I am not, I'd say she has a line on every male in the building. She can get a line on me anytime she wants. Archie, your insatiable interest in the female seems sometimes to border on the psychopathic. You know a more pleasant way to go crazy? Phooey. This strange is a light on in there. I can see it under the door. Shall I try the door? Do so, Archie. Thank you. Hmm. Unlocked. Well, at least we can get in. He may be in the bedroom. Probably in the kitchen. I'll just sit here. I must forgo the comforts of my own home. I certainly intend to avail myself of the comforts of Arthur Merle's. Hmm. Very much over-decorated. You wouldn't like heaven unless they had orchids and beer. Hmm. Not a chair in the place worthy of the name. Well, I'll try that divan while you have a look around. For what? Ah, the mail, of course. Suppose you have a look in the study. Maybe writing. Have a look, my boy. I'm exhausted and thirsty. See if he has any... Boss! Boss! Good heavens, Archie. Don't shout. Uh, I'm coming. It's Arthur Merle. Look. Slumped over his desk. A knife in his back. Yeah. He's quite dead. You haven't touched anything? Certainly not. I've been around long enough to know that. Well, you just call Inspector Kramer at homicide. How long do you think he's been dead? I'd say a half hour. From all appearances, yes. And perhaps only ten minutes. I can't understand it. Why would anyone want to kill Arthur Merle? Everybody liked him. Nice man I'd expect such a thing to happen to. The answer is probably a considerable distance from the question, Archie. Inspector Kramer, homicide. Archie Goodwin, Inspector. Just a minute, Nero Wolf wants to speak to you. Oh, no. Don't tell me you two have started up something on a night like this. It's ten below zero. I'm sorry. Here you are, boss. Hello, Inspector. Yes? What is it this time, Wolf? Find a dead body on the Grant's tomb? 
And I'm sorry you'll forgive any apparent failure to find humor in your little witticism. But I'm at Arthur Merle's apartment. I suggest you come here at once. Seems that Arthur finally met a deadline. So you just walked in here and found Merle dead, huh? We were invited here for dinner. Hmm. Anyone else around when you got here? No. You see anyone, Goodwin? Only the elevator operator who brought us up. Well, Mr. Wolf, since you were in on the ground floor, maybe you've got some ideas. Sorry, Inspector. Had I been able to solve the crime so soon, I would have advised you, Inspector. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's obviously murder. Obviously. You knew him well? Quite well. Ever know of his being in any trouble? No. Everybody liked him. Arthur Merle, I felt, didn't have an enemy in the world. Is that so? I don't think anybody pulled this as a little friendly gesture. Don't jump to conclusions, Inspector, that this murder was committed necessarily by an enemy of Merle's. Meaning? It could have been an absolute stranger. A woman? Or a burglar, or a madman, or a crank, or... As far as we know, it could have been anybody in the city, Inspector. Arthur's been dead nearly an hour. And an hour ago, I was in my own home, sitting comfortably in my own big easy chair, drinking a delectable glass of beer. Someone at the door, Archie. Yeah, just a minute. I'll answer that. Mr. Merle? No. Uh, well, is Mr. Merle here? Yes, he's here. But he's not seeing anyone. Well, he's expecting me. I'm from the Serve Right Catering Company. We're ready to serve for four here tonight. Their dinner has been canceled. Oh, but it's been ordered. Breast of guinea hen, cooked in wine and cloves, delicious. It's prepared and waiting. I'm afraid that I must insist on seeing Mr. Merle. Mr. Merle has been murdered. Well, I'm afraid I must... Uh, murdered? Well, oh, my goodness, but... Well, in that case, I... Yes, good evening. Don't you think you might have taken a bit more time with the fellow, Inspector? Why? You might at least have let him serve the dinner. Guinea hen, wine, and clove sounded positively delectable. Look, I've had dinner. I'm afraid you're too busy, Inspector. So busy that you've just passed up an extremely interesting bit of information. What are you talking about, Wolf? He said he was to serve dinner for four. Well? Arthur Merle, Archie, and myself are only three. Well, who else was supposed to be here? A fourth guest who either hasn't arrived yet or who arrived earlier and left. Oh, I see what you mean, Wolf. Good. In that case, I'll leave you to pursue your deductions from that premise. Archie, will you please stay with the inspector and be of any help that you can? As for myself, I'm going back to my own home, which I should never have left in the first place. <laughs> Okay, that finishes the apartment search, Goodwin. And what have we? Nothing. Except that Merle had over $300 in his pocket, and he was wearing a ring worth a couple of thousand, so it couldn't have been robbery. And I don't think it was premeditated murder. Why not? The weapon. Obviously, if someone had planned on killing Merle, he'd have prepared it better. Used a better weapon than a blunt paper knife. No, as I see it, someone was here before you and Wolf arrived, and for some reason that person found it necessary to kill Merle, and he did it on the spur of the moment. I'm listening. Well, it's obvious. Merle was slumped over his typewriter. The sheet of paper was in it. He'd been working. May I see it? Yeah. Starbreaker. Strange title. Page 189. He was getting well along with his latest mystery. Apparently. Okay. Gregory Thorne slipped the paper into his pocket. It was just an ordinary piece of paper, but Gregory knew its value. Used properly, as Greg knew how to use it, it would be worth $100,000. He walked away briskly, and as he... That's all. Yeah, that's all. Must have been right. No, I'd like to read the rest of it. We didn't find any more of it. Any other ideas? No, at the moment we seem to be right where the murderer himself left off. Oh, what is this, open house? Sorry to be so... Oh. Oh, what? I was... I mean, I expected to see Mr. Murrow. Is he here? Well, who are you? Cynthia Roberts. He expecting you? Well, no. That is... Uh, come on in, Miss Roberts. Thank you. Maybe the young lady is trying to say that he didn't have to expect her. Maybe she felt free to call without advance notice, Inspector. Inspector? Uh, what did you want to see Mr. Merle about? I... Well, I'm his fiancée. Oh. Had dinner yet, Miss Roberts? 
Why, yes, I had dinner earlier. Uh, when were I... you last here, Miss Roberts? Well, last night, after the theater. Arthur and I were... What's the matter? Is something wrong? I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Miss Roberts, but Arthur Merle was murdered. And you say you hadn't talked to Mr. Merle all evening. Is that right, Miss Roberts? Yes, that's right. You didn't have a date with him tonight? Oh, no. Then why did you come here? I told you we were engaged. I just came by, that's all. I see. Any more questions, Inspector? Yeah, none for the present. How about you, Goodwin? Nope. But maybe Wolf. Let me call him. Yes, I guess under the circumstances we can't very well leave him out. <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, Arthur, I just can't believe it. Why would anyone want to kill him? That, Miss Roberts, is a question we'd all like to know the answer to. Nina Wolf speaking. Archie, boss, I'm still at Merle's. We haven't found out anything new except that Arthur's fiance dropped in a few minutes ago. Did she know anything of interest? I don't think so. What does the inspector plan to do about it? Just a minute. He wants to know what you're going to do with it. Well, hold her, of course. He's going to hold her. Let me speak to him. Okay. He wants to talk to you, Inspector. All right. Hello. Inspector, I suggest you let the young lady go. Are you crazy? I haven't got enough suspects in this deal to be letting the hottest one go free. You can't consider her a suspect simply because she knew Arthur. Now, see here, Wolf. If you go around arresting people at random, you'll suddenly be tipping your hand to the real murderer, admitting that you don't have a real clue to go on. And just what do you suggest? Find a motive, Inspector. Find a motive. Then, if you stumble on a suspect, you'll have some basis for making an arrest. At the moment, I suggest that you let the girl go and tell Archie to stop wasting his time down there and come home at once. So that's the story, boss. We went over that place with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing. There's not a single suspect. The last person to see Arthur alive was the elevator girl. Correction, Archie. The last person to see Arthur Merle alive was the person who ended his life. Well, I just can't imagine that pretty little elevator gal. You don't solve crimes by imagination, Archie. Then there's Cynthia Roberts, his fiance. You suspect her? Not exactly, but just suppose she did have a motive. Maybe he threw her over. Wouldn't it have been very clever of her to come back to Arthur's apartment after the police arrived, allegedly looking for him? I thought you were the admirer of the fair to sex, Archie. So far, the best you can do is practically accuse the elevator girl and Arthur's fiancée of murder. Well, who else is there? Certainly the fellow who came with the food doesn't count. I repeat, who else is there? The entire population of the city, Archie. Thanks. Well, that's all I get. Oh, oh there was something else. What? This. Page 189 of what appears to be Arthur's latest novel. It was in his typewriter. As you can see, he just started the page. Hmm, Starbreaker. Hmm. Very interesting. What's the rest of it? It's all we found. What? And there was something missing. Archie. Yes, boss? First thing tomorrow morning, get the address of Mr. Morton, who publishes Arthur's books. Then get over to see him right away. Yes, may I help you? I'd like to see Mr. Morton. Uh, did you have an appointment? Tell him I'm from Homicide. Uh, ho oh, yes, sir. Yes? Uh, Mr. Morton, I know you have someone with you, but uh, there's a gentleman here from the Homicide Bureau. He wants to see you. Tell him I work for Nero Wolf. My name's Goodwin. His name is Goodwin. Send him in. Yes, thank you. You may go right in, sir. The large door to your right. Thanks. Come in, Mr. Goodwin. Come in. I understand you're from Homicide. Not exactly. I'm Nero Wolfe's assistant. We're working with Inspector Kramer. And what can I do for you? You've heard about Arthur Merle. Yes, I received the word when I came in this morning. It was a great shock. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Goodwin. This gentleman is Henry Childs. How do you do, Mr. Childs? Glad to meet you, Mr. Goodwin. You're with Nero Wolfe? I'm his, well, his assistant, Man Friday. Mr. And... Childs is a publicity agent. He handled all publicity for Arthur Merle. I've not only lost an excellent client, but a very good friend. Did you know Mr. Merle? Yes, I'd met him a number of times with Mr. Wolf. Yes, indeed. Arthur Merle was a great writer and a fine citizen. He'll be missed by millions. Mr. Goodwin, when was the murder discovered? Last night, shortly before dinner. Well, what are the police... I mean, what do you think the motive was? Don't know as yet, Mr. Charles. A little early for that. 
Well, it's certainly a shame. I, uh, I want to ask you a few questions, Mr. Morton, privately. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Charles. Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave. I'll run along now, Mr. Morton. Uh, see you again soon, Mr. Child. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Goodwin? You did a lot of business with Mr. Merle, Mr. Morton? I published every one of his novels for the past eight years. And you intended to publish his new one, the one he was working on? Yes, we had a contract. The usual agreement between you? Naturally. Although I didn't know the story, I was always sure that if Arthur wrote it, it was good. Mr. Merle's name on a novel was a guarantee that it would sell a million copies. You don't know what this last one was about. I haven't the faintest idea. We relied completely on Arthur's judgment. Not even any carbon copies, huh? Not that I know of. Why? When Mr. Merle was killed, the only thing missing from his apartment was the novel. The novel? The first 188 pages. All we found of it were a few lines of page 189 in his typewriter. He must have been working on it when the murderer stabbed him. The rest of it's gone. You mean, Goodwin, the, the novel's gone? This will cost me a million dollars. Well, it cost Arthur Merle his life. Arthur Merle dead and his novel gone. I can hardly believe it. Well, thank you, Mr. Morton. Oh, I hope I've been of some help, although I I'm don't sorry quite... you haven't. But we may call on you again. Before it's over, you may be a great help. Mira Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. I just finished with Morton. He doesn't know a thing. Merle never discussed his stories with anyone, and as far as Morton knows, he never made carbons. I see. Where do I go from here, boss? See Cynthia Roberts. Oh, then you haven't dismissed the possibility that she may have had something to do with it. Being his fiancée, she probably knows more about Arthur than anyone else. She may know who the fourth guest was to have been last night. And she also may know what Merle's novel was about. Right, boss. I'm anxious to know what the novel was about, too. I personally don't give a hang what the novel was about. What I want to find out is someone who does know the story. Because I have a hunch that whoever knows that is the person who killed Arthur Merle. <laughs> Miss Roberts, I know you want to help us find out who killed Arthur. Oh, yes, of course. I'll do anything. Nero Wolfe and I were invited to have dinner with Arthur Merle last night. Well, I knew he was having friends in for dinner, but I didn't know who they were. Oh, I'm sorry. I hoped you'd know whom he invited. No, he didn't tell me. Miss Roberts, we have reason to believe that there was to have been a fourth person there last night. A, a fourth? The caterer came to deliver dinner for four. Now, the fourth party never did show up, or else came earlier and left after Arthur was killed. You mean someone Arthur invited to dinner might have... Killed him? Maybe. Oh, there's no one that I can think of who bore any ill will toward Arthur. We're I... convinced that this was done on the spur of the moment. Unpremeditated murder. Arthur Merle suddenly became a threat to someone. Now we've got to find out what the threat was and who was threatened. We'd hope you could help. I'm sorry. Did he ever discuss his new novel with you? Oh, no. He never talked about his stories until he'd finished them. So his latest mystery contains the answer to an even greater mystery. Unless we find the first, they'll both go unanswered. Mr. Morton? Yes? Nero Wolf speaking. Oh, yes. Your man Goodwin was here to see me. I presume you are interested in seeing Merle's murderer brought to justice? Certainly. Arthur was a close friend of mine. And his death cost you a best sir, I know. Now, would you be willing to help a bit? Why, yes, if I... I prepared a statement for the papers. I want you to call the literary editors first thing in the morning. Here's what I want you to tell them. Got a pencil and paper? Yes. And take this down. Quote, Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publishers with carbon copies of each day's work Consequently, with the major portion of his... Boss! Boss! Good heaven, Archie. Please don't be so loud. Look here. In this morning's paper, why, that rat, he lied to me, that... that... What on earth are you talking about? That publisher, Morton, he said he didn't have copies of Merle's manuscript, that he didn't know what it was about. And, li and listen to this. Mr. Carlton Morton announced today that the last work of the late Arthur Merle will be published according to schedule. 
Fortunately, it was Mr. Merle's custom to furnish his publisher with carbon copies of each day's work. Consequently, with a major portion of his latest work, Starbreaker, in the hands of his publisher, together with a complete synopsis, including the denouement, it will be possible for a ghostwriter to complete the novel. It will be published posthumously in proceeds with... Boss, did you hear that? I did, and it couldn't have been more to my liking if I'd written it myself. Now, excuse me. I want to make a telephone call. Who? Publisher Morton. Yeah, I'm beginning to see. He lied about the whole thing. I still don't see why he'd kill Merle, but on... Hello, Mr. Morton. This is Nero Wolf. Yes, perfect. Now I'll call Kramer, and he and Archie will be waiting for you. Remember now, if anything comes of it... You are to say the manuscript is in the safe in your home and you steer the party here. Say you've recently rented this place. I hope we'll be seeing you. Yes. Goodbye. Oh, and be careful. Remember what happened to Arthur. The manuscript is in my desk in the middle drawer. What's it? You mean... Archie, look out of that window. Huh? Yeah? Out there is a city of some five million people. In that five million, there is one who murdered Arthur Merle. Now, we don't know who it is, so we can't go out and put a finger on him. But, Archie, since we can't go to him, we have only one other choice, make him come to us. Tell me why we're sitting here in the dark in Wolf's office. Yes, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Wolf promised us a caller. Mr. Morton is to pretend that he's rented this place recently. Well, who's the caller? Can't tell you until he or she gets here. You seem certain he'll come. I'm quite certain. I'm just hopeful. You trying to tell me that Morton killed Merle? You're almost as dense as Archie was. No, Morton didn't do it. Unless Mr. Wolf is very wrong, which is doubtful, before the night is over, Morton will know who did. Then it won't be long until we know, too. Uh, you should get on a quiz program. You're so good at guessing games. Shh. Listen. Huh? Yeah, someone's coming. A great introduction, my dear Kramer. I hope there are two of them. Inspector, behind these drapes. Quick. I'll get behind the screen. All right, Mr. Morton. So far, you've been very cooperative. Just keep it up. I have no intention of doing otherwise. Your gun has me completely convinced, Mr. Child. Get the manuscript. Uh, yes, uh, just a moment. It's in my desk. Wait a minute. I thought you said it was in the safe. A mistake, Mr. Childs. I don't have a safe. Shall I get the manuscript? Yes, but no tricks. You be careful. I'm being exceedingly careful, Mr. Childs. There you are. Oh. Starbreaker by Arthur Merle. Yes, this is it. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Now, I trust that's all you want of me. I'm sorry. I wish that were true. Unfortunately, you see, it's not the actual novel that I want. Oh? My interest in this copy is the same as it was in the original. And that is? That no one should ever learn the content. I take it you know what it's about, then. Yes. You see, Mr. Murrow made the mistake of telling me when I called a bit early at his apartment for dinner last evening. I was forced to deprive him of his life once I learned the storyline of this novel. This story must be kept secret. Why? Most of you people in the publishing business know me as a public relations and publicity agent for several prominent writers. Yes? Actually, I've been as successful as I might in this business. Because a few years ago, I stumbled onto a very neat and foolproof method of blackmail. Unfortunately, Arthur Merle thought of the same thing and based this story on it. If it got out, I'd be exposed and sent to prison. So he can see why I had to stop it, why I had to kill Arthur and why... Now I'll have to kill you, too. Oh, child, for heaven's sake. The contents of these pages condemn me. You know what's in them. Further, I've confessed to murder to you. You don't think I could let you live after that, do you? Child, you're insane. I'm sorry that I must repay you for your trouble in such an ungrateful manner. I'm sorry to do this to oh, you, Charles, but I can't... Charles, please, no! <laughs> sorry, Mr. Charles. There wasn't time to ask you to drop the gun. All right, Mr. Charles. Get your hands up and stay where you are. Nice going, Mr. Morton. Who are you? That took courage, Mr. Morton. Sorry we had to wait so long, but we had to make Mr. Charles here convict himself. Convict? What do you mean? We've been waiting here for you. Behind the drapes all the time. We heard every word. Mr. Charles, you're under arrest. Police? Yes, Mr. Charles. Only one person could have been so anxious over a copy of that novel. That's the person who killed Arthur Merle for the original. 
And we heard you confess to that. And that's all we need to convict you. We didn't have any proof until we set it up for you to make a second try to cover up for the first. Fortunately, the setup worked. Setup? Take a look at the rest of the manuscript, Mr. Child. What? Oh, the front page is there, all right, but look at the rest. Why, the blank. They're just blank pages. You didn't have a copy at all. No, but we certainly got a murderer, eh, Inspector? Child! Child! Stop, Child! Stop! Well, that's one way to avoid standing trial. Well, Archie, I'm glad you and Kramer got Charles. Some beer, please. That was a clever scheme, boss, making him think there was a copy. Yes. In a way, though, I wish it hadn't been just a scheme. Meaning? I wish there had been a copy of Arthur Merle's novel. Why? You never read detective stories. No, but I've drummed up so much curiosity over this one, I'd like to know exactly what that blackmail gimmick really was. Good night, Archie. Ah. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Don Arthur was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman production and is directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin. And Evelyn Eaton, Peter Leeds, Lucille Alex, Marna Keneally, Herb Butterfield, and Bill Johnstone. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you the case of the Telltale Ribbon. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's excitement for you Sunday when talented servicemen compete on the Phil Regan Show. And Sunday on NBC also means another delightful adventure with Cary Grant and Betsy Drake when they star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings, the proud but bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Tomorrow for excitement, hear Herbert Marshall in The Man Called X on NBC. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited every Saturday over most of these NBC stations to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. Tomorrow's symphony performance features Metropolitan Opera star Helen Traubel as guest soloist. For tomorrow's broadcast, the orchestra will be under the baton of the widely acclaimed conductor, Wilfred Pelletier. For the world's great music, hear the NBC Symphony brought to you tomorrow and every Saturday. Transcribed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes, who's calling? Mr. John Blake? Well, is this a matter of business? That's fine, Mr. Blake, I'll just call him. Archie, I'm not here. Tell him I'm up in the plant room with the orchids. Uh, I was going to call him to the phone, but he's up in the plant room with his orchids. Uh, what sort of a case is this, sir? Really? Really, is that so? Is it a man or a woman? Oh, I understand perfectly. It's a man. Well, at least that's something different. Yes, sir, very urgent, I understand. And I assure you, Mr. Wolf will be here waiting for you. The fee? Oh, um, shall we say about, uh, oh, a thousand? I will not see any client until after dinner. Fritz is having mountain quail on toast. Yes, Mr. Blake, come at once. What were you saying, boss? And found you, Archie, nothing but business. All the time. What's the problem? I don't know. And at $1,000, considering our bank balance, I'll help him poison his great-grandmother. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> What 
we chose to refer to as the case of the hasty will began, of course, with an urgent phone call from the mysterious John Blake. At the moment, Nero Wolfe was seated in his chair, which was specially built for his 300 pounds, and I was giving him a lecture on the importance of money. Archie, that will do. I'm not interested. You will be when you learn you can make no more purchases of beer and Skittles. You've passed up two cinch cases now. Each would have meant a healthy fee. Let us hope this Mr. Blake has a nice, fat problem that will take us days to solve. Archie! Yes, sir? Answer the door. Good evening. I'm John Blake. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Blake. You have no idea how welcome you are. Archie, show Mr. Blake in and close the door. That draft is unbearable. Uh, This way, sir. Mr. Wolf doesn't care for anything resembling air. Oh, I'm Archie Goodwin. Uh, Good evening, Mr. Blake. Mr. Wolf, uh, I have a little business for you. Now, uh, before you say anything, I know you're not a lawyer. I'm not a member of the bar, let us say, Mr. Blake. Of course. What kind of business, Mr. Blake? I have here a short will, which uh, I have typewritten myself. I I haven't signed it yet. Uh, Also, I have here a sealed envelope containing a letter which I want you to be prepared to deliver to the addressee. A will and a letter. Very well. Yes. Uh, Do you know who I am? Seems that I've certainly seen you before. Same here. I just can't place you. Well, I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture many times. You have a staff of the best attorneys in the city, Mr. Blake, and this is most assuredly the business of attorney. Perhaps. But in this particular instance, I wanted an individual who had no interest in me, uh, nor uh, previous knowledge of my affairs. I see. Also, I wanted the person who was, well, uh, shall we say, not too well fixed. Well, you certainly could Archie. Have... Imagine Mr. Wolf being in need of money. Just why can't your attorneys handle this? You'll know in a moment. But when I leave here, I want you to forget the whole thing uh, for the time being. Indeed. You have said it. Here's the will. You may read it. Archie. January 25, 1951. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. So, simple enough, isn't it? That's all. Now, the pen, please, and I'll sign it. Now, then, you sign as witness, Mr. Goodwin. You retain the will, Mr. Wolfe, and the envelope here, which is addressed to Hillary Brake, my brother, who is now living in this city. Your brother? He's just recently returned from 25 years in Australia. Though Hillary has written me several times, I have not favored him. We've, uh, we've been estranged these many years over, uh, well, a certain unpleasant situation which this enclosed letter will clear up. Are you in fear of your life, Mr. Blake? Murder? No, Mr. Wolfe. There was a time, yes, but, uh, well, not now. You will know what to do with the will and the letter, though, when the time arrives. Now, uh, as to your fee, you said uh, a thousand? Well, we usually receive... A thousand uh, will do. Well, here's a check, all made out. If you're thinking of suicide, Mr. Blake, we must warn you. If you don't care to go through with this, please say so. I'm not planning on suicide, I assure you. We have taken the job, Mr. Blake. And good evening, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for your kind indulgence. Well, that's the simplest little thousand we ever made. I believe, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to be quite surprised. I want you to get acquainted with John Blake's secretary. You will more than earn this thousand, young man. Archie. Archie, is that you? Yes, boss. What time is it? It is 6 p.m. The clock is right in front of your eyes. I'm thinking, Archie, it's very interesting. Very. An entire day has passed since the visit from John Blake. Did you learn anything from Blake's secretary? I did. He left his office late yesterday, she said. His daughter Anita is quite upset because he didn't come home. Check his club? Yup. I didn't talk to the daughter, but I learned that she's engaged to a young fellow named Wilbur Martin. She told the secretary that her father had been acting strangely of late, a bit morose. And what does the daughter feel has happened? Anita's afraid he's been kidnapped. You haven't met nor talked to any other than the secretary? Not yet. And so far, no one's called the police. Good. We must, for the time being, prevent that. What did you learn of Blake's brother from Australia? He's been here only a year. 
They've met only once or twice since his return. The secretary thinks the breakup was because of their love for the same woman. Hillary became very wealthy in Australia. Very well, Archie. It is time for you to visit Miss Anita Blake at her home. I'd love to, boss. She's a mighty purty gal. Fooey. Archie, you can do me a great service. Anything. Be sure to close it tightly as you leave. Close what? The coal chute, of course. I'm awfully glad you could come, Uncle Hillary. Wilbur seemed to think you might know something about Father's disappearance. No, I don't know, Wilbur. Uh, I'm just as nonplussed as you are. When did you see your brother last? Oh, it's been four or five months. Why? Well, I just wanted to know. What do you two think has become of him? Surely you know his recent actions better than I. Well, at first I thought he'd been kidnapped. Now I'm afraid it's suicide. Oh, I say, really now. Have you been putting such ideas into our head, young man? On the other hand, could have been murder. Indeed. Well, I suggest that the police be called. The hospitals, the morgue, every place. Have you thought of doing that, young man? I was going to. Oh, really? Then what are you stalling about? I'll just step into the library and do it myself. Oh, it can't be, Wilbur. It just can't be. Miss Blake, there's a Mr. Goodwin to see your father. Oh, I'll see him. Thank you, Miss Blake. I'm Archie Goodwin. This is my fiancé, Mr. Wilbur Martin. Mr. Martin? How do you do? What is it you want, Mr. Goodwin? Is your father here, Miss Blake? Why, no. No, he isn't. What is your business, Mr. Goodwin? Why do you want to see Mr. Blake? As a matter of fact, I don't really want to see Mr. Blake because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. Just who are you? I'm a detective. Police? Private investigator with Nero Wolf. John Blake has disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We have called the police. Oh, what do you think has happened to my father? I think he's dead. Oh, dear. What, why do you think that? Yes. Just what do you know, Mr. Goodwin? Oh, Anita, I want to ask you a few questions. I think it's advisable... Mr. Blake. To... Yes? I, I thought you were done for. That is, no, I don't think I... Uh... This chap is a detective. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Blake, but curiosity got the better of me. I hope I haven't wrecked things. What are you talking about? You remember the agreement. What agreement? Mr. Goodwin, do you know who you're talking to? Why, yes, John Blake. Oh, no, Mr. Goodwin. This is my Uncle Hillary, my father's brother. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. John and Hillary were twins? Of course. Well, this news to me. I didn't know that. What did you know about him? Well, now that I look at him, now that I can recall his speech, there is a difference. And now, why do you think John Blake is dead? I've just come from police headquarters. You mean he's been murdered? No. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Oh. Are you sure? Poor father. Oh, I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and an overcoat were found on the East River docks near Pier 9. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. There was a will? Yes. Could you identify the hat and coat, Miss Blake? Well, yes, of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hanlon. Miss Blake, do you recognize this coat and hat? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. They, they were fathers. I... Oh, Wilbur. Suicide? I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. What about the will found in the pocket? Show them the will, Sergeant. Read it, Miss. You... You read it, Wilbur. Hmm. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marsha Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. Where did you get this? Notice the signature of the witness? Marsha Goodwin. You witnessed his signature? In Nero Wolfe's office. But Mr. Blake had his own attorneys. Nevertheless, he came to Mr. Wolfe to take care of the will. If we hadn't recognized him from his photos in the papers, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. Anita, is this your father's handwriting? Yes. Yes, it's his, all right. But this still isn't proof that he's dead, nor that he committed suicide. No corpus delecti. And the body may not be found for days. But this evidence we have here certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Goodwin. It's possible they could have... What were you going to say? Nothing. Miss Blake, in a way, I blame myself for your father's death. 
How do you mean? I had a sort of premonition. It's obvious now why he came to Nero Wolf. Is it? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But he made a will. Why did he draw this new one? Yes, that's what I don't understand. Well, I still am not convinced that he committed suicide. Mr. Blake, here is a letter he has to be delivered to you. Oh, well, now. Perhaps it will shed some light on the problem. What does it say, Uncle? <clears throat> Joe says, uh, hmm, Hillary, for 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia. She was rightfully yours. But I loved her, too, and I couldn't go on without her. I know you've despised us both, and I've, uh, pretended to despise you. I had to pretend, because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to marry a woman in Sydney. Marcia was innocent. I was to blame. Uh, when Marcia died last year and you wrote that you were coming back, I knew then that your resentment had faded, but I didn't answer you, and I've kept away from you because I couldn't face you. I've told you all this because things have happened, which you will learn soon enough, that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I uh, have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, Hilary, and I beg you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, Hilary. Hmm, well, this, uh, this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we'll just have to wait. Yes, for that and the body. Well, boss, up here in the conservatory a bit early, aren't you? How are the orchids? Well, it's a nice sunny morning. Even though it is around zero outside, the sun is fine for them. And behold, Archie. Huh? What is it? The dendrobium scorostel. The b- b- Yes, indeed. What about it? Showing two buds. Most encouraging. Indeed, indeed so. Boss, I can't take the steam heat here. Tell me, this painting of Marcia Blake, is it large? It hangs over the Blake mantle, about three by four feet. Find it most intriguing that John Blake should mention the painting in so short a will. And Hillary, does he seem to offer any suggestion on this problem? He has very little to say. Wilbur has definite ideas, and he's in there pitching all the time. He has a rather unpleasant way about him, though. You have talked with Inspector Kramer? I have. And asked Miss Anita and Hillary to meet you at the morgue to look at the body? Right. And I left Wilbur out of this gathering. This body is practically unidentifiable, huh? In Kramer's opinion, it is. After you're finished down there, I'd like to have a chat with this Wilbur Martin. Okay, but you'll get nothing out of him. I've tried. Archie, you're becoming so conceited. Soon I fear I'll have to... uh... Fire you. If it were summer, I would forthwith resign. Run along and close our coal chute behind you. Morning, Inspector Kramer. Up early. Yeah, Goodwin. I just love to come down to this morgue. This is Miss Anita Blake and her uncle Hillary Blake. How do you do? do? Good Good morning, Mr. Goodwin. I hope you don't object too much to my joining the proceedings. Oh, I know, Wilbur. I suppose it's all right. Please, Mr. Goodwin. What's happened? There's a body here. Rather badly bruised and cut and in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. I'll be all right. Well, I'd like to come along. Oh, yes, Wilbur, you must. Well, come on. This way. Say, Miss Blake. Oh. Now get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. Yes. Yes, that's Father. And you, Mr. Blake? Well, it's certainly hard to say. It looks as though it might be John. Was there no means of identification on the body? No jewelry or. Father never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here. Nothing in the pockets. Yes. That's Father's suit, all right. I know. Oh, why? Why did he do it? Come along now. That's all for today. (laughs) 
Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Wilbur Martin. Ah, yes. How do you do, Mr. Martin? Sit down. Thank you, sir. No, no, no. Take the red leather chair. That's right. So glad you could come. Archie, uh, be of us. Uh, tell me, Mr. Martin, you saw the body? I did. Whether it was John Blake or not, I'm not sure. But Anita feels positive enough. You are skeptical about the suicide theory, huh? Well, yes, I am. Are you trying to cast suspicion on someone else? No. He thinks he was murdered. I do. But not by you, of course. Certainly not. <laughs> but who would know that John came here, signed the will, and gave us the letter to his brother? He must have contemplated suicide, don't you think? Are you positive it was John Blake who signed the will? Hmm. How interesting. You think it was his brother Hillary who came here, posing as John, huh? It could have been. But the man was quite gray and had no Australian accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent for a short while and grayed his hair. And they were twins. So enlightening, Mr. Martin. Do go on. After he left you here, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river. And left his overcoat and hat on the wharf. And why would Hillary kill John? Well, I... Well, there may have been several reasons. Maybe because of Marsha. Well, uh, there's several reasons. Tell me, did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No, why should he? I don't know. <laughs> I merely asked. Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting. She identified the body. You still believe it's murder? Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You had best be careful, Wilbur. In trying to make a murder out of this, you might place yourself in a most unhappy position. I checked the letter and the will with papers at John's office, and the handwriting is identical, in my opinion. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Then how can you tell unless you had a bona fide sample of Hillary's writing? Hmm... I take it that you found a sample of Hillary's writing? Some letters from Hillary to John? Yes. I found a package of them. In John's desk at his home. That, Wilbur, is most encouraging. Here they are. Several of them tied together. Some written in 1928 and a couple in 1948. Now, we'll tell you something. We never thought John committed suicide either. You... You didn't? No. And before you go, Wilbur, write your name here on this pad... Very well. Thank you so much. I hope we shall see you tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised, Inspector Kramer, to see you out in such inclement weather. I like the cold spells. Sit in the red leather chair. Yeah, thanks. Good. Have your experts finished checking the will and the letter? Yep. But not all through with a package of Hillary's old letters that Wilbur found. What's the verdict? If this is forgery, it's the cleverest bit of forgery we've ever come across. My men say the will and the letter you received appear identical with the specimens from John's office. Indeed, the will and the letter then do seem to have been written by John Blake. Yes. But on the other hand, and this is unusual, by comparing this letter from John with a letter Hillary wrote from Australia in 1948, we found characteristics in both men's letters which were definitely similar. Then, Inspector, you feel that Hillary might have written the letter and signed the will. That it was Hillary who came to my office? It's a tough thing to prove, but I think that's being on the right track. Inspector, what about the rest of the package of letters I got from Wilbur Martin? They're still working on those down at headquarters. Uh, what about young Wilbur? Well, so far, can't see much in him to worry about, but it's a bit early. Archie. Phone out to the Blake Mansion and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing. And if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone before you get there. We can pick him up later. Okay. I'll let you know about the rest of Hillary's letters. Good. We won't phone out there until you're finished. And I'll call you as soon as possible. Archie, I want you to look into the affairs of the Plymouth Building and Loan Company. See what you can learn about the actual uh, stability of the company. Okay. Boss... Please put on your muffler and overcoat and open a window. A candle couldn't burn in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on my way. Anita. Anita. What is it, Wilbur? What's happened? I came out as soon as I heard. Well, what's happened? Speak up, man. You haven't heard? You don't know? No, what? Look. Look at these headlines. Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes. 
Wilbur, what does this mean? It means your father embezzled the funds of the company and he has gone to the wall. What? Yes, closed the doors. Oh, no, Wilbur, no, I can't believe such a I'm thing. I'm sorry, Anita, but there it is in black and white. Then this is the motive for John's suicide. Why? Why? Because he, well, he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to come up the shortage. I don't think he lost it. You don't? No. Oh, nonsense, he must have. Else why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, this is awful. Oh, please, please, Anita, you mustn't worry. I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Now, let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico until this blows over. You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her anyplace. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. You... Your father may have fleeced the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid the money, and your Uncle Hillary found the hiding place. And he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Hillary killed him. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why, this doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. Pack your things, Anita. I'll phone the airport for reservation. You can't leave at a time like this. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. I've just talked to that detective, Mr. Goodwin. He's on his way here. The police have uncovered everything. I know you killed John, and you have the money. Wilbur, you're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out of here. Get out. I won't leave. No one will leave till Goodwin comes. Ah, Archie. Come in, Miss Blake. Mr. Blake, Mr. Martin, glad you were all able to accept my invitation. You too, Inspector Kramer. Yeah, I know how glad you are I could be here, Wolf. Please be seated, folks. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? John Blake stole the money from the company, but Hillary found out about it and killed him. Mr. Wolf, this is utter nonsense. Mr. Blake, Inspector Kramer's handwriting experts have examined the will and the letter left with me. They have also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. Indeed. And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, having the same characteristics as the letter and the will you give me. You you mean you think that I signed the will and wrote the letter? Definitely. Ridiculous. But there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Archie, where is that painting? Did you bring it? It's here. Uh, bring it in here, Sergeant. Uh, just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. What are you doing to it? Tearing off the paper backing of the picture. Yes, and there you are. There's the reason for the whole thing. Bonds. Pasted in the back. Thousands of dollars in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He killed John for all this. He had a need order the picture to be credited for shipping. I did no such thing. Nevertheless, you didn't kill John Blake. Certainly he did. Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John here in America. What are the dates? September and November 1948. Those were supposedly Hillary's most recent letters to John. And look at these letters, June and July 1928. Notice any difference? All are signed by Hillary, but the ones dated 1928 are not at all like the ones written in 1948. Not the least similarity. The ones dated 1928 were written by Hillary. But those dated 1948 were written by John. By John? How do you mean? Carry on, Inspector. You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? Oh, but how And can you... you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. What? I don't understand. Mr. Wolf. Wilbur, you yourself unearthed the old 1928 letters, rarely written by Hillary from Australia. The recent letters are not in the same handwriting. They were poorly forged by John in 1948. Furthermore, we checked with Australia and learned that Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. And this man here is really John Blake posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Anita, it just doesn't seem possible. Anita knew all about it, and they might have gotten away with it if they hadn't come to us, Archie. What a fantastic plan. I'm giving you back your thousand dollars, Mr. Blake, but I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Thank you so much, Inspector Kramer, for dropping in. Well, boss, that was a clever bit of deduction. You really think so, Archie? It was quite a blunder for so clever a man as John Blake. Why did he make the mistake of coming to us? There are many holes in the plans of the criminal mind. He must have forgotten about the 1928 letters or he would have destroyed them. And he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. And I thought he was a dope, too. But he was half right. He really slipped up on the body in the morgue. 
Inspector Gramer was most kind to cooperate with us in that little act. Anita was too eager to identify the first body she saw. And the painting. You sense there was more importance attached to it than the fact that it was a work of art. True. Some beer, please, Archie. Coming up, boss? Now, that brings me to an unpleasant subject. What's that? You were talking about resigning. Are you still in that frame of mind? Resigning? When did I say anything like that? Then you're going to be content with conditions as they are? Why, of course. What are you saying? And you don't mind it a bit as long as this dreadful weather continues? Well, not at all. I... Don't mind what? Going in and out of the house through the coal chute. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout and produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In tonight's cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Victor Rodman, Louise Arthur, Hal Gerard, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Disappearing Diamonds. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Thirteen. Box thirteen. Box thirteen. Box thirteen. He leaned over the shining halo of her blonde hair, reflected in the soft glow of the new moon. Oh, no, 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 not that. Holiday, my boy, why did you ever decide to write fiction for a living? You know, you could have gone into something interesting, like being a truck driver, with the open road in front of you and a motorcycle cop in back. Hey, Susie, where have you been? Don't you remember, Mr. Holiday? I went down to Star Times' office. Oh. Oh, so you did. Tell me, what's new in Box 13? <laughs> Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, what now, Mr. Holliday? What's new in Box 13? Yesterday, a man wanted to sell me a horse for $1,000 and a ranch to go around the horse for 25 times that much. The day before, my ad for adventure brought me a reply from a golf professional who simply wanted to drive golf balls off the tip of my nose. Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, was that Susie? I said that when a nice young man like you runs an ad, he should get a whole box full of answers. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. He should get bushel baskets full. Well, thanks again. The, the place should be loaded with letters. All right, all right. Now, what did I get? One postcard. And from a kid at that. A kid? You mean a child? Sure, uh-huh. Here, let me see it. A postcard from a youngster. It's probably a gag. Some small girl selling ten-cent packages of flower seeds for 50 cents. 
sell 5,000 packages, and she gets absolutely free a St. Bernard dog. <laughs> well, let's see what really is on this postcard. Hmm. I wrote to you, Kara Box 13, because I thought you wanted it that way. I got to see you right away on a very important matter. I am still doing business at the old stand. Signed, Johnny Moran. Johnny Moran? Why, he's a little boy who sells newspapers on the corner. Hey, Susie, get Johnny Moran up here right away. Oh, I can't do that, Mr. Holliday. Why can't you do it? Because he's here already. Oh, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Johnny, how are you, my boy? Why didn't you just come up and see me instead of writing a postcard first? Well, I like to do things sort of business-like. Besides, it was fun to answer an ad for Adventure Wanted. Would you really do anything, Mr. Holliday? Sit down, Johnny. Tell me what your trouble is. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to see you alone. Sort of private-like. Oh, that uh, man-to-man stuff, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, where would you like to talk? Well, I thought maybe you'd come down to the corner with me. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. A drink? You interest me strangely, Johnny. Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, Susie, you'll excuse us, won't you? Well, I don't know. You better be careful, Mr. Holliday. Careful? I don't want Johnny teaching you bad habits. Johnny Moran is a very nice boy. Can't be more than 12, but he certainly seems to know his way around. Yes, Holliday, if you were ordering a small boy, this is just the model you would choose. But this drinking business... I'm worried about you, Mr. Holliday. You sure that lemon coke is enough? Lemon cokes are always enough for me, Johnny. Especially when I spike them with an ice cube. Say, how's your banana split? Well, this one's got a little too much chocolate. I like the last one better. Better finish it, my boy. You want to talk business, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you might have read about it in the newspapers. Of course, you could have missed it. It was way back on page five. I was on page five. Well, here. I got a clip in the story. Read it. Police announced they've recovered a portion of the jewelry stolen in last Tuesday's raid on Maury Jewelry Company. Held under suspicion of grand theft is John Moran. John Moran. Johnny, that's your father. Yes, and he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. I know he didn't. Just a second. A part of the loot was found in Moran's apartment. I don't care what they put in the newspapers, Mr. Holliday. He didn't do it. That's why I came to see you. Oh, uh, what about your mother, Johnny? Oh, she died when I was a baby. Pop and I lived together. But he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. Only they won't believe me. Oh, you've been down to the police? Sure, I went there right away. I even offered them my 18 bucks for bail. You know what? What? The old D.A. just patted me on the head and told me to go home. Mm. I bet you could go down and talk to that district attorney and make him let my father out. You can do anything. Well, not quite anything, Johnny. Yeah, but this would be easy for a guy like you. Besides, you're not afraid of anything. Not even a policeman. Well, that's very flattering, Johnny, but I don't know what I can do. Oh, you'll think of something, Mr. Holliday. You're a writer. You're smart. Oh, but listen, my boy, I... I bet you get my father out of jail in time for dinner. Okay, Holiday. The boy says you can get his father out of jail in time for dinner. But what day? The story in the paper makes it look like they caught John Moran cold. You don't find stolen jewelry in a man's apartment if he didn't do the stealing. But there's a small boy waiting. Waiting with all the faith in the world. So, Holiday, do something. The district attorney will see you now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, thanks. Holiday, haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I know. I've been pretty busy. Huh, busy, huh? Well, then what brings a promising young author down to City Hall? Because he's a promising young author who made a promise. And I hope he didn't make a mistake. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? About a man named John Moran. You've got him locked up in your nice new jail. Yes. And from what we've got on him, he's going to stay there for a while. His son thinks Moran is innocent, Clark. Yeah. I feel sorry for that boy. He came down and talked to me, but what could I do for him? You've got the goods on Moran, then? Absolutely. The police found some of the stolen stuff in his apartment. Well, what's Moran's story? 
A woman who works in the same building with Moran asked him to stop in at the jewelry store and pick up her watch. While he was there, the stick-up artist walked in and held up the place. And that makes Moran guilty? Don't be in a hurry. The stick-up artist used him as a shield when he beat it. Moran claims the man forced him to drive the getaway car out into the country. Well, that still doesn't make him guilty. I think you've got the wrong person. This is where Moran's story went wrong. He walked into police headquarters and told it, but it sounded too good to be true. They detained him while a detective went over and searched his apartment. Oh? The detective found part of the loot. Moran couldn't explain where it came from. Well, to our office, it looks like he pulled a clever gag. We think he's in with a holdup man. What about the woman, the one who sent Moran after the watch? Grace Willard? We don't have a thing on her. She's in the clear. I see. So, Holiday, you better forget about playing Don Quixote. Day of fighting windmills is over. Go home. Forget about Johnny Moran. Sure, Holiday, just forget all about John Moran. Write the need of the story and take it out of the typewriter. But how are you going to write the dialogue for a man who has to tell a small boy that his father hasn't got a chance? And describe the look in that boy's eyes. I don't care what that old district attorney said. My father isn't a crook. And your father should have been able to explain the stolen jewelry they found at your place. I'll bet he could, too. They just wouldn't listen to him. Oh, now, Johnny, if your father's innocent, they'll let him go. So you won't help me either. But I'm trying, my boy. What else can I do? Oh, nothing, I guess. See you later, Mr. Holiday. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm kind of busy right now. i got to earn a lot of dough, I guess. Johnny. Because lawyers come pretty expensive, I heard. Oh, look, kid. You better go home, Mr. Holiday. I should have handled it personally in the first place. Small boys have that knack, don't they? They can just vanish into thin air when they want to. You're quite a character, Holiday. Go home and write this on your typewriter. Write about the small boy who wanted you to get his father out of jail. And you didn't quite make the grade. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Johnny. I'm up at the place where we live. Yeah, Johnny. There's something funny going on. What are you talking about? I'm afraid to go into our place. There's a man in there. Do you know him? <clears throat> he's going through the place, though. And he's looking for something. Johnny, listen. Run outside, find a policeman. I'll be right over. I gotta get out of here. Johnny, do what I said. He just walked out the door. He saw me. Get over to Moran's place fast, Holiday. You've got no time for fooling. <laughs> Not outside. Maybe he's upstairs. Oh, Johnny. Johnny. Where could that boy have gone to? Grace Willard. The woman who sent Moran up to the watch. If she knows Moran, she knows his boy. Yes? Oh, Miss Willard? Yes. Well, I'm Dan Holliday. Would you know where little Johnny Moran is? Come in. Now, what's this about Johnny? Well, he phoned me a few minutes ago from his place. There was a man going through it. He saw Johnny making the call. Johnny's disappeared? Yes. You phoned the police? Do you think he's been hurt? Well, the police knew nothing about it. I don't know what happened to the boy. That's why I came over here. I figured that if you knew his father, you knew Johnny, you know. Poor Mr. Moran. I feel so badly about him. You know, if I hadn't asked him to get my watch, this never would have happened. But that doesn't make it your fault, Miss Phillips. Oh, I feel terrible about it just the same. And now... Johnny disappearing. He hasn't been here at all? No. Let me think of it. Oh, um, by the way, I was just having some coffee. Would you care to join me? Grace Willard is a very nice person. Really worried about the boy. Perhaps you'll come back with an idea. Here's your coffee, Mr. Holliday. Now we're talking. Well, thanks. Uh, did Johnny recognize the man? No, he didn't have time to say. Well, perhaps he found a policeman on the street. He might have gone back to the house. Well, maybe I ought to call back. Johnny's a cute little fellow. Johnny has a father who's in jail. Johnny's quite concerned about his father and would like to set him free. Grace Willard is stalling holiday. Waiting for something. I don't know if Johnny will get his wish or not. You see, his father looks very guilty to the police. Holiday, you idiot. That coffee was doped. 
The oldest gag in the world and you swallowed it. You look sleepy, Mr. Holliday. Are you feeling all right? She looks like a reflection in one of those amusement park mirrors. She's, she's long and skinny. No. No, she's short, short and fat. Holiday. Holiday, get up on How your you feet. How do you feel, Mr. Holiday? Are you all right? Anson. Get on your feet, I said. Walk, Holiday. Walk. Walk this thing off before it's too late. You look very tired, Mr. Holiday. Let me get you a pillow. Come on. Come on, Holiday. One big How do you effort. feel, Mr. Holiday? I I I can't can't make it. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, take it easy, Holliday. Take it easy. Turn slowly now. Maybe your head still is connected to the top of your neck. That's better. Better? Hmm. What am I saying? Where am I? An alley. Oh, fine. Dan Holliday, author found lying in an alley. Between yesterday's newspapers and tomorrow's trash. What you need right this minute is a quick change, a fast bath, and a little chat with a district attorney. I've got a man going up to the Willard woman's place right this minute, Holliday. Thanks, Clark. This ties her up with the Moran case. Sure, or else why would she give me knockout drops and have me dumped in an alley? I'll bet anything she's disappeared. But why just knock you out? Why not dispose of you permanently? I don't know, unless she was trying to kill time. Enough time to get something done. Well, you can't do anything now. If she's disappeared, she won't stay lost for long. My men will bring her in. Uh, don't let her give him any coffee. She'll be out again. Uh, pardon me. District Attorney's always Clark speaking. Yes? Where? When? How is he? Thanks. I'll see you later, Clark. I want to go over and see Johnny Moran. I don't think you'll find him at home, Holiday. Why not? That was the hospital who just called. Johnny Moran was brought in a while ago. The victim of a hit-and-run driver. <laughs> On top of that phone call about Johnny Moran is another one. Grace Willard checked out of the Wharton Hotel an hour ago. So, Mr. Holliday, they got you out of the way long enough to get to little Johnny. A small boy in a hospital. Me with an aching head and an aching feeling that something is very, very wrong. I think this is it, room 809. Johnny? Oh, Mr. Holliday. How do you feel, kid? Kind of banged up. Yeah, I know. The nurse said you weren't to do too much talking. So, just let me ask a couple of questions. It wasn't an accident, Mr. Holliday. He did it on purpose. You sure about that, Johnny? Yeah. I was walking down a side street. He had to swing way over to the wrong side to hit me. Johnny... Did he look like the same man who was in your place? I didn't get a good look at him. He was bent down, way behind the wheel. Well, could you give me just a hint? Was he tall, short, thin, fat? All I know is... Yes? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny passed out and won't be permitted to talk for a while. Well, that puts it up to you, Holiday. Come on, you're an author. 
You write hundreds of situations like this one. Think. The boarding house where Johnny lives. Maybe the landlady saw the man. I certainly hope so. Johnny Moran? Yes, I saw him come home, but it was quite some time ago. Oh, did you see him leave? Yes, he went upstairs. I heard him on the telephone, then he came running down. Who was the man chasing him? Chasing him? There was no one chasing him. Are you sure of that? Well, of course I've been here all the time. Oh, poor little fella. Don't know what's going to happen to him, what with his father and all. This doesn't make sense. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. You see, Johnny called me, told me there was a strange man in his place. The man saw him, hung up the phone and disappeared. But I saw no man. Are you sure? <laughs> Only Joe Coakley, but he's one of my rumors. That is, he was. Was? When did he move? Oh, today, just after Johnny left. Was he upstairs while Johnny was there? Why, well, yes. Yes, he was. Uh, was he a friend of John Moran's? Oh, no, no, he never spoke to anyone. Stayed in his room all day and went out at night. Oh, one of those night flyers, huh? Uh, could I see the room he occupied? <laughs> this is Coakley's room, but it's empty. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're on the wrong track. Track? Or are you? A stub from a dance hall ticket. I'd better talk to Johnny about this. Johnny, the man who came out of your room, was he about my height? Did he have grayish hair? Did he wear a brown suit? Yeah. Yeah, that's the man, Mr. Holiday. How come you never saw him before? He lived right across the hall from you. That guy? He only went out at night after I was in bed. Oh? Well, I'll see you later, Johnny. Hey, where are you going? Tonight I'm going dancing. This is a very nice place, Holiday. Admission 60 cents, which includes an evening of dancing. And from the looks of the customers, they're trying to get their money's worth. You like to dance, fella? Uh, who, me? Hey, you're not twins, are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a very bad dancer. Oh, you let me be the judge of that. Come on, kid. You look good to me. Oh, wait a second. Say, isn't that Joe Coakley over there? Oh, you're not Joe? Yeah, and, uh, and the girl with him. That's his girlfriend, Grace Willard. Oh, thanks. I'll see you later. Hey, where are you going? This is it, Holiday. Only what are you going to do? They're leaving, and if you stop to make a phone call, you'll lose them. And I wouldn't like to lose that man. He's the one who hits small boys with big automobiles. They're going into the department house. This begins to look like the final chapter. Now to make a fast telephone call to an old friend, then better to get to the payoff. It's a very nice door. You can hear quite distinctly through it. Well, Holiday, here's where you cease to be a wallflower and become the life of the party. Go! No. Holiday! Put up your hands, fella. Sure. Sure. Close that door, Grace. Well, here we are. Aren't we? Can you reply, Miss Joe? What are we going to do? You finish packing that junk, we'll figure out something. We can't. I didn't stay alive. Finish the packing, I said. Too bad I didn't use poison in that coffee I gave him. Quiet. I uh, noticed you were packing. Going away someplace? What do you think? And get away from that bag, Holiday. Oh, that's the stuff that was stolen from the store, huh? None of your business. Oh, uh, going away together? You and Miss Willie? Maybe. Mm-hmm. You pull that, go down and pick up my watch routine in a lot of cities, huh, Joe? Make him be quiet, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, who was the girl who worked with you before you met Grace? You know, the one who lived in Cleveland, or was it Chicago? I always forget. Come on, Joe, what happened Shut to up, her? you. What happened to her, Joe? Or the girl before? How do, How do you know there was another girl, Holiday? Well, Miss Willard, you don't think you're the only one, do you? You're crazy. Yeah? 
Ask him where he was last night. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace. He wasn't with you. Know where he was? How do you know he wasn't with me? The stub of a dance hall ticket I found in the other room. It calls for only one admission. You shut up, I said. Just a minute, Joe. Were you down there last night? Were you dancing with that blonde again? Suppose I was. So what? You've got a lot of nerve. You have me set up this whole deal. Have me find John Moran to play sucker for us. Have me frame the business of picking up my watch. I time it out perfect for you. What do you do? You go dancing with a blonde. Grace, be quiet. This fellow's up to something. Me? Now, what would I be up to? What about that other girl he talked about? What happened to her, Joe? Why don't you tell her, Joe? Cut it out, will you? Did she plant stolen jewelry in a sucker's room like I did to Moran? Grace, listen. Yeah. I'm listening. Go on, explain. Hey, Holiday, where are you going? Just opening the door. You see, I'd like the district attorney to hear the rest of your explanation, too. <laughs> chapter to a story I was afraid might have an unhappy end. But Johnny Moran's father is free. The district attorney has Grace Willard, Joe Coakley, and the stolen jewelry. And Johnny? Hmm. Johnny is out of the hospital. Mr. Holliday. Uh, uh, what did you say, Johnny? I said you might have been killed going up to the apartment like that. No, I was safe for the DA just outside the door. Gosh, and you figured it all out by yourself. No, you helped, too, when you telephoned me. And I hate to mention this, kid, but uh, did you bring the $18 with you? Sure I did. I pay off, you know. Here. Oh, uh, thanks, kid. I, I was just a little worried. I was going to pay before Mr. Holiday, but I didn't think he needed money that bad. I uh, needed it to put with this check. Uh, here. There was a $500 reward for recovering the jewelry, and it's going to a bank account for you. $500? Gee... Gosh, I guess I'm rich. Johnny, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you out and buy you a drink. How about an idiot's delight? Uh, a what? Idiot's delight. It's got a pint of ice cream, three bananas, some oranges, and seven flavors. Well, Johnny, I... I don't know. I... M Mr. Holliday, I just heard that Johnny got out of the... Oh, there you are, Johnny. How do you feel? I feel swell, Susie. I just invited Mr. Holiday out to have a drink. Well, he can't go out, Johnny. He's got some very important work to do. Oh, well, gee whiz. Thanks a lot, Susie. Thanks? What are you thanking me for? You don't know it, but you've just saved me from a horrible fate. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, box 13, box 13, box 13. He looked deeply into... Her eyes, which reflected his mood like twin lakes of azure blue. Azure blue. Why does a woman always have to have azure eyes? Why couldn't they be fire engine red? Huh. As his muscular arms tightened around her fragile... Susie. Oh, Mr. Holliday, I'm not fragile, but I'm sure scared. Somebody's been following me. 
With those legs? Why not? I, I was petrified, afraid to look back even. His footsteps kept going click, cluck, click, cluck. Real sinister like. Oh, I bet that's him now. Mr. Click Cluck? Oh, Mr. Holiday, he followed me all the way from Box 13. And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Well, this is a brand new twist. Besides a message from Box 13, Susie has brought a mysterious caller. Somebody who wants in, but definitely. Don't answer it, Mr. Holliday. Now, now, Susie. You didn't see this person, huh? No, I, I just felt him following me like a, uh, like a phantom. Except his heels went click, cluck, click, cluck. Oh. That doesn't sound so dangerous. Let's take a chance. Come in. Silly me. I ought to be ashamed for being such a fraidy cat. Look who it is. Well, Susie, who is it? I don't know. Who are you, mister? My name is George Flitt. I'm a, a detective. And you're Dan Holliday, the writer. It's, it's on the door. A detective, huh? <laughs> Why, well, isn't any bigger than me. But I have nerves of steel and the heart of a lion. Oh, oh, I see. And what brings you here, Mr. Flitt? Well, uh, uh, nerves of steel, heart of a lion. <laughs> that was no fair, girl. You took me by surprise. Susie. Now, Mr. Flitt. Why don't you open the envelope I put in box 13? Here it is, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Open it. I'm all goose lumps. Okay. Well, what do you know? Why, there's nothing written on the paper. Hmm. How about that, Flint? See how clever I am? I put that envelope in box 13 as bait. As bait? Yes. I knew it would lead me to the person who put the ad in the Star Times, Adventure Wanted. Will go any place and do anything. Very clever, Mr. Flint. Oh, what made your footsteps go click, cluck, click, cluck? <laughs> oh, that. I lost the metal cleat off of one of my heels. Oh. Well, now that you've discovered me, Mr. Flitt, what? Mr. Holliday, I'd say you're just the man for the job. Job? Something exciting, you hope, huh, Mr. Holliday? I'd handle it myself, only I'm so tiny. Besides, I've done mostly divorce work. <laughs> just the right height for keyholes. But uh, about the job? Well, I'm coming to that. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Bolton sent me $50 just to attend the party tonight. Fifty dollars. I should have been a detective. Oh, you can be. I'll split with you if you'll go to the affair in my place as me. I got the money. What's the catch? Oh, there's really no catch. Uh, only thing Mr. Bolton said was there might be a little uh, bloodshed. Well, well, well. This holiday is the wackiest situation yet from good old Box 13. Yes, Holiday, you must be hard up for story ideas. Hard up for brains, too. Otherwise, why are you riding with George Flitt, detective, in his hot rod jalopy? Destination, bloodshed. And you've never met this Bolton who's having the party? No, but he phoned and explained that the party is going to be at his nephew's place, at Kenneth Bolton. Kenneth, huh? Uh, what about the bloodshed? Well, as I understand it, Kenneth's father, that is, uh, Gilbert Bolton's brother, committed suicide not so long ago. Oh. Uh -huh. Gilbert said the boy is suffering from neurasthenia, I, I think he said. Psychoneurotic, huh? Uh, yes. On account of the way his father died, uh, Gilbert's afraid the boy may take his own life tonight. Why tonight, especially? Well, it seems that Kenneth drinks a lot at these parties and gets depressed. And my job is... To see that he doesn't commit suicide tonight. I've looked forward to more pleasant evenings. I, I think that's the place up ahead with all the lights on. Yeah, that's the address you mentioned. 
Mm, they must be about 15 miles from town. Uh, 14 and 7 tenths by my speedometer. Well, Flit, I may as well take off. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll sit here in my car and listen to the radio, sort of keep my eye on things from the outside. Good idea. See you later, then. Here we go again, Holiday. Oops, the name's George Flip, detective. Remember? Beyond this door, who knows? But it's a beautiful house. A beautiful night. And a beautiful girl. Good evening. Oh, good evening. I'm looking for Mr. Gilbert Bolton. Would you come in? And you are? Uh, George Flip. You say you are George Flip? That's right. I'm Rita Martin. How do you do? Now, let's go in and find Gilbert Bolton, Mr. Flett. Oh, Holiday, here's a jungle cat. A vampire right of Terry and the pirates. That jet black hair, those heavy lidded eyes. That glistening crimson mouth. And something else. Yes, heavy, clawing, sensuous. A perfume such as you've never known before. That's something to remember this Rita Martin by. Mm hmm. Oh, there you are. Oh, Gilbert. Yes, Rita. Gilbert Bolden, this is George Flitt. George. How do you do, Mr. Flitt? Mr. Bolton? If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll see you all a bit later. So, you're George Flitt, the detective. Yes, that's right. Your voice seemed, well, different over the phone. Well, you know, detectives, many disguises, many voices. <laughs> Got to keep them confused, you know. Somehow I pictured you differently. Oh? Well, no matter. You know why you're here. Yes, to keep my eye on your nephew, Kenneth Fulton. More than that, to keep him from chilling himself. <laughs> This man looks at you, Holiday. So cool, so calculating, with piercing eyes that thud against the back of your skull. He could be one of two men a man of distinction or a man of extinction. Okay, Mr. Bolton, I'll keep your nephew alive. That's your job. But what makes you think the boy wants to commit suicide? Well, since his father, my brother, took his life, Kenneth has been extremely upset. It's only natural, Mr. Bolton. I know, but I've heard Kenneth threaten suicide, and it's got me worried. Anyone else heard him? Yes, Miss Martin. Uh, anyone else? What do you mean, anyone else? I just wondered if anyone else had heard him make these threats. I really wouldn't know. It's enough that Rita and I know about it. How does Rita figure in this picture? Aren't you being a bit presumptuous, Mr. Flitt? A detective likes to know these things. Miss Martin is an old friend of the family. Oh, there's Kenneth now. I'll bring him over. <coughs> Just as Gilbert Fulton passed me, there was something familiar about him. What was it? Who was it? Come on, think, Holiday. It may be an important clue. But here they come. The man of extinction and a typical boy from Princeton or Yale or Harvard. George Flitt, my nephew, Kenneth Bolton. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Enjoying yourself, Mr. Flitt? Very much. How about you? Oh, so-so. These parties get to be a bore, you know. Kenneth hasn't been quite himself since the tragedy. Must you always bring that up, Uncle? But you know you've been terribly upset, Kenneth. So I've been upset. Why talk about it? Oh, uh, Mr. Flett. Yes? Will you come with me for a moment? Oh, I sure. It's so close in here that I thought a breath of air. That suits me. In the garden. The garden it is. Hmm. Nice. A moon, too. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely night. Ah, the scent of those flowers. Exquisite, isn't it? Uh huh. But not to compare with your perfume. You noticed it? Yes, it was so unusual. It's called Whispering Gown. Whispering Gown? Mm, I like the name. Say. Yeah? I know where they got that name. Oh? From Cerno de Bergerac. The passage where he describes Roxanne. Across my life, one whispering silken gown. I was lovely. 
Lovely. You're quite literary, aren't you, Mr. Blake? Well, yes and no. Just what do you do? Gilbert Bolton didn't tell you. No. No, but let's sit on this bench and you tell me all about yourself. As you come close to her, you get another whiff of... And suddenly you've got it. That's what bothered you about Gilbert Bolton. Her perfume rubbed off on him. It is an old friend of the family. She's young and a close friend of Gilbert Bolton's. She's brought you out here for a reason. Well, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, I sure, but uh, just a minute. I want to borrow some cigarettes. I've got plenty of cigarettes. Oh, I'll be right back. Something about this whole setup is as phony as a china egg. And as the crooks in your story say, you better case the joint before you go inside. There. There's the window. Just pull the bushes back. Let's take a gander. Well, everything looks on the up and up. Kenneth with a drink on the table beside him, and there's his uncle coming up. Hmm. He said another full drink right beside Kenneth. Hey, what else is he doing? You'd better get in there, Holiday, and fast. Mind if I, I join you, gentlemen? Well, not at all, not at all. You appeared quite uh, suddenly. Care for a drink, Mr. Cliff? Here, I haven't touched this. No, no, let me fix Mr. Flit a fresh drink. I think I'll just have one of these hors d'oeuvres. Here, watch it, my drink. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Flit, you... you awkward idiot. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Uncle. Accidents will happen. I didn't really feel like another drink. It was your idea, remember? Well, Mr. Flit, were you able to borrow some cigarettes? I was ambushed by hors d'oeuvres. Glad you're here, Rita. I have a proposal to make. Yes? What say we all run up to my penthouse for a while? Oh, sounds good. What do you say, Mr. Flynn? Fine. I think a change of scenery would be nice. Well, you'll enjoy the view overlooking Green Hill Park from the penthouse, Mr. Flynn. Oh, good. What's the address? Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Flit. Rita, Kenneth, and myself will go ahead in my car. Then you can follow us in yours. Well, maybe I'd better go with Mr. Flit. Keep him in company. No, I'd like you with me, Kenneth. There's something I uh, want to discuss with you. Important. Well, per- perhaps I should have the address in case I lose you. you that know, but... won't be necessary. Uh, just follow me. Of course, Holiday, you could be wrong, but it looks like Gilbert Bolton isn't too anxious to have you find his penthouse. Uh, but you're a suspicious lad, Holiday. You've created so many diabolical characters for so many fiendish plots. Maybe you, maybe you've become a little touched. Time's a waste on holiday. Get to a phone. Huh. There it is, end of the hallway. Now, if Mac's on duty in the morgue of the Star Times, we'll ask a few questions. Star Times reference room. Hello, Mac. This is Dan Holiday. Ah, oh, Danny. What can I do you for? Say, you got anything on the Bolton suicide? Just filed those clips away yesterday. And even if this is a clips joint, I won't charge you a penny. <laughs> Clips joint. You get it, Dan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I get it. What about Bolton? Poison himself. Left all his dough to his son. Name of Kenneth. Anything else? Well, there was something about Bolton's brother, uh, Gilbert. He sort of taken over and helping the boy. It was pretty broke up. Hey, Dan. Hey, did you hang up? No, but someone did. Someone was listening on another extension. <laughs> Hey, this is the fastest hot rod I've ever driven. We're keeping right up with the Bolton. And he's doing 70. <laughs> Wait until you shift into high gear. Uh, where are we going? To a pot house, I hope. Gilbert Bolton's. Hmm. Uh, what happened at the party? Oh, Rita Martin tried to get me into the garden, and I got suspicious. Trying to keep you away from your job, wasn't she? Yeah, so I rushed back into the house, stopping to case the joint through a window. Case the joint? <laughs> a detective talk. Yeah, then I got into trouble with Bolton. Well, how? By knocking a drink from his nephew's hand. Huh? Uh, what did the uncle do? He got insulting. Then all of a sudden he suggested going to his penthouse. Watch it, watch it. He, he's slowing down. Yeah, I wonder what his idea is. Oh, he's just slowing down for that train. But he only slowed down for a second. Look at him go. I know what he's doing. He's trying to beat that train to the crossing. He's trying to lose us. Step on the gas. Step on the gas, Mr. Holiday. Okay. 
Friday. Are we going to make it? He made it, but I don't know about us. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Shave, I'll see my barber. Yeah, me too. Josh, Mr. Holiday, I thought I could handle this hot rod, but the way you whipped her off the road just short of those tracks, I... Not a scratch on her. Lucky us. Uh, that train must be a mile long. By the time it passes, Bolton can be in Alaska. What's the address of this penthouse? You're asking me. All I know is it overlooks Green Hill Park. Our next stop. <laughs> George Greenhill Park. <laughs> I bet all these buildings have print houses. We'll try them all until we hit the right one. I'll go around this side of the park. Okay, and I'll try the buildings around the other side. Bolton's got to be in one. Do you have a Mr. Bolton in your penthouse? No one here by that name. A Bolton in the penthouse? No, but uh, we have a Botsford in the basement. Why, yes, Mr. Gilbert Bolton came in a short time ago. Hello? No, with a lady and gentleman. Want to go up? Oh, please. Did Mr. Bolton say anything about expecting more guests? No, sir. Do me a favor. If a little fellow with a squeaky voice shows up asking for Bolton, tell him I'm here, will you? Dan Holliday. Yes, sir. Oh, here you are. Thank you, sir. Your floor, sir. Uh, that's the penthouse door over there. Right. I've got a sneaking hunch I won't be welcome. Flip, how did you get up here? You, uh, you didn't expect me? Oh, yes, yes, of course, but uh, you've earned your money. You can, well, you can go home now. I'm sorry, Miss Maud, but Mr. Bolton hired me. It's up to him to fire me. But he's not here. He and Kenneth both went out. May I come in and wait? No. Goodbye. Now what? Now what does the intrepid hero of my stories do? Hmm. He looks for another door. Like that one. He tries it. It's open. It leads into a hallway. And there's yet another door. The service entrance to Bolton's penthouse. And ten to one, it's locked, bolted, and barred. Maybe even nailed shut. Here's some gambler holiday. Offer ten to one and lose. The door's open. Well, here we go again. Quiet holiday. Ah, there's a door leading to the terrace and voices. I'll get your ear up, Holiday. But don't let them see you. Don't you think it's a little chilly out here, Uncle? Let's go inside. Chilly, Kenneth? I'm really very comfortable. Here's the view I was telling you about, Kenneth. Better lean over the rail a bit to see around that turret. Oh, don't push against me, Uncle. That's a ten-story drop. Now, look over there, Kenneth. Uncle Gill! Kenneth, let's get away from that rail! Oh, Flip, you don't have to throw me back. Better than having your uncle throw you forward. What's the meaning of this outrage? How did you get in here anyway? I'm going to call the police. Fine, and save me the trouble. Look, Kenneth, I was hired to keep you from committing suicide. Suicide? Who, me? Yeah, but instead I'm keeping you from being murdered. Feel in your coat pocket. They ignore him, Kenneth. He doesn't know what he's talking about. A bottle? It's marked poison. Yeah, I saw your uncle plant it in your pocket through the garden window. He wanted to make it look like you poisoned that drink I knocked from your hand. Stop right there, Holiday. This isn't a cap pistol. You too, Kenneth. Don't move. Well, you must be crazy, Uncle Gil. And you knew I was Dan Holiday all along, huh? Of course. 
I've seen your picture in the book review pages. And I caught you a telephone conversation at the Star Times. On the extension. You get around. I can't believe this. You, you, my uncle. What's the play now, Bolton? Well, first I walk over to Kenneth and knock him out with his gun. Nope. Don't move, Holiday. I've still got you covered. Oh? And now that you've knocked out your nephew, what's your next move? Mr. Holiday, before I heave him over the rail to make it look like suicide, I'm going to shoot you. Oh, why? Then I'll wipe my fingerprints off this gun and press my nephew's hand around the butt. Hmm. His fingerprints on the gun will prove he shot me, huh? But what about a motive? Very simple. You tried to stop him from jumping off the terrace. And you're supposed to invent plots, Mr. Holliday. But they'll trace the gun to you, Bowen. Oh, no. It's Kenneth's gun. I took it from his room. And you wanted a detective on hand to throw off suspicion? Yes, Mr. Holliday. Who'd suspect Gilbert of murder when he'd hired a detective to protect Kenneth? But why? Why do you want to kill your nephew? Let's say I borrowed quite a large sum I can't make good. Oh. Embezzlement, huh? And you need Kenneth's inheritance to keep out of jail. Wouldn't he lend you the money? Not the amount we need. We? Obviously. So, we're taking it all. Clever, eh, Holiday? You're killing me. You're so right. Get rid of whoever it is, Rita. That doesn't help, Holiday. Forget about writing the great American novel. No room in a coffin for typing. I tell you, you really can't. I'm trying to finish. I know. 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 I now, Mr. Gilbert Bolton, you know how your nephew feels. Well, I know how it feels to be on the right end of this Smith & Wesson. You knocked him out. What are you going to do? Do? Well, since the party's getting dull, let's invite a few more boys. Say, from headquarters. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Come in. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Hello, Susie. Ah, Mr. George Flitt, detective. How's the arm, Mr. Flitt? Oh, it's uh, healing up fine. One of the bullets just grazed me. You know, I bled quite a lot. Say, wasn't that awful, them trying to kill that boy? And he really wasn't psycho whatchamacallit at all. Uh, Bolton cooked that up to support the suicide story. Oh. What's going to happen to them, Mr. Holliday? Well, they've got Bolton for embezzlement and attempted murder. They're holding Rita as his accomplice. And she was such a beautiful girl and so sweet, too. Yes, George, you can say that again. H how's the rod hot these days, Mr. Flint? Hot rod, Susie. Hot rod, rod hot, red hot. Oh, how is it anyway? Red hot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's fine. And Mr. Holliday, hmm? even if I did run away from that gun, I really do have the heart of a lion. But of course, George. Only thing is, <laughs> it's a scaredy cat lion. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. 
and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager, with an original story by Larry Kraft. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Oh. But Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. It has the odor of Christmas night. Or, uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything... What I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridle path. Signed, Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. Well, take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. Anonymous note. A rendezvous in the park at night. Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was writing. At least it's got a good start. The question is, what's the ending? Well, this is the park and the clock says ten. There's the bench at the end of the bridle path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep, nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Oh, I'm sorry. The Sandman came and I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. Well, aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? <laughs> yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. Oh, I like you a lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. Just happened, I guess. What's your name? Janie. I mean, uh, what's your other name? 
I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Janie? Oh, I got two homes. I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I like you and I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie, flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right and go two blocks. <sighs> that's home. That's where the ice cream fire is. Now, stop that, Janie, and tell me how to get to your home. Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Only they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At 10 o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Let me see Uh that. How do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother. Hmm. You're not. I like your voice. What's your name? Dan. A sucker if there ever was one. This is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Then, Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. Let's hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. Uh, put it down on the couch, Holiday. Hmm, that's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, feels kind of good, too. Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holliday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? She's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I want a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? Oh, I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holliday, keep her just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. He'll understand soon, Mr. Holliday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're all right, our Holliday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. <laughs> Janie. Janie. 
That's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't mean to. I wanted my bed to poop. No, don't cry, honey. That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. No, Janie. My daddy went away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? Mm. It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleepy? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now, you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? No, I'm sorry. No doll. Daddy Bear? No teddy bear. You might be far for a long time. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? Tell me a fairy story. All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears. The papa bear, the mama bear, and, and the... the ba- baby bear. I know that story. Hmm. Okay, uh, I say, once upon a time, there's a little girl named Red Riding Hood, and, and the... And wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed, and it grew up into a mighty tall vine, and, and he... And he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. Oh, that's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. You stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. Yeah. Well, what's this? A little girl. Oh, thanks, Holiday. Uh, what's your name, young lady? Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it isn't. It isn't? Uh, Holiday. Great little kid. Her dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody uh, else. Uh, all children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop. A policeman, honey. Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. The writing business slow these days, Holiday? How do you mean? Oh, I thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh, oh yes, just helping out a friend. I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? That depends, uh... Are your children anything like you? No, Holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad to accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, Holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Your hand is shaking. Never mind, Jane. It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Hmm. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off. You'll wake the kid. You Dan Holiday? Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old. Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Can I use the phone down the hall? I'm sorry about this. But get inside then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Right, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. You come with me, Holiday. Just keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him! (laughs) 
You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holiday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? Mr. Holiday, I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holiday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? The man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man, did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? Holiday, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. You must have seen him. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can't a man get some sleep? Are your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant, mind telling me what this is all about? Uh, I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant? I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Kling, you have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you can remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I got here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. Lieutenant, you'd never believe me. Then where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holiday. You. They've gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's mother... Mr. Holiday, mother, there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark. What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here. But I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. Uh, Mr. Holliday... He carries a gun. You stay here. You'll get her. We'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. 
what we're waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. Better be right, Holiday. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He, he said he didn't want to be disturbed. It's a matter of life and death. Get into the phone. Uh, who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Now, quick, Holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just step around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? 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 What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark. Oh. That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is? Of course I do, Daddy. And tell me quickly, that man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Well, come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. <laughs> I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holliday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Janie. Mommy. No, no, no. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mommies. Holliday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holliday. Thanks. Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then, who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Kling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Kling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. If neither of these two ladies had the child... Who did? A man named Sam Parker who turned out to be Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her... A child, a holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Are uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no, not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer the door, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? No. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up his gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. Mr. 
holiday. How can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holiday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Mommy. Yes? He fixed it so I can see my two mommy, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. Would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holiday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Janie, and this is my daddy. Why, Mr. Holiday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh boy. I'll bet this is going to be good. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hedegar. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Care of the Star Times. Carl! Carl! What are you doing? Nothing. I ain't doing nothing. It's just a book holiday. Somebody sent a book to Box 13. Why? <laughs> Now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Susie. Susie, come here a minute, will you? You call me Mr. Holliday? How did you guess? I heard you. All right. Now that we've cleared that up, how about this book? That one? This one. It came in the mail for Box 13. You sure? Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Holliday. The wrapping paper's right in the wastebasket there. I'll get it and show you. Here. Address printed. Block letters. Shaky hand. Susie, did any letter tell me this? Mm, just a book. Ex Libris. Robert and Chase. All right, Susie, we've got a problem. Somebody sends me a book from the library of Robert and Chase. Why? Maybe it's a bestseller. Yeah, and its day it was. Still is. The poems of Sir Walter Scott. Do you like poetry, Mr. Holliday? Love it, Susan. Just love it. Listen. If thou wouldst view fair Melrose aright, go visit it by the pale moonlight. The gay beams of lightsome day gild but to flout the ruins gray. Pretty, huh? What's it mean, Mr. Holliday? Susie, you're asking the jackpot question. The book's broken to fall open at this poem. Why? We're in a rut. Well, there's one way to get out of it. If anyone calls for me, I'll be in the morgue. Star Times. Sure, sure. Robert N. Chase. We've got plenty about him, Holliday. Well, let me have it. You ought to remember him. Vaguely, I do. All right, Mac, what do we got? Headlines. Lots of them. Headlines, huh? What's he been doing? Same thing he's been doing for the past ten years. He's in a rut, too. Six foot deep. Dead? Here. 
You read all about it, Dan. Socialites dead in tragic blaze. I'm oh, sure I remember now. For ten, ten years ago, I was cutting my reporter's teeth on a police beat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A cop wouldn't get a juicy story like this to cover. Son near death. Daughter at school escapes tragedy. Last night, fire swept the Robert M. Chase mansion. Blazed unnoticed until too late. Spread rapidly. Injured son not expected to live. He did, though. Uh Uh-huh, I see. Mildred Chase, 18, was attending a college function when the flames took the lives of her parents and swept rapidly through the palatial country estate, Fair Melrose. They were... Fair Melrose? Yeah, that was the name of the estate. Fair Melrose. Mac, the uh, Chase girl, got anything on her? What paper didn't have. What do you mean? You know, too much dough, spoiled kid, wrong company. She ran smack into the gossip stuff almost every week. Know where she is now? Well, she dropped back after the fire. It kind of cooled her off. Mm, you've been a good girl ever since, is that it? Well, that's it. I tell you what, Dan, drop upstairs to see Moore in society. She can give you the dope. All right. Thanks, man. Say, you must come and visit my morgue sometime. Uh, I like this one. I only read about characters. I don't have to bump into them. Ah, but mine move around, Mac, and sometimes too fast. <laughs> Oui, monsieur. Ah, three French are engaged. You wish to see someone, monsieur? Yes, Miss Chase. Miss Mildred Chase. You have an appointment? Is that an offer or a business question? <laughs> monsieur, if you would tell me... Well, what... what is it? There is someone here, mademoiselle. I don't wish to be disturbed. I'm sorry, monsieur. But mademoiselle Chase, she is not home. Oh, I see. Then you've got a talking piano. <laughs> oh, please, monsieur. I cannot let you in. You are mademoiselle. Yes, I did. But if you will go in and tell Mademoiselle that Sir Walter Scott is waiting to see her, I'm sure she'll listen. What do you say? Where? Vive la France. <laughs> All right. You wait here. But I cannot find it. Yes? What is it? What do you want? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Chase. I, I have to see you. Well, I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Well, lots of people haven't. But my name's Dan Holliday. The name means nothing to me. It means everything to my mother. <laughs> what do you want? I'm sorry, Miss Chase, bursting in like this. But I've come to see you about Fair Melrose. Who... Who are you? Oh, I told you. Dan Holliday. Occupation. Fiction writer. And are you writing now, Mr. Holliday? Maybe. Oh, uh, is this yours? Mine? That book? Here, take it. Where did you get this? You don't know. No. Where did you get it? But you do recognize it. Yes. It it was part of my father's collection. I asked you, how did you get it? Through the mail. It was addressed to Box 13, care of the Star Times. Or doesn't that mean anything? No. Nothing at all. You should read the classified ads, Miss Chase. Box 13. Adventure wanted. We'll go anywhere. Do anything. But you thank see, I... you for bringing the book back to me, Mr. Holliday. You don't have any idea why the book was sent to me? Oh, I, I don't know any more about it than you do. Maybe you don't. That's right. Colette will show you... Was there anything happened. suspicious about the fire that destroyed Fair Melrose? Mr. Holliday, I don't know what you have in mind, but that was a cruel thing to say. A hateful thing. You're not proud of it, are you? I'm nothing one way or the other, Miss Chase. But that book was sent to me. It was broken to fall open at the palms about Fair Melrose. I'd just like to know why. I know nothing about it. All I know is that fire took my mother and father. It's very sad, Miss Chase. And my poor brother was left a hopeless invalid, completely paralyzed, unable to speak, to move. Where is your brother now? At Fair Melrose. The place he always loved. But I thought it was destroyed by fire ten years ago. Yes. But one wing remains standing. Your brother is there alone? Yes. At where he would want to be. And I arranged for someone to care for him. Oh, I see. Now, Mr. Holliday, I'd like to forget all this. Well, I'm sorry to have bothered you, Miss Chase. I was merely curious about that book. I know nothing about it. All I want to do is to forget. To forget. <laughs>
What you want this hour of the night? I'm looking for Fair Melrose. Eh? What for? Will you tell me how I can get there? I'm lost. Stay lost, then. Just a minute, please. Get your foot out of the door. Get Don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. I just want to know the way to Fair Melrose. Eh, what for? I've I've got business there. You're lying. Nobody's got no business there. Nobody. All right, I'm nobody. Is your house on the ground? Well, it should be. Been here for 30 years. Oh. Nice little cottage you've got here. What you want to go up there for? To look at it. Huh? What for? Huh. Nice waltz we're having. Young fella, I asked you a question, and you ain't answered. All right. I want to find out about the fire. Well, there ain't nothing nobody needs to find out about it. It was a visitation of the Lord. It was a judgment on the sin that was going on. Heaven rained fire that night and wiped out the last of Babylon. I'm not sure I got all that. Oh, the wages of sin is death. Now you know. Wait a minute. Were you here that night? Me and Carl. Carl? And my husband. He was down here and seen the fire eaten up like the vengeance of the angels. We seen it, young fella. It was a judgment. A judgment for the years of sin. <laughs> we didn't have to do no more caretaking after that night. Providence took care for us. You and Carl, uh, caretakers, is that it? That's right. <laughs> only, only one wing to take care of now. Only one wing and him. Oh, the brother. Yes, yes, him that can't move or talk or hear. And that's where they brung him. And that's where he stayed. Now, you get. I, I talked enough. I wonder. How do I get up there? You're still going up, huh? More than ever now. Which way? Uh, straight up the canyon. Turn left. It's top of the hill. Thanks. Well, maybe you should have picked a lighter night. Yes, one with a moon. <laughs> Maybe she's right, Holiday. This is definitely no night for a picnic. Now, who said it's going to be a picnic? Feathers on. Hello. Oh. Light a match, Holiday. Don't be so stupid. Is anyone here? Chase. Oh, Mr. Chase. Holy mackerel. Who are you? Answer me. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, nice barracks on voice you got there, Holliday. Clean. Inspector Clean. Where am I? Hospital. What for? For your head. There's a little dent in it about two inches deep. Oh, I remember. Where is he? He? Who? The body. Oh, the body. What body? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you get in? Who found me? Who told you all about this? The old girl, caretaker's wife. She found you. Oh. Clean. I saw a body in Fair Melrose. Holiday, I don't know what merry go round you're on, but keep up this way and you'll get the brass ring through your nose. How do I get out of this place? Walk out. Thanks. What are you going to do now? Why? I want to know where to pick up the body. Keep in touch, Clint. What have you got in mind? A date. A date with a beautiful young lady. 
Slightly hysterical and more than a little mysterious. But interesting. What do you want here again, Mr. Holliday? More to the point. What do you want? Will you please leave? Every time I come here, I get invited to leave. I don't know what you're doing, Mr. Holliday, but it's none of your business. You ought to... I went to Fair Melrose last night. What for? I wanted to see it. And your brother. You mustn't see him. Why not? What do you do, Miss Chase? Please leave him alone. All right. Did you go to Melrose last night? No. I haven't been there for ten years. You weren't there the night of the fire either, were you? No, no, I wasn't. All right, all right. I'll take the word for it. Now, mind if I ask you one more question? If you'll go, I'll answer it. It's a deal. What are you afraid of? Nothing. That's your answer? Yes. I... I'd almost forgotten that horrible night until you came here. For ten years, I've lived away from it, keeping it away from me. Now you've brought it all back. Don't you have any pity? Lots of it, Miss Chase. For a lot of people. Particularly you. <laughs> What do you want to see him for? I got to. I want to talk with him. He can't talk. He can't hear. He's in the only wing left by the fire. Well, that he is. You you still want to go up to see him? Yes, I do. Oh, that chase is devil's brood, all of them. Devil's brood. The young and with her temper, screaming at her mother and father. And him that's upstairs now, always fighting with his sister. The fire was a visitation and a judgment of providence. Ah. Uh, Ah, there he is. Oh, no. That's him. You stay here. Mr. Chase. Mr. Chase. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't, can't. Shut up. Mr. Chase, I'm... I'm Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13, do you understand? Not in his head. That's all he can do. Mr. Chase, you wanted to see me. You sent me that book. You had Carl send it to me. Is that right? Nod your head if that's right. Good. Now, why? He can hear. You can hear me a little, can't you, Mr. Chase? Good. Why did you send me that book? Why did you want me to come here? He wants me to look around, Bertha. At what? At what? Ain't nothing in here. Ain't nothing. Look, Mr. Chase. I'll walk around the room. I'll watch you. When you want me to stop, nod your head. Understand? Good. Now watch me. Here, this trophy case. Is this it? What about it? What do you want me to see in this? Good. Bertha, come here. I ain't coming in. I said, come here, come on. Take a good look at this trophy case, Bertha. A good look. Uh, I don't see nothing. There's a plaque missing from its place. There's heavy dust around behind all those cups and trophies, but there's a clean spot here where a plaque stood. No dust, Bertha. No dust. Someone took a plaque from here not more than a few days ago. Did you? I ain't touched nothing. Never touched nothing. Mr. Chase. That plaque. Whose was it? Yours? No. Your father's? Mother's? Mildred's. It was hers. But someone took it. Chase, try to understand. Try to answer. Please, you've got to. He can't. Mr. He... Chase, try hard. Try hard to hear me Let again. Let him alone. He can't do no more. Stay with... Stay with him, Bertha. Don't leave him for a minute, do you hear? Oh. Hello there. Hello, Holiday. Inspector, I'm in a hurry. No, it looks like it. But you can't spare a poor cop a couple of minutes to explain something, can't you? What? That body... We found it. 
In a ravine about a mile down the road. All right, you found the body. Now I'm in a hurry. I gotta go. Not so fast, Holiday. There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Later, Kling, later. You know where to reach me. Holiday. Come back, Holiday. I say come back here. I'd be care of box 13. You. You saw my brother, Mr. Holiday? Yes, I saw him. Oh, please keep playing. I don't know why I let you in here. I do. Can't you leave me alone? Please. The piano. I like to hear it. What did you find out? So you don't know why anyone would have taken that plaque from the trophy case? No! Your brother managed to tell me it was yours. You are... Where was it? In the lower right-hand corner of the trophy case. Lower right-hand corner? Lower? That mean anything? Well, it... It was a plaque I won for dramatics at Merrifield Academy. I don't get it. What value does it have? It isn't worth anything except... Except what? The plaque was presented to me at a dinner at Merrifield. So, go on. The dinner was the night of the fire at Melrose. And the plaque would prove you were at Merrifield the night of the fire. Yes, but somebody, somebody wants people to think you were at Fair Melrose. Were you? No, no, no. How many times do I have to say that? That's enough. Who hates you, Miss Chase? My brother. Your brother? They all hated me. My mother, my father, my brother. Sometimes I think I hated them. Watching me, picking my friends, cutting me off from the friends I'd take. I couldn't stand it. I any... see. All right, Miss Chase. We'll forget it for now. But can I come back this evening? Why? I said before I wanted to help you. That still goes. Miss Chase, it still goes. Please sit down, Mr. Holliday. Thanks, Miss Chase. Do, uh... Do you have anything to tell me? A few things, yes. But first, uh... Is there anything you want to tell me? Tell you? Why, no. You sure? Positive. What could I tell you? A story. I don't know what you mean. All right, I'll explain. Must you play the piano? No, but I'd like to. Miss Chase, let me tell you a story. What about? Well, I don't know whether it's exact or not. You see, I have to guess a lot. Fill in details myself. But this story is about a girl, an 18 year old girl. That is, she was 18 10 years ago. And what's that got to do with me? Oh, you might be the girl, Miss Chase. Wild with a temper, bad temper. She had a lot of fights with her parents, mostly about the friends she had, the way she ran around. What are you trying to say? That one night this girl set fire to her home in a fit of temper. After a fight with her parents. Maybe she didn't mean to do what she did. But the fire destroyed her home almost completely. It meant the death of her parents and it made her brother... You're over... making this up. You're guessing. I said I'd have to guess. I was at Merrifield the night of the fire. For a while. I checked. Found out you left early enough to get to Meldo's. And you brought a plaque with you. The one you'd won for dramatics. Well, I I brought it to Melrose later. The, the next day or the next. I, I, I don't remember. No, that's no good, Miss Chase. It's too hard to believe that anyone would walk into a ruined home and put a plaque in a trophy case. I say you took it to Melrose. Then had the fight with your mother and father. You're lying. I don't think so. I took it there after the fire. And why is it missing? Want me to look around your apartment for it, Miss Chase? Or send for the police to look for it? No. Why not, if you haven't got it? Why are you afraid to let me look for it? So I am right. Now let's get on with the story. For ten years you held the secret. There's nothing to connect you with the fire at Melrose except that plaque. For years that fire's on your mind. Day after day you have to live with the secret. Wondering if there's anything that will connect you with that night. But there's nothing. There's nothing. Then you remember that plaque. It will prove that you were at Melrose. Because the date engraved on it is the same 
since the date of the fire. No. I tell you, it's not true. So there's only one thing to do. Get that plaque out of Melrose. But you didn't count on one thing. Your brother. Day after day, he saw that trophy case. Day after day, it was the same. Never changing. Like the four walls he had to stare at. But suddenly, it's different. There's... There's something missing. He racks his brains and he remembers. He remembers the plaque that was there. When he was able to read, he must have read about the fire. How you escaped the tragedy by being at school that night. How lucky everyone said you were. He read how you were presented with a plaque for dramatics. And his tortured mind puts two and two together. And he arrives at the conclusion that you were at Melrose. Home. The night of the fire. Well, Miss Chase, did you like that story? There's nothing you can prove. Maybe not. But how about Carl's murder? You killed him. Because you thought Carl was me last night. No. What, what are you doing? Calling the police. If for them now, I think they'll prove you killed Carl. They're good at that sort of thing, Miss Chase. Very good. No, no, please. What do you want? Money? I'll give you money. Anything, only don't call them. Why not? Please, please. Hello, Inspector. Please. They hated me, all of them. Okay, I hated on. them. It's you. I hate you. Look out. Get a gun. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello, Kling. Holiday. Come to the Sunview Apartments now. I, uh, I just rang down the curtain on a ten-year dramatic act. <laughs> Thrilling, Mr. Holliday. Yes, yeah, sure, Susie. About as thrilling as throwing dirt in a guy's face. Oh. Well, here's some more mail for Box 13. Later, Susie, later. But here's something maybe you ought to look into. What? If you subscribe to this book club, you get a free set of Sir Walter Scott's poems. Oh, fine, fine. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. With an original story by Frank Hart Towson. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. This is a Mayfair production. The FBI in Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS two weeks from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, where you can take a bus ride into the summer evening and make believe it's a dreamboat. Then, Broadway's as innocent and nostalgic as carousel music. But if you walk, you can get hit in the face by a guy fishing for nickels under a grating. Then you can't make believe anymore. But either way, it's Broadway. My beat. Danny! Danny! Come in here! The big voice that boomed through the afternoon heat belonged to Silks Bergen. Him, the heat couldn't bother. There wasn't enough of it. Silks was a jockey, about five hands high, and with a wet saddle, he might have scaled 110. He waved to me from the doorway of a haberdashery store. In here, Dan. In the store. Yeah, Silk. Sure. I've been waiting. <clears throat> I said I've uh, been waiting for you to pass by, Danny. What's the matter with your voice, Silk? You're down to a whisper. Laryngitis. Had it for a week. Hey, uh, Danny, I wanted you should meet a friend of mine. 
Joe Murdoch. Say some hello to Danny Clover, Joe. Hello, Mr. Clover. Joe? Joe's six foot six and speaks like a tanner. <laughs> you should know about things like that, Danny. Is it possible? I... Joe, uh, huh? go buy me a shirt over there. I got to talk to Danny. Sure, Silks. Add the lavender and the polka dots. The dots, Joe, the dots. Uh, can you hear me good, Danny? My voice has got so far to go from down here from me to up there to you. I'll listen close. What's on your mind? I want you to... I, I said, I said, do me a favor, huh? About the key. Why didn't I think of it myself, about the key? What key, Silks? Well, I'm riding a race down to Maryland tomorrow, you see. I don't know how long I'll be gone. Now, you understand? Oh, that key. What key, Silks? The key for the locker at the LaGuardia plane terminal. Oh, now I know. That key for that locker. Huh? <laughs> I got a parcel checked there. I ain't got time to run down for it now. It begins to dawn, Silk. Yeah, sure. So if I ain't back tomorrow night, how about having one of your boys who's on duty down there pick it up, huh? Yeah. And you hold it for me. Yeah. That'll save me rental, and it'll make us even for them riding lessons I give you in Central Park. <laughs> okay, Silk. Give me the key. Uh, thanks, Danny. Yeah. And now, now, don't lose it. Uh, don't worry about it. I'll put it right here on my ring. By the way, what's in the parcel? Just some of my riding silks, Danny. <laughs> what else does a jockey own? I patted silks on the head, bit him a fond yikes, and mushed back into the tropical heat of Broadway. Tropical was an illusion that wasn't hard to believe. The crushed pineapple and papaya stands, the coconut milk and real whiskered coconuts... The sly, grinning beat of the native drums heard through wilting loudspeakers. The girls, the luminous girls in their grass sandals and 14th Street sarongs. And then one whose lips looked as if they'd been painted with wild strawberries stopped me and kept me from my appointed rounds. I didn't mind. I'm so honest. I don't have the price of a dream and I'm honest. Here, you drop this. What? This hundred dollar bill. You dropped it. Take it before it burns through my hand. A oh, hundred dollars. Wasn't I the careless one? Must have been in that Cracker Jack box I just threw away. Never throw anything away, Mr. Clover. There can be a prize in each and every package. That's a hard thing to remember. Will you help me try to remember, Miss... Uh... Ames. Bell Ames. Oh. You ever need any help, Mr. Clover? Ring for Bell Ames. That's cute. Very cute. Now maybe I can do something for you, Bell. Maybe give you back all this money you said I dropped. <laughs> all right, so I lied. All you have to do is believe you dropped that money and listen. See how easy it is? A hundred dollars and no pain. For a hundred, you can throw in a little pain. Who do I listen to? It's written on the bill. Marty wants to see you. Oh? Marty says it's easier to talk to people who have money. He likes people with money. He says they listen better that way. I'm a fool for psychology, Bell. Let's go listen to Marty. Not me, Mr. Clover. You. It's you he wants to listen. Hey, come back here. Bell, Bell, come back here. The heat melted her into the crowd and then into a cab. And I was left standing there with the after scent of a perfume I'd never smelled before and a hundred dollar bill I'd never held before. I inhaled both of them. They added up to the acrid odor of a bribe. I had to find out why. 42nd Street, the address on the bill said. I decided to walk. Somewhere between Broadway and the number I was looking for, the honky-tonk started. And at the corner where women's high heels clack more slowly and the handouts become more frequent, I took a right turn into limbo. Two blocks down was what I was looking for. The last paddock hotel, room 16. Your name, Marty? Yeah. Yeah, that's my name. And these are my boys, Tinker and Dolly. Say a greeting to the police, boys. Police? Gee. Police? Golly day. Yeah, boys are from out of town police like me. The word don't impress us. You gonna give me some more money, Marty? Maybe. Maybe money, maybe trouble. Guy has a hard time figuring which is which these days. What you trying to buy, Marty? Talk. I'm buying words like I'm an editor. <laughs> <laughs> Marty the kick, ain't he, Tinker? He's a regular comedian. Your floor show stinks. Well, they ain't really working, police. So let's stop playing footsie, huh? We got business, me and you. Hmm. 
About an hour ago, police, a little guy hailed you into a haberdashery shop. He's got a message for you. What kind of message did he have? You should have heard. All you need, Marty, is a long, thin ear. Hey, hey, the police is a kick, too, Dolly. A jolly boy, real jolly. What did Silksbergen tell you, police? Who? Now, look, I got time. Time, patience. Let's do it again. Silksbergen, what did he tell you? You looking for a tip on the horses? I got a tip. You're it. Tony, you look sad for a win. You look like hardly anything at all. Show him the gun, will you, Dolly? Yeah. Look, Mr. Police, this is a gun. Golly day. Let me have it, Dolly. Yeah. Here, Marty. Now, what did Silksbergen tell you, police? Marty, you go to movies to see how Gunsel's act in this kind of situation? Yeah. Yeah, in a movie. Now, how did you know? Dolly. Yeah? Show the police the second reel. Yeah, pleasure. A great big pleasure. <laughs> You know the language better than that, police. You might say something. Your two muscles and your gun make me bashful. Stage fright, huh? <laughs> Dolly. Yeah. Hey, Tinker, this is fun. Yeah. You can play too, Tinker. Yeah, such a jolly guy. <laughs> Playing movies with a jolly guy. <laughs> a jolly, jolly guy. <laughs> Somewhere a light going on and off made a big noise and a bigger hurt just in back of my eyeballs. It screamed at me from across the street and through a window hung with grease-stained drapes. And I knew I was still in Marty's hotel room. I knew that hours had been torn out of my life and thrown away. Then the light screamed again, and this time there were words. Big thousand-watt words that said, Pearl Club, delicious dancing girls. First one, then the other. And in between there was the creaking sound of a rocking chair. Then the rocking chair made words, too. Don't hurry. It's rather pleasant here, sitting rocking in the dark with that brazen sign throwing its naked, intermittent light. This gum gives me the right to introduce myself. I'm Gil Sherry. Oh, should I know you? Perhaps. I believe I'm in the class book of one of our more venerated colleges. That's my identity. A thesis on Gil Sherry would make lurid reading for the boys with the old school tie, don't you think? I wouldn't know. Read me a chapter. I'm oh, delighted. Chapter one begins. Early in life, I learned to love money. It was the symbol of the sordid life into which I'd fallen. Now, sitting in a bleak, villainous hotel room, my comrades, a detective and a corpse. The corpse and the detective. Is that all me? <laughs> Not quite. You're the detective, true. And the corpse is the true corpse lying in the corner. Huh? And I believe he's a friend of yours, Mr. Clover. Silks. Silks. A rather fancifully named, don't you think? Silks Bergen. Proud, colorful name. But pride and color seem to have drained out of him. Maybe he's ashamed of wearing bullet holes where his polka dots ought to be. He was a neat little guy. So? And he'll be pleased with death. Death is so precise. Closes your mouth, too. That wasn't smart of Marty. Marty realizes that. That's why I'm to keep watch over you. Until you open yours and tell us what Silks had to tell you, huh? Oh, by the way, here are your meager belongings. Yeah. Your wallet, a key ring, your badge, and... A hundred dollar bill. Marty's orders. That's good of him. They're all there? Yeah, yeah. You said, uh... Hundred dollars, like there were words that hurt you. As I suggested, money is beautiful, Mr. Clover. Money buys money. Money is an ecstasy, but an exquisite pain. Oh. Uh, Gil, I dropped the bill. Huh? If you pick it up for me, I'll let you hold it for as long as you want. Go on. Touch it, Gil. Feel it. Oh, of course, I'll get it. Yeah, Gil. Yeah. And get this! <laughs> I'm not going to send my boys to college. Their noses break too easy. Took 15 minutes for the riot squad to clean up room 16. I booked Gil Sherry as an accomplice to murder. And the morgue booked Silks Bergen. The thing I had to do now was break a promise to a dead man. I couldn't wait until tomorrow to use Silks' key. The key that Marty didn't even notice. 
A half hour later, I was in the big waiting room at LaGuardia Field. American Airlines DC-6 leaving at gate 5 for Chicago and Los Angeles. Loading at gate 4. Hiya, Lieutenant Clover. What brings you down here? You're an officer. Had any trouble? Uh, locker thieves? No, only trouble was a three-year-old kid in a $400 cowboy suit screaming because he lost his nurse and chauffeur at the same time. Where's locker 147? 147? Uh, uh, right over here, sir. Let's go. Now, let's try this key. A suitcase, Lieutenant. Yeah, pretty heavy. Something you're looking for? Hold on a second. Since I get this open. Holy! All that dough! Tens and fifties and hundreds! Yeah. What could be bought with that? It's been bought, officer. A lot of blood. Bought and paid for. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Practically all of Casey, crime photographer's adventures are summed up in the title of tonight's show, Big Danger. If you haven't met this ace newspaper cameraman, his pretty assistant, and Ethelbert, the merry bartender, if you're looking for a top-rating thrill show, be sure to hear this latest of crime photographers' adventures. Along with Escape, which tonight will present Urban S. Cobb's Snake Doctor, crime photographer is heard on most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. <laughs> Broadway is an animal that feeds on hot tips, a tip on a horse or a chopped liver sandwich. There are even touts who will hawk you a scratch sheet giving odds on Broadway's being wiped off the face of the earth. And sometimes the tips pay off, like the one not to put your two bucks on jockey Silk's Bergen because Silk's was dead and his handicap was a chest full of bullets. Or maybe his handicap was a heavy $100,000 left in a pasteboard suitcase in a public locker. It didn't make sense for Silk's to have that kind of money. Even to sane, sensible, sensitive Sergeant Tartaglia, it didn't make sense. It don't make sense, Danny. Silk's with a hundred grand left kicking around. Ah, that's not like him. Yeah. Uh, got a cigarette, Tartaglia? I put a carton in this desk drawer a week ago, and I haven't been able to open it since. Oh, here, let me try, Danny. It's stuck, Tartaglia. Just give me a cigarette. Danny, my wife, Mrs. Tartaglia, says I am the best opener of stuck drawers she ever saw. Just give me a cigarette. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, here, Danny. Hey, and how about some circus peanuts to munch while we're thinking? When do you have time to go to circuses, Sergeant? Oh, not me, not me, Danny. It wasn't me, it was my kid. Yeah, there was a street carnival on Mulberry Street, so it was my kid. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, you know, for a minute there, Danny, I thought you were munching me out. All right. Playtime's over, Sergeant. We had any reports that anyone is shy a hundred grand? No, Danny. The money has been reported neither lost, stolen, nor strayed. Did you check whether Silks made any bets that would have got him that kind of money? Yeah, Danny. The word from our stoolies is that no bookies is out that kind of dough. Not out the Silks, anyway. The word also is that Silks didn't have a wrinkle deuce to bet on his own name. Yeah. Uh, what do we got on the man they call Marty? Ah, not a thing. Aside from his autographed hundred dollar bill. Now, we can't find him, Danny. We can't trace him from no place to no place. Hmm? Uh... Danny, you feel all right from that beating? I've had it better. Uh, Sergeant, what's on Bell Ames? Ah, uh, likewise. It's an empty day with a hole in it, isn't it, Tartaglia? Yeah. It... Huh? If you want me, I'll be in Gil Sherry's cell. There must be somebody who can tell me something. Anything. <laughs> There's no need to humiliate me further, Mr. Clover. Being forced to talk to you is humiliation enough. Murder doesn't bother you, huh? As long as it's not mine. Dying can come to a man a lot of ways, Sherry. You could die as an accessory to Silk's murder. And there are so many things to prove, though, before I die, aren't there, Detective Clover? If you told us some secrets, you could maybe keep on living. That's as good as money sometimes. True, true. That's why I keep my mouth shut. I'll breathe longer that way. You mean Marty will kill you if you talk to us? I'm not brilliant like you, Sherry, but it seems to me you'll lose either way. 
Man has few choices, but the destiny of Gil Sherry will spin itself out as Gil Cherry chooses. That's what my class book said about me. Yeah. Real profits, your classmates. Real profits. Here's the envelope with Sherry's belongings you asked for, Danny. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I return your meager possessions, Sherry. Your cigarettes, an empty wallet, a fraternity pin, and... Hmm... This is interesting. Roll of tickets to Pelagus Shooting Gallery. You know Pelagus, Sherry? Pelagus, the ex-bookie? You shoot at his shooting gallery? Yeah, that's what I thought. Happy destiny, Sherry. Happy destiny. Oh, Pelagus, keeping in trim? Pardon me, Danny. You're in my way. Oh, uh, sorry. Nice shot. You angry at somebody? What's on your mind? Guy named Marty. Yeah. You like that shot? Makes me quiver with excitement. You think I hit that duck twice before it sinks? I doubt it. <laughs> See what I mean? You still booking races, Pelagus? I got caught once. You still booking? Uh-uh. You're in my way again. Try getting used to it, Pelagus. Try this. Where would Silks Bergen get a hundred grand? Yeah. Where? From you? Oh, yeah, from me. From Pelagus. I give people a hundred grand, eh? Yeah? That's why I'm running this thing in shooting gallery, because I give such big prices. You hit that duck, Lieutenant, I give you a hundred grand prize. Is that what you mean? Oh, hold on. Hold on. No, tell us. Tony Vrani, Joe Murdoch, Nessus to Potami. Petty Manos. Oh, Petty Manos. Joe Murdoch. Joe Murdoch. Silks' friend. The big guy with silks in the haberdashery. Malikas, what's he saying about Joe Murdoch? It's hard to explain. Hard, huh? Like this. Uh, Joe Murdoch. Oh, he started this river. Murdered. A visit on us, day. Don't spare me that last, either. What did you say? May he rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, See you around, Pelagus. Pure scene of thoughts. Danny Clover. I feast it on us, security. It was a thought I had to think that pal Joey Murdoch was dead for the same reason that Silks was. I checked headquarters, found out that Murdoch's last known address was the last paddock hotel. He shared a room there with Silks. The environment made its own possibilities. The lobby of the last paddock had a new embellishment. Above the clerk's desk was an embroidered wreath. To Silks, it said, you finally beat the bookies. The clerk didn't sound funereal at all. Sorry, mister, you gotta come recommend it. The last paddock don't rent rooms to just any fink that asks. I didn't mention room. The sign under your chin says information. I'll take that. Ah, you don't look like you carry that much dough. I got it sewn under my lapel. Here, take a look. A cop? A shaman. A real friendly policeman, mister. Come on, the information. Now, look, I'm a new boy here. You ring that bell, I give you the register. You sign it, you got a room. That's how it works. That's all I know. Yeah. Say, that's a pretty big safe over there. Why such a big safe for such a small flea bag? New, too. Yeah, new. How come? How come such a big new safe? Look, like I said, I'm a new boy Look, here. friendly, we got laws about new boys who get close to new murders. Put your out-to-lunch sign on the counter. We're going uptown. No, 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 wait a minute. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, about that new safe. See, we had an old one. What happened to it? Well, yesterday the boys opened the old safe and all it gave back was an empty stare. The boys did? What boys? The boys, the guys that live here, the bookies. Oh, they kept their money in a safe, huh? Well, sure, it's much safer than a bank. No peeping team men that way, eh? That way the bookies don't pay income tax. That way, if their money gets stolen, they can't run to the police. Yeah, yeah. And that's all I know. You can take me uptown, and that's still all I know. Yeah. Don't go away, friendly. Maybe soon you'll be able to tell your story to an audience. Get in the car, Clover. Well, uh, Marty. Good seeing you, Marty. I've been looking all over for you. Get in the car, Clover. Dolly's looking at you with a gun pointed to where your badge might be. Now, just get in the car. Mm. 
Hey, Tinker. Hey. It's the police again. Maybe we'll get to play some more movies. After I take a gun. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Golly day. You'll play later, boys. Wait out here. Oh, Marty. Wait. This way, police. In that house. Two murders, eh, Marty? How does a guy feel when he's murdered two men? A good feeling. I like it. Open the door. Yeah. There's someone I want you to meet again, Clover. In here. Mr. Clover. Mr. Danny Clover. You mind if I blush with joy? You can still think of a reason to blush, Belle. <laughs> Such pretty words for a man who's nearly dead. You got one chance, Clover. The dough. The hundred grand. Where is it? First, I'm going to tell you something about Marty, Bill. He had that money and he didn't know it. What? What's he saying, Marty? You tell us, Clover. Bill, when Marty had me worked over, he should have taken a look at my key ring. One of the keys was for a locker. Locker, money. Marty, how could you be so stupid? Answer the policeman, Marty. So, so I made a mistake, Bill. Don't worry. We got the police. We'll get the dough. hundred thousand dollars, Marty, like that, right under your nose. Oh, <laughs> Bill, you picked yourself a dull playmate. You can't afford a playmate who makes mistakes, Bill. Marty, you fool. You stupid fool. <laughs> Bill. I've got to ask you, too, Bill. How does it feel to kill a man? Where's the money, Mr. Clover? At police headquarters, in my office. Get on that phone, Mr. Clover. Get on that phone and have one of your flunkies bring it over. No tricks, Mr. Clover. Just tell them... It's hard to kill from up close, huh, Bell? Palagos. It's me. Palagos of Palagos Shooting Gallery. You see, Clover, how well they learn from Palagos? You always teach them with a gun in your hand? Yeah, one needs something to wrap one's pupil across the knuckles when she is bad. No, Bell? Belle deserves it, Pelagos. She tried to double-cross you. That makes two, Belle and Marty. Didn't know you were so much alike, Belle, you and Marty. Don't listen to the policeman, Pelagos. No, it's just, it's just you and me. Nobody else. It's you and me and a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, sounds good. To me, that sounds good. How does it sound to you, Clover? Speaking strictly from a personal point of view, I wouldn't believe it. Uh, from a personal point of view, that is. Uh-huh, but Pelagos point his view different. Then it's all right, Pelagos. It's all right, isn't it? Oh, it couldn't be better. Just show me you mean to throw away your gun. Huh? On the floor, Bill, throw away. Oh, sure, sure, anything you say. Ah, you're a good girl, Bill. Nice, good girl. <gasps> oh, Pelagos. Yes, 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 yes. Belle was a nice girl. She had nice, good ideas, Clover. How did she say? Get on the phone and have a flunky bring money over. No tricks. That's how she said. The flunky comes alone, Clover. I tell you in English, not in Greek, so you understand. He comes alone in 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Tartaglia, this is Danny. Silk's dough. Yeah, the hundred grand. Bring it here to me. Yeah, to 8 West 63rd. In my desk drawer, Tartaglia. It's in my lower left-hand drawer. Yeah. Yeah, right away. Come alone, Tartaglia. Alone. You did good, Clover. Nice good. Now we wait. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, the man said. Just Pelagos and me. There was no one to play him off against. No Marty, no Bell. Just me. The fall guys I'd set up, Marty and Bell, all gone. It all belonged to Pelagos now. Two new fall guys, Tartaglia and me. A few more minutes, the man said. Mostly, the man watched the clock. Ah, sir. You're lucky, Clover. In two minutes, you could have died. Open the door. 
Hiya, Danny. Well, here it is. I brought the dough just like you said. Hey, you know, it's good to get away from the office. With a suitcase on the table. Huh? Hey, it's Belagos. Hey, and he's got a gun. Hey, Danny, what Give the man the suitcase, Tartaglio. Well, whatever you say, Danny. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, Clover. You're a nice, good fool. I get the money, you still die, huh? You and the funky. Huh? Talk to us before we die, Pelagos. I like to talk. What do we talk about? That was your money. Silk stole it from the safe at the last paddock. Thought he could get away with it. He thought you couldn't do anything about it. But you crossed him. You had Marty kill him and his friend Murdoch. You talk all by yourself, Clover. You didn't let me say a word. <laughs> now fold your hands behind your head and stand facing the wall. You both. Good. That's nice, good. Now I want to look once more at my money. It's too long since I looked at the money. Yes, my mo- the money. Something wrong, Pelagos? This money is... It's what, Pelagos? It's nothing but paper. Lousy torn up strips of dirty newspaper. Paper is nothing but Hit the car, Tartaglia. I'll take him. Oh. Nice, good, huh, Pelagos? Ah. Yeah. Nice, good. First, I kissed Tartaglia on the top of his bald head, because today that's where his brain was. My lower left-hand desk drawer had been stuck for a week, and he'd gotten the cue. Dolly and Tinker, they were sitting outside, just like Marty told them, right in the middle of a police net, just like Tartaglia had arranged. So I kissed him again. So he invited me to a spaghetti dinner. Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's crowd and it's laughter, and it's a trumpet that screams. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley, and they're heaped there, the bright-eyed kid, the voice that whispers from the doorway, the poet, the dregs. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for Broadway's My Beat. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The FBI and Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS one week from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a swamp that'll drag you breath by breath into its shadowed pools, or it's a meadow shining with golden light. It's a place and a time and a loneliness that reaches out for you, then beckons you into an airless room and locks the door. You get out or you don't. Either way, it's Broadway, my beat. A man dies in silence and in dark, and the city sets up a shrieking clamor, and you're part of it. You ride a scream through the crowded, heat-heavy streets, and then you hit a dead end. And it's a building, and a room at the top of the building. And it's a man lying in the center of the room while other men take notes on the history of his dying. All right, Joe, get one from this angle, huh? Yeah, hold oh, the light while I focus, will you? Hiya, Danny. Okay, that's good. Got it. Now get a shot of all that food. Oh, what a banquet this guy hey, Danny, laid out for Danny, come over here. This will interest you. It never interests me, Doc. What have you got? Al Dane, the novelist. Ever read any of his stuff? No. Neither do I. The wife does, though. Says she's mad about him. But she went mad over Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Well, let's have tea some other time, huh, Doc? Tell me about Dane. Hey. Yeah, well... 
Hey, first tell him about me, huh, Doc? Tell him about me. Oh, yeah. Danny, this is Clem, Clem Pic- Picasso. Yeah, that's who I am. Picasso. Picasso? Haven't I heard your name someplace? Sure you have. Clem Picasso, the painter. I paint flagpoles. That's where it was. You were painting a portrait of a flagpole for Dane, is that it? No, you don't understand. I'm the real article. Let me tell you about me. Yeah. If it wasn't for me, you guys wouldn't even know Dane was dead. Tell me more about yourself. Well, I was painting a flagpole on top of this building, see? All of a sudden came a gust of wind. I grabbed hold of the pole, dropped my pail of paint right through that skylight there, see? I look for spilled paint, I find a dead man. That is the experience that happened today to Clem Picasso, flagpole painter. Unforgettable. Uh, it'll live in my memory, too. Uh, you got anything to add to that, Doc? <laughs> Only this, Danny. This room is a fortress. Dane must have built it on top of his penthouse for a retreat. It's ventilated by an air conditioning system. The only source of outside light is that skylight, and that's at least 30 feet from the floor. Mm -hmm. There's no phone, and the room was locked and bolted from the outside. Dane couldn't get out. This place is bare. No writing materials, nothing. Yeah, like a tomb. Maybe he needed this kind of atmosphere to think. Maybe. All the boys found when they broke in here was Dane and that table, loaded with food, all jarred. Fruits, chicken, all sorts of good things to eat. What's the matter, Doc? You hungry? Just tell me how Dane died. He died of starvation, Danny. Huh? Yeah, yeah. all that food, and he died of starvation. Curious man, this Val Dane. Now, huh, Danny? I could have dropped it right there. Val Dane, I told myself, had committed suicide by starving himself to death, thereby obtaining new material for his next novel. That's what I told myself. That's how much sense it made. And that's why I couldn't drop it. In New York, hardly anybody dies in a vacuum. A man as famous as Val Dane never does. There has to be a close friend or relative to break the news to, and in a case like this, to question. It wasn't tough to find out that Val Dane had a wife, now divorced, and a city directory said she lived on West 79th Street. It was apartment 105. As simple as that. Yes, what is it? You're Mrs. Dane? Well, only approximately. Mr. Dane and I are divorced. I've kept his name for my son's sake. Uh, you're... Uh, Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Oh, how interesting. We've never had a caller here from the police. Won't you come in? Thank you. I do hope you'll stay until Jimmy comes home. Jimmy is my son, Mr. Clover. I'm sure he'd love to hear the experiences you'd have to tell him. Uh, in here, the living room. That's quite a collection of glass toys there on the floor. Clowns, building sets, animals, and all in glass. Jimmy must be an unusual boy. Oh, yes, he is. That's all I have left in life, Mr. Clover. To make him happy. Uh, there's something I have to tell you that might make you quite sad. About Jimmy? No, it's about your former husband, Val Dane. He's dead. Oh, I'm so happy. Well, I mean, I'm relieved. I was afraid with Jimmy being on the streets... Then it might... doesn't affect you, Mr. Dane's death? I think I should be more sad if I read in the papers that a man I never met had died at the age of 93. I see. No, you don't, really. How could I feel sorrow for Val Dane? He was a miserable ten years thrust into my life. Why do you say that? Because he was a talented egoist. He cared nothing for Jimmy. He cared even less for me. We lived for him. He lived for Val Dane. Uh, when did you see him last? Two years ago. In that horrible cabin in the Adirondacks. He, he forced us to go there so he could write. And one more thing, Mr. Clover. Yes? When you write your report about me, put this down. Put down... Joanne Dane, Val Dane's ex-wife. She's glad he's dead. I didn't bother to tell Joanne Dane that her former husband had starved to death. I had a feeling she would have enjoyed that too much, and death doesn't need laughing at. But when I hit Broadway again, death was screaming at me in big black letters. Val Dane had become public property for a nickel a copy. You got the funny papers, too. I called headquarters and asked Sergeant Tartaglia if anything new had turned up. Something new had. Get back to your office right away, the sergeant said. There's a guy who wants to see you. He's hysterical. The sergeant wasn't kidding. 
<laughs> Something in my office makes you laugh like that? The pollen, maybe? <laughs> I can't help it. It's rich. It's the richest one I've ever heard. Okay, okay, come out of it. Who are you? Uh, my name's my name's Brooks, Lyle Brooks. <laughs> Lyle Brooks, huh? Tell me gently, what's so rich? Oh, if I think of it again, Lieutenant, I shall roll in your floor in continued convulsions of hilarity. And think of something real sad, like a right to the jaw, and tell me what's on your mind. Why, why Valdane starved to death. Don't you think that's funny? No? Well, I think it's funny. What tickles you about a man's death, Brooks? About Val's death? He was such a pig, and he starved to death. Well, that lieutenant is humor. Category, ironic humor. What's your interest in Val Dane's death? I'm his ghost. Ghost, huh? Pataglia. Yes, Annie? Now, what do you want? Book this guy for impersonating a human. Hey, that's a serious... Right huh? now, Tartaglia, book him. Well, sure, for impersonating a human, huh? Come on, you. Policemen have a sense of jest, too, I see. Come on, you. So I'll explain. I am Val Dane's ghost. You're doing it again, Brooks. His ghost writer. I did much of the writing which is credited to our so literary Mr. Dane. That's why I came to give myself up. To give yourself up, huh? Did you have anything to do with this dying? Assuredly not. But you might think so. I hated him. Val Dane cheated me time and again, but this time was the biggest cheat of all. Hey, what's he talking about, Danny? I'm talking about the great fake, Val Dane's latest book. I wrote at least half of it, you know. Got no credit. Val said I would get credit. What are you trying to tell us? Just this. If Val Dane met with foul play in any way, I should head your list of suspects. Me and Cynthia, of course. We mustn't forget Cynthia. Oh, well, we can't forget her. Cynthia who? Cynthia Troy. Why, everybody knows she's the woman in the great fake. Heavens, do you mean to say you haven't read the book, Mr. Clover? Mr. Clover hadn't, but Mr. Clover did. The Great Fake, new novel by Val Dane, available at your favorite bookstore, $3 the copy. I bought it, noted it carefully on my expense account, and went home and curled up with $3 worth of vitriol. Because that's what the novel was. A book of hate, a sneering book. A book without humor. There wasn't a person in it, only caricatures dipped in acid. And the leading woman of the novel had been dipped deepest of all. It tweaked me. The next morning, I just had to see her. I'd been expecting a call from the police, Mr. Clover. Drink? Uh, no, thanks, Miss Troy. Then you won't mind if I do. Uh, no. I realize it's before noon, but then I haven't had my breakfast yet. You sure you won't have a drink? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh... Just why had you been expecting a call from the police, Miss Troy? <laughs> because I have no doubt about your intelligence. One thing you must know in my business is never to underestimate anybody. You mind if I ask what your business is? The same as in Val's novel. I give parties, Mr. Clover. I arrange that the unfortunate rich be impressed by their leisure and their wealth. By opulent and clever parties, Mr. Clover. For an opulent price, Mr. Clover. Now the question, Miss Troy. Why was Why I... were you expected, Mr. Clover? Hmm. The answer is a question. How do you get a man to starve to death? I've been asking myself that. Do you think somebody got Val Dane to starve? Undoubtedly. Val Dane was a man whose only love was Val Dane. He was too jealous of his love to kill himself. He would never commit suicide. Then you think he was murdered? I uh, believe I implied that, don't you? Did you kill him? The idea titillates me. Yes, it's a rare thought. <laughs> Ask me that again, Mr. Clover. Look, Miss Troy, the social graces aren't one of my, uh, social graces. In your circle, how do you tell a lady to quit stalling? By telling her. Then let's quit stalling, huh? Very well. You've uh, read Val's novel, yes? It made a fool of me, didn't it? Is that why you killed him? Locked him in that room and starved him to death? I should like to have done that, Mr. Clover. The idea... Yeah, I know. It titillates you. Uh, you've started a train of thought, Mr. Clover. I should like to have locked him in that room and spent days of ecstatic joy watching Val Dane starve. I went back to the clean, almost domestic air of the police laboratory and waited while the lab boys checked and rechecked the coroner's report. No matter how you shook it, it came out that Val Dane had died of starvation. Then it caught up with me what Cynthia Troy had said. 
It would have given her days of ecstatic joy to watch Dane starve. There was only one place anyone could have done that. That was from the roof and through the skylight of Dane's death room. I took a uniformed officer with me because maybe that kind of ecstasy leaves a clue. Danny, I've been over every inch of this roof. There ain't a particle of it that ain't intimate and familiar to me. I'm also sick of the sight of it under my nose. Uh, Okay, officer, you can get up off your hands and knees now. Uh, Thanks, Danny. You know, Danny, maybe it'd help if you told me what it is we're looking for. I don't know. Thread of cloth, a cigarette butt, the smell of hate. The smell... Huh? Hey, Danny, you dizzy from the altitude or something? (laughs) No, no. You can go now, officer. I won't need you anymore. Okay. Hey, you know, it's kind of pretty up here. Huh? All the lights of the city. Gee, that reminds me. I think I'll take my wife to the top of the Empire State Building. It'll be like a second honeymoon. Well, uh, so long, Danny. Don't stay too long in the night air. Yeah. There has to be something. Something. Hmm. Didn't make sense what I saw. A piece of scotch tape stuck to one of the panes of the skylight. I leaned down to examine it. And then there was something that did make sense. The sound of someone moving toward me. And then I... I whipped out my gun and ducked behind the jet of the skylight. And then it found me. When I woke, a sickly dawn spread itself over the roof and over me. I took inventory and found I was missing two items. A valuable hunk of skin from my right temple. And a piece of scotch tape. Just that. Scotch tape. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. A thrill a minute. High tension suspense from the word go. Dramatic excitement that builds and builds until it explodes in a smashing climax. That's Inner Sanctum. The great mystery show that's another of CBS' top-notch Monday night programs. You'll find Inner Sanctum one of the most entertaining spots on your Monday night listening schedule. And remember, Lux Radio Theater returns next Monday, August 29th, for its 15th year of great dramatic presentations. Inner Sanctum, Lux Radio Theater, every Monday night over most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. Morning on Broadway is like any other August morning on a thousand other main drags. People are caught up in a salary to be earned, baseball scores, and the heat. You keep moving and do the best you can. The best I could do was to try to push my way through a brick wall. Progress was practically at a standstill. But by now, one thing was obvious. I had a murder on my hands. Valdane had been found starved to death in a locked room with a banquet spread before him. That in itself was something to nick the curiosity. But when I got too curious, somebody had taken a shot at me. Draw a line and add that up and you get a six-letter word meaning foul play. At headquarters, after I had my head bandaged, Sergeant Tartaglia was terse and intelligent about the whole thing. I can't figure it, Danny. Now, don't try, Tartaglia. If you could figure it, you'd become invaluable to the department. You'd never get your pension. Did you get what I told you to? Yeah, one piece of frosted glass, just like you said. Thanks. Where'd you get it? Now, Danny, where would you get a piece of frosted glass at police headquarters? Out of the men's powder room. Uh, you better hurry up with it. Yeah. Well, we'll tear off a piece of scotch tape. Well, we'll paste it over the glass like this. Uh, what are you doing, Danny? Pasting scotch tape on frosted glass. It's the latest craze. Now we hold it up to the light. Look through it, Tartaglia. Get up close and look through it. Hey, hey you can see right through it. The part of the glass with the scotch tape on it, you can see right through. Hey, that's a neat trick, Danny. It's also a clue, Sergeant. The skylight to Val Dane's retreat was frosted glass. Somebody stuck that missing piece of tape on the glass so they could watch Val Dane die. Uh-huh. Uh, Taglia, suppose you were locked in a room loaded with food and you were starving to death. What would you do? I'd eat the food. Unless what, Taglia? Unless nothing, Danny. I'd eat the food. Unless what, Taglia? 
Danny, I said I'd eat the food unless it was po... Unless it was poison, Danny. You're so right. Tartaglia, I want all the food found in Valdane's room transferred to the technical lab right away. I want every piece of it analyzed for poison. I want the analysis on my desk as soon as possible. Right. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. Plain clothes, Meshikov, sir. Assigned to follow Cynthia Troy. Oh, uh, okay, Meshikov. What do you got? At 9 a.m. this morning, Cynthia Troy entered the Fifth Avenue apartment of one Michael Green. Who? Uh, I mean, cream. Michael Cream. C R E A M. Cream. You know, like in cream. So I took a plant in the hall. At 9.15, I heard loud voices, which at 9.20 become a heated argument. Who's this Merkel Cream? Oh, him I checked. He's a yogi. A yogi, huh? Oh, that's interesting. These guys go on starvation diets to get next to their souls. Thanks, Machikov. Stick with Cynthia. Hey, Tataglia. Yeah, Danny. Get my bed of nails. I'm calling on a yogi. <laughs> The yogi with a homogenized name, Merkel Cream, lived in a rich, creamy Fifth Avenue mansion with a high money fat content. The outside stairs were covered with a thick layer of perfumed oriental carpet. When you rang, a girl made of copper with bells on the ankles of her bare feet and a jewel stuck in the middle of her forehead opened the door. With a scented arm, motioned you into the presence. The presence was a muscular man with the body of a professional football player, wearing a plumed turban and an imported English tweed loincloth. He sat in the middle of the floor, bathed in the celestial glow of a baby pink spotlight. And then the presence spake. You have come. Yeah, Mr. Cream, I... Speak not when I speak. You have come. You said that. You have come to attune yourself to the eternal harmony that lies six fathoms deep in the cosmic sea. You will go into the cleansing room. You will go into the cleansing room and there cleanse yourself and attire yourself in a loincloth. You will find a suitable array hanging from pegs. The uh, panther skin for you, I think. Look, Mr. Cream... Have no fear. They are sterilized after each use. Now go, tortured one, go. Look, Cream, I'm not here to cross your palm with silver. How dare you speak to Merkel Cream thus? How dare you, savage? That's me. Look into your crystal ball and tell me why you should scream at a tortured one named Cynthia Troy and vice versa. How did you know this? Don't answer. I will answer for you. You are omniscient, clairvoyant, like the me that is the true me. Like the me that is Danny Clover, New York police. I got a hunk of protoplasm named Meshikov who floats under windows and soaks up things like a fishwife's brawl between you and Cynthia. But you are clairvoyant. The Cynthia underneath Cynthia is a fishwife. She pays you to tell her that? Cynthia Troy is a disciple. Disciple fall out sometimes, as you know. I've heard. And Val Dane, he, he was a disciple too. What did you do to Dane, Yogi? Put him on a starvation diet for his eternal harmony? Then you've read his book. Yeah, he gave you a paragraph. Let's see if I can remember the exact words. The Yogi, a vicious parasite, a jeweled vampire, a stinking phony. Did I quote the exact words exactly, Yogi Cream? Dane died in a way that pleases me. He died in an agony of hunger. What does it matter if his exact words are remembered? To him or to me, what does it matter? Yeah. Get up, Cream. You're coming with me. I got a feeling you can give me better answers with your pants on. You believe that I'm a fake? You believe what Dane said of me? To put it bluntly, Cream, yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Maybe Dane killed your lush racket with his bestseller. Maybe you knew it would. Maybe you arranged for him to die. Let's go. Help me up, Mr. Clover. Yeah, cosmic harmony makes you weak. All right. You know I can't afford to go to jail. It would ruin me. Let go of me. If you move, Mr. Clover, I'll break your back as if it were a stick of wood. Let go of me. A little trick I learned from a man on Amsterdam Avenue. Ten judo lessons for 20 bucks. Worth it, don't you think? Don't you think? I got my lessons for free. Well, send them back. They're no good. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. Now, my way, Cream. Let's do it my way. Oh. Well, what do you know? The yogi found cosmic harmony. Has to be a phone in this dump. Yeah. Headquarters.
Yes, Todd Tagley is speaking. Hey, Todd Tagley, this is Danny. Send a stretcher to pick up Yogi. Mr. Merkel Cream? Yeah, he spilled out of his bottle. One stretcher coming up. Hey, Danny, we got a report on that food. Yeah? Give it to me. Uh, I was about to, Danny. You know, it is very interesting. Todd Tagley, if you don't talk fast, order a stretcher for yourself, too. What about that food? Well, that's what I'm telling you. So interesting. It was not poison, Danny. Baldane's food was not poison. Until the yogi was in condition to talk to me, I had to talk to myself. What kind of man was Val Dane? That was the big question, the important question. Locked in a room long enough to starve to death and he refused to touch the food, the unpoisoned food at his fingertips. Why? What was the mentality of the man? Once, long ago, he had been human enough to marry, to have a family. Maybe that was the clue. Once somebody loved him. Maybe his ex-wife, Joanne Dane, would be calmer now. Maybe she could divorce her memory from ugliness. Yes? Who are you? I'm Danny Clover, police detective. Who are you? I'm the landlady. What can I do for you? I want to see Joanne Dane. Joanne's not in any trouble. She's a fine girl. What kind of trouble would she be in? No, no, I didn't say she was in any trouble. I just wanted to talk to her. Well, she ain't in. Where is she? Oh, Joanne's out for a walk. With Jimmy? Jimmy? What are you talking about? Her son, Jimmy. Mister, you got the wrong address. Joanne's got no son. Nobody lives here by the name of Jimmy. Say, what kind of a detective are you anyway? Yeah. What kind, Clover? Let's go find out. <laughs> Here are the vital statistics he asked for, Danny. Yeah? Hey, when are you going to take me to see South Pacific, Danny? Oh, any day now, doll. I'm just waiting for that inheritance. Oh, Danny, stop pulling my leg. Here. Know the vital statistics, Danny. <laughs> Read it to me, doll, because your voice is like honey. Read it to me. <laughs> Get him. James Dane, age four, son of Val and Joanne Dane. Died June 22nd, 1947. Cause of death, accidental poisoning. Death spasms took four hours. Remoteness of cabin and Adirondacks made it impossible to reach boy in time to help. Signed, Dr. James Robeson. Hey, hey, Danny, where are you going? I haven't finished. Danny, come back here. I've got some things to settle. I was out when you called before, Mr. Clover. Yeah, I know. Joanne, your landlady said you'd gone for a walk. With Jimmy. Jimmy loves to walk on a sunny day like this. Where's Jimmy now? Out playing. Joanne, I asked you before. Now, don't lie. When was the last time you saw Valdine? I won't lie. A few weeks ago, as I told you. A few weeks ago, yeah. Another question. Why did you go to see him? To ask him for money. I hated myself for it, but Jimmy needs clothes. You see, he'll be going to school this fall, and... I see. Joanne, did you take anything with you, anything that you gave to Val? Well, I, I don't think so. I can't remember that I did. Food? Why... Uh, food in jars, chicken, preserves, things like that? Well, now that you mention it, Mr. Clover, I... Yes, I think I... Yes, Joanne, you told Val that food was poison, didn't you? Just before you left, just before you closed the door behind you. You told Val it was poison, didn't you, Joanne? What are you talking about? Just before you locked the door and bolted it behind you, you told him that. You pointed a gun at him and told him that. Why should I do that? Joanne. Joanne, listen to me. Jimmy is dead, isn't he? Jimmy dead? <laughs> Jimmy dead? Jimmy died two years ago. You know that, Joanne. No, what? I don't know what you're saying. The Adirondacks, one summer two years ago. Jimmy took some poison by mistake. There was no way to get help soon enough. You and Val had to watch him die. You're making all that up. You blamed it on your husband. You blamed him for bringing you there because it was so remote. No, no, no. It wasn't that way at all. Yes, it was. You left that food with your husband, Joanne. You told him it was poisoned. You knew he'd never have courage to taste that food after seeing the way Jimmy died. Your husband took his chances with starvation rather than suffer the way Jimmy did. Jimmy suffer? Jimmy dead? Yes, Joanne, he's dead. These glass toys are only a lie that you're making yourself Put believe. Put them down. They're Jimmy's toys. Your final revenge, Joanne. You had to watch Val die. 
Yes. You came back each night to look through the skylight. Yes. Finally, when he was dead, you came back to remove that tape. That's when you saw me. Yes. And I wanted to kill you because I was frightened of you, Mr. Clover. That's the only reason. I didn't hate you then. You've got to believe me. I didn't hate you. Joanne. But I hate you now. And I've got to kill you now, Mr. Clover. I've got to. Joanne, put down that gun. I'll kill you. You you broke Jimmy's toys. You broke them. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, all your beautiful toys broken, broken. All your toys. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. How can you forgive me, son? I'm sorry. Hello? Give me the police department. This is Danny Clover. No, I don't want a riot squad. I want an ambulance. The doctor. It took 15 minutes for them to come, and in that time I watched the shadow soak up the remnants of her mind. How do you tell a woman her life is done? How do you fill it in reports? How do you make statistics out of it and file it in a ledger? How do you write sorrow as a number? How? Broadway's really living now. It's got a creamy yogi back in circulation. Cynthia is throwing a marvelous party for Patrolman Mishikev. And the ghost, Lyle Brooks, he's haunting another author. Broadway's jaunty now and it wears a chip on its shoulder. It's flexing its muscles and daring the nighttime. And before it's over, it'll tear itself apart and laugh at its own agony. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, was directed tonight by Cliff Howell, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. That man is coming back again. Yes, Arthur Godfrey is returning from his vacation. And he'll be helping some promising young performers up the ladder of success when Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts return to the air next Monday night over most of these same CBS network stations. Along with the Talent Scouts, you can hear such great shows as My Friend Irma, Inner Sanctum, The Lux Radio Theater, and The Bob Hawk Show, all on Monday nights and all on CBS. Stay tuned now for Mr. Keene, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you hear Lux Radio Theater every Monday, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's a neon-lighted revival meeting that screams for the joy and the salvation. And it's a lonely path that sighs down into darkness. It's a fury of voices and stamping feet, or a cry that wanders and waits to be heard. It's Happy Alley with Happy Talk, where a hot trumpet plays background music for a panhandler. However you want it, that's how it is. It's Broadway, my beat. The November twilight filtered into my office at police headquarters, and I sat there looking at it, pushing away the time for the filling out of my daily report. There were other diversions. Through the open window, I watched a girl walk down the street. She wore a green silk dress that knew summer was over but didn't care. Then I heard two things, a sigh that came from me, 
and a door opening that came from the door. I have no wish to trespass upon a reverie of delight, Daniel. There was only one man who could talk to me like that. A miniature of a man called Lee Kai. Lee Kai, professor of oriental art at the university. He hadn't changed. The same black military-looking jacket that buttoned high on the throat. The same patent leather shoes with spats slightly pink. And the face still as if it had been engraved on yellow shantung. Daniel, may I presume upon you? <laughs> Anything you want, Lee, any time. Then permit me to read you this telegram. Is that all? You could have presumed bigger. I shall, when you have read the telegram. It is addressed to me, and it says in three words, Terror follows me. It is signed Mei Ling. Only three words. Is not ten words the usual? Yeah. He's a frugal one, this Mei Ling, huh? Mei Ling is a delicate interweaving of all that is lovely and exquisite in a girl. I do not think she meant to be frugal. I do not think I know what you're talking about. Of course. Therefore, I will explain. You see, Mei Ling, this lovely girl of whom I have told you so much already, hmm? she brings me a statuette of the goddess Kuan Yin, the Chinese goddess of mercy. And among friends, there is no need for circumlocution. Of course. Uh, for what? Circumlocution, of course. Oh. The Kuan Yin was smuggled out of my bleeding China, Daniel. It is worth approximately... A hundred thousand dollars. Mei Ling was bringing it to me. And now, in three words, terror follows her. You understand what I need of you? Not yet. I want you to meet Mei Ling's train at 125th Street at 8 tonight. She is in private car 23. You will give her the protection from the terror that follows her, Daniel. Oh, we have uh, other departments for that, Lee. I could... But uh, you are the friend department. No, Daniel. In the nighttime, the 125th Street station hangs over the edge of a glittering world. Arrival and departure have a special meaning in the dark. There are shadows between everything, and the talk is always whispers. I walked out on the concrete platform toward the light on the bulk of the train, and I saw him, the man in a conductor's cap, holding a lantern and looking down at his watch. I asked him a question. Car 23, next one down through this empty coach. Oh, thanks. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Can't get in 23, private coach. That's well, all right. I just want... Nope, to... can't let you on. Nope. Sorry, but no nope. orders. Want to see something? Huh? Look at this for a second. Go oh, hold it up to the light. Yeah. Police badge, eh? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, train pulls out in seven minutes, mister. Oh, bury me not all alone, prairie. I... Oh, excuse me, mister. I didn't know where... Hey, you big enough to come from Texas. Are you from Texas? No, now, if you'll let me through well, here... Well, city fella, huh? You know how I can tell? City fella's always in a hurry. That's how I can tell. Yeah, now, one side, friend. Now, in Texas, it's different. People are friendly. Just folks down in Texas. I'll show you what I mean here. Here. <laughs> You have a drink. Maybe I didn't understand. I said one side, friend. Hey, you meaner than a shoat with a cut snout. No drink, huh? Well, Texan don't prejudice a man because he ain't no drinker. Let me tell you about Texas. Maybe I got to prove it to you. Out of the way. Uh, uh, oh, you got the idea. Sure, sure, I got the idea. See if you can get this one through your head. Oh, oh. What are you... Central oh. Station. Hey, hey, you, wake up. <sighs> now, don't ask me where you are. I've been shouting out my lungs where you are. Oh. Come on, come on, get them, get them. Come. There you are. Hey, you're the policeman. Yeah, the finest of the finest. Stumbled, huh? Later. First, I was slugged. Feature that. You feature it. I haven't made car 23 yet. Hey, hey, come back here. I've got to write a report. <laughs> I finally did. I finally made it. Car 23. Inside, the place was a shambles. Upholstery ripped, baggage opened and tossed across the seats as if someone had been in a desperate hurry to find something. I noticed her then. She was sitting there, very lovely, very delicate. The frown pressed at the corners of her lips. 
I guessed her name was Mei Ling. But I knew she was dead. The bullet hole between the almond eyes made this common knowledge to anyone who took the time to look. To a policeman, a death scene is a place of business. There was nothing there that looked like a priceless statuary called Kuan Yin. I made some notes, called the station master, then found a phone booth to make the violent death of Mei Ling by person or persons unknown a matter of routine. Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. Danny Clover. Mei Ling's dead. Send the boys down to Grand Central. Photographers, fingerprints, technical, the whole crew. The coroner, too. I'll wait for them. Okay. Hey, say, Danny, a guy called. Said he wanted to talk to you. Said it was urgent. Who said all that? John Smith. Well, that's what he said his name was, John Smith. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. He said something about, a. uh, uh, uh wait a minute, here, I'll, I'll spell it to you. K-U-A-N-Y-I... Kwan Yin? Uh, yeah, yeah, Danny, that's it. What's John Smith's address? 1212 Mott Street, got it? Yeah. Goodbye, Tartaglia. Anyone who wanted to see me about a Kwan Yin was a man I wanted to see. I waited around Grand Central until the crew from headquarters arrived, then I took off my squad car and hit Mott Street in ten minutes. The red brick pagoda that bore the address of one John Smith held all the charm and grace of a 20th century housing project. The only thing oriental about it was a cast iron dragon that snarled at me from the door knocker. I picked up its head and banged it against the door. Ah, you would be Danny Clover. And I would be John Smith. The ecstasy is mutual. Please enter. The thing that stood in front of me I didn't believe was a mound of flesh wrapped in a scented mandarin's robe. Perched on its shoulder was a small white monkey with enormous eyes that loathed me with an enormous loathe. John Smith looked like a fat crock of Ming pottery but he talked as if he'd spent a lot of time tilling the good earth around Harvard. You admire my monkey, Danny Clover. Rest assured, he admires you. I hate him. Get him out of here. <laughs> you are frank, Danny Clover. We shall get along splendidly. Now, run along to bed, Max. It's way beyond, you know. I'll tuck you in later, Max. Now go, go. Revolting beast, isn't he? I say that deliberately. <laughs> it depends on your point of view. Me. I find all the answers to all the mysteries of eternity in Max's eyes. Hmm. You gaze at my house. You like it. Yeah, looks like you've collected all the loot in China. Cozy, though. Spurious loot, Danny Clover. It's all fake. These statuettes, for instance, tourist stuff. Hmm? And all this rubbish, nothing so delicate or so desirable as the Kuan Yin image. An evanescent image. A will-o'-the-wisp image. You don't say. Tell me more. I shall. A most intimate source in Hong Kong has revealed to me that the fabulous, the priceless Kuan Yin has vanished. Do you have a theory as to where she might be? Should I have a theory? I thought perhaps the eminent oriental art expert known to both of us as Li Kai may have helped you formulate one. Your most intimate source operates in New York, too. I have other intimates. Besides Max... Try one from Texas. Texas? What is that? A person, place, or object? You know I wouldn't know. Exactly. And now, Danny Clover, a word of caution. The Kuan Yin is a legend among my people. A fairy tale. Fairy tales are sometimes bloody. A most discerning observation. On a sensitive and intelligent mind, they can leave a most fatal scar. Sometimes not only on the mind. It's sweet the way you try to scare me. The Kuan Yin is a goddess of mercy and compassion. If you know where she is, may she watch over you. If you don't, we have nothing further to discuss. And now I must tuck Max in. Au revoir, Danny Clover. I shook his hand, watched him wince then bowed out of his fat presence. John Smith was a man who would keep. Now there was one place I just had to go, to the university, to break the news to Lee Kai. It was at this time in my life that I exploded the myth that the thirst for knowledge never ceases. The door to the arts and science building was locked. 
It took me a half hour to find the night watchman, go through the policeman's badge routine, and, and get ushered to the self-service elevator. Wait a minute. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel silly saying this, but... Floor, please. The third. Oh, good. Me too. I've never seen you about the building. What are you in, arts or sciences? I never knew which. I'm Danny Clover, a policeman. Oh? Mm-hmm. And you're in, uh... Seismology. I'm Professor Higgins. Professor? Oh. Here we are. Third floor. Oh, yeah. You, um, were saying... I was saying Professor of Seismology with a question mark after it. What is seismology, exactly? Exactly. It's that branch of geophysics which has to do with earthquakes and their attendant phenomena. Mm Mm-hmm. Here's my lab. Good night. Oh, before you go, uh, and in non-scientific terms, could you tell me where Professor Lee Kai's office is? Lee Kai? Yeah. How nice. In the Argo, any friend of his is a friend of mine. Now we'll shake hands. I'm glad to know you. I'll show you his office. You've known Lee Kai for a long time. Why, he slapped my... He was in attendance when I was born. There were no doctors nearby then. In China, Mr. Clover. In the interior. Oh, and from that moment on, you became interested in earthquakes and their uh, attendant phenomena. Pretty nearly. Understand, Mr. Clover, I enjoy seismology. A girl can always make her way in the world with a good, sound knowledge of seismology, I always say. I always say the same thing. (laughs) It does make for dull conversation, doesn't it? Well, uh... Here. Here's Lee Kai's office. Professor Kai. Professor Kai. Professor Kai! There was only one man who could lie on the floor like that, a miniature of a man called Lee Kai. He had only changed a little bit. The patent leathers were the same, and the spats, the crinkled face. But the small change made a big difference. The sharp object sticking in the middle of his black military-looking jacket made him a venerable ancestor to whatever good he'd done in this world. I knelt down beside him. It was a letter opener plunged deep into his back. And on its handle it said, Acme Life Assurance Company, put your life in our hands. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. 50,000 or more, always in the jackpot on Sing It Again. Music by Gene Autry and Vaughn Monroe. Mystery and thrills with gangbusters Philip Marlowe, Johnny Dollar, and Danny Clover, the Broadway cop. That's the one-way ticket to top fun on most of these CBS stations every Saturday night. This fall, when you hear them all on CBS, Saturday night promises top music, top adventure, and a chance at radio's top prize. There's this about Broadway. It savors the exotic while it's taking bites out of a hot dog. The deaths of Mei Ling and Lee Kai were duly reported for the next morning's newsstands, were scanned by the crowd while reaching for their respective mustard jars. Then Broadway went about its business. You can't blame Broadway. It's got too many other things to consider, like tea formations and mass substitutions, the weather, making a buck. But a policeman with a murder in his hands has to make a world outside all that. Mine revolved about a specific Chinese statuette called Quan Yin, and incidentally worth $100,000. It also included paying final respects. I took a ride down to a twisted alley off of Mott Street. The festivities for Lee Kai's funeral had already begun. Venerable Chinese ladies and gentlemen stood on the curb and with great ceremony lighted firecrackers and tossed them serenely into the air. As the body of Lee Kai approached, others tossed money into his open coffin to ensure his price of admission into heaven. Walking directly behind was a lady by the name of Higgins, Professor Kate Higgins. She was dressed in a mandarin robe, and her tears were the tears some enchanted princess might weep. There were only two, one under each eye, and each one a jewel. And then across the street through the procession, a face that I had seen once before in a train station brought me back. Pardon me. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, pardon. 
Tell me what Texas, kid. I got more time now. Oh, who are you? Why leave a great place like Texas just to strong arm a city fella? Take off, friend. They warned me about talking to strangers. In here, friend, in this alleyway where we can be far from the city's rattle. In here where we can be parts. In here. Take your hands off of me. Talk to me, pard. Who told you to slug me on that train? I can do it now without nobody whispering in my ear. Do it. Yeah. Oh. 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 It's going to be a well-filled saddle tonight in the old Hooskow. Come in. I was looking for Professor Higgins. This is her laboratory, isn't it? Yes. The professor isn't in. I'm John Scarn, her assistant. Danny Clover, police. Oh. Uh, social or business? I only ask because Kate has such various callers. Last week, it was a gentleman peddling hot Persian prayer rugs. I got quite a size him out of him. Size him? You're not hep, are you? Size him. Earthquake. A big bang. Tell me, uh, what do you do around here when you're not having seisms? Well, I'll explain it to you. See, these things here are seismographs. They're connected to another machine embedded in concrete below this building. Oh. If there's an earth tremor, it's picked up by the machine downstairs and recorded on these. I see. Uh, and this needle here writing on this rotating drum records the time of the shock. Precisely. Interesting. Mind if I take a closer look? Well, take it easy, Mr. Clover. We don't need a tembler to disturb the needle, you know. It's very delicately balanced. It'll even record footsteps that come too close to it. What do you do with these recordings after you've got them? File them. Each recording is for a 24-hour period. Unfile yesterday's reports and send them to my office. Well, but... And do you get reports from other stations that do this work? Yes, every day, but... Send yesterday's, all of them, down to police headquarters. Now, see here... Mr. Scarn, you had your size them today? I'll send everything down just as soon as I can get them together. Good. And quietly. No one's to know. Uh, another thing, Mr. Scarn. Who has access to this lamp? Why, just Kate and me... And, well, yes, the night watchman. Yes, we three. We have the only keys, I believe. Thanks. And Kate, uh, uh, Professor Higgins, where would I find her? Perhaps at her apartment. 125 Morningside Drive, I believe. Thanks again, Mr. Scott. <laughs> something on. I'll wait. Clover, why is it that everything happens to you while you're on duty? Uh, maybe it's because you're on duty. Oh, it's you. How nice. You caught me just as I stepped out of the shower, so you'll have to take me as I am, robe and all. Come in. I could wait outside until you... Uh... <laughs> A shy policeman, how charming. You can trust me. Go on in. Thank you, Professor. Over there, but the fire's nice. I always dry myself by the fire, but you interrupted that. Easy, Clover. I'm here. Tell me. I didn't say anything. Oh. Shall I get us something? A drink? Do you object to the phonograph? Some men do, you know. I saw you at Lee Kai's funeral. I saw you, too. You're different now. You're not. That's right. I'm still thirsting for knowledge. So talk to me about things Chinese, Professor. The, uh, Quan Yin, for instance? For instance? A miraculous goddess believed by the Chinese to have only to kiss a wound to make it vanish. A hundred thousand dollars a kiss. It's expensive healing. There are some who would pay more. Two murders, maybe? More, if they have to. Yeah. You told me Lee Kai slapped you into the first breath he ever took. What else did he do for you? Everything. He was my father, my brother, my companion, my teacher. And, uh, Mei Ling? I didn't know everyone in China, policeman. Nice policeman. And a man named John Smith? John Doe, yes. John Smith, no. Give up. <sighs> All right. Invite me to an earthquake sometime, will you? I'll take time out for it. You'll love it. There's nothing quite so exciting as when the earth moves. Danny? Yeah? The Guan Yin. 
You could give her to me. I'm only a professor on a professor's salary, but I could think of some way to pay you for it. Oh? What makes you think I've got the quinine? Because Lee told me he'd gone to you. Because you found Mei Ling. Because it would have been simple for you to steal it from a dead girl. Yeah, it would have been. But you know, I, I didn't think of it. Also, she didn't have it. Now it's your turn again. Lee Kai would want me to have it. No one else. I'll make a note of it, Professor. Now, uh, would you unlock the door, please? I promised Mother I'd be home early. Of course. There's frustration everywhere, isn't there, policeman? Nothing but frustration. I think I remembered to tip my hat. I know I remembered to get back to police headquarters. I hustled Sergeant Tartaglia off his fat comic book and sat down at my desk to go over the sheaf of seismographs I had Scarn sent down. Not only were they dull reading, but for a long time they didn't make sense. I kept trying. <coughs> you can talk, Tartaglia. Item one, Danny. I've questioned the Texas cowboy in his cell. Mm -hmm. The breath won't talk. Won't open his mouth. Hey, in a Texan, this must be some kind of terrible disease. Okay, physician. Item two. Item two is alibis. Good and indifferent. At the time of Lee Kai's murder, John Smith was giving a dinner party. Assistant Scon was calling a square dance. Hey, you know, Danny, they're fun. You ever been to one? Well, ask me sometime, Dodaglio. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, item two continued. Professor Higgins was to a movie. The night watchman checked in at the station the other side of the campus. Item three. San Francisco Customs reports this Mei Ling never had no Quan Yin. Tell me that again. The Quan Yin Mei Ling was supposed to have. She never had it. Danny, this means two people was killed for something they didn't have. Huh? You said something to Tugger? When San Francisco Customs reported they had no records in the Quan Yin, something clicked into place. If the Quan Yin existed at all, I figured there was only one place where it could exist. So I went there. Back to the university in the office of Li Kai, lecturer and collector of Chinese art, now deceased. Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. We thought perhaps we would meet you here. The place was a mess. Standing in the midst of the debris was the monkey-owning poet John Smith. And in a corner with a soft light playing with the amber of her hair was Kate Higgins. Danny Clover, it's always a delight to be where you are. The policeman is a meddling, stupid fool, Kate. Yeah, you warned me, didn't you? First to the hired thug, then during a lecture on spurious loot. Mr. Clover, I'm afraid I must dispense with you. Let him talk. I like to watch his mouth. Thanks. So I'll talk. Lee Kai was a wise little man. He had the Kuan Yin all the time. All he wanted was to find out who was trying to get it away from him. He came to me because he knew his enemies would follow him to me. And it backfired, shall we say. In his face. His and Mei Ling, the girl with whom he planned the whole puppet show. You have talked enough, Mr. Clover. Quite enough. I've been watching Smith, but where that knife came from, I'll never know. He held it low, slanting upwards for ripping, and then he lunged at me. I sidestepped and reached back, grabbed one of Lee Kai's art figures, and threw it at his head. He ducked, and the statue shattered against the wall. Kuan Yin. The Kuan Yin. And there it was, an ebony image shining with some inner light. It held us in a kind of suspended trance. Lee Kai had been clever. He'd encrusted the Quan Yin in a cheap plaster cast and set it alongside the rest of his art, one of the oldest tricks in the world. I came out of the trance faster than John Smith did. He lay there with the rest of the crockery, just as pale, just as broken, just as unconscious. He can no longer harm you, Danny. He was an evil man. Yeah, and tricky. Hiring that hatchet man, McGrath, to kill Mei Ling and slug me on the train. Kate. Yes, Danny? Maybe I shouldn't ask you this, Kate. But how come you were with Smith? I knew his greed would finally lead him to Kuan Yin, as your curiosity led you to her. And to me. To me, Danny... Kate, do you always repay kindness with murder? 
What are you talking about? You killed Lee Kai. Danny, you're insane. Why do you talk like that? Because the seismograph in your lab registered a disturbance at 9 o'clock last night, the time of Lee Kai's murder. How do you know it wasn't the recording of a minor shock someplace in the world? Because no other laboratory picked it up. That's when you stabbed him, Kate, at 9 o'clock. You said you were at the movies. Nobody could prove that. Danny. But you weren't, Kate. You weren't at the movies. You were in your lab. You stabbed Lee Kai and dragged his body down the hall to his office. He was a small man. You could have done that. Yes. It's no use. You would deprive me of the Kuan Yin anyhow. Two killings for the goddess of mercy. Doesn't add up. I would kill anyone who would deprive me of the Kuan Yin. Yes, you too. If I could now. Danny? Uh Uh-huh. Let me hold the Kuan Yin, Danny. Kuan Yin? Yeah. Here. Kuan Yin. Fabulous. Kuan Yin. I watched her hand slide down the side of her cheek and her body go taut. Her eyes fixed and the Kuan Yin narrowed. I caught her before she fell to the floor. When the boys from headquarters came, it took four of them to heave John Smith onto a stretcher. They started for Kate Higgins. I told them to mark her fragile. Even a professor of earthquakes can break. In the November sun, Broadway shimmers like some frozen city rising out of a frozen lake. It's clear, crystal clear, and its air is fresh and clean. You close your eyes because you know it's a lie. The easy laughter that snarls when your back is turned. The spectaculars that advertise the grave. The welcoming hand that turns to ice in yours. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway is My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Mary Jane Croft, Charles Calvert, William Johnstone, Barton Yarborough, William Conrad, Junius Matthews, and Jerry Hausner. Stay tuned for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's a time on Broadway when the fury dies. The revelers give up and the street is an empty corner of a faraway world. It's four o'clock in the morning. The time of yesterday's newspaper drifting with the night wind. The time of the tired shadow and furtive sounds dimly heard. And you walk it because you're a policeman and your day's just over. You turn a corner because it's the way home. And some of the shadows melt into a man and you're glad because it's a man you know. Hi, Danny. John. How are you? Fine, you? Good. You got your transfer, huh? Yeah, and I like it. I guess I'll always be pounding a beat and shaking doors. But I like doing it better here. What's new, Danny? I don't know, John. The same, I guess. Hey. From down the street, help probably me. just... Help me! Help me! Come on. Some... Right over there. Someone's in a hurry to leave. That car, no light. Here's what they left. This man's been badly beaten up. Call box down the street. I'll get an ambulance. Wait. No need. Dead? Yeah. Go for him, John. See who he is. Okay. 
you notice that truck in the alley, Danny? Yeah, I'll take a look. Can I find anything? Uh-uh. No wallet. Looks like he was beaten for it. You? The truck's a bakery truck, the Felder Bakery. It's not far from here, on First Avenue near 39th. It's on the beat. Yeah, this man in white shirt and white pants could be a delivery uniform. Sure, they're open 24 hours a day. Call it in, John, then stick with it. I'll get over to the bakery. Maybe those people can tell me something. They told me a man wanted to see me. You the man? Yes. Mr. Felder? Uh-huh, Louis Felder. Uh, look, friend, I'm sorry I can't help you. I got all the men I need to handle what I got. I suggest you try the Baker's Union. Uh, they... Uh, try the union. I'm from the police, Mr. Felder. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. No disrespect intended. It, it just that so many men come in asking me for work. If there's been a complaint, I'll product one of my employees. Truck 12. Who drives it? 12? You mean tonight? Tonight. Yeah, I'll find out. Hey! Who was on 12 tonight? Huh? What do you want? Who drove 12 tonight? Well, just a minute. Morris had it tonight. Oh, of course. Mar- Morris Bernstein. Good man. Certainly Morris has... He's dead. He was killed. Morris? In, in an accident? His truck was torn apart. He was beaten to death. Oh, I've been afraid, afraid. Of what, Mr. Felder? Something like this would happen. One night they would beat a man until he died. Who? Hoodlums, rat pack. We don't know. Happened to another one of my boys last week. They turned over his truck, threw the bread into the gutter, attacked him. I'd like to talk to him. Uh, naturally. Sid! Sid Norman! Still here? Yeah, yes, okay, okay. Want me, Mr. Felder? Yeah. A little bit late. I should be out in the route. Yeah, this man is from the police, Sid. Morris was killed tonight. Beaten up? Why did you say that, Sid? Well, because it follows. It happened to me last week, but yeah, I was lucky. I ran away from him. Morris probably stopped to reason with him. He was that kind of a man. Could you recognize any of them, Sid? No, they jumped me when my back was turned. I was gathering up loaves of bread, sweet rolls, things like that, and something hit me in the back of the head. I didn't stop to say hello. I just ran. How many were there? Could you tell me that? Oh, four or five, maybe. Punks, just kids. I could tell by their voices. Gee, the kids nowadays. They gather in rat packs and, and kill... Mr. Felder, any reason this should happen to your trucks, your men? I, I don't know. Maybe it's because my men are out alone at four o'clock in the morning. I don't remember ever doing anything wrong. Hey, excuse me, please. Stop the machines! Stop the ovens! You don't work anymore today. Go home. <laughs> but then men didn't look happy. They looked worried. It was as if suddenly the scene were taking place in slow motion. The tentative movements, the glances, one man detaching himself from the rest, walking over to Louis Felder, then the rest forming a questioning circle around him. But Mr. Felder just shook his head and walked through the door. It was 4.30, and I went home. At 10 o'clock, I was back at headquarters. There was a man waiting for me in my office, just as I knew he would be. The fates had fashioned it that way. They'd grinned and put their heads together and conspired that Sergeant Tataglia should always be waiting in my office when I closed the door behind me. Here we are, Danny. We are indeed. I understand you had a pretty rough night of it. (laughs) You're going to brighten up what otherwise might be a drab day, is that it? My utter best, Danny. Thanks. What do you got? This baseball cap found some 50 feet from the scene of the beating up in the gutter. It might or might not have something to do with what happened. The last is my own comment upon matters. Let's see it. Yeah, Danny, here. If you will notice, on the inside there's a sweatband, and on the sweatband is printed in ink a name and address. Uh-huh. My middle boy, Rufio Tataglia, did the same to his three prapini. Gabe Kirby, it says. 1412 West 18th. Uh, that's pretty far from where Morris Bernstein was killed, Danny. So, like I said, this cap might or might not have something uh, to do... Let me find out, huh, Tataglia? The address printed neatly in the baseball cap was a cold-water tenement, a scar, an open wound fashioned of peeling brownstone, of litter, of something that scurried under your feet, then darted into a hole. It watched you with bloodshot eyes as you walked up the stairs. Then at the landing, you heard it come out again. 
You knocked at a door, and a woman, haggard, resigned, told you her son Gabe was at school, the 16th Street Vocational School. And at the school, a man sighed, shrugged, walked away from you, came back with Gabe Kirby, and said you could use his office. He was used to it. Then he left you alone with Gabe. The principal pulled me away from something very interesting. The secret life of a drain pipe. Plumbing two-way. Why did he do that? Sit down, Gabe. Oh, the courteous approach. I've been making a catalog how you guys approach us guys. Yours is a courtesy type. Glad to add it to my collection. You've been in trouble before, Gabe. Uh, lots of times, huh? I wouldn't say lots. I'm only 18 years old. My share, though. Yeah, I had my share. Yeah. This is baseball cap. Belong to you? Hey, you're a blue ribbon retriever. I've been missing that cap for a month now. How about that? I never dreamed I'd see that cap again. Gabe. I'm sorry, pal. I can't offer you a reward, but I'll even it up for you. Someday when conditions are better. Gabe. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for bringing back me cap. It's a good luck charm. My bat and average... Sit down, Gabe. I said sit down. Okay, okay. The approach changes. Huh, Mr. Policeman? Where were you last night, Gabe? Somebody broke into a grocery store last night? Where were you? I slept on an iron cot. All night. Not at home, Gabe. Your mother told me you went home last night. Oh, the old lady told you that. Thank her for me. Where were you? In a room over a garage. We call it a club room. I belong to a club. The Titans. Last night I slept there. We take turns sleeping there, we boys. To watch over a lot of things we wish we had. You were there all night? All night. From 8 o'clock on. You can check with Richie. Richie? Who's he? You don't know Richie. Mr. Richard Peel? An important man. He's the athletic director of the Titans. Volunteered for the job. He sets us boys a good example. The other Titans, where were they? Who knows? I was sleepy, so I went to sleep. Check with Mr. Peel. Gabe, your cap was found 50 feet from where a man was killed. Beaten up and killed by a gang. A man named Morris Bernstein. Morris Bernstein. And my cap was there, huh? Well, how about that? Check with Mr. Peel, Mr. Policeman. Over to Conway Garage on 20th. And now I hear Plumbing Two-Way calling me. Uh, you'll excuse me? Hey. Hey, you. You looking for someone? Yeah, I am. Well, who are you looking for, mister? Uh, Richard Peel. You found him. You from the employment agency? No. Oh, I thought you were from the agency. Police. I thought you were from the agency. There's no phone here. They said they'd send a man over if anything turned up for me. What do you do here, Mr. Peel? What do you mean? Well, this place, uh, over a garage, empty. Not empty, Mr. Uh... Clover. Not empty, Mr. Clover. Look around. We've got some equipment. Barbells, wall exercises. Enough for now. This is where the Titans meet, huh? That's right. We'll get it fixed up. I still don't understand. I mean, what do you do here? I thought you'd know by now. The boys need a direction. I try to give them that. Get them off the street. Organize teams, you know. You like doing that. A man has an obligation to kids. Haven't you ever told yourself that, Mr. Clover? Especially about kids who come up here without roots, broken homes, drunken fathers and working mothers, or worse. It's my obligation. Yeah, I suppose more people should feel the way you do. Somebody has to. <laughs> what am I telling you for? You'd know. Ever read any statistics on juvenile delinquency? Uh huh. Then you'd be the one to know. These kids need something. To let them know their heritage, rights, things like that. Give them direction. They don't find that on the street. There's a reason I came up here, Mr. Peel. I know. Not many adults come up here. They're just not interested. It's about Gabe Kirby. Well, something's bothering you, I can tell. Just what about Gabe? He said he was here last night, all night. I know why he said that. Because he was. Seems to me... I know just what you're going to say. And it seems to you a boy 18 years shouldn't stay out all night. All right, suppose Gabe went home. What'd it be there for him? The drunken father I told you about. You'd swear he was here all night. On that cot over there. And I slept on the other one. I assure you, Mr. Clover, if some young man got into trouble last night, it wasn't Gabe Kirby. You have my 100% word on that. <laughs> Mr. Peel found my hand, shook it, looked me straight in the eye 100% and invited me to address a meeting of the Titans. The boys would appreciate friendly advice from a friendly policeman, he assured me. I mumbled something and got out. (laughs) 
At headquarters, the routine of tracing down the murderers of Morris Bernstein gnawed at the day until there was nothing left but the nighttime. I gave it up and went home to sleep. That didn't work either, so I went back to headquarters. The files on rat packs, from a social point of view, from a criminal point of view, from a statistical point of view, educational, but no help in the murder of Morris Bernstein. So I thought I'd try to sleep again. At two in the morning, it should come. It didn't. On the street, back to it, a friend stopped me. Officer Rucker. How you, Danny? Long day, huh? Yeah. How's it been for you? Quiet, Danny. Not a peep. Nothing? Nobody? I've been keeping a close eye on every person, every car. If they don't look right, I question them. So far, nothing. You'll keep on it, huh, John? You told me to do that. It won't change. Hey, good night, John. Get some sleep, Danny. It'll do you good. Danny, Danny, you all right? Yeah. Just knocked me down. License? No lights. No license, Danny. I was blind. Didn't they see me? They saw you all right. You're lucky, Danny, because whoever it was, they tried to kill you. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Every Saturday evening, two top music makers bring CBS listeners an hour of great entertainment. Vaughn Monroe is on hand with his famous band playing the five top tunes of the week as chosen by Variety. Gene Autry then comes along with a half hour of ranch ballads and roundup comedy. The Vaughn Monroe Caravan and the Gene Autry Show are regular Saturday evening features on most of these same CBS stations. Hear them both this Saturday. Night slips out of Broadway's fingers. Broadway is left alone, empty-handed and bewildered. The long, long day, 100% pure, 100% unadulterated, now walks the street and invites. So what's to do, kid? Well, there's the guy at the newsstand to the comic books and the hot tips. No. Well, there's the pinball machines and the flea circus. Uh-uh. Well, there's the trash baskets with the morning papers. Try that. Hmm. Day old murder of a bakery driver warmed over for this morning's commuters. Nothing. A policeman run down by an unidentified car. Better. And at police headquarters, you try to readjust the adhesive on your ribs when the door bursts open. Danny, what do you think you're doing? Leave the bandage alone. Oh, don't get upset, Dr. Sinsky. I was just trying to ease it a little. Take your hands away from it. Here, here let me look. It's uh, all right, isn't it? Who did this job on you? The boys in the police emergency hospital. Oh, medical students, amateurs, college boys. That bad. As a matter of fact, it excites a certain envy in me, Danny. This is a very progressive way to apply a bandage to a cracked rib. Hmm. <laughs> what are you doing? Hurts, huh? That's good. Serves you right. You couldn't call your old friend Dr. Sinsky no matter what time of night. You don't approve of Sinsky's oh, methods. It's not that. I, uh, the next time someone tries to kill you, Danny, please call on me. Do that for an old friend, please. <laughs> you made a deal. Hmm. Contusions, abrasions. Well, this will leave a small scar to make you interesting. Otherwise, you'll live. Thank you, Doctor. I can button up my shirt now. What's the matter? I uh, called on you for another reason, too, Danny. Yeah? Uh, here, let me help you with the buttoning. Uh, yeah, Danny, we uh, we completed the examination of the body of Morris Bernstein. And? I won't bore you with medical terminology, but the man was beaten in such a way. A new way for hoodlums, methodically, systematically, beaten after, even after he sank into unconsciousness. Whoever attacked him, Danny, made sure Morris Bernstein would die. Doctor, that uh, slip of paper on my desk that I tell you just brought in. Oh, of course. There's an address. Uh-huh. Uh, 2650 Riverside Drive. Who's Danny? Morris Bernstein's. I'm going to find out why somebody wanted him dead. <laughs> I beg your pardon, are you... The, the... Whatever you want me to be, that's what I am. In this place... Oh, pardon me. Russell speaking. Again. 
Look, Mrs. Braverman, just tell Mr. Braverman to pull down the blinds. That's my only advice to you. How do you like that? Somebody wanted to look at Mr. Braverman. Now, what is your complaint? My name's Clover, from the police. Here are my wrists. Slip the handcuffs on them. Take me far away. A rain solitaire. <laughs> you don't look like a criminal, Mr. Russell. You've been working here long? Uh, I'm a new boy. I'm just breaking in one month. Did you know Morris Bernstein? I read about him in the papers, about hoodlums beating him up. I'm trying to find out something about it. Well, I can tell you this. He lived in apartment six, a four-room apartment shared by four other gentlemen who had exclusive rights to use kitchen number 2A. Otherwise, it was just it's a nice day. Yes, isn't it? Between Mr. Bernstein and me. Anyone up there in his apartment now? Any of the four gentlemen? I curtsied them all out on their way to work this morning. I'll uh, want to talk to them later. About seven o'clock, I think. That's when they'll all be home from the world. Another party, please? Russell speaking. Yes, Mr. Scar on the mail is in. And how do I know whether you've got anything? I haven't put it up yet. Well, all right, then. We'll wait for him. It's a rebel, Mr. Clover. He wants me to see if he has any mail before I put it in his box. I'll wait. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, Giordano, Westfall, Valentine. Uh, uh, look, Mr. Clover. What? A letter for Morris Bernstein. Uh, let me have it. Uh, sure. I can tell you who it's from. The girl whose name and address is on the upper left-hand corner. Well, I can see that. Yes, but this girl, she's Morris's girlfriend. They write letters to each other, even though they could phone... This has been going on since the girl moved away from here. Oh? When did that happen? Oh, just before I came to work here. Someone told me. Let me see. Maybe Morris. Uh, Mr. Scarn? Were you clicking? No mail, Mr. Scarn. There was no more mail for Mr. Scarn, and sorry. No more information about Morris Bernstein. Very sorry. Try the girl, Leah Golden, on the return address. Maybe she could help. Maybe Leah could. I tried it. At a rooming house on West 76, a woman shook a mop out a window and told me Leah Golden had moved to another rooming house on West 90th, 2346 West 90th. It took 10 minutes. No Leah Golden moved to a furnished room in a flat on 116th Street. A kid told me Miss Golden was a nice lady. Gave him bubble gum, but was gone now. Moved. Don't ask nobody where, mister, because nobody knows. At headquarters, I put out an all-points bulletin on Leah Golden. Find her, I said. What does she look like, they asked me. I added it up for them. All the scraps of description I'd salvaged in darkened hallways on the screaming street. Find her, I said. And at one in the morning... Danny? Danny, you're asleep? <sighs> no, Dr. Sinsky. Well, there's no time, Danny. They found Leah Golden. What? The call came to my office routine. Then she's... No, Danny. Just hurt. How bad, I don't know. Where? In a vacant lot on Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, the man who found her said she was beaten up. The ambulance is waiting. I thought... Well, let's go. From somewhere out of the alleys, detaching themselves from the shadowed streets, from the unlit doorways, breaking away from the night whispering, they'd come. The seekers after someone else's pain. They stood in a circle, silent, hungry for the spectacle. Stood on tiptoe, strained for a look at the girl lying broken in a patch of weeds. The policemen held them back, and they murmured their seething protest. And in the building standing at the edge of the lot, windows had been flung open, heads poked out of them, and the gallery seats were filled. Dr. Sinsky pushed a way open for us, and they retreated from his fury. Then he kneeled at the girl's side. Uh, uh, my case, Danny, a, a bottle. Give it to me. This one? Hey, yeah, yeah, quickly. So much blood. Miss Golden. Not now, Danny, not now. I'm sorry. But... In the morning, you can question her in the morning. Maybe. What's all the excitement? A garbage mail mover. Who was that? You up there in that building. Who was that? Danny, I need help with the girl. But gently, very gently. I nodded another officer into the building to look out for who had yelled down to us. To bring him to me, I'd be at headquarters. And I helped Dr. Sinsky. Back at headquarters, I waited. The officer came in, reported no one in the building knew who it was that yelled. Then later, a couple of hours later, word came down from Dr. Sinsky that I could talk to the girl. Miss Golden? You are Mr. Clover. The nurse told me. Before you sit down... Yeah? Will you crank up this bed so I can sit up so we can talk better? Oh, sure. All right. Oh. oh, 
pull it down. Oh, my back. I, I didn't realize. That's better. I can come back later, Miss Golden. No. All right. But if it's too much to talk Please. now... Please. Who beat you up? I don't know. Boys, young men. I'd never seen them before. No faces you'd recognize? No faces, but... But the names they call me... I've heard them before. In Europe. Uh -huh. There's something else. You want to know why I was running away? We need to know it. I was running away from a man. Morris Bernstein? No. Oh, no. Then who? I don't understand it. Wait. I lived at the same apartment house that Morris did. I know. That's why we were... I met him there, Morris. We, I don't know, we went to the movies together and did things like walking and looking at each other's face. Something was happening between us. Something... I always hated the word love. He said it it wasn't enough. Then why were you running? A man worked there at the apartment house. What man? He wanted me to. He, he said that a nice girl like me shouldn't be spending all that money for rent. He said that. What man? Listen to me. One night he walked into my room. I tried to reason with him, but he wasn't hearing me, so I screamed. He ran away out of the room. Didn't you tell someone about it? Morris? Morris had him discharged. He went to the owner of the building and had him discharged. The man's name, Miss Golden? I don't know. What, you? The, the name he, they call him by, that's all. Richie. They called him that, and after that I ran, but, but he followed me. Wherever I ran, he followed. You, you'll be all right, Miss Golden. I'll, I'll try to make it that way. <laughs> Clover, come back to the clubhouse to look for me? Yeah, I am. How are you feeling, Mr. Peel? I'll feel better after this. <sighs> Nothing like a workout on the barbells to make a man feel good. Uh-huh. You caught me in the middle of some repetition presses, Mr. Clover. Press away. I'll wait. Thanks. Well, I relax between exercises, Mr. Clover. <laughs> What's on your mind? You are, Mr. Peel. That's why I'm here. Oh, you want to hand me that sweatshirt? We got a girl down at the doctor's hospital. She says you were bothering her. Oh? What's her name? Leah Golden. She only knew you as Richie. The Titans, your, your club, calls you that, too. Yeah, I know Leah Golden. She got hurt, huh? On account of you, Richie. Oh, come I'll now. I'll tell you about it. You were after her while you were superintendent in her apartment. She got you fired, didn't she? I quit that job. The people there... Well, you know. Leah told Morris Bernstein about you walking in on her one day, so Morris saw to it you got fired. People like that think they run the world, don't they? People like you, Richie. No, not me. Look at me. An out-of-work guy. Somebody waves a finger and I'm out of a job. But you figured a way to get back on them, didn't you? Volunteering your services to these kids. <laughs> Look, I I'm cooling off. Time for my bicep building exercises. You want to watch out for a minute? Uh-uh, leave them alone. I said leave him alone. Hey. Clover, don't push me around. Stand there and listen. The kids, Richie. You heated them up, fed them your poison, pointed out Morris Bernstein and Leah Golden and said sick them. I did that, huh? Good for me. With Bernstein. You were there, huh? You finished it up when the kids were through. Your boys, Peel, the juvenile authorities will want them. You got a long way to go, Clover. Just uptown. Get your shirt on. <laughs> that easy, huh? Oh, you're so... You're soft, Clover. You look big, but you're soft. Like I said, Peel. Uptown. time of June, 
Broadway shimmers like an enchanted island. Night falls, and the wave of neon floods the streets, showers it with its light and color, the million sounds, and it ebbs. The pavements strike glints where dreams were caught in the mud. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Harry Bartell, Maria Palmer, Barney Phillips, Jack Crucian, Billy Halep, and Howard McNear. Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Charlie and Edgar. They're off on summer vacation, but Sunday night on CBS still offers one of radio's top bargains in entertainment. Red Skelton, Lucille Ball, and Corliss Archer are still here with their unbeatable brands of comedy, plus the bright new comedy star, Steve Allen. There's superb music with Dick Hames and Joe Stafford on the Contented Hour, with Guy Lombardo and his sweetest music, This Side of Heaven, with Percy Faith, his orchestra, and his guest stars. Horace Hyde is on hand with the original Youth Opportunity Program, and Hit the Jackpot can hit home to you with fine prizes if you get a call and can solve the secret saying. They're all here this Sunday on most of these same CBS stations, so be listening, won't you? Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where the Goldbergs are every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. People who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's one of those drowsy summer afternoons. The sort of day executives spend on their favorite golf course, and office workers spend watching the clock. But not Mike Shane. He's hard at work. Hudged over a desk in his private office, Mike's mind is clicking like a Powell Street cable car. In fact, he's right in the middle of a crossword puzzle. Phyllis Knight, his capable assistant, is daydreaming in the outer office, gazing out a window at San Francisco's rooftops. A quiet day? (laughs) Let's be frank. It's a downright dull afternoon. But wait... Is this Michael Shane's office? Ah, uh, uh, yes. Do you wish to see him? Idiotic question. Of course I wish to see him. In there, I suppose. Wait. Well, of all the nerve. Are you Michael Shane? Hmm? Oh, yes. And the young lady who was suffering from spring fever is my usually capable assistant, Miss Phyllis Knight. Won't you have a chair? I'm Winifred Spencer. The society columnist? I believe that is the correct title, although most of my readers and radio listeners prefer to call me a gossip writer. I know something of your work as a detective, Mr. Shane. Well, I'm just an amateur, Miss Spencer, in comparison with you when I think of all the skeletons you've dug out of closets. I'm afraid I've found one too many, Mr. Shane. Hmm? I received this letter this morning. I'm going to kill you. Your poison words have caused grief, wrecked fortunes, divorce, suicides... Now they're going to cause your death. There are scores who would like to kill you. None has a better reason than I, so I'm going to kill you. What would you do if you received such a letter? I'd read it the second time on a train, a fast train. No, Mr. Shane. You'd go after the writer, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. You think you know the person? I hope I... to know tonight. Mr. Shane, will you and Miss... uh, Miss Knight? Will you and Miss Knight be at my home at eight o'clock? Hmm? I'm having a dinner party, and I believe you will find the guests interesting. You may even find the person so intent on murdering me. We'll be there, Miss Spencer. Oh, may I keep this note and the envelope, too, please? Of course. And please dress. You're to be friends from out of town tonight. We'll endeavor to be presentable. And I trust prompt. Goodbye, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Goodbye. Ma, 
like. Hmm? You didn't ask her any questions. Well, for the present, Angel, I'd rather she did the talking. Hmm. Now, I believe she was actually frightened. Oh, she's scared stiff, honey. Her chickens are coming home to roost. Half the people in San Francisco, the so-called better half, would like nothing better than to send flowers to her funeral. Yeah, I guess that's true enough. Now, you can't grow up on the right side of the tracks, tattle on your friends, and not get your fingers burned. Hey, isn't there a brother somewhere in the background? Mm-hmm. A mm, bit younger than the old Dane. Went through his money fast, and now they say he's going through hers. I believe he lives with her. Oh. Let's have a look at the note, huh? Envelope plain, business type. Dressed to the old girl at her office. Mailed at 6 p.m. last night. You uh, noticed anything odd about the paper? No, let me look at it against the light. Watermark business stationery, Mike. This has been torn. The letterhead's been torn off. Right you are, Angel. Now, look at the typing. Ah, it looks almost like a professional job to me. Could be. But, come on, let's do a bit of research on San Francisco's society. Oh, that won't be necessary, Mike. I'm one of Winifred's uh, constant readers. Just ask me questions. I'll remember that when the time comes. Uh, now, please, Mr. Shane, I'd like the rest of the afternoon off. We get a red-hot client and you want to play. No, dear, I want to get my hair done. We're stepping out in society tonight. Say, I wonder if I got a black tie. <laughs> an old mansion. Look at the Iron Deer on the lawn, Mike. Mm. The bay window in front. Not as big as the Palace Hotel, but older. Anybody with Iron Deer on the lawn is just inviting, mother. Yeah. Ooh, it gives me the creeps. Ivy all over the walls. Probably some growing inside, too. Yeah. Anyhow, let's find out. Ring the bell. Uh, you mean lift the knocker. Oh. This way, please. Bring them in here, Henry. This way, please. Oh, I'm glad you came early. Nice to be here, Miss Spencer. What an unusual house. Oh, yes, this old house is filled with memories. The Spencers have lived here since 1850. Say, that's a fine old square rigger model on the mantelpiece there. My grandfather sailed the original round the horn. He brought uh, most of the furniture you see here with him. Oh. This desk was one of his prized possessions. Well, it looks like it's being put to use these days, too. Typewriter, lots of books. Is uh, this your study? No, I do my work at the office. My brother, Seward, spends quite a bit of time in here. Seward likes to think of himself as a writer. Is your brother here tonight, Miss Spencer? Yes, with his latest conquest, a Miss Melody. You'll meet them at dinner. Oh. Uh, we'd better be getting back to the dining room. It's time for the guests. Uh... I think there's somebody behind that curtain. Huh? Of course there is. The curtains hide a service entrance. Come in, Henry. Pardon me, Miss Spencer. Oh. May I announce dinner? Yes, Henry. We're ready. Will you please stop boring one another and listen? I have a surprise for you. This is my broadcast night, and it's almost time for me to go on the air. You're going to do your broadcast right here? No, I recorded it this afternoon. But we're going to listen to it on the radio. I thought it would be interesting to have the people I'm going to talk about as my guests. That's why most of you are here tonight. I'm sure you'll find what I have to say uh, interesting. Uh, Mr. Davis, Hugh, please step into the drawing room and turn on the radio. I don't want anyone to miss a word of this broadcast. You might have spared us this, Winifred. I'm through protecting you, Seward. Well, I'm not going to sit here and be made a fool of by my own sister. You'll remain right where you are. What's the station, Winifred? And for heaven's sakes, how do you turn this antique on? Oh, bother, I'll come and do it. I believe he was afraid to turn it on. What's this all about, Mike? It looks like she's going to tittle-tattle on Seward and her guests. Oh. Hey, Mike, look at Seward. He's ready to explode. He's not by himself, honey. Most of the guests seem to have high blood pressure. Yeah. 
Oh, I don't know. There's Mr. Davis. He's standing there by the door laughing. Huh? <laughs> oh, it looks like the joke's on Winifred. I don't believe the radio's going to work. Well, what seems to be wrong with the radio? Well, that's what Winifred's trying to find out. She should have bought a new one years ago. Are you sure it's plugged in, Winifred? Well, I guess we're going to have to listen to her. And now, your society reporter, Winifred Spencer. Good evening. This is Winifred. Have I been gathering tidbits about people you know? The first item tonight concerns an immediate member of your reporter's family, my brother Seward. He has played with fire once too often, and I regret to announce that I will my brother stay and has listen. gone too far. Come on, Merle. She's got no right to talk to me. There goes Seward into the drawing room, and Miss Melody right after him. Oh, come on, Phil. Let's get in there. Hey, hey, what goes on here? It's Winifred. She's dead. She's dead. Hmm. A knife in her back? She's dead, all right. We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Friends, if your automobile engine has a habit of giving a death rattle when you step on the accelerator... The fault may lie with the motor oil you use. You see, most rattling and pinging in an engine is due to excess carbon. And contrary to popular opinion, nearly all carbon formed in automobile engines comes from the lubricating oil and not from the gasoline, as so many people think. Now, no two motor oils form the same amount of carbon. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the brand of lubricating oil you buy. Because, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any of the seven leading motor oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means all harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based lubricating oil. An oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. So, friends, with parts and mechanics as scarce as they are today, why not take advantage of the unusual protection you can get from Triton Motor Oil? You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. The inspector is on his way. Mike has announced his identity and taken over. Ten minutes has elapsed since someone murdered Winifred Spencer in her drawing room, not more than 12 steps from where a dozen guests sat finishing their dinner. May I have your attention, please? Now, I'm sure that you want to return to your homes, and there's no reason why those of you who were at the table when Miss Spencer met her death should remain. Uh, you may leave now before the police arrive, if you wish. Hey, the inspector isn't going to like this, Mike. Hmm? You said yourself that there were ten people here who had reason to murder Miss Spencer. I said there were at least ten people who would love to murder her. Hmm. Whoever killed the old dame had a lot stronger motive than revenge, Angel. I let them go because they were cluttering up the place. Now, just the same. The inspector isn't going to like it. What's this I'm not going to like? No. Huh? Mike got big-hearted and let some of the guests go home. Uh, we can always bring her back, Phil. Who's left? That's Miss Spencer in the chair with a knife in her back, Inspector. Oh. I believe I told you on the phone that her brother, Seward, took a powder. Yeah. The lady on the sofa is his... Uh... I'm uh, Merle Melody, and I'm sticking around a little. Because Seward will be back. He just lost his temper and couldn't face the guests. Lost his temper, huh? Oh, tut, tut. And uh, the gray-haired gentleman who looks like a banker is a banker. Family friend named Hugh Davis. He's coming over to say hello. Glad you're here, Inspector. I'm Hugh Davis. Mr. Shane has told you... Yeah, that's why I'm here. I understand you're an old friend. I suppose I know Winifred as well as anyone in San Francisco. I've been the Spencer's banker for 20 years, Inspector. Hmm? Did uh, you handle Seward's financial affairs too, Mr. Davis? Yes, although I must say they became rather tangled. Miss Spencer mentioned something about his spending a great deal of money on his new girlfriend. The charming Miss Melody. None of us approved of that infatuation. All this might never have happened. Well, you'd better tell us all about it, Mr. Davis. I'd much rather discuss the matter when Seward is present. Mr. Spencer isn't here. He's flown the coop, so let's have it now. 
What about Seward and his money? It wasn't his money. Oh, Winifred was generous with him, generous to a fault, in my opinion. Seward spent the last of his fortune more than a year ago. So he has uh, been living off his sister, eh? Yes, Mr. Shane. Well, it's not a very pretty picture, but you can't hang a man for sponging. Something I'd like to know, Mike. Yeah, what, Angel? Well, I'd like to know what Winifred Spencer said about Seward in her broadcast tonight. It ended rather suddenly here. You... I picked up the script on the way over, Phil. Just a lot of society gab and a sprinkling of sneers. Right people in the wrong places. Uh-huh. What'd she say about her brother and his girlfriend? Well, let's see. Oh, yes, she said Seward had stepped out of bounds with a chorus girl. They were dropping his name from the social register. Then she said she doubted that Miss Melody would be able to support Seward in the style he'd been accustomed to. Oh, so his sister was going to cut him off. That right, Mr. Davis? Yes, they had a bitter quarrel a couple of days ago. Will Seward inherit Miss Spencer's money, Mr. Davis? I think the proper person to advise you on that matter is Miss Spencer's attorney. Mm. Maybe you're right, Davis, but as uh, Miss Spencer's banker, I believe you can answer the question. Well, I'd much prefer that Seward was present, but... Well, I don't suppose this is any time to be guarding family secrets. You're right so far. Now, look, if you know anything, spill it. I doubt that there will be more than several hundred dollars in this old house for Seward to inherit. What? Well, what happened to the old lady's fortune? Well, I'd much rather wait... Well, it'll have to come out sooner or later. Winifred and Seward have had the same safety deposit box at the bank for years. Just three days ago, Winifred came to my office highly agitated. More than $200,000 in negotiable bonds were missing from the box. And just what has your bank done about finding the two hundred grand in bonds? Mr. Shane, there are times when a bank has to use discretion. We hope to recover Miss Spencer's property without undue publicity or scandal. That's one reason I sent Winifred to you this afternoon. So, Brother Seward raided the box. That is all too evident. There's another I... thing quite evident, sir. If you and Miss Spencer hadn't been so cagey, ducking the very thing that little Winifred dished out, scandal, she might be alive right now. We thought we were doing the right thing. Well, that's water under the bridge. Mike, hmm? do you notice anything missing from the room? Well, sure, Angel, the body. The police doctor just left a few minutes uh -huh. ago. No, not that body. Merle. Merle Melody. Huh? Holy smoke, she has gone. You better search, Mike, with the murderer still on the loose. There's only one way she could have gone. Through here. The door's open. Try that room, Inspector. I'll try this one. Right. Here she is, on a bed. Is she alive? Well, I don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, she's breathing. Hmm. Now it's like a light. Oh, oh sleeping pills. Yeah, I guess so. Pulse is slow, but regular. Didn't want to answer questions, eh? All right, let us sleep. Let's have a look around while we're back here, Mike. You read my mind, Inspector. Uh, which way is the kitchen, Davis? Next turn to the left and down the hall. Here it is. Hmm, it's as big as a barn. And just as empty. The sergeant came back here when he searched the house. He probably sent the servants All to right, their quarters. The What's that? What have you picked up, Sergeant? I just nabbed the butler. Let me go in the back door. Bring him into the light. Wow. Look who's with him. The missing brother. Thanks, Sarge. I'll take him. All right, sir. Bring him into the drawing room, Inspector. Here we are. All right, talk. Where have you been all evening, Mr. Spencer? What are police doing all around the house? Where, where's Winifred? What have you done with Miss Melody? I'll have the answer to my question first, Mr. Spencer. Where have you been? I've walked for miles. I don't know where I've been. You were here when I lost my temper and dashed out, Mr. Shane. Winifred had no right to humiliate me before my friends. I, I hated to come back here. Then why did you come back? I don't know. This is my home. Where is Winifred, Merle? Miss Melody's asleep, Mr. Spencer. Your sister is dead. What? Murdered. No. no, that isn't true. I saw her sitting in that chair when I ran out the front door. Yes, Spencer, she was there. It also looks as if you stopped long enough to stick a knife into her back. No, no, I didn't do it. I might have wanted to, but I didn't. Just a minute, Henry. Where are you going? To my quarters, sir. You'd better stick around. Say, where were you when Miss Spencer's broadcast began? Uh, oh, yes, yes, I recall. I... I was preparing to serve the coffee, sir. I saw you going toward the side entrance to the drawing room when Miss Spencer left the table to turn on the radio. Oh. So you entered the drawing room by the side door, just ahead of Miss Spencer? I did not, sir. The door was closed. 
I I stood outside listening. I, I never miss one of Miss Spencer's broadcasts. Why did you lie to me about serving the coffee? I was frightened. You don't look like the type that frightens easily. Were you outside with Mr. Spencer? No, I heard someone at the back. It was Mr. Spencer. I let him in. Didn't the sergeant tell you to stay in your room? I have always answered the door, sir. That's probably the only truthful answer you've given me. Inspector. Yeah? Want to help me with an experiment? What are you going to do, Mike? I'd like to refresh my memory, Inspector. Let's all go into the dining room. Now, there's one thing I want to find out. All right, everybody, please take the places you had when Miss Spencer turned on the radio. I see. Mr. Davis, when I give the word, you are to get up and walk to the radio in the drawing room. Yes. Wait a few seconds and call just as you did at dinner. Very well. Phil, Phil, you be Miss Spencer and answer him. All right, Mike. Henry? Henry, you had better take your eavesdropping post by the side door, if that's where you really were. Yes, sir. Mr. Spencer, when Mr. Davis returns to the dining room, I want you to run into the drawing room. Oh, do I have to go through with this again? Yes, you have to go through with it again. No, I can't. I... I can't... Oh. What? Seward. Seward has fainted. Was that what you wanted to find out, Mike? No. No, that wasn't on the schedule, Angel. <laughs> We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, an automobile radiator that's clogged with rust and scale is a menace to your gas coupons. Yes, that's right. You see, choked water lines block the easy flow of the water. That means your motor heats up more than it should. And that spells trouble because motors, when too hot, can waste gasoline. Now, another thing which many people overlook is that cars driven around town with constant starting and stopping get hotter than those driven on the open road. So, even if you aren't planning any trips this summer, it's a good idea to drop in at a Union Oil station and ask the Minuteman to clean out your radiator. This service takes but a few minutes and works like magic. Union radiator flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, when this foreign matter is cleaned out and the Minute Man fills your radiator with fresh, clean water, you can be sure it will really circulate with a fast, steady flow. So, for cooler driving, economical mileage, just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Radiator Service. Thank you. <laughs> A couple of minutes has passed. Seward has been placed on a leather couch. Mike, Phil, and the others are gathered around the couch. A rather cruel thing to do, Mr. Shane, pretending to make Seward go through with all that nonsense. It wasn't nonsense, Mr. Davis. Here, loosen his collar. Henry, is there any brandy in here? I'll fetch it, Mr. Davis. It's in the pantry. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's coming, too. Oh, no, I can't. I can't. But... Oh, I fainted. Yes, yes, you fainted. All right, now... Now, maybe you'll tell us why you killed your sister. What you did with those bonds. I didn't kill Winifred. I tell you, I didn't. And I don't own any bonds. Uh, my glasses. I've lost my glasses. Uh, Mr. Right. Shane, hmm? you've tried your methods. May I try mine? What are your methods, Mr. Davis? I'd like to talk with Seward for a few minutes, alone. I've known him since he was a boy. That's up to the inspector. Why not let him talk, Mike? My man have the place corked up like a bottle. Well, okay, but remember... We'll be just outside the door. Oh, I don't like this, Inspector. But, Mike, all we got on Spencer is circumstantial evidence. The fact he was the last one with his sister. Don't forget the $200,000 in bonds. I'm not, Phil, but with this kind of evidence, I need a confession. We'll get it, Inspector, from one of the three. Three? Yeah, sure. Seward, the butler, and Davis. Davis has a pretty fair alibi, Mike. You told me yourself he was back at the table seated before Winifred Spencer turned on the radio. Yeah, that's right, Mike. He was sitting on my left. Yes, yes. He was in the dining room, but he's still on my list. Now, mm. let me see. I know it. What are you muttering about, Mike? Ten steps, twelve, maybe fourteen seconds. That's it. That's it. Why didn't I think of it before? Come on, let's go. It's in the bag, Inspector. Maybe you got it locked up, Mike, but I... Oh, there you are, Inspector. 
It didn't take long. Well, Davis, the conference over. What's that you've got in your hand, Mr. Spencer? Well, you thought I should sign it. The bonds... Uh... I'll explain. Seward wanted to make a statement after we'd talked a bit. All right, what about? Seward and I talked things over, and I typed a statement which he dictated to me. Yes, I wanted to clear up any... Let me see that paper. Did you read this before you signed it, Mr. Spencer? Well, I, I can't read without my glasses. Hugh read it to me. I though. thought so. Mr. Spencer, this is a signed confession to the murder of your sister. So what? you did get it, Davis. He tricked me. He told me to say Winifred took the bond. I didn't kill her. Grab him, Inspector. No, no, not sure. You gave it to me. No. Hold him. Let me, let me search him, Inspector. You... Well... Here's a pair of glasses. This is outrageous. Those are my glasses. Like to try them on for size? You couldn't get them on with a pair of pliers. They're Seward's glasses. You picked them up when you helped carry them in here. You're crazy. Davis? Davis, you killed Winifred Spencer when you found out you couldn't hoodwink her any longer about the theft of those bonds, the bonds you stole. Are you out of your mind, Shane? I was standing where you could touch me when Winifred was killed. You killed Miss Spencer. You tried to hang the murder and the theft of 200,000 in bonds on young Spencer. You stole his glasses, persuaded him to sign a confession he couldn't even read. You'll find such absurd surmises difficult to prove, Mr. Shane. I couldn't have killed Winifred, and all of you know it. Mike, I, I really don't see how it was possible. I was with you in the dining room when Winifred was killed. I was standing within plain sight of at least a dozen people. Can you answer that one, Mike? I don't have to, Inspector. It has nothing to do with the killing. Now, I think you're all familiar enough with the radio set to know that after you switch it on, it takes a few seconds to warm up. A few seconds, yes. But I was in the dining room considerably more than a few seconds, Mr. Shane. Besides which, I was carrying on a conversation with Winifred in full view of you all. A one-sided conversation. Winifred didn't answer. Very convenient of you to think of that now, Mr. Shane. But hardly enough to charge me with murder. I'm afraid Mr. Davis has a point there, Mike. Mr. Davis has a point in that I was half asleep when I should have been wide awake. I heard the noise that was the clue as to who killed Winifred Spencer... All of you who were in the dining room heard it, too. But no one thought anything about it. You... you mean the snap of the radio switch? Well, I heard Miss Spencer turn it on, too. But that's just where we were all wrong, Angel. We what? didn't hear the radio switch when Miss Spencer turned it on. Mr. Davis? Yes? This is what you did. You saw that the radio was plugged into a light switch. So you switched off the light. That meant that when Miss Spencer switched on the radio, nothing happened. You grabbed her, slapped your hand over her mouth, and stabbed her. Then you walked to the dining room door, stood there talking. And when sufficient time had elapsed, sufficient time that you felt you had an alibi, you slipped your arm behind the wall, pulled down the light switch, and about 10 to 15 seconds later, the radio came on. Anything to say to that, Mr. Davis? From the look on his face, you must have been right, Mike. Oh, I know I'm right. His efforts at blaming young Spencer will hold up in any court. Okay, here's yours, Inspector. Am I being kidnapped? This isn't the way home. I've got to get that society clam bake off my conscience, honey. We're heading for Fisherman's Wharf. Oh. Maybe a nice cold lobster. Mm. Jeepers. We forgot all about Merle Melody. Oh, the sleeping beauty? <laughs> well, she's young Spencer's problem now. Mike, hmm? what made you so sure Davis was the murderer? Oh, he kept tipping his hand. Yeah, but that radio business was a clever alibi. Mm. Not too clever, Inspector. He counted on the noise covering up the click of the switch. His timing was bad. It didn't. Yeah. We both heard the snap, but we weren't thinking fast. Well, maybe you can tell me one other thing, Mike. I'll make a stab at it, Angel. Oh, don't use that word. Hmm? I only wanted to know if they serve Crab Louie where we're going. When you look like that, Angel, they'll serve you anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in 
time again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Tom Petty and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is Michael Shane with a message from Director of Fleet Maintenance, Admiral V.D. Chaplin, United States Navy. It reads, quote, To all welders, riggers, electricians, coppersmiths, and other skilled shipyard repairmen. Subject, Fleet Maintenance. There is a serious skilled labor shortage in all West Coast shipyards due to heavy battle damage suffered by our warships in recent weeks. For three straight months, NIP planes have hampered, hammered at our fleet off Okinawa. One day alone, late, late in May, 11 of our ships were hit. Not every day is that bad, but every day is bad enough. Until these smashed ships can be patched up or rebuilt, they are as total a loss to the fleet as if they were sunk. This is an urgent appeal to all skilled workers who may be able to qualify as shipyard repairmen to apply at once to the nearest United States Employment Service office, unquote. Well, that pretty well tells it, friends, except to say that if you can qualify as a shipyard repair worker, apply at once. You'll find the number of the nearest United States Employment Office in your phone book. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. We all know that our detective friend, Mike Shane, is the hardest working member of his profession in San Francisco. We all know that he's a dynamo of energy in his tireless pursuit of the criminal. But at the moment, it seems the criminal is in pursuit of Mike. His assistant, Phyllis Knight, ushers into the office two rather odd characters. Uh, Mr. Shane, my name is Belsey, George Belsey, Jr., my friend here, Richard Stowe. How do you do, Mr. Shane? I'm glad to know both of you. Gentlemen, my associate, Miss Knight. Hello. How do you do? A pleasure. Mr. Shane, this is a very peculiar business call. I might say it took considerable persuasion on my part to get Mr. Stowe to come here this afternoon. Oh, well, it's so embarrassing. We I... handle many embarrassing problems, Mr. Stowe. Dick's problem is more than embarrassing. It's almost driving him crazy. You see, Dick is afraid he's going to murder me. Murder? Uh, could we have that last chorus again? Well, <laughs> I don't blame you, sir. Dick thinks he is going to murder me. Uh, Mr. Stowe is going to murder you. <laughs> At least I'm afraid I might. This is not a practical joke, Mr. Shane. Nor I'll be crazy. I, I'm not sure just when it started. I, I've been very upset in recent months. I guess I've brooded too much. I'll say he did. Dick got so bad, I finally dragged him down to a psychiatrist friend of mine, Dr. Neiman. Mm-hmm. Neiman, yes, I've heard of him. Well, the doctor seemed to help me for a while. My health improved. But then I, I began having this dream. It's always the same dream. It never varies in any detail. It's, it's the perfect crime. I kill Mr. Belsey in such a way that the police are completely baffled. Which could happen only in a dream, but uh, go on, go on. Well, George Belsey's office is up in the Commerce Building. On the ground floor is a cocktail lounge. Well, I dream that about 8 o'clock at night I go into the bar. I order a drink. I drink half of it. I tell the bartender I'm out of cigarettes. I go out to the lobby, but I don't buy cigarettes. I slip through the door on the left and hurry down a hall. I get into the freight elevator. Room 707 is right in front of the elevator. I open the door. I walk through two offices. George Belsey's room is the third. 
I see the light shining through his glass door. George is working tonight. I take out my revolver. I open his door gently, quietly, just a crack. George is behind his desk. It takes just one bullet. I close the door, wipe off the doorknob, and run back to the elevator. In a minute, I step up to the bar again. I ask the bartender to light my cigarette. I finish my drink. And the dream is over. Well, that's really something for the scrapbook. Well, the dream is so horribly vivid that sometimes I don't know whether I've dreamed it or actually done it. I see. And you want me to set your mind at rest, Mr. Stowe? All right, I think I can show you why you couldn't commit a perfect crime. First, uh, Mr. Pelsey, are the bar, the freight elevator, and your office situated as in the dream? Yes, they are. Dick has been up to my office often enough to have the details straight. Mr. Stowe, would you have any motive to kill Mr. Belsey? Oh, no, not the slightest. Are you in any business deals together? No, my line is mining. Dick's is wholesale hardware. Mm -hmm. Mr. Belsey, do you work at your office every night? Oh, no, very seldom. No matter how carefully a murder is planned, there's always the danger of something unforeseen. Mr. Stowe would have to know which night you're working. Then somebody might notice him sneak out of the lobby. An operator might be working after hours on the freight elevator. And then there's the scrub woman upstairs to avoid. And the gun to dispose of afterwards. Yes. No matter what gun you use, the police would trace the bullet. You'd have to prepare yourself against all these slip-ups and a dozen others. Well, now, does that take a load off your mind? Uh, uh, yes, it, it does. And if you dream it again, Dick, just laugh at it. Roll over and go back to sleep. <laughs> well, really, I do feel better already. George, we'd better not take up any more Mr. Shane's time. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, we want to pay you. No, forget it. I don't charge for just talking. Oh, you've done more than that, Mr. Shane. You've pointed out my mistakes. You've told me how to commit the perfect crime. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to meet you, sir. And Miss Knight. Thank you. Good afternoon. Goodbye. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Well, this is just fine. Mike Shane, consultant on murder. Hand me that phone book. Who are you going to call? Who do you think? That psychiatrist. Of course I understand, Mr. Shane. Mr. Stowe has been my patient for months, but there is no cause to be alarmed. Well, the way he talked, Dr. Neiman, I, I, I just wondered if he had all his buttons. Oh, there is nothing wrong with Mr. Stowe. He has had a series of especially vivid nightmares. It has become a habit with him. There is nothing to worry about. I see. Nothing to worry about. Hmm. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed your drink, sir. Yeah, oh, very much, thank you. Here you are. Much obliged. Good night, sir. Good night. All right, honey. Let's head for the lobby. Okay. Now, let's see. Mr. Stowe said the lobby, then the door to the left. Must be this one. And there's the freight elevator. We've done everything in the right order. We had a drink in the cocktail lounge. We went through the lobby. We found the freight elevator. All checks with Stowe's dreams so far. Yeah. Room 707 right in front of us. Mike, the lights are on inside. Hmm. Belsie working tonight? Through two rooms and then his office. Mike, it, it's this next office. There's a man's shadow against the door. And it isn't Belsey's. No. Those shoulders look awfully familiar. And the angle of that hat. It's the inspector. Who's out there? Hey, Mike and Phil. What in the name Inspector, of... you're here on a murder? Why, yes. It's a man shot to death? That's right, but how did... Oh, uh, one more question, Inspector. In that next room is a desk, and behind that desk... Is the body of George Belsey, Jr.? How in the name of everything did you know? <sighs> I hate to tell you, Inspector. I really hate to tell you. We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. 
Ladies and gentlemen, nearly everyone knows about carbon and the trouble it causes in automobile engines. But what most people don't know is that the kind of motor oil they buy directly influences the amount of carbon in their engines. That's because many drivers still believe that carbon comes from the gasoline, when actually nearly all carbon formed in gasoline engines comes from the lubricating oil. But, and this is the payoff, some motor oils form a great deal more carbon than others. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the kind of oil you buy. Now, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any other of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based motor oil, an oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. A man's dream of murder has turned into a nightmare of reality for Mike Shane. In the office of the dead man, Mike and Phyllis have explained to the inspector how they knew George Belsey had been shot to death. So you and Phil were tracing Mr. Stowe's dream footsteps. That's right, Inspector. Phil and I came up here just to see if Stowe could commit the crime the way he dreamed it. And when we saw you here, the inspector of homicide, we knew what had happened. Uh-huh. It happened all right. Bullet right through Belsey's heart. Well, we'll have Stowe picked up right away. I know where he was 40 minutes ago. Uh, who's this? Frank Mann. I was in business with Belsey. Yeah, Mike. He found the body and phoned us. I saw Stowe down in the cocktail lounge about 40 minutes ago. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Go down to the cocktail lounge and have Mr. Stowe paid for a phone call. If he answers, bring him up here. If he doesn't, send a couple of men to pick him up. Right away, sir. Uh, Mr. Mann, you say you were in business with George Belsey. The mining business? Yes. I'm a mining engineer. Well, maybe you'd call me a prospector. George and I were just about to hit it rich. Now it's hopeless. Oh, uh, why's that? Why? Well, you don't find gold mines with every blow of a pickaxe. I've rawhided over every mile of the Sierras looking for a good digging for George and me. George grub staked me. I found him a couple of little mines, but now I need some real cash. That's what you came here tonight to talk over with Belsey? Yes, I just got in from Nevada. Uh-huh. Hadn't seen George for, oh, five or six weeks. He was back east a while. I walk in the door tonight and... Well, you know the rest. And uh, this is uh, the way you found him, slumped over in his chair? That's right. You can see the bullet embedded in the back of the chair. Went clean through him. Mm-hmm. Looks like a forty-five caliber. This is uh, Mr. Stowe, Inspector. Yeah. Found him in the bar, like you said. Where's George? Where's... Oh! Uh-huh. All right, Mr. Stowe. Suppose we have your story. You were in the cocktail lounge. You went out for some cigarettes. Yes. It's, it's just like my dream. But I didn't kill him. Inspector, I checked with the bartender. Mr. Stowe came in about an hour ago. Mm-hmm. Yes, I went out in the lobby. I even went to the freight elevator. I was just curious about my dream. But I went right back to the bar. I didn't know George was working tonight. I didn't kill him. I know I didn't. Sergeant, was he carrying a gun? No, sir. Well, if Mr. Stowe doesn't believe he did the killing, we've got to go ahead and solve the case ourselves. Now, let's see. The usual stuff on the desk here. Is a bottle of whiskey the usual? Hmm? Hmm. Bonded. Mm Mm-hmm. Must have been open recently. The label's still wet. But this one drinking glass is clean and dry. Mm Mm-hmm. Appointment pad shows Belsey's last caller was at 5 p.m. Mike, there's a a phone number jotted down. Fairfield 62041. Hey, that number. Mean anything to you, Mike? You bet it does, Inspector. I called that number this afternoon. It's Dr. Neiman. Maybe we better check up on it. Yes, and speaking of checkups, uh, how about the angle of the bullet? Was it fired from the doorway? Looks like it, though we haven't traced it yet. Well, let's do it now. Must be a good 20 feet from the desk to this door. Mm. Listen, I think I hear somebody coming. Probably the coroner. He's late. Uh Uh-uh, that's a woman's footsteps. Mm, Yes, it is. All right, miss, in this way. What's the meaning of this? Perhaps you'd better tell us. What are you doing here? I came back for something I forgot. She was Belsey's secretary, Marie Farrell. Hello, Marie. Mr. Mann, why are these people here? In case you really don't know, look behind Mr. Belsey's desk. Oh, then it happened. 
Mr. Stowe's dream. No, Marie, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. Miss Farrell, do you know anybody else who might want to kill Mr. Belsey? Why, no. Mr. Stowe kept dreaming about it, but nobody would have a reason. Well, we don't think anybody killed him for the pure sport of it. You say, Miss Farrell, you came back to the office because you forgot something? What was it? I... I, I can't remember. You've forgotten what you forgot in the first place? Oh, I remember. I, I'm so mixed up that... The theater tickets. I was on my way to the theater with some friends. They must be wondering what happened to me. Well, I guess there's no point now keeping you. We can always find you. Yes, then. I'll get the tickets. They're in my desk. We may want to talk to you tomorrow, Miss Farrell. So if you'll give the sergeant your address and phone number. Oh, of course. Marie Farrell, Calistoga Apartments, Dawson 90351. I, well, I guess that's all. Good night. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, yes. Checking the angle of the bullet. Sergeant, you might take Mr. Stowe and Mr. Mann to the next room and let them dictate their stories. Yes, sir. This way, please, sir. Mike, look at this. Mm -hmm. I found Belsey's account books in this desk drawer. Uh, let's see, Phil. Hmm. Partnership. Belsey and Mann. Gold shipment. Huh. Mike, from these figures, I'd say they were doing all right for themselves. Mike. What? How's this little item for the third finger left hand? An engagement ring. Where did you find it? In this middle drawer. Look at this newspaper with it. Photograph of the blue penciling around it. Uh, Miss Carly Schaefer announces her engagement to Mr. George Belsey, Jr. of San Francisco. Hmm? Right good-looking gal. It's a Pittsburgh paper three days ago. It must have been mailed to Belsey. Wait a minute. Huh? Hey, kids, look at this picture again. Huh. Miss Carly's showing her engagement ring to some girlfriends. But now the ring is here in San Francisco. Uh-uh, it's not the same ring. It's smaller, a different cut. Oh, how can you tell? It's only a newspaper photo. All right. Look at it through this magnifying glass. Mm-hmm. Phil's right, Inspector. The Pittsburgh gal is wearing Belsey's engagement ring, yet he's got another piece of Cupid's ice in his desk drawer. For whom? Marie Farrell. Maybe she was after this ring. Could be. I think we'd better have a real heart-to-heart -heart talk with that young lady, and right now... Uh-uh, Mike, you forgot. She's gone to the theater. All the better, my dear. Meanwhile, we can have a look around her apartment. Sergeant. Yes, sir? We're going to see Miss Farrell, the Calistoga Apartments. Well, looks like our little canary is about to fly her cage. Uh-huh, suitcase all packed. Hmm. Looks like she's traveling light. Unless she has other bags. Dresses, blouses, stockings, slips. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps I'd better take the inventory. Here. Yeah. Hey, hold it, hold it. Here's a letter. Return address, George Belsey, Jr., State Hotel, Pittsburgh. Okay, okay, read the letter. Hmm, written last week. Dearest Marie, I'll be back in San Francisco by Saturday, but there's something I want you to know before that. You remember a girl I used to know here in Pittsburgh? Her name is Coralie Schaefer. A good old-fashioned jilt. Yeah. It seems Coralie is the one and only for him. Then Phil was right. The engagement ring in Belsey's desk did belong to Marie. Do you think the jilted young lady might soothe her feelings with a well-placed bullet in her ex-boyfriend? Marie told us there was no reason why anyone should want to kill Belsey, yet she's got the only motive for murder we've found so far. Yeah, but you can pile motives up to the ceiling, and Richard Stowe will still look like the murderer. That's true, Inspector. He had the dream, and the killing was exactly as he told it to us. I'm not saying he didn't do it. In fact, there's one angle which may pin it right on him without motive or intent to kill. Meaning what, Mike? Meaning that we've all forgotten Dr. Neiman. The psychiatrist? Yes, and I think we should swap complexes and phobias with that gentleman. Well, you kids go ahead. I'm waiting right here for Marie. She's got to come home sometime tonight. Well, we're not going to leave you here alone. Oh, ho, ho, listen, Grandma. I'm not helpless. I was with Homicide while you were still playing in the sandbox. Okay, Inspector. Okay. Come on, honey. Do you know where uh, Dr. Neiman lives, Mike? Well, we'll get it from the phone book, but first uh, we're stopping by my apartment. There's something I want to have when we visit Dr. Neiman. <laughs> Of course I remember you, Mr. Shane. You telephoned this afternoon about Mr. Stowe. May I ask, Dr. Neiman, if Mr. Stowe has talked to you this evening? No. 
What do you ask? Oh, curiosity. I am interested in that nightmare which has been troubling Stowe. The details of the dream to kill Mr. Belsey were so complete. I asked, Doctor, when Stowe was talking to us, he seemed to think it was the perfect crime. So? The perfect crime? In fact, Doctor, it looks like the dream was too much uh, of a temptation for Mr. Stowe. Belsey has been murdered. Tonight? Yes. In the same manner? In the same manner. Uh, will you have a cigarette, Miss Knight? Uh, no. Thank you. I understand, Doctor, that Mr. Belsey brought Stowe to you to help him out of a bad mental state. Yes. He was morbid about his business affairs. I might say he was on the verge of a neurotic collapse. I helped him considerably. How, may I ask? Oh, by various technical means. I'm afraid Mr. Stowe's mind was not quite balanced. That's not what you told me this afternoon, Doctor. You said he was all right, that there was nothing to worry about. How was I to know he would do such an insane thing? Doctor, in treating Mr. Stowe... Did you use hypnotism? Yes, occasionally. I know what you are thinking, Mr. Shane, but you are wrong. It is impossible to hypnotize a man to commit murder. You can't hypnotize anyone into violating his code of ethics. Mm -hmm. I see. Doctor, I brought along a copy of one of your books, Exercises in Psychiatry. I'd like to read you something you wrote on page 93. 93. Oh, I think I know what it is. Quite yes. possibly. This is it. Modern psychologists maintain that a person hypnotized cannot be made to perform acts which violate his ordinary standards of conduct and morality. However, I suggest that if the patient is first convinced by hypnotism that he has no standard of morality, he can be made to follow out any order, even if it be murder. You can't hold that against me. What I wrote eight years ago, I've uh, tested my theory and I found I was wrong. I... How did you test your theory, Doctor? And uh, can you explain why Mr. Stowe did not have this dream of murder till after you began to treat him? Mr. Shane, I refuse to be dragged into this mess. If you try to smear my reputation in this town, I promise you, you'll regret it very sorely. Very well, Dr. Neiman. Then I think we'll be going. You uh, haven't been what I call helpful. I am not required to be. No. No, but if Mr. Stowe is proved guilty of murder... You may find yourself named accessory to the crime. Think that over, Doctor. Why so quiet, Mike? Thinking. When I look back on it, I think Newman knew what happened from the moment we walked into the door. But, Mike, even if Mr. Stowe was hypnotized to commit a murder... How are we going to prove it? Mike? Mike, what's wrong? We're being followed. Where? No, no, no. Don't turn around. Don't turn around. Look in the rear vision mirror. I saw that same Suzanne behind us when we started over Twin Peaks. Mike, you, you don't think... We'll find out, honey. I'm going to swing into the alley. It passed right by. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm just getting jumpy. It's a place safe... We'll go over to another street. Oh. I couldn't see who was in the car. Did you? No. No, it's so dark we... Phil. I see it. It turned around. It's right behind us. Duck, honey. Duck! In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. You see, aside from the fact that it makes driving uncomfortable, a motor, when too hot, wastes gasoline. And whether you realize it or not, cars driven around town with frequent starts and stops usually get hotter than those driven on the open road. Now, an easy way to make sure your radiator is on the job and cooling your engine is to have your Union Oil Minuteman treat it with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, with a radiator that is flushed clean, you can be sure of rapid water circulation and a cool motor. So for cooler driving, economical mileage, ask for Union Oil Radiator Service, wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Thank you. 
One of the bullets fired into Mike Shane's car came near its mark. Mike was hit in the shoulder. Phyllis has bandaged the wound, and the two are now back at the scene of the murder, the office of George Belsey. How are you feeling now, Mike? Oh, a little rocky, but okay, Inspector. It was just a fresh wound. We'll have a doctor dress it properly. You better, Phil. Oh, Mike, the sergeant has just brought in Neiman. We got everybody back here now. Stone, Man, and Marie. Have you got anything out of Marie? Yeah, admit she and Belsey broke their engagement. But there's a funny twist to it. We didn't notice when she was here earlier she was wearing another engagement ring. You mean the one we found in the desk didn't belong to Marie? Looks that way, Phil. She froze up when I asked her about the one she was wearing. Have you checked up on where everybody was at the time I got shot? Yeah, they all got alibis. It's up to us to find out which one is lying. That's what bothers me, Inspector. Somebody tried to kill me because he or she thinks I know the answer to this case, and doggone it, I don't. All right, I'll bring them all in now, and we can sweat them. All right, Sergeant. Say, Sergeant. Yes, sir? <clears throat> Open that door again, please. Yes, sir. Well, I'll be... Inspector. What? There must be something wrong with our ears. We've opened and closed that door 40 times tonight. Well, what about it, Mike? What about it? Well, listen to it. There. Don't you see? The killer couldn't possibly open this door to fire his gun without Belsie hearing him. Mm. Let me show you. I'll step outside the office and close the door and then open it again. What's the matter, Mike? I can't see the desk. Look. Look, the door has to be completely open before I can see the desk. That means the killer practically had to come into the room. I catch. Belsie must have seen him, but he didn't jump up or try to escape. He just sat there, paralyzed with fright. Wait a minute. We've skipped a big point here. Belsie was hit by a forty-five bullet. That would knock an elephant sideways. Yet he stayed there in his chair. Yeah, you're right. The nervous reflex alone would make him jump out of his seat. Unless he was unconscious. Inspector, what? we've assumed all along that the whiskey and drinking glass on the desk were unused. I'll bet my gold bridge worked that the killer cleaned and dried that glass. Belsie took a drink that was drugged. That's possible, but there's still the main question. Of who did it? All right. Mr. Stowe dreamed of the killing. Marie... I believe you indicated that you knew of his dream. Well, yes. Mr. Stowe talked about it so much. And Dr. Neiman knew it, of course. And you, Mr. Mann. Well, Belsie joked about it with me once or twice. So everybody knew of Stowe's dream and could take advantage of it. But here's the point. I practically accused Dr. Neiman of hypnotizing Stowe to commit the murder. I still deny it. And I believe you, sir. I've been thinking it over the past few minutes. Dr. Neiman has never been in this office. We checked on it. He couldn't possibly hypnotize Mr. Stowe... And give him all those detailed directions about the cocktail lounge and the freight elevator. Yeah, that makes sense. The same reason would rule out Mr. Stowe. If he killed Belsie, he would do it exactly as he dreamed it, which is not the way the murder was committed. No, Mike has demonstrated that. Huh? By the opening and closing of the door, and by the probability that Belsie was drugged. Marie, Marie, you are the prize suspect except for two things. You didn't know Belsie was working tonight because the last appointment jotted down on his desk pad was for 5 p.m., and you were not in your apartment when Miss Knight and I decided to call on Dr. Neiman. So you couldn't have followed Mike there or tried to kill him afterwards. But that also goes for Frank Mann. Not quite, Inspector. He did hear us say we were going to Marie's apartment. He followed us first to her place and then to Neiman's No, and... no, you're wrong, wrong. Frank wouldn't kill Belsie. He's not a murderer. Oh, so now it's Frank. Oh. You've dropped the formality. Miss Farrell, that engagement ring you're wearing, Frank Mann gave it to you, didn't he? Yes, we're going to be married. I suppose you'll make a crime out of that, too. It's a very expensive ring, several thousand dollars. If you're broke, Mr. Mann, and Belsie was grub-staking you, you couldn't possibly afford that ring unless you knew you were taking over the gold mines of your dead partner. You, you can't prove a thing. You can't convict me. You've convicted yourself, sir. You were the only one who knew Belsie was working tonight because you had an appointment with him. You killed him, then called the police. Well, the police are still here, ready and waiting. How about it, Inspector? Mike? Huh? How do you want your eggs? Oh, let's have them sunny side up this time, huh? You know, with this bum arm of mine, Angel, you'll have to feed your poor old boss. And how you'll love it. <laughs> Uh-oh, I bet that's the inspector. Hey, wait, wait. I want to hear this, too. Hello? 
<laughs> yeah, you guessed right, Inspector. She's fixing me some eggs. What bacon? Huh? Uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. It's in my pocket. I guess I was just absent-minded. Sure, sure. I I'll bring it in tomorrow. Okay. Good night, Inspector. What will you bring in tomorrow? Oh, that engagement ring we found in Belsie's desk. I stuck it in my pocket here and walked off with it. Forgot all about it. Uh, yeah, I know how that is. Huh? When it comes to engagement rings, your mind is a complete blank. Ah, uh, Angel, you walked off with something of mine, too, tonight. This book on psychiatry here. Oh, that. Hey, wait a minute. You've dog-eared a page already. Chapter on hypnotism and its power over the emotions. You give me that book. <laughs> You're wasting your time, Give honey. It, it doesn't work. I've already tried it. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. In the course of his detective career, Mike Shane has been called upon to track down escaped murderers, to find missing jewels, to recover stolen bonds and sensational diaries. But never before has he been asked to hunt for something 3,000 years old. In his office high in the Rust Building, Mike and his lovely assistant, Phyllis Knight, listen sympathetically to a worried little man, Dr. Frederick Wakeman, museum curator. Mr. Shane, these thefts have been going on at the museum now for two weeks. Some of the losses just wring my heart. You know how today people save the baby shoes of their children, even have them cast in bronze? Well, yes, but Then I... realize what it means to me to lose the baby sandals of the Pharaoh Ramesses the first. Why, I used to hold those tiny things in my hand and think back to the days when they patted around the royal court of Egypt. Yes, 3,300 long years ago. 3,300 years? Well, why would anybody steal baby sandals 3,300 years old? Unless they were fresh out of shoe stamps. That's yes. the baffling part of it. The thefts don't make sense. One time it's the court robe of a Chinese emperor. The next it's the original of a love sonnet of Shakespeare or the signet ring of a Russian czar. They're famous. If the thief tried to sell them in New York or London or Bombay, it would be known they came from this museum. In which case the thief would be caught. Sounds like to me the work of a pretty clever thief. Dr. Wakeman, do you suspect anybody in particular? No, how can I? It's bewildering. It's, well, it's a mystery. The museum is open every day, but we have very capable guards. I believe the thefts occur at night, when only two watchmen are on duty. Any signs of uh, somebody forcing in a door or window? No, none that we can recognize. Hmm. But it's got to stop, Mr. Shane. It's got to. I'm responsible, and there are people who will take advantage of my failure. Even in a museum, one can have enemies, huh? This is what I want you to do, sir. Hmm? Come out and look over the museum with me. Perhaps spend a few nights there. Well, that's quite an order, Dr. Wakeman, but I guess we're game. How about it, Phil? Certainly we are. All right. Then if you would meet me at the museum tonight in my office, say, about 8.30... Your office at 8.30? Okay, but it's only fair to warn you, Doctor. Every time I go out on a job lately, I seem to wind up with a corpse. Really? Oh, <laughs> then you won't be disappointed. You'll find six corpses. Six corpses? Yes, in the mummy room. 
Mike, there's something really ironic about tonight. Mm? For years I've worked with you, tried and begged and coaxed you to go to the museum with me, and it takes a crime to break you down. Well, I can't think of a better reason. Well, I'm excited about it. This case is so different. Imagine sitting up all night with Egyptian mummies and things. What atmosphere? Uh Uh-huh. Well, right now I'm more concerned about the atmosphere collecting on our windshield. It's starting to rain and I forgot to get those windshield wipers fixed. Mm, A night in the museum. A rainy night in the museum. That's even better. Dr. Wakeman, to the contrary, I doubt anybody will try to swipe anything tonight while King Tut is entertaining us. Do you think we'll have to hide in a sarcophagus or or whatever they call it? Sarcophagus, yes. (laughs) Well, yes, this is the museum. Ooh, hug your coat, Angel. There's a wind with this rain. All right. Ooh, it's a spooky-looking old building at night. Uh-huh. There's only one light showing. Probably in Wakeman's office. I ain't got nobody. Well, right on time, according to the clock in the tower. Not very cheerful sounding, is it? What do you want? Well, uh, we have an appointment with Dr. Wakeman. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told me about you. Come on in. Thank you. All right. Follow me. Yes, sir. Mike, that room right ahead, that strange green light all through it. Egyptian department. Mummy room. Oh, it looks so uncanny. Are are we going through it? Yeah. Shortcut to the curator's office. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice layout of mummies. Reminds me of the morgue. Ooh. Hey, hey, Bill, slow down. Oh, uh, Mike, that, that mummy standing up, it moved. Oh, don't be silly, that's a god. Oh. And, and you talked about hiding in a sarcophagus. Oh. Curator, Thomas, <laughs> right on in. Thank you. Sure, sure. Well, looks like Dr. Wakeman isn't here. Well, he's probably around him. Mike. Yeah? That big chair with its back toward us. Yeah, tobacco smoke coming up from it. Uh, Dr. Wakeman, eh? I... Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, I didn't hear you. I, I was reading this manuscript. Oh, I didn't see you, young lady. I beg your pardon, being in my shirt sleeves. I was drying my coat on the radiator here. Ought to be dry now. Yeah, just a little wet, but no matter... Good heavens, is that clock on the desk right? Yes, it's 8.30. I'd better phone Wakeman's house and find out what's keeping him. Get me Wakeman. Hello? Arthur? Uh, this is Cameron. What's holding up Wakeman? Uh, Mr. Shane is waiting here in the office. But he told me to be here at 7.30 and I'm still waiting. Oh, yes, that's possible. All right, Arthur. That's the young professor who lives with Wakeman. Said he left for the museum at seven. He lives just across the street. Well, he must have stopped somewhere else first. Yeah, that's what Arthur said. I'm curious, sir. How did you know my name was Shane? Oh, Wakeman told me about you on the phone. I'm Professor Cameron, one of the governors of the museum. Oh, I see. Well, I'm glad to know you. And this is Miss Knight. How do you do? How do you do? I hope you people can help poor Wakeman. He's all upset about this trouble in the museum. I suppose that's what he wanted to talk to me about tonight. I've wanted to see your exhibits for a long time, Professor. (laughs) I'm not the Egyptologist here, but antiquities have been a hobby of mine most of my life. I'll be glad to show you anything I can. Oh, perhaps this is Wakeman. No, it's Arthur. Hasn't he come in yet? Wakeman? Not yet. Uh, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight, this is Professor Arthur Arthur Behrens. He's the man you want to talk to about Egyptology. I'm glad (laughs) to know you, Professor. How do you do? I don't understand it. The guard just told me he hadn't seen Wakeman all evening. He must have gone out again. Well, a little wait won't hurt us. Uh, pardon me. Do we have to suffocate while we're waiting? It's awfully stuffy in here. Do you gentlemen object to fresh air? Oh, I'm sorry. I've been smoking my pipe. <laughs> well, I'll open the window just to crack. <gasps> What's the matter? Good heavens. Wakeman. <gasps> Hanging behind the curtain. Well, get him down, quick. Wait a minute, Professor. We've got to see if he's still alive. What difference does that make? If he's dead, we've got to leave him there for the coroner. He's dead, all right. Oh, how could he be so foolish, so foolish? You think it's suicide? What else? Of course, look at him. I just did. San Francisco Police Department. 
on. Give me the inspector of homicide. We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis and their adventures in just a moment. Here's a tip if you're worried about excess carbon in your engine. Just drive into any Union Oil station and ask the Minuteman for Triton Motor Oil. Why? Well, nearly all carbon formed in engines comes from the motor oil and not from the gasoline. Now, there's a wide variation in the amount of carbon different oils form. So it's logical to buy the oil that forms the least carbon. And that's where Triton comes in. For Triton, and this is a proved laboratory fact, contains less carbon-forming elements than any of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, Triton cuts costly carbon. The reason is that Triton is refined by Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent process, a process that removes harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur, leaving a pure 100% lubricating oil. An oil that will safely lubricate your car for many hundreds of miles and give added protection against excess carbon. Your engine deserves that protection. You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Mike and Phyllis have located the missing Dr. Wakeman, curator of the museum hanging from a curtain rod in his own office. The inspector has arrived on the scene and questions Mike and the two museum professors. Now, just a minute. Mr. Shane says it's murder. Professor Barron says it's suicide. I can't be positive it's suicide, Inspector. But I know that Wakeman was a very morbid man and terribly affected by these museum thefts. You mean he may be linked in with them? When he saw the things closing in around him, he chose the one way out? No, no, I didn't say that. Inspector, I'd... just so you don't fall for a phony suicide deal, take a look at that rope. Uh-huh. See what you mean, Mike. The heads of the rope are all flattened in one direction. It couldn't be suicide. How could that possibly tell you? Because we make a study of such things, Professor. When a person is dead before he's hanged, the killer has to haul the body up into place. When the murderer pulled the rope over that curtain rod, the pressure going over the rod flattened all the hairs on the rope. But who would kill Waitman? Unless, perhaps, the thief who's been stealing from us. Obviously. We better question the guards and check up on any clues of burglary. Dr. Wakeman said he couldn't find any clues after the earlier thefts. But he made a list of stolen articles. Now, if we looked at them, we might get an idea of the type of thief. I'm afraid you'll have to forget that. Wakeman kept the list in the big safe there. But he was the only one who had the combination. Well, let's see. It's unlocked. We kept some of our most valuable items in that safe. You and Professor Cameron better take inventory. Hmm. Everything looks in its place. A chapter from the Gutenberg Bible, the Greek medallions. Carelessness, carelessness. Wakeman never put anything twice in the same place. What's wrong? This papyrus, any fool can see it's a prayer scroll of the Fourth Dynasty, but the marker says Egyptian Book of the Dead. Or he just filed in the wrong container. Ah, here's a list of stolen articles. May I see it, please? Mm hmm. Two blue porcelain vases, Ming Dynasty. Jeweled Arabian sword, gold scabbard. Two miniatures, Napoleon and Josephine. Set of Egyptian... Napoleon and Josephine. Hey, there's a point. Cameron, you remember how Mr. Bradley fought with Wakeman when Wakeman wouldn't sell those miniatures to him? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about Richard Bradley, the lumberman and art collector? Yes. A creature wholly without culture who buys rare and beautiful works merely to flaunt the power of his money. Oh. But, but a man with millions wouldn't descend to stealing? Well, I'm not so sure. Bradley offered Wakeman $20,000 for the miniatures of Napoleon and Josephine. Then he upped it to 25000 Yes, I remember. He was bidding against that art dealer, that, that Francois Lys. Yes, and when Wakeman wouldn't sell at any price, Bradley got so furious he threatened him. He said he'd come down here some night and slit Wakeman's throat and take the miniatures anyway. Oh, I'd discount that. Bradley is notorious for his bad temper. Still, we can't overlook it, Mike. we got to follow all leads. Sergeant. Yes, Inspector? We're going to call on Mr. Bradley. Nobody is to leave this building till we get back. Hmm. So Wakeman is dead, eh? Well, well, perhaps now I can do business with the museum. 
What time did you say he was killed? We didn't say, Mr. Bradley, but we think between 6.45 and 7.30. Well, that's lucky for me. With my feeling toward Wakeman, you might be coming here to accuse me of his murder. But at that hour, I happened to be eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. I ask why you're so bitter toward Wakeman? Number of reasons. Do you realize I offered Wakeman a quarter of a million dollars to build a new wing on the museum, and he and his board of governors turned it down? Yeah, turned it down, yes. Merely because I wanted my name chiseled over the doorway. Would another of those reasons be, Mr. Bradley, that Wakeman wouldn't sell you two miniatures of Napoleon and the Empress Josephine? Yes. Twenty-five thousand dollars offered him. And I believe when Wakeman refused to sell, you threatened him. And said something about coming down and slitting his throat to get those miniatures? <laughs> yes, I said that. Anything else you want to know? We ask these questions, sir, because those two miniatures were among the articles stolen from the museum. Well, I hope you find them. And when you do, let me know. I'd still like to buy them. When we find them, sir, we'll have the murderer of Dr. Wakeman. I may be able to put you in the right direction. Mm. Yeah. Let me take a look out of the window. Yeah, I can see the light in his store. It's still open. He's down just a block from this apartment. Who? An art dealer, Francois Lys. Yes, I think he would be a very interesting man for you to question. Thank you, sir. If we need any more answers, we'll be back. You know, Mr. Bradley may be a big shot in this town, a millionaire and an art collector... But his heart doesn't pump blood. It's vinegar and arsenic. Yeah. Awfully anxious to pack us off to Francois Lys. Mm -hmm. That alibi of eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. I think the sergeant better double check on that. You kiddies are a suspicious crew. Now, why would a millionaire commit a murder for two useless miniatures? Well, we can continue this discussion some other time. Here's Mr. Lys' gallery. You are looking for <laughs> something, yes? Oh, Yes, we didn't see you. It's uh, it's like this. My friends here and I are redecorating an apartment. It's to be in the French style, and I... Uh... So? Uh, what kind of an apartment are you decorating? Perhaps a cell at the police station? Hmm? Uh, what? <laughs> you are Monsieur Shane, the detective. This is Monsieur Inspector of the police and the young lady. She is Mademoiselle Knight. You have come here to ask me about my poor friend, uh, Dr. Wakeman. Alors, it is a great pity. But... But... Uh, How did you know? It is simple. One of the guards at the museum, Monsieur Olson, he telephoned me about the murder. So now you come to my studio to look for stolen property. Très bien. My studio, she is at your command. Well, this isn't exactly what we expected. It you see, there is no need for apology. You will pardon if I go. I am promised to see Madame Van Allenhaven tonight, and uh, perhaps to buy her library. Yeah, but hold on. Uh, just a minute. Uh, when you have searched my studio, if you will lock this front door, please. Au revoir. Well... Hmm. Well, of all... You've the... come to my studio for look for stolen property. I am happy to have you. Yeah, that's what's wrong, mm. Inspector. Mr. Lease is too free. He knows there's nothing here. If he dealt in stolen goods, he was very careful not to store them in this studio. Mike, let's go after him. He's going to tell us a few things. Wait a minute, Inspector. He's already told us something. A guard at the museum named Olson telephones him that Wakeman has been murdered and tells Lease about us. What for? Yeah. Lise and the guard must be working this together. Maybe, but that's what we've got to find out. And I know how we will find out, Inspector. We are going to search his studio. For what? I want a cardboard box, some wrapping paper, and a shipping label. Then back to the museum as fast as we can go. The sergeant's got Olsen in the next room, Mike. You ready for him? Yes, Inspector. Yeah, now look. This is the way we'll work it. On the desk here, we've got the box all wrapped and uh, addressed to Richard Bradley. Mm -hmm. Now, inside, we've planted a Chinese vase that we borrowed temporarily from the museum. We'll call in Olsen. We'll tell him we've found this box at Lee's studio. And then when he recognizes it as museum property, we hope he'll get rattled and confess. Right. Huh? Okay, kids, let's begin the act. Olsen, in here, please. Olson, we just got back from a little trip downtown. In uh, looking through the studio of an art dealer, Francois Lise, we ran across a package, this box here on the desk. Well, what about it? We'd like you to read the label on it. I don't get what you're driving at. All right, Olson, I'll read the shipping label for you. To Mr. Richard Bradley. <coughs> well, suppose we see what's inside the package, huh? 
Here we are. Well, very pretty. It's like it's a vase. A rare Chinese vase, Olson, from this museum. Why, how, how do you... It was one of the things stolen from here, Olson. And we know who stole it. We know. Now are you going to talk? No, no. No, I didn't take that. He never told me anything about it. You admit you stole for Francois Lee. <laughs> Look out, Phil! It came through the window. I... I... Jake... No, 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 no... Oh... Right through the heart, Inspector. Sergeant, McCarthy, Cuban. The side door, Inspector. Come on, this way. There you go. Inspector! Inspector, over here! Bring him over here into the light. Holy jumping. It looks like it is. That's my lease. No, no, no. No, let me go. You are wrong. Inspector, we caught him running for his car. We got his gun. It's still warm, and one of the chambers is empty. No. No, you do not understand. But we do, Mr. Lees. You were afraid the guard would talk, and you killed him. But you were just a little too late. He confessed that he was working for you. All right. Yes, yes, I, I admit. I killed Olsen. But not Dr. Wakeman. No, no, never. We let a jury decide that. Inspector, shall I call off all the boys now? I wouldn't do that, Inspector. This case is not closed yet. What are you talking about, Mike? We've caught the man who killed Olson, but the man who murdered Dr. Wakeman is still at large. We've still got one murderer to catch. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, the radiator on your automobile plays a definite part in the economical operation of your engine. Like other parts, it needs some attention now and then. You see, the small honeycomb cores and water pipes of a radiator are easily plugged with rust, dirt, and scale. When that happens, the water circulation is impaired... The temperature gauge shouts danger, and the engine loses efficiency. That's why, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. And the quickest way to do that is to have your Union Oil Minuteman clean your radiator with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale and rust right out of choke water lines. Then, with this foreign matter flushed out, the clean water can circulate rapidly and the engine stays cooler. Remember, your Minute Man can flush the radiator while you wait. The cost is nominal, and you'll benefit with cooler summer driving. You can get Union Radiator Service wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. <laughs> Mike is certain that the capture of Francois Lys does not solve the murder of Dr. Wakeman. In the office of Dr. Wakeman, the inspector argues the point with Mike and Phyllis. I'm sorry, Mike. I just don't get your reasoning. Lys admits he and Olson were robbing the museum. He admits he killed Olson to cover up. Then why do you accept his denial that he killed Wakeman? You just gave me my reason, Inspector. Lys will be convicted for one murder. It will make no difference to him to confess the second killing. That's why I think he's telling the truth. In other words, Mike... You think the second killing occurred tonight merely because of our investigation of the first killing? Correct, Angel. Okay, right. suppose you're right. Maybe Olson killed Wakeman. They're both dead. One murder cancels out the other. No, Inspector, no. The murder of Dr. Wakeman was very clever, too clever for Olson to have thought of. Mike, you must have something in mind. I have. I was just thinking. When we first started out tonight, we found that safe over there unlocked. Dr. Wakeman wouldn't leave it unlocked with constant thefts going on around here. Do you think the the murderer made him open it? Well, let's have another look inside that safe. Huh? There's a lot of valuable stuff in there. If we could find it... Wait a minute. That papyrus. The Book of the Dead, remember? Yeah, sure. The professor said it was kept in the safe. Yeah, the young one. Berlin said it was misplaced. That's what he said. Now, I'm no expert on Egyptology, but I do know that the Book of the Dead is an extremely rare old papyrus in delicate condition. Now, if you were going to steal it, what would you put it in? How would you carry it? Well, I see a half dozen long metal cylinders in the safe. I suppose you'd carry it in one of them. Okay, let's check them. Uh, all of them are labeled. Prayer scroll of Imshet Sup. Yeah, and record of Noble's War. Hey, here's one with no label. It's bigger. All dusty and dirty. What? Let me see that. Oh, it's even got cobwebs on it. 
But the safe itself is almost antiseptically clean. Inspector? Yeah. Look at these spots. They're all over the cylinder. You know what made them? Mm, water spots. <laughs> ah, yeah, water. And I'll bet you the papyrus inside this tube is the Book of the Dead. Okay, Inspector, get everybody in here. <laughs> Why, yes, Mr. Sheen, that's the Book of the Dead. We always keep it in the safe. Yes, as I said, Wakeman must have misfiled it. Uh, Professor Barron, you told us you were studying this papyrus just the other day. Yet now we find it in an old, dusty container. Well, I don't know why that would... All the other papyrus cylinders are perfectly clean and bare labels. Where did this dirty, unlabeled container come from? It must be from the storehouse, a building away out back of the museum. Are there a lot of uh, spiders out there? Spiders? Naturally, it's an old building. All right. I'll tell you exactly how Dr. Wakeman was murdered. This evening, he opened the safe for somebody who wanted to look at the Book of the Dead. The only thank you he got was to be strangled to death. Then the killer hung the body behind the curtain so it wouldn't be discovered immediately. The murderer needed a special carrying container for the papyrus. So he went out to the storehouse and got one and came back. Time was running short. So, temporarily, he tucked the papyrus back in the safe, hidden in the new container. It was almost 8.30. He knew Miss Knight and I were due in the office. So he calmly sat down and pretended to be reading. That's when we walked in on you, Professor Cameron. Why, why, preposterous. I I never heard of such a thing. Professor, you told us that you came into the museum at 7.30 and spent the whole hour here in the office reading and smoking. It didn't start to rain tonight till almost 8.30. Yet when we came in, you were drying your coat on the radiator. Well, I... That doesn't mean that It means everything, sir. This papyrus cylinder has more than dust and cobwebs on it. It's got spots. Water spots, rain spots. Spots that were collected at the same time you collected them on your coat when you came back from the storehouse after you killed Wakeman. And as final proof, Professor, all four of us here can see wet cobwebs stuck to the back of your trouser legs. Does that convince you, Professor? Yes... Yes, I... I thought I was so careful that no one could prove... That's what every murderer thinks, sir. But the murderer is always wrong. He always makes some little slip, some little mistake. Tonight you made yours. Well, kids, there's my car parked across the street. I'll say good night and thanks again. Oh, come on, Inspector. Follow us over to Phil's apartment, huh? She'll fix us some coffee and sandwiches. Well? No, I'll do better than that. I'll try out a new spaghetti recipe on you. Spaghetti? Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. There goes my waistline again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. I'll meet you at the apartment. <laughs> okay, okay, Inspector. We'll see you later, then. <laughs> Mike? Yes? You know I still don't get it. Why would Professor Cameron kill a man just to own an Egyptian papyrus that he could borrow any time he wanted to? Now, it seems no motive for murder. Well, it seems silly to us, maybe. But you remember... Remember how sentimental Dr. Wakeman got about those baby sandals of the pharaoh Ramesses? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Cameron felt the same way about the Book of the Dead. But Cameron was uh, inherently dishonest. Yes, I suppose so. Cameron buried himself in his work. He isn't married, didn't play golf or dance or go to movies, didn't have any fun at all. Ah, that's dangerous for any man. (laughs) Now, now what are you giggling about? It sounds like a perfect description of Mike Shane. Oh, 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 no. No, there's a difference. I uh, may not be married. No. May not play golf or dance. But I've got you, Angel, and I do have fun. Tune in 
Dial again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. Here is a message from our government. It's been a long time since there were any new cars, and naturally we're all excited about them. But let's not forget that it'll be many months before new automobiles are on the market. That means that we still have a pretty serious job taking care of our old cars. More and more cars are junked every day. That places a mounting burden on public transportation facilities that are already overtaxed. Now, a few simple conservation measures will help you keep your car rolling. Join a carpool. Check your tire pressures every week and have tires recapped in time to save the casings. Have your battery checked regularly and make sure your car is regularly and properly lubricated. Take care of minor troubles before they become big repair jobs. Drive slowly. Speed increases wear. Remember, your car has to last till victory and then some. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's just before noon on a bright but blustery day in San Francisco. And Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, instead of chasing criminals, is sitting peacefully in his office, academically discussing crime and its detection with his able and attractive associate, Phyllis Knight. And, oh yes, the inspector of homicide who has come to take them to lunch. You see, Inspector, I'm not criticizing the police department when I say that uh, I'm not bound by the rules that... Well, you, for instance, are bound. I realize that, Mike. I have to be pretty sure of my ground before I make an arrest. I have to have evidence enough to convince the district attorney, and he has to have reasonable prospects of obtaining a conviction before he goes to the grand jury. Plus the fact that you, Inspector, can be sued for wrongful arrest, whereas we, Mike and I, never arrest anybody. <laughs> we pass the buck to you. <laughs> I know. I know all that. But what I'm getting at is this. Mike has something in the way of, well, being able to nose out a suspect that we, well, that is most of us in the department, either don't have or else don't apply. The answer is simple. Proving it is difficult. Let's hear it in all its simplicity. Well, you and every other member of the department are so busy taking notes, which you have to do, that you get into the habit of reading what witnesses and suspects have to say. Whereas I, uh, I listen to their tones, uh, to their delivery... I strain my ears for the meaning behind what they say instead of the mere words. I'll admit all that. I think there's something else, Inspector. Although I hesitate to say this. <laughs> don't spare my feelings, Phyllis. <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of your feelings. It's Mike's. Oh, don't spare mine, Angel. You never do. Hmm. Well, in spite of the fact that Mike hates criminals and hates crime, I think he has a criminal mind. Angel, what you just said. I mean it. Mike seems to be saying to himself... If I had committed this crime, how would I go about it? Or if I were the important clue, where would I be found? Well, that's not a criminal mind, Angel. That's just that I... Michael Shane, private detective... Hi, Phil. Is the inspector there? Oh, sure thing, Sergeant. For you, Inspector. Uh-oh. Hope this doesn't break our lunch date. 
Hello, Sergeant. Report homicide, Inspector. man named Porter called up and said he found a body at 323 Foothill. Any idea who the murdered man is? Porter said the man's name was Beatty. Didn't give much more information. He seemed pretty upset, not too coherent. Okay, Sergeant. I'll meet you there as soon as I can get there. Homicide, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want? Murder or lunch? Oh, don't be silly, Inspector. We'll pass up a whole week's meals for a murder any time. This is the street. Yeah. And that looks like the apartment. Right there, with a man standing on the steps. Yeah, that's it. No signs of your boys yet, Inspector. No, but then we were closer than headquarters. That must be Porter. Looks all upset. Well, wouldn't you if you just found a body? Are you, uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes. I've been pacing up and down these steps waiting. I thought you'd never come. Where's the body? Upstairs, on the couch in his living room. This isn't your house, then? Uh, no. No, this is Mr. Beatty's house. Oh. You were visiting Mr. Beatty? I called to take him to lunch. When? Just before I called the police. Not more than uh, 20 minutes ago. In this way, please. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I went in, and there he was lying on the couch. There was a knife sticking out of his chest. I ran over to him, felt for his heart, and got my fingers all sticky with blood. You shouldn't have touched the body. Well, I didn't know it was a body. He might still have been alive. Had he been, I would have called a doctor before I called the police. That makes sense. Where is he, in this room? Uh, on the couch there. He, uh... Oh, but... But he must be. Body? There's no body on this couch. But no. he was there. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe he wasn't dead. Oh, but he was dead. He was cold. He was bleeding. His, his heart wasn't beating. Ugh. What's the matter, Angel? Oh, there's blood on the couch. I just got my hand in it. So you're right. Here, here's my handkerchief. Thank well, you. if he was dead, someone must have removed him. But they couldn't, Inspector. There's only one entrance to the apartment through the front door. There's no back door to the apartment? No, and I've been here all the time. I... I haven't been out of the sight of that front door since I discovered his body. I, I... I feel sick. I've got to sit down. Okay, okay, now calm yourself, calm yourself. I don't blame you for being upset. But we'd better get this straightened out. Mr. Porter, tell us what you did from the very start. Well, I, I told you. I, I came to take him to lunch. If he was dead, how did you get in? Well, the door was open. Uh, and that's funny, too, because he was always careful about locking and bolting it. Go on, go on. The door was open, so you went in. I found him, and... When I saw he was dead, I, I, I phoned the police. You'll probably find my bloody fingerprints on the phone. Yes. Then what did you do? Well, I, I walked up and down, and I went to the front door. I came back and... Oh, I, I remember. I saw the mail lying in the hallway. I absently, almost unthinkingly, picked it up. Where did you put it? On the table there. Mm-hmm. Huh? Oh, the wind must have blown it on the floor. There. That's it? That's it. Uh, then you did what? Well, that's all I... I walked back and forth, and I'd walk downstairs to the front door to look for the police, and then I'd come back. And you were never out of sight of that hallway and front door? No, not for one second. Well, it's a cinch that even Houdini couldn't take a body out this back window. That window was open? Yes. <sighs> no signs of anything on the sill. No, and even if there were, Mike, look there. Workmen working on that building would be bound to see anything like that. Yeah, you're right, Angel. You up there, Inspector? Yeah, come upstairs. Well, what do you think, Inspector? I don't know what to think. What's more, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Well, to put it bluntly, how do I go about finding a murderer when I haven't even got a body? But there was a body, and there has been a murder committed. You can't talk like that about not doing anything. The man's right, Inspector. I know perfectly well he's right. But why don't you suggest something? All right. I will. What? Let's go hunt a body. <laughs> Return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. You know, you hear a lot about magical post-war products and how easy they're going to make your life. Well, friends, one such product is here already. Yes, that's right. It's Union Oil Company's Luster Wash, a product that makes washing your car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Using an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously over the car. Then, just rinse off with a hose, and you're all through. 
In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. No fuss, no bother, no mess. Union Luster Wash is harmless to the car finish and to your hands, yet cleans as fast as you can apply it and without the usual elbow grease. Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film and traffic dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. You'll be amazed at how fast it works and how clean it makes your car. A package of Luster Wash sells for only 10 cents and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can get Luster Wash at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have been confronted with a murder, a man who saw the victim, but so far, no corpse. They've finished searching the apartment and stand looking at one another. Well, if there's a body in this house, it must be in small pieces and hidden in cracks in the walls. Uh, there's certainly no body in this apartment. But, Inspector, Mr. Shane, I, I, I saw it. We know. We know, Mr. Porter, but it isn't here now. Look, we've all had our say on the body. Let's change to something else. We've pretty well covered the apartment. Not only us, but the sergeant and his boys. We couldn't find a thing amiss. Ah, uh, Granted. So, let's take a look at the murdered man's mail. Oh, h- here it is. I put it on this end table. Oh, thanks. Ad from Flower Shop. Oh, open this one, Inspector. Okay. Here's another ad. And uh, you open this one, Angel. All right. I'll tackle this one. Hey, Mike. What? Hmm? Listen, I warned you for the last time. Settle up or else. Sign. I can't read the initials, but the signature looks like Reynolds. Oh, that must be. Yeah? Tell us more. Well, I, I, I don't know very much, but Reynolds and another man by the name of Weaver went into some sort of a deal with BT. They felt that BT had swindled them. Uh, not in the way that they could go to law, you understand, but in such a way that B.T. didn't lose his money, but they lost theirs. And B.T. told me that he'd been threatened by them. He told me he was worried, but that was all. Why the Dickens didn't you tell me this before? Oh, because I, I, I didn't think it was important. You surely don't think that either Reynolds or Weaver would kill B.T. Over, over a thing like that? We don't know, but it's our only lead so far. Wouldn't you say so, Mike? Oh, not exactly, but it's one we've got to follow up, of course. You'll return home, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be there if you need me. Okay. Let's go, Phil, Mike. We'll go in my car. Let's see. The address on this stationery of Reynolds is Stats Building. I'll stay behind, Inspector, just in case of any phone calls or anything like that. Right, Sergeant. Um, doesn't anybody want to know what was in the letter I opened? Huh? Why, you little... I wondered why you were so quiet all of a sudden. What is it, Phil? Well, I didn't want to read it while we were in the room. You think we'd better wait till we reach the car? Oh, no, no, no. We're out of earshot. Okay, shoot. It says, I don't suppose I should care what happens to you, but just the same, you are a fool. I've told you before that I don't trust Porter, and I'm more sure of it now than ever before. What's the signature? There isn't any. But although it's written on a typewriter, I'll make you a bet. What? What? I'll bet you this warning was sent by a woman. Eighth floor, please. Yes, sir, eighth floor. Number eight, sir. There's Reynolds' office right down the hall. Yeah, there's a man just going in. Yeah, we might be in luck. That might be Weaver. Something tells me that this isn't going to be very profitable. Well, we'll soon see. Yes? May I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds is busy just now. If you'd care to wait, he has someone with him. The someone with him isn't by any chance Mr. Weaver. Well, well, yes, it is, but how... Oh, you saw him come in just before you did. Then if it is Mr. Weaver, that's most fortunate, because we want to see both gentlemen. Well, I I don't know. I'll ring Mr. Reynolds. Please don't. We're on police business, and we'd rather go in unannounced. Oh, but I... I... Well, and to what do I owe this intrusion? Isn't my receptionist out there? Your receptionist isn't at fault, Mr. Reynolds. I'm from police headquarters. We'd like to ask a few questions. Police? What on earth for? You sent this threatening letter, Mr. Reynolds? Let me see. Uh, Yes, yes, I did. And I'll send more if I don't get satisfaction. Uh, Satisfaction for what, sir? I don't think it is anyone's business. It's police business, Mr. Reynolds. Now, we can all be very comfortable and save a lot of time by getting our answers here. But, of course, if you prefer headquarters, then that's your privilege. Oh, well, 
If Beatty has been fool enough to report this letter to the police, I'll tell you all you want to know. We'd like to know why you wrote the letter. Well, briefly, uh, Beatty, Mr. Weaver here and I, uh, put up equal amounts of money into an enterprise. It was at Beatty's inducement. Uh, Beatty had the inside track on the thing. He knew before we did that the venture wasn't going well. He withdrew his money without giving us a chance to withdraw ours. And the venture folded. It did, and... Uh, Go on, sir. Reynolds and I feel that Beatty should share the loss with us. In other words, you feel that Beatty should split what he got out of the deal three ways with you two. Yes. Uh, legally, of course, we can't compel him. Morally, we feel entitled to it. Uh, where does Mr. Porter fit into this scheme? Porter? <laughs> He doesn't fit in at all. He's just a real estate man who helped Reynolds find a warehouse. A personal friend of Reynolds? Well, yes. You said warehouse. Is uh, the warehouse being used, Weaver? No, no. We still have a lease on it, but the business folded three weeks ago. And the warehouse is empty? Yes, uh, quite empty. You have the keys. Uh, I do. Uh, You want to borrow them? Yes. Thanks. Now, one more question. Where is the warehouse? It's at 2200 Key Street. Beatty, Weaver, and Reynolds is on the signboard. Oh, boy, what a rat trap. Yeah, well, here's hoping it's more than just a rat trap. A man trap. Yeah, this looks like the key. Well, yeah, here we go. All right, now careful where you walk. Remember, they said the business folded three weeks ago. There should be enough dust on the floor to show footprints. The place is empty enough. There are footprints leading to that cubbyhole of an office. Well, leave us have a look, see. There's not a blessed thing in here, except this old table. Take a look, Phil, Inspector. Hmm? Yeah. You notice how the dust is disturbed on the edge of the table next to the wall? That means that table was moved. Yeah. No, it may not mean a thing, but keep it in mind. Outside of that rickety chair out in the warehouse, that seems to be everything. No loose boards or hidden closets or anything? No, uh, pretty much of a blank. Mike? Yeah? Inspector. Yeah? Here. Yeah. Take a look at this chair. I, I may be wrong. But... What is it, Angel? Oh, oh, look, that spot. Dry, shiny. It, it looks like brown paint, but it... It could be blood, huh? It does look like blood. One single drop. If it is a blood spot, it dropped from quite a height. You see how it's spread out like a... Like a sea... Inspector. Yeah? That table. Let's get it out here, right in the center of the floor. Okay. Now, the chair on top of the table. Yeah. Mike, that ventilator in the roof. Right, Angel, right. I didn't notice it till now. Oh, it's a common failing. People never lift their eyes high enough. Now, give me a hand, Inspector. Okay. I hate to twist an ankle, even on a murder case. There. There. Any luck? Yes. Yes, blood on the edge of the vent. You need a flashlight, Mike? Uh-uh. Uh, the body's here, all right close to the eaves and lying along the rafters. That'll do till the police surgeon gets here. Yeah, okay. Phil, will you make an inventory of all the stuff as we search it? Mm Mm-hmm, shoot. Okay. Leather wallet, identity card, J.J. Beattie. Driver's license, age 52. Mm -hmm. I think... Yeah? I think he was stabbed twice, Mike. Once in the back, and that was the stab that killed him. Stabbed again in the chest, eh? Looks that way. Autopsy will tell us definitely. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, pocket handkerchief. Okay. One or two? One in trouser pocket. One folded in breast pocket of coat. Mm Mm-hmm. Got it. Checkbook. Balance, $800.30. Any stubs to Porter, Reynolds, or Weaver? No, Mike. Seems to be all for light bills. Gas bills, department store purchases, things like that. Pipe, tobacco pouch, and book of matches. Yeah. Bill clip with $25 and loose cash. Three silver dollars, 90 cents, and two streetcar tokens. Old-fashioned gold watch and chain. Watch and gray, J.J. Beattie, from fellow workers, Wadsworth Plant. Kansas, 1913. Uh-huh. Fountain pen and pencil. 
And that seems to be it. Okay, then. That's all. Got it? Got it all down in my own inimitable shorthand. So, that's all, is it? What do you mean, Mike? Yeah. Why that cat that ate the canary look on your face? <laughs> Once before, I told you that something was so blamed obvious that I wasn't going to tell you what it was. Oh, we remember, Daddy. Okay. The same thing applies here. Now, come on, let's get going. I don't know where you'd like to go, but I'd like to put in a phone call. Who to, Phil? First, to Mr. Beatty's wife, if he has one, ex or otherwise, to see if she wrote that warning note to Beatty. One run? Go ahead. If no Mrs. Beatty exists, then to the little receptionist at Reynolds' office for additional... Two runs, no errors. I'm with you. Good. And I'd like to use a police teletype. I'm with you on that one, Mike. We'll teletype Kansas to see what associates Mr. Beatty had in the days of his past. But I'm still puzzled about what you seem to know that we don't. <laughs> I don't know a thing that you don't know, Inspector. I'll give you one hint, just one. But you mustn't ask any more questions. I'll bite. Go ahead. Just put your hands in your pockets, Inspector. That's all. Just put your hands in your pockets. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, we told you about a sensational new way to wash your car. Now, if you think that there can't be anything new about washing a car, well, just try Union Luster Wash. You see, Luster Wash is a special detergent compound that makes washing a car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Then, with an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously. To finish, you simply rinse the car with a hose. That's all. No rubbing or elbow grease is necessary. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. Luster Wash cleans glass and chromium, too, which means you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. It's harmless to the finish and to your hands, and leaves no film to dull the surface. No matter how dirty your car may be, Union Luster Wash will wash it as swiftly as you can apply it. A package sells for just ten cents, one dime, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Union Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can buy Luster Wash at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector are at headquarters. Phyllis is on the phone. Mike is looking at his notes, and every few minutes, the inspector guiltily puts his hands in his pockets, pulling them out again when he catches Mike's eye. Doggone you, Mike. You got me as self-conscious as a giggling schoolgirl. <laughs> it's your own fault, Inspector, your own fault. If the solution of the murder depended on it, I'd tell you right now, but, well, it's only hush, one hush, link. Hush, hush, kids. Huh? She's on the phone. Oh, who? The ex-Mrs. Beatty. Oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Beatty. Yes? Mrs. Beatty, don't hang up when you hear my question, because if you do, you'll be called right back, and that will be by the police. Yes. Go on. Uh, did you by any chance send a note of warning to Mr. Beatty? Well, Mrs. Beatty? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's, it's hard to explain, but there was something about this Mr. Porter I didn't trust. Oh, I haven't seen much of Mr. Beatty these last few years, but I've met him socially several times when he's been with this man, Porter. Mm -hmm. Go on, Mrs. Beatty. Well, that's all. I have only a woman's intuition for not trusting Mr. Porter. He, he reminds me of someone. I can't remember who, but... Someone not to be trusted. And that's all? Honestly, that's all. Thanks very much. Well, there's not much there. She sent the note. But just womanly intuition made her distrust Porter. You think she was telling the truth? Well, yes, don't you? Uh, not entirely. Not the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes? A force from Kansas, sir. Bring it in, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector. I'll get it typed up. Doggone, if there isn't something in the Kansas report, we're going to have a regular unsolved mystery on our hands. Wouldn't like to call in Sherlock Holmes or Father Brown, would you? Oh, Mike, this is serious. This is murder. I know it is, Inspector. Now, look, both of you. Yeah. Yeah? When we burst in on Reynolds and Weaver, 
they didn't show any signs of knowing that Beatty was dead. I mean, they were wholly taken up with the idea that Beatty had brought the police into it because of the threatening letter. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Reynolds said that if that letter didn't bring results, he'd send more letters. Right, Angel, right. And although that could be cleverness, I'd be inclined to mark it down as truthfulness. You may be inclined to mark it down that way, Mike, but until we have the murderer in our hands, everybody who ever knew Beatty is a suspect in my little list. Granted, Inspector, but Weaver didn't hesitate to give us the uh, keys to the warehouse. Mm, you can't lay too much stress on that, though, Mike. Bo both Weaver and Reynolds knew that we could get into that warehouse without keys. True, true, but to be able to carry off their interview with us uh, with such savoir faire would indicate that they were very clever and very experienced crooks, which I, for one, don't believe they are. Yeah, yeah, but Mike, murderers don't have to be crooks. Many a killing is a criminal's first and last crime. I know that, Inspector. I'm thinking out loud to convince myself. You see, what I... Yes, yeah, sir. Not much, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this says. Only connection Beatty ever had with police was his witness in robbery trial. His testimony was essential in proving guilt of defendant. And the defendant's name was Porter. Yes, Phil, the defendant's name was Porter. Well, what are we waiting for? That's it. No, no, not quite, Phil. You see, Porter died in a penitentiary in 1936. Oh. Oh, well, then, of course, it isn't the same Porter. That hmm. report doesn't say whether or not Porter had a brother. No, Mike, it doesn't. But I'd be almost willing to bet that he had... What so many women like to call woman's intuition is uh, nothing more or less than a half-forgotten incident or something half-heard and half-forgotten. You think that Mrs. Beatty's instinctive dislike for Porter is because of the name or a likeness between the Porter who found the body and the Porter who went to jail? Yes, Inspector, that's exactly what I do Well, that shouldn't be hard to find out. But it still isn't the stuff that convinces district attorneys or grand juries. No, Inspector, but on the face of it, I think another interview is justified. Interview? Who with? All of our suspects, Weaver, Reynolds, Porter, and Mrs. Beatty. All right, Mike, we've got nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. You see, our chief suspect holds the key to this little mystery, and we'll find that key at 323 Foothill. Well, I can understand why it's... Quiet, please. Quiet. Now, to some of you, this is going to be somewhat of a shock. But Mr. Beattie has been murdered. What? We found the body in the warehouse you used, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Weaver. But Mr. Porter had the distinction of finding it first, although he lost it again. Uh, will you take over from there, Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I came here this morning to take Mr. Beatty to lunch. The door was open, which was funny because he was very careful about locking and bolting the door. Mm -hmm. I came upstairs, found him lying on the couch, stabbed through the chest. I, I ran over and felt him to see if he was alive. Found he was dead and called the police. And got your fingers all sticky with blood? Yes. Uh, then I, I, I wandered about the apartment, went downstairs to the front door to watch for the police, and came back upstairs and picked up the mail. The mail which contained the threatening letter from Mr. Reynolds and the warning from Mrs. Beatty. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, when you arrived, we all came upstairs and the body was gone. It uh, couldn't have been taken out the front door because I was never out of the sight of the head of the stairs. And we know it wasn't taken out the back because there's no back door. Would uh, you have any explanation for that, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, no, no, I, I can't see how. Or you, Mr. Weaver? No, no explanation. And I'm sure that Mrs. Beatty hasn't. Oh, no, it's completely baffling to me. It was to us for quite a while. The reason it was baffling was because we were stupid enough to believe Mr. Porter. What? If you picked up the letters after you examined the body and after you phoned the police, how come there are no blood-stained fingerprints on any of them? But I... And with the wind blowing so hard that it blew the mail off the table, how come the front door was open? It would have blown shut. And if the body couldn't be taken out the back window and you never lost sight of the front door, how could the body be spirited away? I don't know. I don't know. That's the mystery. No. No mystery, Porter. Just a tissue of lies well rehearsed. The body never was here. But the blood on the couch. Put there by you after you had hidden the body in the warehouse rafters. Oh, this is absurd. You can't throw accusations around like that. We can and we will. Give me your keys. My keys? Yes, yes, the keys in your pocket. There you see. When we searched Mr. Beatty's dead body, we found everything a man usually carries. A wallet, pen and pencil, watch, checkbook, handkerchief. But, uh, but, Inspector... Yes? No keys. No keys to get into his house or anything. Now, what Porter did with the rest of Beatty's keys, I don't know. But here's the key to the warehouse. Uh, F-24 is its number. It checks with the number of your keys, key, Mr. Weaver. Yes, that's right. And one of these two keys is the key to Beatty's apartment. This apartment. Shall I try them, Porter, or do you admit it? I... I admit it. 
Okay, Inspector. I guess that takes care of that. Well, here it is, early in the evening, and we're on our way home. Aha! But we're not on our way home, Angel. No? Where are we going? We're going to meet the inspector and have a late snack at Fisherman's Walk. Oh, good. Mike, I-, I wonder if Porter is a brother of the man who died in the penitentiary. Oh, I'm sure of it. He'd better be. Why? Because if he isn't, we'll spend the evening talking to the inspector about motives. Oh. And what would you rather do, Mike Shane? Are you asking me or taunting me? Well, I just... Uh... Huh? No, not here in the car. I mean... Why it... not, Angel? I can drive with one hand as well as the next. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story, based on the character created by Brett Halliday, was written and directed by David Taylor. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is your Rexall family druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall MI-31, for example. Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Yes, for a dependable, refreshing mouthwash, remember Rexall MI-31. And remember also, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we never say die. Mr. Diamond? That's right. How would you like to make $1,200? Do I have to name the mystery melody? This is not a quiz show, Mr. Diamond. I have a proposition for you, a business arrangement by which you may profit to the tune of $1,200. Oh, well, that's my favorite tune. My name is Evans, Dr. William Evans. I have an office in the Grant Professional Building, Suite 409. Grant Professional Building, Suite 409. Yes, I, uh, I'd appreciate it if you would come right over. Well, it's after six now. I I'll don't... stay in my office until you get here. And so as to save time with explanations. On your way over, pick up a late afternoon times and read the article on page three, column two. A story about a man called Farmer. I locked the office, went downstairs and out on the street where I purchased the late afternoon times. And in the cab, headed for Dr. Evans's office, I read the article on page three, column two. 
George Farmer burns to death. And a picture of the deceased. According to the article, Farmer had been on a vacation in the North Woods. He'd gone to sleep smoking a cigarette, and that was that. Mattress caught fire. Before anyone noticed, the whole cabin was burning. My cab led me out in front of Dr. Evans' building, and one look at the large crowd, plus the very familiar black sedan and the passenger loading zone, tied my stomach in a knot. All right, now, get back, you. You? Evening, Sergeant Otis. Lieutenant, what are you yelling about, Melonhead? Oh. Evening, Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, no. I hope you were just passing by, Mr. Don. I saw the crowd, Lieutenant Levinson, and came over to find out if you and Otis were playing hopscotch or possibly kick the can. This is a swell time to make with the jokes. Some guy took a dive out of the fourth floor window. Fourth floor? Dead? Very. Name was Evans. Had offices in the building. Dr. William Evans. Guy named Evans. Offices on the fourth floor. Doctor. Some guy. Just 20 minutes before, he'd called me with a $1,200 proposition. And now it looked like the only thing I was going to get out of the deal was a late afternoon paper and a story about a guy named Farmer. Farmer? Burned to death and bad? Oh, yeah. We got a report on the case. Well, this Dr. Evans was hooked up with it in some way. He offered you $1,200? He asked me if I was interested. Huh, silly boy. There's the doctor's office. And uh, there's the window he went out of. Who saw him jump? Bill Mitchell, cop on the beat. Saw the body come out of the window feet first. Said at least it looked like he jumped. No sign of a struggle? I'll have the boys give the room a good going over. Well, we're pretty sure of two things, Walt. First, there's a strong possibility that Dr. Evans didn't commit suicide. Also, that he knew something about George Farmer, the guy who got burned to death. Might have been Farmer's doctor. Well, there's one way to find out. This uh, Times article says that Farmer left a widow. While you're checking things here, I think I'll go see what Mrs. Farmer's views are on dead husbands and dead doctors. Yes? Mrs. Farmer? Yes, what is it? I'd like to talk to you about your late husband. Are you from the police again? Well, I just left them, but this is my own idea. My name's Diamond. I'm a private detective. Oh? You working for the insurance company? No. Well, then just what do you want? I'm tired of questions about my husband's death. I've told the police and insurance company everything I know. Well, I know it's been difficult, but I won't take long, and there are a few things I, I'd really like to find out. Well, what are they? Do you know a Dr. Evans? Dr. Evans? No. No, I don't know any Dr. Evans. Your husband never mentioned him, said he knew him? No, he didn't. Besides, what has this doctor to do with my husband? Well, I don't know yet. You mentioned an insurance company. Was your husband insured, Mrs. Farmer? Yes, with the National Mutual. But if you're not working for the insurance company or the police, who are you working for? Me. You? Look, would you mind telling me what possible interest you could have in the death of my husband? Tell you the truth, I really don't know. But there are $1,200 mixed up in it somewhere, and that's enough to keep me well interested until I find some answers. Thank you, Mrs. Farmer. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. You see the wife? Yeah, lovely girl. Type you'd like to bring home to Mom. You find out anything? Nothing in the room to indicate the doctor was pushed out of the window. Mrs. Farmer didn't know the doctor. Said her late husband didn't either. But uh, she thought at first I was from an insurance company. Well, what company? Oh, a national mutual. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Got the names of the officials in national mutual? Yeah. Bring them in. Right. Why all the action? We checked with the dead doctor's nurse. She said aside from his regular practice, he worked for two or three big insurance firms. National mutual was one of them. I didn't yeah, think of a connection then, but I made the check just in case. Well, George Farmer was burned to death. Dr. Evans knew something about Farmer. Farmer was insured with the National Mutual, and the doctor worked for National Mutual. Might be a tie-up. Well, the vice president of National Mutual is Arthur Peterson. Oh, it's not too late. Let's take a run over to his house and see if he knows anything about it. <laughs> gentlemen. In answer to your questions, yes, we did insure the late George Farmer, and Dr. Evans does work for us. 
As to whether or not he was the doctor who examined Farmer, I really couldn't say. I'd like to check the files. Lieutenant, aren't you satisfied? You think there's something wrong? We don't know. Dr. Evans jumped or was pushed. Out of his office window this evening. Good Lord. He called Mr. Diamond here and indicated he knew something about Farmer's death. Have you settled the claim with Mrs. Farmer yet? No, but it's to be settled within the week. $25,000 policy. Hmm. If someone could show your company that Farmer's death was no accident, there'd be a reward, wouldn't there? Yes. 10% of the policy. In this case, $2,500. Oh, half of that'd be about $1,200. You uh, think we could look at your records tonight, Mr. Peterson? It's uh, very important. I, of course. I'll just get a coat and we'll go right down to the office. We left with Mr. Peterson and headed for the offices of the National Mutual. A quick look through the file showed us what we wanted. A full report on the state of George Farmer's health. Okayed for insurance by the examining physician, Dr. William Evans. It's too bad the first claim on an action policy has to be a death. Well, that ties that up. Now what have we got? Enough to keep on looking. I think I'll go have a long talk with Farmer's wife. Our company detectives checked that. She was right here in the city when her husband died. Well, a little talk won't hurt. Who sold Farmer the policy, Mr. Peterson? Um, well, um, according to the files, the insurance man was Martin Ames. You have his address here? Yes. Here you are. Good man. One of our leading salesmen. While you're talking with Mrs. Farmer, Walt, I think I'll run over and see this man Ames. Maybe he can do us some good. If the late Dr. Evans hadn't offered me $1,200, I would have okayed his four-floor dive as an act of suicide. But the way things were shaping up, he was going to split an insurance reward. And knowing doctors to be pretty practical people, I just couldn't imagine him giving up that kind of money for a fast trip to the sidewalk. The home of Martin Ames was an apartment on the Lower East Side. His wife answered the door. No, my husband isn't here. I was just leaving. Uh, you know where I can find your husband, Mrs. Ames? It's rather important. I don't know what you want, but if you want to see my husband, that's where I'm going now. I just got a call. He's had an automobile accident. Miss? Yes, I'm Mrs. Ames. I was told my husband. Oh, yes, Miss Ames. If you'll just have a seat, I'll call Dr. Tully. He's in charge of your husband's case. But I want to see my husband. Can I see him? You'll have to see Dr. Tully first. But I want to know how serious it is. I should be with my husband. If, if you'll serious... just be patient for a moment, Miss Ames, I'll get Dr. Tully. Come on, Mrs. Ames. Let's sit down over here. <laughs> now, just sit down right over here and try and relax. Dr. Tully, third floor right. reception room, please. Uh, uh, hello, Walt. Dr. Dr. Tully, no, this is a police officer, Miss Ames. Police officer? He's a friend of mine, Miss Ames. Nothing about my husband. Dr. Tully's the man you want to see. Uh, can I talk with you, Rick? Oh, sure. Yeah. Will you excuse me, Miss Ames? Oh, yes, of course. You'll be all right? I'll, I'll be all right. Okay, Walt. Well. well, this far north. About her husband? Yeah, I was questioning Mrs. Farmer when I got the call over the hot shot. I remembered, so I figured you'd wind up here. Have you heard how he is? Died five minutes ago. Oh, no. Accident? Hit and run. Before he died, he told us a car ran him off the road. Went down a 20-foot embankment and right into a cement retaining wall. The wall stopped him from going any further, but broke his neck. Any lead on the other car? No, well, only stretch of road. No one else saw it. It happened too fast for Ames. Now, wait a minute. That must be Dr. Tully going over to Mrs. Ames now. Yeah, Mrs. Ames, Tully. I'm afraid that... He I'm did everything he could. I don't envy him. Your husband is dead. Oh, no. Mrs. Ames. Oh, dear Mrs. God, Ames, you. please control yourself, Mrs. Ames. Oh, Come on, Walt. This is turning into a rotten case. <laughs> Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. I often think that perhaps the most common under-the-weather complaint in the average family is either 
Acid stomach or plain old sluggishness. Well, you certainly hit the nail on the head as far as my family is concerned. And I'm also sure that's why there are literally millions of bottles of Rexall milk of magnesia on hand right now in family medicine cabinets. Why, that sounds almost unbelievable. No, ma'am. Not when you know that Rexall milk of magnesia is both a quick-acting antacid and a thoroughly effective yet gentle laxative. What's more, Rexall milk of magnesia has none of that unpleasant, earthy, gritty taste. Say, my family would really appreciate that. Then why not let them see for themselves just how creamy smooth and actually pleasant-tasting Rexall milk of magnesia really is? Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. A little after six, I got a phone call, and by 6.30, the man who called was lying on a sidewalk, broken in two from a four-story drop. Two hours later, an insurance salesman named Ames was run off the road and ended up with a broken neck. Coincidence? Not a bit. Walt found the location of the place where George Farmer had burned to death. Then we climbed in the squad car and started the long drive for the Catskills. Around 7 in the morning, we turned off the main highway and onto a dirt road. A sign reading, Sportsman's Retreat, Two Miles, pointed the way. And 20 minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the lodge. Morning. Morning, and welcome to Sportsman's Retreat. Morning. <laughs> Police car, ain't it? I'm Lieutenant Levinson, Fifth Bracing, New York Police. This is Mr. Diamond. Oh, howdy, howdy. Oh, yeah. Are you up here about Mr. Farmer's death? Unofficially. You run the place? Yeah, yeah, I'm the foreman. My name's Pop, Pop Sloan, but everybody just called me Pop. We thought we'd stay a while, Pop. Can you put us up? Well, sure, sure. How long you figured on being around? Oh, not long. We only brought one change of clothes. Well, come on in. Breakfast was an hour ago, but if you're hungry, I can have the cook rustle up some bacon and eggs. Oh, sounds good. Many people staying here, Pop? Oh, about 14. Yeah, 14. Same crowd comes up every year. Sort of a club, you might call it. Uh, uh, how many years did George Farmer come up? Oh, Mr. Farmer come up about, uh, oh, for the last 10 years. Hey, who owns the place? Mr. Phillips. He ain't here now, but he phoned and says he'll be in sometime this afternoon. Say, how come you fellas are interested in Mr. Farmer's death? We had the police and the insurance up here for three days. You're a little late, ain't you? Well, uh, there are a few things we haven't cleared up. Sure appreciate some help, Bob. Yeah, yes, sure. I'll give you all the help I can. I'll go get some breakfast for you, and then we can gab a little while. Hmm? Pop went back to the kitchen, and we relaxed in a couple of big leather chairs in front of a large window that looked out on a row of cabins. That last cabin must have been Farmer's. Yeah, nothing much left of it. <sighs> it's beautiful up here. Look at those trees with the sun shining through them. Your soul is showing, Walt. Oh! It was a beautiful place, all right. The cabin stood in the clearing, fronted by well-kept paths and backed by tall trees. Pop came in a little later with enough bacon and eggs to feed a platoon of tapeworms, and we talked. Where is everybody, Pop? Out fishing. Get up about 4.30 around here. Many of the men bring their wives? Oh, some of them. Mr. Farmer used to bring his in up every year. Fine-looking woman, Mrs. Farmer. Didn't come up this year, though. It's too bad, too. Why? Well, might have saved him. Used to smoke in bed all the time. Maybe if she'd been around here, she might have caught him at it. Uh, who discovered the fire? Oh, we all saw it, but it was too late. By the time we got there, the whole place was burning. By the time we got the hose going, there wasn't much left. You say you all saw it. Where were you? Oh, we was up to Willow Peak cooking out. That's about three miles from camp. You can see from there. See? See that tall peak there to the left of them trees? Yeah. How come Farmer didn't go along? Oh, he never went on many hikes. Had trouble with his legs, you know. Anyone stay here in camp besides Farmer? No, no, no. no. Everybody was up at Willow Peak. Mm. Who examined the body? Doc Combs from Evanston come up and looked at the body. Where's Evanston? Mm, about 50 miles east. But if you want to talk to the doc, you'll have to wait till everybody comes in from fishing. Oh, God. Is he up here now? Yeah, yeah. Come up last night. First day a week for the fishing. Oh, Pop. Oh, oh, well, morning, morning, Mr. Phillips. Good morning. I didn't expect you till this afternoon. 
This, uh, this is Mr. Phillips, the owner. Oh, I have some bags out in the car. Uh, will you get them, please? Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Right, uh, good morning. Yeah, is there some more police fellas, Mr. Phillips. Oh, uh, about Mr. Farmer's death? Yeah, I've got to clear up a few things. Uh, would you please get those bags for me, Pop? Bags? Oh, <laughs> oh yes, bags. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, we <laughs> just wanted to ask a couple of questions, Mr. Phillips. I'm Lieutenant Levinson. This is Mr. Don. <laughs> well, how do you do? How, how do you do? Do? Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Well, not at all. Uh, I, uh... I thought the authorities were satisfied. Well, I guess they are. Uh, where were you when the accident occurred, Mr. Phillips? Oh, uh, I was on my way here from the city. I arrived about an hour later. You live in the city, Mr. Phillips? Well, yes, I have a house there. I divide my time between there and the lodge. Tell me something about Farmer, Mr. Phillips. What kind of a man was he? Well, You uh... fellas want any more breakfast? Uh, no, uh, thanks, no, thanks, sir. Oh, all right. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> Good old pup. Uh, well, there really isn't much to tell. Farmer was a nice sort of a guy, rather quiet. As you know, he had a very bad habit of smoking in bed. You have any trouble with him smoking in bed before? Oh, yes, several times. Nearly started a fire two years ago. Well, uh, wouldn't that make you watch him a little more closely? Well, uh, you see, his wife came up with him every year, but this one, she was usually near enough to prevent any trouble. How long did he usually stay here? Oh, week, ten days, however long his vacation lasted. Mm-hmm. What was his business? I, I think he was in advertising. Make much money? <laughs> I have no idea. He certainly never spent much. He was tight as the devil. He was known for it, in fact. Coming up here was the only luxury he allowed himself. He'd tell everyone he'd save all year just to come up here and relax for a week or so. Hey, hey, Lieutenant, here comes Doc Combs. He must have got his limit. Oh, you gentlemen interested in talking to the doctor? Yeah, Pop tells us he was the one who examined the body. Well, what'd you get, Doc? Hi, Pop, I got my limit. Oh, good for you, good for you. Come on over here. A couple of fellas want to talk to you. Well, how are you, Phil? Hello, Doc. Uh, Pop said you weren't due in until this afternoon. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, this is Lieutenant Levinson and Mr. Diamond. Found out. How are you? Uh, police? Yeah, yeah. They want to ask you a few questions. we got to clear up a few things about George Farmer getting burned today. Uh, oh, Pop, uh, that's hmm? enough, Pop. I was only trying to help. <laughs> well, certainly, gentlemen. Uh, here, will you take these fish, please, Pop? Fish? Hold the fish. Yes, yeah, sure. I'll be right back. Well, I don't think I could tell you much more than I've already told the police. Did you know George Farmer prior to his death? Oh, yes, over a period of ten years. Did you identify the body? Well, not at first. It was too badly burned. Not at first? You mean you did identify it later? Well, when they told me that George had a broken wrist, I found the broken section of bone and identified it. Broken wrist? Oh, yes, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you see, when George arrived, his lower arm was in a cast. He told us that he'd broken his wrist the week before. What day did he arrive? Uh, Tuesday of last week. Well, put in a call to Otis and have him find out where George Farmer had his broken wrist treated. Most of all, when the accident occurred. What are you getting at, Rick? Then have him find out the date the insurance policy went into effect. Doctor, uh, which wrist was broken? Uh, the right one. And it was in a cast, huh? Uh-huh. Would you say he could move his fingers well enough to write? Well, depends on how recent the accident. Step on it, Walt. Okay, but I don't get it. <laughs> I talked to Otis. He'll get the information and call us back. Now, would you mind telling me what the devil this is all about? George Farmer had to sign the insurance policy, didn't he? Yeah, but he could have done that with his left hand. An accident policy would cover a broken wrist, wouldn't it? Sure, and what? Mr. Phillips, you said Farmer was known to be careful with his money. Yes, that's right. I can vouch for that. I treated him for cigarette burns three years ago and had a devil of a time collecting. Thanks, Doctor. Well, so what? So what? So if Otis gives us the answers I want, I think I can show you George Farmer was murdered. Murdered? Yeah. And I think I can explain why an insurance salesman and a doctor were killed. So we all sat around and waited for my hunch to grow muscles. I kept turning the whole thing over in my mind, and the more I thought, the more the whole thing tied together. Around noon, a call came in from Otis, and Walt gave him the information I needed. There it is. George Farmer broke his wrist on the 26th of last month. He was treated at the Olive Hospital. About three weeks ago. He stayed one night at the hospital and went home. What day did he arrive here, Mr. Phillips? Mm, about the 4th. Uh, two weeks after the accident. He died on the 11th, according to the papers. Yes, that's right. He'd been here about a week. When did the insurance policy go into effect, Wall? The 22nd of last month. It went into effect. It wasn't taken out. I said, went into effect. Now, it would cost him a few bucks to have a broken wrist taken care of and spend the night in the hospital, wouldn't it, Doctor? Yes, it would. Remember what the vice president of National Mutual said, Walt? Too bad the first claim on an accident policy had to be death? Yeah. Well, if Farmer had an accident policy, why didn't he put in a claim for his broken wrist? Come on, Walt. We're going back to town and talk to Mrs. Farmer. <laughs>
You got your men spotted around the building? Whole block surrounded. Peterson and Evers are covering the front. Cars in every corner. Isn't Otis going to play? Well, there's been some complaints about noisy cats in the neighborhood, so I stuck Otis and back in the alley. He'll drive every cat right into the river. You might have made a mistake. One yell out of Otis and he'll end up with all the shoes in the block. Here, here it is. Yes? Yeah. Oh. Uh, mind if we come in, Mrs. Farmer? No, I guess not. Well, what is it this time, Lieutenant? We think your husband was murdered. Well, that's ridiculous. Now, we know you didn't do it, but you ran on it. You know who did. Are you serious? Very. We just had the lab make a check on the insurance policy. The signature and the fingerprints were from the right hand. Well, of course they were. So your husband didn't have a broken wrist at the time? Well, no, he, he did that sometime later. And you'll swear that it's his signature on the policy? Certainly. I went to the doctor with him. I thought you said you didn't know a Dr. Evans. Well, I don't. He was the insurance doctor. Well, I'd, I'd never seen him before or since. How could you expect me Your to remember Your husband the... didn't turn the claim for his broken wrist. He didn't? Well, that was his business, wasn't it? Don't you think it's rather strange to take out an accident policy and not turn in a claim on your first accident? I don't know. I didn't bother with my husband's affairs. Is this your husband's driver's license? Where did you get that? Motor vehicle department. Is it your husband's license? Yes, I guess so. The signature on this license is not the same as the one on the insurance policy. What do you mean? He means that the signature on the insurance policy is a very clever forgery. Who forged it, Mrs. Farmer? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Who went to that doctor's office representing your husband? No one. Why in the world would I do that? Why would I have someone represent my husband? Probably because you wanted your husband out of the way. That's horrible. Get out of here. That's not true. Who was in on it with you? Who killed your husband up at his cabin at the lodge? Get out. Get out. It had to be someone at the lodge who knew what cabin he was in. No, 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 no. Did you get the papers your husband's picture? Yes. You're lying. The newspapers told us you claimed not to have a picture. Well, I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Oh, sure you do. You didn't want to give the papers a picture of your husband because you knew the insurance salesman and the doctor would identify it as not being the man who took out the accident oh, policy. no. You knew your husband was going to take his trip, so you planned his death and stayed home for an alibi. The picture came out, and the insurance man and the doctor had to be killed. A man killed them, Mrs. Farmer. Someone strong enough to run a car off the road and lift an unconscious man out of a window, feet first. Who killed them, Mrs. Farmer? Hey, you, stop! Stop! Lieutenant! Otis has got something. Well, let's get out of the fire escape. Stop, or I'll shoot. There's a new line. Somebody halfway up the fire escape. Look out, Otis! Move over a wall. Otis could hit a herd of elephants in a broom closet. Uh, uh, I got him, Lieutenant. He got him. No, make him happy, Wall. Climb out there and see what we got. Okay. <laughs> now, just take it easy, honey. Quick! Yeah? It's that guy, Phillips. The one who owned the lodge. And he's dead. <laughs> well, Mrs. Farmer, that's it. Want to tell me about it? Oh, yes. It doesn't make any difference now. Phillips killed your husband and the other two men? Yes. We fell in love three summers ago. But he planned it. The whole thing was his idea. Oh, sure, sure, I know. But the state is pretty narrow-minded about those things, honey. A guy like that gets ideas and gets dead for it. You like his ideas, and you just got to get in some kind of trouble along the way. Go on, Melon. I'm in. You're not hurt that bad. I get told. You get shot, Otis? No. But I'd like to ask you something, Shamus. Did you throw a shoe at me? Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you're suffering the pain of a headache, remember, there's no faster-acting aspirin made than Rexall aspirin. When swallowed with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Ask for Rexall aspirin at Rexall drugstores everywhere. There's no faster-acting aspirin made. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall.
Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Wally Mayer, Joan Banks, and Bill Boucher. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime de Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hi, you beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on, and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. <laughs> Wednesdays this fall, hear Groucho, Gildy, and the Halls of Ivy on NBC. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall mineral oil, for example. This is the mineral oil specially refined for extra heavy body. What's more, Rexall mineral oil is tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-irritating, and non-habit-forming. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Uh, Just a moment. Diamond. Diamond, pick up the receiver and speak to me or I'll, 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 I'll... I'll... Walt, Walt, is that your blood pressure I hear bubbling or are you calling from Niagara Falls? What's the big idea keeping me waiting like that? The big idea is that it's a beautiful day and I'm happy. When I'm happy, I whistle. And when I'm happy and whistling, I don't like to be interrupted. I'll remember that the next time you're unhappy and you ask a favor from me. You can whistle then, too. Oh, the great, big, important police lieutenant wants a favor from poor little old Richard Diamond. I want you to go to a funeral. Yours? No, it's mine. <laughs> Say, I'll live to dance the Charleston on your grave, wise guy. Well, they're burying Bigfoot Grafton this afternoon. How do you know? How do I know? How do I know what? That it's Bigfoot Grafton they're tucking in. The way it read my paper, the Harbor Patrol fished out a guy presumed to be Bigfoot Grafton, boy racketeer. We're satisfied with the identification. Huh? Fingerprints? Fingerprints. Look, the body was in the Hudson River for nearly a week. Oh. Then tell me, what makes you so sure the guy they're putting in the ground today is Grafton? Look, Diamond, you're beginning to exasperate me. Will you or won't you go with us to Bigfoot Grafton's funeral this afternoon? Why me? 
Maybe you can show the boys how to dig the grave. Oh, Walt, Walt, that's silly. I don't know a grave from a hole in the ground. So why me? Because you once told me about a little business matter you had with some of Grafton's gang out west. And because some of those same hoods may attend the funeral. And because if any of them do, you'll recognize them. And I can point them out to you. Say, you are a detective. Otis and I'll pick you up in about an hour. Goodbye, Diamond. Goodbye, Bright Eyes. Billy, how many times have I got to tell you this is the only thing left to do? It's all wrong, Marge. I'll tell you there's no need to call in a private eye. Well, hello, girls. Who are you? The name's on the door. Your diamond? Ah. Uh, you see something you don't like? Yeah, you. Oh, you'll never be lovely, be engaged, or get to use puns with an attitude like that. It's a waste of time, Marge, a waste of time. Lay off it, Billy. I know what's right. We came a long way to see you, Diamond. All the way from West Frampton we came. We're ducklings. Well, first impressions are so deceiving. I almost thought you were girls. Now, look, there's a psychiatrist just down the hall who... Get this, Billy. The guy thinks we're nuts. Well, maybe you are a couple of ducks, and I'm the one who's crazy. Not ducks. Ducklings. Oh. Well, then, if you have that kind of a problem, go to the Audubon Society. You never heard of the Long Island Ducklings? All we done was win the pennant last year. Pennant? Oh, baseball? Now it's coming. We're a girls' softball team. We got our own park out in West Frampton. I play third base. Who's on first? Me. Come on, let's get out here, Marge. We'll stay. We gotta find Lottie, and he's gotta help us. Lottie? Lottie Wyrachek, our second baseman. She's been missing almost a week now. We can't win without our second baseman. Oh, yes. I can see where it must leave quite a gap between first base and shortstop. We ain't gonna win the pennant again unless we get Lottie back, Diamond. We gotta have her. You're elected. Elected? I'm not even sure I accept the nomination. See, let's go, Marge. You don't want the job, Diamond? Well, I've never looked for a missing second baseman before. I wouldn't know where to begin. A fine detective. Here, you, you begin by looking at her snapshot. Oh, no, no, girls. Really, I'm terribly busy right now. I've got to go to a funeral and help the police department look with it. Look at her picture. But I tell you, I... 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 I, I don't tell me this is... Lottie Wirechick. You mean a girl who looks like this wastes her nights playing second base? Yeah. Wastes, he says. Diamond, stop drooling. You take the job? Well, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted, yes. I'm, I'm very tempted. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's get some answers first. I ask Billy. She's a roommate. All right. Now, think back, Billy, to a day or so before she disappeared. Uh, she seemed worried about anything? Nervous? Upset? No. Why, she even hit two home runs the very last night she played. She did, huh? Well... I wonder if... Oh, no, no, that isn't possible. The Dodgers do a lot of things, but they wouldn't kidnap people. You say she's been with the team two years? Yeah. Diamond, what sort of questions are these? Please, Lefty. It's my turn at bat. Now, Billy, what did she do before she became a second baseman? Who knows? You'll find her for us? For you? <laughs> oh, no. For me. They gave me a pass for the game that night with the Amagansett Amazons, informed me how to get out to West Frampton the quickest way as the E-train flies, then exploded themselves out, leaving me with a snapshot of a second baseman who looked like Jane Russell, only more so. I wasn't able to dream too long because soon the door opened and I looked up to find the most beautiful gabardine suit I'd ever seen walking toward my desk on the frame of the ugliest hoodlum I'd ever seen. Hey, you diamond? To some people. To others, I'm Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, Diamond. Mr. Diamond. The late Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the one I like the best. All right, Parrot Puss. Who's been eating your crackers? All right, comic. I'm just a boy with a message. Well, spill it. You had visitors, huh? Yeah? Yeah. A couple of overgrown tomatoes. A couple of tomatoes that look more like they belong to the Russian infantry than to the human race. Well, you're not very much to look at yourself, ugly. Get on with the message. Messages lay off. Don't go looking for no missing girl. You don't wake up with no bullet holes where your eyes ought to be. Huh? That's the message. The whole message. No signature? You don't need no signature, friend. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, uh just a minute, Repulsive. Yeah? I want to tell you about the last side of the mouth punk who brought me a message like this without a signature. Go on. Frighten me. Go on. Hey, just stand back that diamond. Don't come no closer. I'll let you... Don't reach into that pocket, punk. Oh, my arm! Now, let me get it for you. Ah, a luger. And almost as ugly as you are. We won't be needing it for this game. My arm! My arm! Oh, there's your arm. Now, put it up with the other one and I'll knock your head off. 
few seconds later, when I picked myself up off the floor, I looked around for my spar mate, but he'd taken his arms and gone home. Leaving me with an eye which for weeks to come would have me lying to people about walking into a door. Yeah, a door wearing gabardine. Uh, how'd you get that shiner, Diamond? I walked into a door, Walt. A door with a fist at the end of it. Where is this cemetery? South Carolina? We'll be there soon. Bigfoot Grafton won't mind waiting a little longer. Assuming, Sergeant Otis, that it is Bigfoot Grafton they're planting. Oh, no, you're not going to start that again. I told you on the phone. We're satisfied with the identification. What identification? Laundry marks and Grafton shirt. Cleaning marks and Grafton suit. Go on. What do you mean, go on? Look, Walt, suppose you're wanted for murder. Two murder raps. You don't have a chance of beating. And suppose that next to the mailman with the income tax refunds, you're the most looked-for guy in the country. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're going to say, Diamond. You think maybe Grafton finds a sucker with his same general build, shoots him in the spine, changes clothes with him, and then dumps him in the big bathtub. That's right, Walt. Well, us silly, confused, homicide cops figured that way, too. Until we checked up on what gave Grafton his nickname. His nickname? Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. Fourteen and a half. We found his shoemaker. He verified the size. So? So it's possible that... Grafton can find a guy that fits his general physique. It's even possible that the guy he finds not only is built the same way body-wise, but wears exactly size 14 and a half Brogans, too. Yeah, it's possible, but highly improbable. Yeah, maybe you're right at that. Well, on behalf of myself and all the other simple-minded fellas known as cops, thank you, Diamond, for saying what you just did. Thank you. There's the cemetery. <laughs> It was just a simple little funeral. Except that the coffin cost maybe $10,000 more than mine will ever cost. And excluding the fact that there were enough flowers to make a couple of dozen floats for the Turnip of Roses parade. Yes, it was just a simple little funeral with maybe a thousand simple little mourners. Good conservative people, like safe blowers, burglars, con men, petty thieves, and some not so petty. Big wheels, little wheels, chiselers, grifters, grafters, jip artists. Well, Diamond, you see anyone who used to run with Grafton's mom? No, not yet. Hey, hey, look. Now, what's he doing here? Oh. The parrot nose in the stylish gabardine suit. I've been admiring that suit. Gabardine, huh? Too bad a poor little gabardine had to go give up its life just so a mug like that could have a suit. Where are you going, Diamond? Who is that guy? He's a messenger boy. I'll be right back. I edged my way through the crowd toward him, hoping that in view of the solemnity of the occasion, none of the pickpockets among the mourners would make use of the opportunity to swipe my suspenders. Five yards away, he turned. He saw me and started to run. I put my head down like a sprinter and turned to follow. There's nothing like a merry chase in a merry place like a cemetery. And just when I thought I had him... Diamond! What are you doing running into tombstones? Oh, well, I suddenly remembered it's been years since I had a collision with a tombstone. Oh, what were you chasing that guy with a fancy suit for? I wanted to find out who his tailor is. Look, uh, Otis got a good look at that twerp I was chasing. Tell him to go through Rogue's Gallery and try to identify him for me, huh? Yeah, but where are you going? Me? No, I think I'll go to a ball game. <laughs> It was a good game as games go, fast and exciting, and my girls did themselves proud. Eight to three. Even though the girl who was playing second in place of the missing Lottie made three errors. After the game, I was in the corridor outside the dressing room talking to Billy, the first baseman. The one who didn't think I should have been hired to bird dog the missing girl. Look, Diamond, this is all for nothing. Lottie ain't missing. We never called on you. There's no case. Now, that's the same tune with a slightly different lyric and ugly in a gabardine suit sang to me. It's a good thing I'm stubborn. It's a bad thing, Diamond, for you. It's going to maybe cost you your life. No. No. Don't. It happened that fast. By the time I turned around to see who did the shooting, he had disappeared in the crowd. Dirty keel. Diamond, what happened? I heard shooting. Stand back, everybody. Send for a doctor. Oh, my God. He grabbed me. I was on his team. Who, Billy? Who? I told him, Marge, called on you to find Lottie. Who, dear? They'll kill Lottie. They'll kill Lottie. Billy. Uh, uh, Billy. 
diamond. Is she? Is she? If anyone asks you who's on first, the answer is no one. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. I've discovered lately that a lot of people think they don't need to take any precautions against vitamin deficiency during the summer months. But the truth is, we're just as apt to be low on vitamins during the summer as any other season. Then you think people should continue right through the summer taking a vitamin supplement? Indeed I do, ma'am. And the one I recommend is Rexall Plenamins. Why exactly? Well, just two plenamin capsules a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other beneficial factors of the vitamin B complex. Say, with all that, they must be expensive. On the contrary, plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at any Rexall drugstore. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond, this department isn't in operation so that you can find girls. I don't care how she looks in her baseball uniform. Oh, but this is business, Walt. I tell you, she's been kidnapped. Another girl on the team was just murdered. Another murder? Where? West Frampton. West who? Frampton, out on Long Island. City limits? No. Huh. That's the quickest case I ever marked closed. What do you want to waste my time with imported homicides for? Don't I have enough to do right here? Oh, but Walt, Don't look, I got... bot me. They've been knocking each other off like flies this week. We're so jammed up, I got three stiffs that don't even have a place to lie down. Four, if you include Otis. Oh, just for that wise guy, I ain't talking. Oh, if I could only be sure of that. I mean, I ain't talking about the guy you played tag with in the cemetery. I found him in the picture book, all right, Diamond. It took me two hours. And just for making cracks at me, I ain't telling you his name. Whose name? Joe Gabardine's, that's whose. And I ain't telling you what else I found out about him in the picture book either. Why not? Because you think you're smarter than the whole police department put together. That's why not. Oh, and so if I go spill to you that this Joe Gabardine used to work as a gunsel for the late Bigfoot Grafton, you're going to right away say Bigfoot Grafton ain't dead after all, and that I'm a dope. Walt, you hear that? The guy that threatened me if I went looking for Lottie Wirecheck, this Joe Gabardine, is one of Grafton's boys. Say, who told you? Was one of Grafton's boys. Grafton's dead. No, but maybe not. Maybe all these shenanigans are part of Grafton's plot to put some sucker in his coffin and stay undercover. Sure, sure. Maybe Lottie Wirecheck knew in some way or other that the guy they fished out of the river and buried today wasn't Grafton. Look, Walt, you got a... Uh, 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 Diamond, tell me. Uh, that name you said, the, the one that sounds like something spelled backwards. Wirecheck? That's funny. What's funny? That's the same name as this dame's in the file missing person sent over. Only this one's name is Lottie... Why, Richick? So's this one, you dope. You mean there's two dames with a name like that? Yeah, just like there are two heads on a sergeant named Otis Loveloon. Now, listen here. Who reported I... her missing? Just for being a fresh guy, I ain't gonna tell you. You ain't gonna tell him what? That it says here on the file card that this doctor reported her missing. Who said anything about a doctor? Huh? You sick, Otis? You need a doctor? I ain't sick. Besides, he ain't that kind of doctor. He's a dentist. Who's a dentist? This Dr. Alman, Dr. Percy Alman, 223 Park Avenue. So? What do you mean, so? What about him? What do you mean, what about him? Well, you brought him into the conversation, Dr. Percy Alman. You said 223 Park Avenue. What made you mention him if you don't have anything to say about him? He's the guy who reported this laddie watch him a check missing, you dope. Gee, Diamond, are you dumb? <laughs> Dr. Percy Alvin's home for decrepit teeth at 223 Park Avenue was a fancy schmancy establishment where bad little molars and becuspids went in for punishment. I could tell even before I met Alman that he was the kind of drill artist who assured the customers there'd be no pain. 
No pain at all, and there usually wasn't. Until the customers got their bills. The office was a ground floor professional suite that opened directly on the street, and when I pushed open the door and went in, this kind of nice middle-aged guy greeted me with, Yes? I'm uh, looking for Dr. Alman. I'm Dr. Alman. But it's after my office hours, young man, unless it's an emergency. Well, it's, uh, it's about Lottie. Lottie Wirecheck. Lottie? You're from the police. You found her. Well, not yet, no. And I'm not from the police. Not... Who are you? My name is Diamond. I'm a private investigator. Oh. <laughs> you gave me quite a turn for a moment. Well, I'm sorry. Doctor, I'd like you to tell me a few things. What sort of things? Lottie Wirecheck. What's she to you? Well, presently, just a friend. Uh, formerly the best dental assistant I ever had. An extremely nice girl. Yeah, yes, I uh, I saw her snapshot. A dental assistant, huh? Yeah, lovely, lovely girl. Um, I hated to lose her. But this baseball thing had been burning in her for a long time. Look, Diamond, just how much do you know about all this? Uh, I know that Lottie's missing. Maybe in trouble. Well, uh, I do need help, and perhaps I'd better tell you everything. I'm game. But I think I should warn you, the information I'm going to give you is dangerous. It may mean your life. Well, I'm uh, still game. Maybe not as much as a few seconds ago, but... Very well. A year or so ago, I had a patient, a man who called himself Dunn, George Dunn. And then you found out that Dunn wasn't Dunn at all. That he had very big feet and he was a racketeer named Grafton. Yes, you're very clever, Diamond. It was a gentle chart he wanted. He threatened me. I felt that if I ever gave it to him, he'd feel the necessity for for killing me. So I gave the chart to Lottie to keep him here. It happened so fast, I barely had time to leap behind the chair. One second, the doctor and I were talking. The next, everything was bedlam and confusion. And blood and death and anger. My anger. The doctor had caught one smack between the eyes. And I got mad, shooting mad. I charged out of that office maybe ten seconds behind the killer, just in time to see him get into a car and melt away into the traffic. He headed east, then south, and east again, then stopped at a crummy-looking building and went in. And that's when smart, shrewd, clever private detective Diamond climbed a drain pipe, tore his pants, looked inside a second-floor window, saw a girl tied to a chair, and like Lockenbar, broke in to rescue the fair second baseman in distress. Lottie? Look out! Oh, oh! this was getting monotonous. The billy caught me on the back of the neck, and while it didn't knock me out, it didn't make me feel like dancing either. The first thing I was aware of when I oriented myself to my new condition was the biggest pair of feet I'd ever seen. And the next thing I saw was the gabardine suit containing in its bright, clean folds the filthiest little murder artist I'd ever seen. So I made like a possum and pretended I was asleep. So, say, Grafton, I told you the shamus followed me. I won him. He's all yours, Joe, I promise, but later. Why later? Why wait? Because I gotta get that dental chart, that's why. Now that you've rubbed off the dentist and that goofy Billy the ball player, that chart's the only thing in the world that can prove Bigfoot Grafton's still alive. So why does that have to hold up Diamond's execution? Because maybe he knows where the dental chart's hid. I'm giving up on the dame here. She'd have told us long ago if she knew. If Diamond knows, he'll talk. Even if he don't know, he'll talk. And scream, too. Later, Joe. Now put that pig sticker back in your pocket. I don't hear you, Grafton. This Diamond made me unhappy, and I don't like to wait. I said put that knife away, Joe. I still don't hear you. All right, Joe. I, still I knew this was the only chance I'd get. They were too busy showing each other their fangs to give me their undivided attention. And so the possum stopped playing possum and made a stab at playing tiger. The act started with a well-aimed kick to what the fight reporters call the midsection. <laughs> and the gabardine suit folded limply and sagged to the floor like it didn't even have a man inside it. And that's when Grafton pulled the gun, and that's when I made a grab for his knee. And you guessed it, there was a shot. And then there was a punch that made a mess out of a jawbone. And I'm happy to report that this time it wasn't mine. Oh, you're wonderful. What's your name? Well, honey, my name's Diamond. Diamond? Yes, dear, and believe me, a diamond is a girl's best friend. I 
I hadn't anyone till you. I was a lonely one till you. I used to lie awake and wonder if there could be a someone in the wide world just made for me. Now I see I had to save my love. For you, I never gave my love till you, and through my lonely heart demanding it, Cupid took a hand in it. I hadn't any one. You. You're so romantic, even with a black eye. Oh, thank you, dear. Oh, Ricky, darling, it must have been dreadful. Oh, it, uh, it had its moments, Helen. Yes, I saw that photograph. The second baseman. What's the matter with the second baseman? Well, Ricky, if she were any good, wouldn't she be a first baseman? Honey, honey, I don't think you understand too much about baseball. Teach me. Oh, it takes years, baby. Years. Well. Hmm? Well, uh, well, baseball's a game that's, uh, that's, uh, divided into innings. Nine innings. Innings? What's an innings? Maybe I better teach you how to play post office. No, no. Ricky, please. Well, uh,. Well, uh, let's see now. An inning is a, a sort of a division, a, a stanza, a, a, a frame. Yeah, that's right, a frame. A frame? An inning's a frame? Hey, you're digging it. No, I'm not, Ricky, not really. Maybe we'd better forget it. All right, all right. An inning is a frame. That's right, dear. An inning is a frame. Hmm. Ricky, was she nice? Lottie? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll say this for her. She sure had a beautiful inning. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Don't wait until you're already suffering from acid stomach and then wish you had Bismarex on hand. Buy a bottle tomorrow. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. More than that, Bismarex gives relief that's continuous and prolonged because its scientifically balanced ingredients work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarex. He'll tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Michael Camroy with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, John Daner, Bill Conrad, Virginia Gregg, Gloria Blondell, and Sidney Miller. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. 
Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall Drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Dick Powell, who stars as Richard Diamond each week at this time, is a chime star. And there are many more of your favorite entertainers who are chime stars on NBC. Listen for the familiar NBC chimes. They're your invitation to fine radio entertainment. Whether it's action-packed adventure mystery, comedy, music, drama, or news, you'll find the very best on your favorite NBC station. Listen again next Wednesday at this same time for another exciting adventure with Dick Powell starred as Richard Diamond. And remember, three chimes mean good times on NBC. In two weeks, enjoy the Halls of Ivy with Ronald Coleman on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall aspirin, for example. There's no faster acting aspirin made than Rexall aspirin. When swallowed with water, Rexall aspirin is ready to go to work for you even before it reaches your stomach. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now, your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. No, no, no. Oh. Yeah? Well, what's the matter with you? Oh, hello, Helen. Nothing has gone right all day. I called your office, but you left an hour ago. What took you so long getting home? Well, I had to stop by the laundry. Didn't have any clean shirts. Are you forgetting we're supposed to be at my mother's at seven? No, honey, I'm not forgetting. What time is it now? A little after six. No, nuts. What in the world's wrong? Well... First of all, I haven't seen anything that looks like a client for two weeks. That's unusual. I only got two hours sleep last night. You're complaining. Oh, no, 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 honey. Then what is it? Well, that stupid laundry gave me the wrong bundle. I can't go over to your mother's with my bare chest hanging out. Well, can't you go back and get the right bundle? Well, it closes at six. Oh, be practical. It was the laundry's fault, so use one of the shirts out of the wrong bundle. They'll have it clean. No, what if it doesn't fit? Make it fit. Now, I won't have you being late again. No, well, all right, all right. I'll see you at seven. I still love you. Then tell your mother not to suggest Monopoly again. I have to get some sleep tonight. The shirt wasn't bad. A little short in the arms, but with my charm bracelet, no one would notice. I shaved, cussed a little, showered, cussed some more. Really let loose with some choice ones while I got dressed and kept it up all the way over to Helen's. She walked out in a green number that plunged so far it could have been arrested for attempted suicide. Sure cure for cussing. Like it? The guy who went off the Golden Gate didn't have half to drop. Oh, stop perspiring and come on. Helen's mother lived in a 40-room vault on Long Island. We had a wonderful dinner. Soup, salad, pheasant under glass. The only thing missing was cracked crab. Until Helen's mother suggested Monopoly, then I nearly shelled her and ducked her in the mustard. 
About one o'clock, my eyes felt like two, three-minute eggs lost in a sand pile, so I gave up and went to sleep right in the middle of a tricky trade for my railroad. Helen apologized, looked at me hatefully when I suggested a piggyback ride to the car, and by two o'clock, she dropped me in front of my flat on 53rd. You were horrible. Oh, well, how did I know your mother had the electric company, too? Oh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Kiss? You can't even keep your eyes open. This is going to stop me. I do my best work with my eyes closed. No. All right. Honey, are you growing a beard? That's my mink coat. Oh. Night. Good night. Good evening, Frank. Hmm? My name Diamond? Yeah. What do you want? I got some laundry that belongs to you. Well, that's nice. Nothing like getting your laundry at 2 o'clock in the morning. You got mine. We'll stop around about noon tomorrow and we'll swap. I'd like it now, friend. I gotta leave town. Oh, look, I'm a little tired, friend. I want the laundry. Yeah, well, you're dealing with a bad customer. I just traded Pennsylvania Avenue for one lousy railroad. What? Come back tomorrow, friend, and I'll give you your laundry and a detailed explanation. I want the laundry now. Now, look. You look. Well, if anything could have opened my little old sleepy blue eyes, it's that lovely gun. You look divine together. Now, let's go up and get the laundry. What's the matter? You got the only long underwear with sequins? Move. And I moved. Up to my little flat with the laundry man sticking close enough so I wouldn't forget the big gun on his hot little hand. We went in and traded bundles. You opened it, huh? Well, what did you want me to do? Put it on a table and offer up prayers? You're a little too wise for your own good, but I got what I wanted. No hard feelings. Yeah, well, I hope your socks fall down. You just stay put until I'm out of the building. Thanks, friend. Well, any other time, I might have done something ridiculous, like chasing the guy or calling Walt up and complaining about the inadequacy of the old police department. But this wasn't any other time. It was after two in the morning and I was tired. Sure, it was unusual to trade laundry at that hour, but I was in no condition to try and figure it out. So I brushed my teeth, left my clothes in a neat pile in the corner, and stumbled into bed. Oh, no, no, I'll never get any sleep. I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? Yeah, who is it? This is Mr. Green, Mr. Diamond. Well, thanks for calling, Mr. Green. Good night. Oh, wait, wait. Please wait, Mr. Diamond. This is Mr. Green, the man who owns the Blue Bell Laundry. Well, how's business? Can you come over to my apartment right away? Why? Someone's going to try and kill me. What time is it? Three o'clock. Look, can't you hide in a closet or something until noon? I tell you, someone's going to kill me. Oh, get in the closet and close the door. If anyone opens it, take a bite out of the nearest coat and head for the closest bright no, light. This is serious, Mr. Diamond. I haven't got much time. Well, if you don't think you can look like a moth, maybe I'd better drop around. What's your address? Savoy Arms, Apartment C. And hurry, I'm desperate. Well, if you're just half as desperate as I am sleepy, you're really in trouble. I'll be right over. <laughs> I stumbled back into my clothes and downstairs and a quick walk down to park where I could grab a cab. Then ten minutes later, I was knocking at the door of apartment C. No answer. I was about to try the door when it opened. Uh, Mr. Green? You're too late. Mr. Green? He opened the door all right, but that was as far as he got. He just slid down and stretched out on his stomach, head turned sideways, thick glasses pushed up at an angle... His weak eyes trying hard to see everything there was to see before they closed for good. I kneeled down beside him. Jones. Wrong laundry number. Jones. Green. Green. Well, everybody dies. He'd been shot just under the heart from the back. A warm breeze made me turn and look out the open window on the far side of the room leading out to a fire escape. I went over and looked out. Nothing. But it was a good bet that the killer had shot Green from there. I put in a call to Walt, and in ten minutes he was standing over Green. And this is the guy who owns the laundry and gave you the wrong bundle. That's right. How do you always get mixed up in things like this? Well, it's a talent. Did he say who he thought was after him? 
Oh, he just told me that he was in fear of his life. Now, what about the guy who shoved the gun in your face and took away the bundle of laundry? No, oh, about my size. Had a hat on, light gray suit, brown eyes, heavy eyebrows, high cheekbones, very sharp features. Well, let's go down and run through the gallery, see if we can get an identification. Okay. But first, let's take a run down to the Blue Bell Laundry. Might be a good idea to find out what this is all about. <laughs> Uh, here it is, Lieutenant. Blue Bell Laundry. Oh, he read the sign. Mm. If a guy with fangs and a long black cape answers, drive a stake through his heart. Or shoot him with a silver bullet. You keep your suggestions to yourself, Sergeant, or I'll open this door with your head. Uh, these keys are a better shape. I tell you, we can't use them. If no one answers, then we got to get a search warrant. Why? Because that's the law. What is? That we got to get a warrant to search the laundry. Well, what do you want to search the laundry for? What do I want to search it for? Because a man's just been killed. Okay, so what? What's that got to do with the laundry? The guy who was killed was the guy who owned the laundry. You told me yourself it had something to do with getting the bundles mixed up and that guy who stuck you up tonight. Okay, but you can't just go busting into a laundry just because of a stupid little old hunch. What do you mean, stupid? You could be wrong, you know. Just because you think you might solve this case, that's no reason for you to go busting into a laundry. Well, why not? The answer to this whole thing might just be in that laundry. Well, you've certainly been right in the past. No, oh, not always. No, most of the time, Wall. Well, just lucky. Well, if you think it's best, here are the keys. Well, you understand, right? Oh, sure, sure, Wall. Lieutenant. Yeah? Oh, nothing. You stay out here, Sergeant. Well, we're in. I hope the commissioner doesn't hear about it. About what? Breaking and entering. Breaking and... Why, why, you... You... Fiend? Yes. Walt hopped around for a while until he ran out of steam, and then we went to work and took the laundry apart. The way it stacked up, I had gotten the wrong bundle of laundry. The guy who'd stuck me up in two in the morning had gotten mine. So the bundle that I'd gotten by mistake figured to be pretty important. There must have been something else in there besides clean shirts. So, Green, the owner, made a mistake. Oh, but that's kind of hard to do, Walt. You've got to have a ticket to get your laundry. Ticket with a number on it? Well, sure. It should correspond to the numbers on those bins. Hey, wait a minute, wait yeah. a minute. Before Green died, he said something about a wrong number. And a name. What name? Uh, uh, uh Jones. Jones. Now, look, when I brought my laundry in, Green wrote my name and number down in a book. Let's see if we can find that book. Walt took one side of the shop and I took the other. Inside of ten minutes, we had the book. We turned to the page with deliveries dated for the day before and found my name. Now, here it is. Richard Diamond. Uh-huh. Laundry number 99. That's right. That was the number on the ticket I gave him. Then Green didn't make a mistake. But he'd have to to give you the wrong bundle. He couldn't get mixed up with the bins, Mark. Walt, turn that book around. Turn it around? Upside down. Huh. Now, if that number was on a ticket and I handed it to you upside down... 66. Yeah. Who's listed under 66? Say it's not on this page. Uh, here. Well, I'll be... John Jones. No address. <laughs> John Jones. Green had said Jones before he died. Jones had the laundry ticket marked 66. Green had evidently looked at my ticket upside down and given me Jones's bundle. Green couldn't have known anything important was in that bundle or he wouldn't have made the mistake. And then why was he killed? Doesn't figure. Well, if he was just a go-between, it does. He didn't put the important something in the bundle. Or he would have just held the bundle until Jones arrived and given it to him. Then the bundle came wrapped with the something in it. Now, now look, Walt. You know how these small places work. They, they send their stuff out to a large laundry and cleaning plant. Yeah, but which one? Hey. Yeah, I got a shirt on it from that wrong bundle. I bet it's got a laundry mark. Should be on the collar. Let's see. Well, let's not strangle me, huh? Let me unbutton a few buttons. Like Scott. Well, go ahead, Grabby. See, yeah, there's some writing on the collar. I'll read it out, and I'll write it down. Uh, eight, six, A, four, five, L. What kind of a laundry number is that? Find out, and you might have the guy who slipped something in that bundle and was responsible for Green's death. Uh... 
We went through the rest of the place, but found no evidence to show us what big plant Green sent his laundry to. I bowed out as gracefully as possible and went home to get some sleep. It was 4 a.m. when I stumbled into my flat with just one thought in mind. Sleep. And I got it in a hurry. Rick, come on now. Snap out of it. No. Come on, come on. Sit up. No, leave me alone. Somebody sapped you. No, I don't care if you split my head in sections. I went to sleep, didn't I? What happened to your shirt? My shirt? All right. Oh. Oh, so that's it. What's it? The shirt. That's what the guy was really after. You suppose it was Jones? Well, sure it was. Walt, when he, when he traded bundles with me, he didn't have any way of knowing that I'd taken a shirt out of it. That shirt was what made that bundle important. Those numbers on the collar. I checked. They weren't a laundry mark. Uh, you still got them? Yeah. Well, they sure mean something. Let's see if we can figure out just what. I gave Walt a pencil and paper, and we put our two brilliant minds to work trying to figure out the numbers that had been written on the collar of the shirt. Just numbers with two letters, A and L. Easy problem for two brilliant students of criminology. I got it. You have? Let's take the numbers down to the decoding department. Oh, that's what I like. Perseverance, a sharp mind, and nothing's too tough for us. Well, come on, come on, Art. You've been working on those numbers for nearly five minutes. Well, I've been sick. Could this be a code for some kind of a pickup? Ah, guess it could be. Well, let's use times and dates. First number is eight. Well, today's the eighth day. Well, the letter A could stand for AM. Six A, six AM. Could eighty eight, six AM. Then forty six L could be the where. Hmm. Forty sixth in any street beginning with L. Out of the way corner. Forty sixth in Lexington, and that's not out of the way. Oh, I'm sure glad you broke that code, Walt. Ah, experience and a little common sense. Come on. You and me are going over to 46th and Lexington. You and I, Walt. I could stand for idiot. That's another <laughs> code, Arch. Fourth letter in Levinson. Oh, come on. We haven't got all morning. You're listening to Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Brought to you by the makers of Rexall Drug Products and your Rexall Family Druggist. And here he is. Every woman will tell you that the ideal home antiseptic is one that will serve as a mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant, all with equal effectiveness. And that's exactly what Rexall MI-31 does. Well, now how did you know that? Because I read all about it in your big ad in this week's issue of Life. Say, isn't that a good ad? A whole page crammed full of top-quality Rexall products. Some of them at special bargain prices, good all this month. And every one of them just as reliable as Rexall MI-31, America's popular all-round mouthwash. What's more, Rexall gives you a full pint of MI-31 at the same price as other leading brands of smaller quantity. That's why I've learned to watch for your ads. I learn all about these wonderful money-saving values. And they always remind me of so many things I need, too. Then maybe I'd better tell our listeners that this same full-page ad is appearing in current issues of Collier's Look, Saturday Evening Post and Country Gentleman. Check it carefully. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah, this is a good spot. No one on the corner of 46th and Lexington yet. What time is it? Uh, five minutes to six. Yeah, well, I hope we figure this out right. Car 86, car 86. Oh, that's us. Car 86, Levinson, go ahead. Sergeant Otis wants to speak with you, Lieutenant. Oh, go ahead. Well, Lieutenant, I checked and found out where the Blue Bell Laundry sent its cleaning. Two companies, Monarch and the Superior Cleaning and Dying Works. Uh, Mr. Ralph Collins owns Monarch and, uh... Mr. Arthur Levin on Superior. 
Find out the addresses of the plants and the home addresses of the owners, and then put a stake out at the homes of the owners. Don't pick them up, but stop them if they're trying to leave. Wilco, Roger and out. Oh, I'm surprised he didn't get tired of Roger and use McGillicuddy just to be different. Hey, Walt, there's our boy. Huh, Jones? Yeah, across the street on the corner. Same guy who got the bundle from me. Let's go. No one else yet. He's waiting for something. It's about two minutes to six. Yeah. That car pulling up. Jones is going over to it. Get going. The guy in the car gave Jones a package. They spotted us. You get the car, I'll take Jones. Stop! Stop that car! Stop, Jones! Jones! Okay. Uh, car got away, but I put some bullet holes in it. Drop the gun, Jones. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm hurt bad. Don't, don't shoot again. Get me an ambulance, will Walt, he's got another bundle with him. I'll get back to the car and get the wagon. I think you got me the stump. You want to talk? Yeah, yeah, okay. What's in the bundle you got from the car? Junk. A hundred thousand in morphine. How did Green figure? Oh, it's just a go between. He worked for the big boy. Took our money. Sent it in with an order for the stuff. Instructions in the collar of one of the shirts. Yeah. Uh, I... You killed Green? Yeah, yeah. Who's the big boy? Jones. Jones. The wagon's on its way. Uh, he's dead. What was he picking up? Narcotics. Well, Walt, we know the code was put in the laundry bundles at one of the cleaning works. Well, go to bother. They've been checked. Yeah, and you could never tell what else might turn up. We waited until the wagon pulled up and carted Jones off, then we headed across town toward the first of two stops, the Superior Cleaning and Dyeing Works. 7.30 when we pulled up in front and let ourselves in with one of my pass keys. This is the only one we can check quietly. They open at eight, don't they? Yeah. Got a half an hour to make a noose for a pretty big operator. So we went to work on the superior laundry. Guys like Jones were caught every day, but the big boys, the ones who dished out the stuff from the top, the big syndicate operators were tough to catch. And here was a chance to catch one. We got into the office and found the order books. Jones appeared in nearly every one. This was the place where Green sent Jones's laundry. But it still doesn't prove enough. We've got to prove that the code was slipped in the bundle from this plant. Then we got to find the guy who does it. Well, come on. We got to work fast. This joint opens up in a half an hour. Hey, Walt, hold it. Car pull up outside. Yeah, I can see it out of the window. Rick, it's the same car that passed the junk to Jones. The one I put the bullets in. Hey, he's coming in. Hey, he's. He's coming up here. Get in the other room. Yeah, leave the door open. Hello, Mr. Levin. Yeah, hey, Charlie. Yeah, there was some trouble. Cops were waiting. Yeah. I'm down at the place. Nah, I got away clean. Uh, Jones had the bundle. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll blow. Let's take him. Hey! Hold it! He's making a break! Stop! Let's get out He's got a gun! Blow him up! Well, he's had it. Yeah. Know him? Charlie Asher. Narcotics record. Yeah, this shirt turned into a mess. Yeah. Let's go see Mr. Arthur Levin of Superior Cleaning and find out what kind of cleaning works he's been running. Hi, Lieutenant. You got the whole place surrounded. Levin hasn't tried to leave? He's been out of the house once, went to the garage. Have anything with him? Well, now, when he came out, went in with a big box. All right, let's take him. You better get out of sight, Otis. You'll see that uniform and get jumpy. Get down there in the end of the porch. All right. Yes? Police, Mr. Levin, we'd like to talk to you. Oh, well, uh, come in. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to my office. Where is your office, Mr. Levin? I own the Superior Cleaning and Dye Works. You do laundry for Mr. Green's Blue Bell Laundry? I do work for a lot of laundries. I believe that Mr. Green happens to be one of them. You know a man named Jones? I know more than one Jones. How about a man named Charlie Usher? Charlie? No. 
No, I don't know him. He called you 20 minutes ago. No, he didn't call me. You're very much mistaken. Now, would you mind telling me what this is all about? How many workers do you have at Superior, Mr. Levin? About 40. Any of them have police records? No, not to my knowledge. And you don't know Charlie Usher? No. No, I told you, I do not know him. Well, he had a key to the front door of your laundry. He used your office phone. I can't help that. He called a Mr. Levin. But I have never talked with a man named Charlie Usher. I, I what swear What was in that I'm... box you brought in from the garage? Box? Books. Books. I brought some books in. Where are the books, Mr. Levin? Oh, I already... I put them in the shelves in the library. What did you do with the box? I, I, I burned it. Uh, I, I don't like dirty boxes lying around the house. You went outside and burned it? Yes, yes, in the incinerator. My men said you only came out of the house once, Mr. Levin. Then your men are mistaken. I went out twice, once to get the box, uh, the books, and the second time to burn the box. Look, what right have you got to hide outside my house and watch it like a bunch of burglars? I know my rights. I want to call my lawyer. Oh, sure, sure, Mr. Levin. You go right ahead and call your lawyer. In the meantime, we'll see if anything was burned in the incinerator. It would be burned out by now. That was uh, 20 minutes ago. About the time Charlie Usher called He you. did not call me. I don't even know him. Well, even if you did burn the box 20 minutes ago, Mr. Levin, there'd still be some smoking ashes. And if it wasn't burned in the incinerator, Mr. Levin, we'll take this house apart piece by piece until we find it. I'll go take wait, a Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, yes, Mr. Look, Levin. Look, I'm, I'm not sure I, I burned the box. Then you didn't go outside the second time? I, I don't know. I, I don't remember. I, I'm all mixed up. Look, you got to give me time to think. Well, if you didn't go out the second time, the box is still in the house. Look, please, please do this. Give me time. What's give me... in the box, Mr. Levin? Books, I told you. Books. Where is it? I don't know. Leave me alone now. Now, will you leave me alone? I know my rights. Start taking the house apart. No, wall. no, no, please. Where's the box? Please. The box, Mr. Levin, the box. Yeah, where's the box? Uh, under the sink. Where under the sink? There's a sliding paddle under the kitchen sink. Narcotics, Mr. Levin? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm ruined. You marked the shirt collars and sent Charlie Usher to deliver the stuff. That's right. I had ten laundries working for me. Green was one of them. I'm ruined. Ruined. Oh, relax, Mr. Levin. You can be happy about one thing. Jones and Usher didn't cooperate like you did. And they're both dead. <laughs> Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're often troubled with acid stomach, or if you're looking for a gentle, non-irritating way to achieve regularity, try Rexall Milk of Magnesia. Pure, mild, creamy, smooth, and with no unpleasant earthy taste. Rexall Milk of Magnesia is justly popular. Buy the economy size, quart bottle. It costs only 69 cents at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Clayton Post, Sidney Miller, Virginia Gregg, and Stacey Harris. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristle puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes. 
to make girls care. Go stag. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's entertainment in store for you every Wednesday night on NBC. In addition to the action-packed adventures of Richard Diamond, beginning next Wednesday, listen to Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman returning over most of these stations with their delightful series, The Halls of Ivy. In four weeks, laugh with Groucho Marx and you bet your life on NBC. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall drug company. Like Plenamins, for example. Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Two Plenamins a day give you more than your daily minimum requirements of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established. Plus, valuable liver concentrate and iron. And yet, Plenamins cost only pennies per day. Ask for Plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective. Starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency. Handy hints on happy homicide. I beg your pardon? I said Diamond Detective Agency. Handy hints... Yes, yes, I heard the last part, but I just wanted to be sure there was nothing the matter with my phone. Uh, Mr. Diamond, I wish to hire you. I'm touched. One hundred dollars a day in expenses. I'm touched. Well, if the figure depresses you a little, I suggest getting out in the fresh air. Exercise. Play a little golf. If you could use a dandy caddy on Sunday... I can easily afford the fee, Mr. Diamond, but to be frank, it wasn't exactly what I expected. Isn't it a little high? Well, frankly, yes. But if you hire another detective, you won't be getting the prettiest. <clears throat> I see. Uh, can you come to my house at six this evening? Name, address, and reason for hiring me? George Lexington. Golden Strand, Long Island. And I'm in fear of my life. I'll see you at six, Mr. Lexington. On the dot. Please be prompt. Just have a substantial retainer ready. Aside from my blue eyes, greed and promptness are my two most outstanding features. Well, that's the way a buck's made my business. I sit around the office for a week, passing the idle hours, playing old Welsh mining tunes on a comb. Then someone gets in trouble, opens the phone book, and naturally the first thing that must catch their eye is my very gaudy full-page advertisement on the Diamond Detective Agency. After that, a phone call, and I'm in business. At six sharp, I was ringing the doorbell to the home of Mr. George Lexington, client in fear of his life. Yes, sir? Mr. Diamond, to see Mr. Lexington. Mr. Lexington is busy at the moment. Does he expect you? I have an appointment with him at six... Oh, I see. Uh, please step in. If he'll wait in the library, sir, I'll tell Mr. Lexington you are here. Uh, uh, what was that? Unless you keep a car in one of the upstairs rooms, that, my friend, was a gun going off. Come on. 
With the butler right behind me, we took the long, curved staircase three steps at a time. The butler managed to pant out that Mr. Lexington was in the study at the head of the stairs, so that was the door we went through, only to be stopped cold on the other side. Standing in the middle of the room was a girl. The word girl in this case, to be identified with adjectives one might think up after having spent three lonely years on a life raft in the middle of the Atlantic. The only thing that kept my eyes from melting and running down on my shirt was the thirty-two revolver she held in her gloved hand. And Miss Morris, no! Give me the gun, honey. No, no! Stop. Drop it, honey. You just scorched my money belt. She dropped it and we all went to pieces. I helped her to a seat and let her cry it out. The gun I could have passed off as a whim or too many Hopalong Cassidy adventures, but the man sprawled across his desk on the other side of the room changed the whole picture. I called the 5th Precinct Police Station and got Lieutenant Walter Levinson started for Long Island. The police? You shot a man, didn't you? Yes. You tried to kill yourself, didn't you? <laughs> Well, they're both against the law. Want to tell me about it? He deserved it. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes? I just found something rather strange. Well, don't scratch it. Miss Morris shot Mr. Lexington, all right. I never denied it. Well, what's bothering you? The thought just occurred to me. Who also took the trouble of stabbing him? Stabbing him? He was shot. Then how do you explain this carving knife in his back? Oh, now, Diamond, you stop that. But it's true, Walt. Sure is, Lieutenant. Been shot in the chest and got a knife in his back. Now, how do I get in on these things? This is uh, Miss Morris, Walt, the girl who shot him. How do you do? Oh, you shot him, huh? Yes, Lieutenant. Well, who stabbed him? Have no idea. Swell. Miss Morris, why did you shoot this, uh, uh, what's his name? Lexington, George. Why did you shoot him? I refuse to answer. Okay, suit yourself. Where's the coroner, Walt? Should be here any minute. I didn't stab him, Mr. Diamond. When you came in, did you talk with Lexington? I just opened the door, saw him sitting at the desk, and I shot him. Did you talk to him? Oh, sure, sure, Walt. She played 20 questions with him while he was trying to paw the knife out of his back. I was just trying to trap her. Why? Why? Because if she said she'd talk to him, it would have been an admission that, uh, uh, uh... She'd talk to him. No, that he was still alive before she shot him. Okay, who stabbed him? How do I know? Well, if he was still alive before she shot him, she talked to him, then she must have seen who stabbed him, right? Yeah. Well, if she saw who stabbed him, she couldn't have done it, right? Right. And no one would have stabbed Lexington if he'd already been shot, right? No one would have stabbed Lexington if he'd already... Yeah, of course. You think I'm stupid? Uh, Lieutenant... You shut up. So if they stabbed him, he hadn't been shot and he was alive. Of course. Then if he was alive and they stabbed him, the girl didn't do it to confuse you. Huh? So if she didn't do it, she can go home. Go on home, Miss Mars. Oh, but Mr. Diamond... You heard him. Go on. Uh, that's what I was trying to tell you, Lieutenant. Diamond's at it again. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Take the girl, the butler, and Diamond down to the car. And when the coroner gets here, we'll all take a little drive down to the station, understand? Yes, Lieutenant. What are you yelling at? I don't know. I, uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Well, the coroner finally arrived and suggested an autopsy for the corpse and a bath and some hot mud for Walt. Then we all climbed into the squad car and headed for downtown New York in the 5th Precinct Police Station. On the way, I told Walt about my phone call from Lexington about 3.45 that afternoon and the few details leading up to finding June Morris with a smoking gun and the dead Mr. Lexington. At the station, we continued to question the girl as to her motive for the killing, but she refused to say anything. The butler could add nothing, so they were taken out to await further question. She was allowed to call her lawyer, and we all settled down to wait for the coroner's report on the autopsy. Yeah? The dame's lawyer is here. Wants to see you first. Okay. Girl's lawyer. Mr. Farnsworth, Lieutenant. Hello, Lieutenant. What is this all about? Mr. Diamond, Mr. Farnsworth. How do you do? How are you? I just got a call from Miss Morris. Uh, Lieutenant. Uh, pardon me a minute. Well, what do you want, Hammerhead? I got the girl's personal effects. Well, give them to me. Okay. Gee, what did I do? Nothing, Sergeant, but your family sure bust things up. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. Thank you. Gee, I don't know. Am I to understand that Miss Morris is being held here on a murder charge? That's right. Just whom is Miss Morris supposed to have killed? You know Mr. George Lexington? Why, uh, yes, he's the boy. 
Maybe you can tell us why she would want to kill him. I suggest you question the witness, Mr. Diamond. But let me warn you beforehand. My advice to my client will be to say nothing until I can find out more about this thing for myself. Now, about Miss Morris. She stays put. Lieutenant, I have a great deal of influence. Then get her rich. She stays put. What about this George Lexington's background, Mr. Farnsworth? Let me give you one more suggestion before I leave. Find these things out for yourself. I have a fair reputation in the legal profession. Good evening, Mr. Farnsworth. I'll have that writ, Lieutenant. Ah, oh, go to blazes. Mm, nice fella. A doll. Well, let's see if there's anything in these personal effects here. Take a look through the purse. Okay. Uh, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Bring in the butler. Right. Here's something, Walt. What is it? A typewritten note in the bottom of her purse. What's that? Meet me at the house at a quarter of six this evening. Bring $15,000 and be prompt or you will regret it for the rest of your life. Signed, George. George Lexington. Mm, Well, bully for you. Diamond, I swear. Out to the butler, Lieutenant. (sighs) Come in. Sit down. Well, thanks. My face... Not you, Melonhead. Get out of here. Oh, well, okay. I just thought... Otis. Yeah? When the coroner's report comes in, bring it right in and bring the girl along with it. Yeah, Lieutenant. How do you feel, Arthur? A little upset, sir. This has been quite a string. Last name, Cameron? Yes, sir. How long have you worked for George Lexington? About four years, sir. Ever since Mr. Lexington came east. Did you know him before that? No, sir. You ever mentioned where he was from? California, I think. Had a lot of money? I presume so. I was paid regularly. He maintained a good-sized house and entertained frequently. To my knowledge, he never had any debts that weren't paid immediately. How long have you known Miss Morris? She and Mr. Lexington were engaged two years ago. It only lasted a few months. But they still saw each other occasionally. Did you know Miss Morris was expected tonight? Yes, sir. She called and said she would be there at uh, 5.45. You sure about the time? Yes, sir. But you didn't expect me at 6. Uh, no, sir. Mr. Lexington said nothing about it. Hmm. Is there another way into that study? Uh, yes, sir. A back door leading down to the garden. Did uh, Lexington have any other visitors during the day? No, sir. Was he in from 3 to 5? Yes, sir. I got the coroner's report and Miss Morris, Lieutenant. Okay, that's all, Arthur. We'll have to hold you until this thing straightens itself out. You go along with Sergeant Lovelorn. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Arthur. Yes, sir. Does Mr. Lexington own a typewriter? No, sir. All right. Come in, Miss Morris. Sit down. Uh, Here's the report and the bullet taken out of Lexington and the knife. Take the butler downstairs. Right. Let's go, Arthur. Yes. When did you receive this note, Miss Morris? Oh, where? Uh, We found it in your purse. When you become a murder suspect, I'm afraid nothing's very private. This morning. It's from George Lexington? Yes. He has something on you. Okay, you're just hurting yourself. Miss Morris, did you know a man named Jack Short? No. Who's Jack Short, Walt? Just read this report. Here's what it says about the late Mr. George Lexington. Fingerprints check one Jack Short, arrested 1936, 38, 39, petty theft, suspicion of robbery, suspicion of possessing narcotics, three arrests, one conviction. Did a year and a day in Alcatraz. When did he have time to do his laundry? He was arrested again in 1942 for manslaughter. Went to trial, case dismissed for lack of evidence. Lovely boy. You mean George Lexington? Was Was really Jack Short a criminal with a record? But his house, servants, the the money he spent. That's something we're going to find out about. What does the coroner's report say, Walt? The knife did kill him, not the bullet. And the knife has got your fingerprints all over it, Miss Morris. What? It's got a what? That's right. Ever see it before, Miss Morris? I, I don't know. It's a carving knife. One that might belong to a set. <gasps> Something wrong? That's my carving knife. I missed it this morning. Sure. When was the last time you used it? Last night. I gave a small dinner party. Do you own a typewriter, Miss Morris? Yes, I do. Hello, June. You better come along with me. Oh, Mr. Farnsworth. Uh, just a minute. What's the idea of busting in here like this, Farnsworth? I, I tried to stop him, Lieutenant. You should have stuck out one of your big feet. Those things could trip a tank. I told you I would be back with a writ. Well, I'm here, and there's the writ. Come, June. She stands right here. Lieutenant, you don't seem to understand. No, you don't seem to understand, Mr. Farnsworth. 
You got that written and was sustained because I was nice enough not to issue a formal complaint. Also, there's a little matter of influence. You're darn right, and I'm going to show you how it works. I'm making a formal complaint right now, and the charge is murder. And if you don't think I can make it stick, I won't even bother to throw you out of my office. I'll let the commissioner do it for me. Now get out of here. Gee, you're wonderful, Lieutenant. You shut up! Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. One of the questions most often asked a druggist is this. What can I take for fast relief from acid stomach? I've often wanted to know that myself. What's your answer? Naturally, ma'am, it's Bismarex. Rexall's justly famous antacid. Why? What is it that makes it so outstanding? Well, the secret lies in the scientifically developed formula. You see, the active ingredients in Bismarex vary in the time it takes them to dissolve in the stomach. That way, the relief it gives is not only fast, but continuous and prolonged. Excess acidity is often neutralized in less than one minute. Then the other ingredients, dissolving more slowly, ease up that gastric distress. And finally, Bismarex leaves a soothing, protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Oh, I'll have to remember that. Bismarex. Is that how you say it? That's right, ma'am. B-I-S-M-A hyphen R-E-X. Bismarex. Ask for Bismarex at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember... You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, Farnsworth got the idea in a hurry and took off like a rabbit with his tail on fire. Walt lived up to his word. After making the formal charge and producing the evidence, the writ was dismissed. He then secured a search warrant for both Miss Morris's flat and George Lexington's house on Long Island. Our first stop was Miss Morris's apartment, and when we went in, I thought how much it looked like her. Small, beautifully decorated. We went over the whole place, nothing except in the small den. There's the party list she told us about. Hmm. Good 30 names here. Typed. There's a typewriter. You got that note you had in the purse? Yeah, uh, here. Top of the E is blocked out like on the note. Same machine. No. Bring the typewriter, Otis. Right, Lieutenant. You going over to Lexington's home? Yeah, aren't you coming along? No, I got an idea. Do me a favor, will you, Walt? Well, sure, why? When you get over there, besides checking that back door to the study, put in a call to the phone company and see if a call was made around 3.45 this afternoon to El Rado 1234. It's a toll call from there, and they'd have a record. Now, let me write that down. El Dorado, one, two, three, four. Yeah. I'll call you at Lexington's in about an hour. If that number wasn't called from there, check every name on that party list. Well, there are 30 names there. You want me to check each one to see whether a call was made to El... What's the matter? El Dorado, one, two, three, four. That's your office number. Well... Yeah? Bye. I left Walt turning that awful green and headed for the Times building. It was a little late when I got there, but an old friend at the morgue noticed the $5 bill I was wearing in my lapel and agreed to take care of it for me while I looked through the newspaper files. I dug up everything on Jack Short and his alias George Lexington. The stuff on Short wasn't much, except the trial for manslaughter had made the front page. The items on George Lexington could all be found in the society columns. From what I could gather, he'd started his social world in 1944. He'd been engaged several times, and each time to a wealthy woman. I even came across a picture of June Morris on the evening they had announced their engagement. Well, having all the information I could get, and with one little item dated California, June 26, 1942, tucked away in my pocket, I put in a fast call to Walt, who was at the home of the late George Lexington. Yeah? What did you find out? Well, someone could have gotten in the back door. There were some blurred footprints outside in the garden, but they won't help. If you had a key, you could let yourself in and walk right up the study. What about the phone call? There was no call made from here to your office, but uh, one of the names on the list paid off. 
Uh, Mrs. Julia Wright out of Long Island. Now, uh, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Uh, you stay right there, Walt. I'm going out to see Mrs. Julia Wright. Well, if she called your office today at 3.45, you certainly must have talked to her. George Lexington called my office today at 3.45. But he couldn't have. The butler said Lexington wasn't out of the house and the call wasn't made from here. Well, someone called. Maybe it was the right day. Maybe she got a low voice and told you she was Lexington. Walt. Huh? Oh, forget it. You wouldn't like it anyway. Diamond? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Wright? My butler says your business is a matter of life or death. Well, that's a little exaggerated, but it's one sure way of getting by the red tape. Then what is your business, Mr. Diamond? I, uh, I'm from the police. Oh. Do you know of Mr. George Lexington? Why, yes, slightly. Are you married, Mrs. Wright? Very happily. What is your interest in Mr. Lexington, Mr. Diamond? Do you know June Morris? Hmm? Quite well. I've known her family for at least twenty, uh, ten years. She's being held for the murder of George Lexington. Oh, that poor girl. She was engaged to Lexington at one time, wasn't she? Yes. He was a beast. Believe me, Mr. Diamond, he deserved killing. I thought you said you only knew him slightly. Why, oh, I, I... June used to tell me how terribly he treated her. A phone call was made from your house yesterday at approximately 345 to El Dorado 1234. Mm, I don't believe I know anyone at that number. Are you sure? A man made it. I talked to him. My husband wasn't home yesterday. Oh, perhaps it was my lawyer. He was here about that time. In fact, I believe he did make a call. Said it was on business. A call from the library. What's your lawyer's name, Mrs. Ryan? Why, Mr. Lucius Farnsworth. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I certainly don't like the guy, but his reputation's been spotless. It's just got to be, Walt. Here's the girl, Lieutenant. Uh, come in, Miss Morris. Thank you, Lieutenant. Hello, Mr. Diamond. June, the note you received was written on the typewriter in your den. What? Lab just sent up a report. You think I sent that note to myself? No, no, no. But can you remember anyone using the typewriter in the last two days? No. No one has used it but myself. What about the night of the party? Who uses a typewriter at a party? Anyone go in the den and maybe lock the door? Why, why yes. As, as a matter of fact, Mr. Farnsworth said he had to make some business calls. He went in and closed... You don't think that... That Farnsworth did it? Why, it's absurd. He's been with my family for years. Did he introduce you to George Lexington? Yes, it was at a party at Julia Wright's. Did Mr. Farnsworth know that you owned a gun? No one knew it. Were you actually using that knife the night of the party? Yes, I, I sliced some turkey. Hmm. You remember what kind of a suit Mr. Farnsworth was wearing that night? He was wearing a dinner jacket. Lexington was blackmailing you, wasn't he? I can't answer that. Oh, honey, believe me, if you don't trust us and it comes out anyway, we'll have no way of stopping it. Oh, right, it was blackmail. I was going to marry George. There were some letters, some... a picture. He broke off the engagement and began demanding money. Last week he mentioned something about leaving town, and I received the note. I couldn't afford that kind of money, and I was just tired of paying month after month. I decided to kill him, and I was going to kill myself. I guess I lost my nerve. Let's go see Mr. Luke Farnsworth, Rick. June, you sit right here until we get back. Be careful. Uh, you can make a book on it. I'm going to drive you home. Use your paw. Yes, what did... You... Oh. What do you want, Lieutenant? I got any hot coffee? If this is your idea of some kind of a joke... Mind if we come in? I most certainly do. Thanks. How dare you break in here like this? I can cause you a great deal of trouble, Lieutenant. How well did you say you knew George Lexington? Only slightly. Hey, get a load of these fancy ashtrays, Walt. Yeah, but I don't go much for modern. Pretty drapes, though. Oh, the policemen are being casual. 
You only knew Lexington slightly, huh? Yes, and this is the third time I've said it. You must make a lot of money. I have wealthy clients. How much did Jack Short pay you to get him out of that manslaughter charge? What? You remember him. Sensational case. Made you quite a reputation. Of course I remember it. This Short was sure a handsome fella. Uh, did he uh, change his name later? I, I, I don't know. That, uh, that was a long time ago. Didn't he uh, change it to Lexington? George Lexington? What is this all about? Mind if we look around the place? I most certainly do. Is that your bedroom? You have no right to go in there. Where's your warrant? Hmm. Nice bedroom. Get out. Get out. I'll call the commissioner. Why don't you do that? Uh, these your keys? Put, uh, put those down. Take it easy. I wonder if one of these fits a back door to George Lexington's study. Don't be ridiculous. I've only been to Mr. Lexington's house twice in my life. Arthur the butler will verify to that. You mean you've only been there twice by the front way? I mean exactly that. What are you doing in that closet? Nice wardrobe. This your dinner jacket? Lieutenant, I warn you. No, I'm going to warn you, Farnsworth, officially. Anything that you may say will be held against you. I'm charging you with the murder of George Lexington. <laughs> this is really one for the books. Would you mind telling me what proof you have? You call my office at 345 this afternoon from the home of Mrs. Julia Wright. Disguised your voice and told me you were George Lexington. Really? Hearsay. You were at a party given by June Morris. You stole a carving knife that she'd been using, probably wrapped it up in a handkerchief to keep her fingerprints on the handle. Did someone see me? For some reason, you wanted George Lexington out of the way. He'd been blackmailing victims that you introduced him to. You made sure that Miss Morris would be at his home at exactly 5.45. You wrote a note on her typewriter telling her to be there. You called me to be sure that someone would catch her. Interesting theory. You went up the back way into the study, probably with one of these keys. You stabbed Lexington and got out just before the girl came up. You made one mistake. You didn't figure that the girl might try to kill Lexington. What? Yeah, she shot him. But she shot a dead man. She shot him? After he was dead. You don't know it, Buster, but you just missed the perfect crime. Now prove it. The girl said you were wearing a dinner jacket the night of her party. This the coat? Yes. And to get the knife out, you had to put it in a pocket or someplace on you. She had been carving turkey. Ever hear of a spectrograph? Of course. Sure. Have the pockets analyzed, and if we find traces of turkey, we'll know you swiped the knife. And if the key to Lexington's back door is on this ring, it'll cinch it. I'm afraid not to. Come back here, Barnes. He's going for the window. Barnes, stop it, you go. Let me go. Not on your life. Not on your life. You don't take it the easy way. Get out of his head. No, no. Got him. No, 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 no. Why didn't you let me jump? What difference would it have made? Well, it sure would have saved the state some money. But a quick trip to the sidewalk doesn't make up for a killing. That's the easy way, Farnsworth. You forget when you commit murder, there's a little thing called society. And if you can't live with people, they'll decide what to do with you. Oh, that last mile is a Lulu. <laughs> Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. If you're a user of mineral oil, remember that Rexall mineral oil is carefully refined by a special process to achieve an extra heavy body. What's more, because it's so exceptionally pure and gentle in its action, Rexall mineral oil is non-irritating, non-habit forming. You'll also like the fact that it's tasteless, odorless, colorless. Next time, try Rexall mineral oil. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, Ted Osborne, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, and Virginia Gregg. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle.
This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll... Go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall Drugstores everywhere. Yes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.